CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The meek shall inherit the earth, but surely not today. Indeed, it wouldn't be surprising if it didn't happen next week or next month or even next year. In order to be a successful member of the meek, one requires patience. Indeed, the thing the meek do better than anyone else is to endure injustice with patience. And yet there is a human limit to endurance. While obviously there is no limit to injustice, something has to give. Can you describe the man who killed my son? Oh, no. No. But you saw the man. I didn't. I swear I didn't. That isn't true. Who are you to come busting in and give me the third degree? Get out! What did he look like? Mister, I got a husband. Kids, let me alone. What did he look like? Get out! Yes. I shall get out, but I shall return tomorrow, and the day after, and the day after, and I'll ask you again, and again, and you will not know a moment's peace until you tell me. Our mystery drama, Blood Red Roses was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Robert Dryden. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. it seems, a narrow and slippery pathway between poetry and practicality. Poetry tells us to love thy neighbor. Practicality warns us, don't stick your neck out. Don't get involved. These are the voices of practicality. And in so many cases, they seem to prevail. Well, we're about to witness an exercise in both poetry and practicality. And you may judge which course has been the most productive. I, I have to stop. I, I gotta rest. I, I can't run anymore. Go uh, open the door. Quick, open it up. Open. What do you want? Please, Lady Glenn, let me in. But you're in? Who are you? What do you want? Let me in, please. Just let me hide for a minute. Hide? They're after me. They'll kill me. Go away. For God's sake. Go away. I'll scream. They'll kill me. Go away, please. Go away. Somebody. Somebody's got to hide me. Please. Please. Yes? Please, please help me. Are you in trouble? Yeah, the guys are coming after me. Help me. Oh, come in. You Maybe, maybe, maybe I shouldn't come in. Well, why not? Because if they find me here, they can kill you, too. Well, maybe we better call the police. Oh, no, no. But that's what the police are for, to help. No! Well, why are those guys after you? Because I knew too much, I talked too much, and I got no place to hide. Well, sit down. You will not be killed here. Oh, well, maybe not. You... You got a gun? This is a sanctuary. A what? A sanctuary. The sanctuary of a church. What church? My church. A church? Well, where's the altar? Where's the cross? This is the church of the heart. It is my ministry to help those in need. Pray with me. Are you crazy? Pray to whatever God watched over your childhood. In whatever language you ever spoke to him. But pray from the heart. The spirit. In here. In here. The dame said he ran in here. Oh, it's Joe. It's Joe. They found me. Come on, open up in there. Open up. We'll bust it. Down. I told you, I told you to let me get out of here. Now it's too late. Let us pray. Open up. The door is unlocked. Here, there he is. 
Why do you enter this house? Knock him off, Albie. Joe, Joe, I'm gone. I know that. But this guy, this priest... Ah, what do you try to pull? What priest? Don't kill him, Joe. He didn't do anything. You must not commit violence in this house. I cannot permit let you to... Let go my arm, you knock leg off. No, I'll be... Listen. I forgive you. He's still alive, I'll be. I forgive... You... Nick. Nick, please. Let me alone, Anna. Look, you can't sit here in the room day and night. At, at least eat something. <laughs> eat something. That will make everything all right. Eat something and it will bring Stephen back to life. Just eat something to keep up your strength. Yes. I need my strength... I need strength to mourn him. That, that very nice police lieutenant called on the telephone. He said, as soon as they find the man who, who killed... Yes? They, they, they'll be able to find the man. Is that true? Yes, Nick. You see, they, they have their ways. Why don't they ask me who killed him? ask you. I know who killed Steve. Nick. I killed him. I killed my own son. Oh, Nick, you don't know what you're saying. I killed him because I failed him as a father. It's God's will that we go on living. I taught him the wrong things. Would he want you to go mad with grief? It was my duty as a father to arm him. I won't listen to... To strengthen him for the battle of life. What are you saying? What did I teach him? Oh, you taught him to be honest, to be decent. Ah, I betrayed him. No. I disarmed him. I sent him naked and defenseless into the jungle. I filled his head with nonsense. Please, Nick, we, we must go on somehow. I said to him... My son, we live because of God's love. It's true. It's a lie. This isn't you talking. This isn't the Nick I've been married to for 40 years. Oh, yes, yes. That much is true. I am no longer the same Nick. The same stupid Nick. The childish Nick. The Nick who believed in miracles. Oh, please, don't say any more now. You... You really don't mean these things. Oh, Mr. Ardmore called. He, he wants to know if you'll look after his gardens this year as usual. No. Nick, if you don't work, you'll... You must do something to keep your mind busy. My mind is busy enough, Anna. I have other things to think about. What things, Nick? What things? Things. It only proves that women cannot understand what must be done. I must kill the man who murdered my son. Even as I say these words, I feel a chill. I never spoke this way. I never thought this way. But until now... I never had reason to. Lieutenant Daly. Who? Well, can't you tell him I'm out? Look, I feel sorry for him, too, but what can I do about it? All right, send him in. Uh, what does this old guy want from me, anyhow? Ah, uh, Mr. Burko, come in, sit down. Oh, thank you. I uh, know what you're here to ask me. Yes. And let me tell you, um, we're working on it. Are there any results? Well, it was a gangland killing. We know that much. Yes? The guy they were after was a stool pigeon. Uh, excuse me? Oh, uh, uh, an informer. Oh, yes. Well, the problem is, uh, any one of a number of well-known racketeers could have ordered the hit. We don't know which gang, which uh, outfit is responsible. 
Yeah, but the gunmen, they prowled through the neighborhood. They were seen. Surely they can be described. By whom? By uh, witnesses. We can't find any. But it is a crowded street. Someone saw them. People are frightened. It is known that the fugitive ran from door to door, and each door was close to him. Yes, the old story. Nobody wanted to get involved. Now, you can't blame people too much, you know. They're, and they're scared. Have you spoken to the people? Yes, Mr. Burko, but we can't force people to testify. Yeah, maybe if I spoke to them... What makes you think they would listen to you? I, I would ask them in a certain way. Yeah? Uh, may I speak with you? Uh, my name is N Nicholas Birko. I am Stephen Birko's father. Oh, yeah. It, you want to come in? Oh, thank you. Well, won't you sit down? Uh, can I get you something? A cup of tea, maybe? No, no, thank you. Huh. Oh, that, that son of yours, he... He was a saint. He's always there when you needed him. You ought to be so proud. Everybody in the neighborhood was crazy about him. The animals had killed him. The chair is too good for him. Can you describe the men who killed him? Oh, no. I, no, I, I, I really didn't get a good look at him. Describe them, please. Oh, Mr. Burko, look, I, I'm really very busy. I, I don't believe you. What did they look like? I, I, I think you'd better leave. You're frightened, aren't you? Look, who, who asked your son to be a hero? He asked for it, and he got it. Now, now, please, you better go. I will keep asking you. Please, I got a husband and kids. I got, I got to protect my own. I won't stop asking you. Will you get out? Yes. And I will wait for you to tell me. I will wait outside. I would stand in the street in front of your door, day and night. And I promise you, you will not know a moment's peace until you tell me. Uh, Nick? Oh, Anna, Anna, oh. Anna, I'm I, I, I woke you, I'm sorry. Oh, where, where, where are you going? It's only six o'clock in the morning. I, 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 out. Oh, Nick. You can't keep doing this. I can. I will. I must. You just stand on the corner outside that woman's flat. I'll go back to sleep. People think you're insane. People may think as they like. Oh, Nick. You have to go back to work. This is my work. Your customers. They'll have to hire other landscape artists. All the flowers you planted for so many good people. I can't be helped. But what good does it do? Your only son was murdered, and you have no wish to avenge his death? Uh, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Ah, uh, yes. But since the Lord shows no sign of taking it, I'll have to attend to it myself. Nick, it's raining outside. It's also raining on my son's grave. Oh. If you could only find peace. I will. On the day I avenge his death. They didn't know what to do about me in that neighborhood. They didn't know what to say to me. So, they did nothing. And they said nothing. And they pretended I wasn't there. But I was. Every day, rain and sunshine. And she would go in and out of her house, and she'd go right past me without a word. And I made no move to stop her, to talk to her. I just looked at her. And then I realized she was going to talk to me. Because she was no longer walking past me, she was beginning to run. And every day she would run faster. And I knew there had to be a limit to how fast she could run. And on that day, she would stop running. And she would walk up to me and she would say... You... You win. You win. I'll, I'll tell you everything. I, I just can't run from you anymore. 
Persistence has paid off. She's going to describe those killers. Joe, Albie, weren't those the names we heard? But what can Nick Burko do with the information? He talks about revenge, but these are professional hoodlums. Well, he has a second act in which to figure out a course of action. He's a quiet man, a humble man, a meek. It is doubtful that he ever entertained a violent thought or performed a violent action in his life. And yet, he proposes to hunt down the professional killers of his only son. Don't sell him short. He was able to get what the police couldn't. A description of the gunmen. Joe? Yeah, it has to be Joe Murray. He's got blonde hair. He's over six feet. And it's going to be him. And Albie? Albie's his sidekick, Albie Perry. And so, now, Lieutenant, you know who they are. Yeah, yeah. Well, will this woman testify in court? It doesn't matter. Oh, but it does. If she won't testify, we have no witness. And therefore, no case. And these guys go free. I am not concerned with that, Lieutenant Dale. I thought you wanted to get the guys who killed your son. These men are merely servants... Isn't that true? Servants of a boss. Oh, yes. That's certainly true. It's this boss who hires them and commands them. He's the real murderer. Isn't that true? Well, yeah. And you said if you knew the employee, the hireling, you could identify the employer, the boss. I can, but it won't do us any good. Once again, we have no evidence. Who is the boss who orders these two men to kill? They work for Jerry Bissett. Jerry Bissett? Yeah. Where can I find him? What do you mean, where can you find him? What do you think you can do? I will make him pay for the murder of my son. Oh, but you can't. Take the law into your own hands. Lieutenant, I find myself in this position only because the law has failed. Look, I know how you feel, Mr. Burko. Huh? Has an only son of yours been murdered? Well, no. Well, then you don't know how I feel. Do you know what you're up against? This guy, Jerry Bazet? He's got connections all the way into Washington, D.C. And so far, he can't be touched. Now, what are you planning? Say, uh, uh, let's say you want to shoot him, huh? How do you think you could get at him? The guy is guarded tighter than Fort Knox, Kentucky. I thanked him. I went home. And then, I... Almost broke into tears. I realized how helpless I was. Oh, Nick, you must rid your mind of all these thoughts. Ah, I must destroy that man the way he has destroyed me. Nick, you cannot be destroyed. You have too much good in you. How? Tell me, Anna, how? I, I've never held a gun in my hand. I, I can't stand even the thought of a knife. Nick, you can't kill this man. He's already dead. And even if I had the weapon, how could I get close enough to him? His soul has died. He's not worth your trouble. Help me think of a way. Would Steve want you to kill him? Steve? Hmm. No. But only because I filled his head with nonsense. Don't use that word. What you taught him was not nonsense. Love, love, my son. Look about you and see God's love. I filled his head with this. It's nonsense. And he believed it. He believed it. And you don't believe it? No more. Now, let me be free to think. About what? About what I must do. And suddenly, I felt as if a weight had been lifted from my mind. Now, for some reason, everything was so clear. Jerry Bissett, the untouchable Jerry Bissett, 
I would find a way somehow. And so, instead of wringing my hands and feeling sorry for myself, I decided to act. First, I must learn everything there was to know about Jerry Bissett. In the beginning, Lieutenant Bailey refused to talk to me, but I haunted his office just as I did that lady's street corner. And I heard some gossip. And I took advantage of it. What are these? Those are roses, Lieutenant. I know they're roses. I never saw such beautiful ones. I understand your wife loves to grow roses. Yeah, what kind are they? It's a rose I have developed myself. Uh, I will tell her how to plant them, how to... Yeah, hold on a minute. Uh, why are you This is these? a bribe. Oh, no, no, I can't take a... Uh... And what am I asking for? Just information on Jerry Rizet. But you'll only do something stupid and get yourself killed. Well, that's my right as a citizen, isn't it? <laughs> you know what's funny? Roses. Why? Well, roses just happen to be Jerry Bissett's hobby. What? This animal appreciates the beauty of a rose? Uh, many of these animals have become domesticated in the certain minor matters. They breed flowers, horses, dogs. They buy art. Roses. Yeah. He exhibits at all the shows. At the shows. <laughs> What's funny, Nick? <laughs> roses. As simple as that. Roses. My blood red roses. <laughs> night, I wrote a letter. I went to the library to write this letter because from now on, Anna must not be aware of what I meant to do. I must keep her out of it. Dear Mr. Pizet, I have developed what I thought was a new flower, which I call the blood red rose. A friend has told me that you have displayed such a rose at a show in the South. Will you please accept these flowers from one lover of roses to another and tell me if they are the same as yours? Nick? Who was at the door? Oh, the mailman. He gave me this letter. The envelope. Uh -huh. Have you ever seen such an envelope? It's, it's like parchment. I see. And it, it just has the initials J.B. Nick, where are you going? In the bedroom. Dear Mr. Burko, it was kind of you to send me the flowers. Even kinder to think that I could grow anything as magnificent as your blood red rose. Roses, as you may have heard, are my consuming passion. When I find a fellow aficionado, I, I gotta meet him, talk with him, make him my friend. Please let me know what day would be convenient for you to visit. I should be very happy to send a car for you. A minute, please. Yes. Uh, is this a house of Nicholas Burko? Who, who are you? Uh, he's expecting us, ma'am. Who's at the door, Anna? Uh, Mr. Burko, I'm Mr. Bazette's chauffeur. Nick, wh what does this Anna, mean? Anna, everything is all right. I'm ready to go with you now, Mr. Uh, uh, just uh, call me Joe. Joe. I could hear suddenly the voice of Lieutenant Daly. Joe. Yeah, it has to be Joe Murray. He's got blonde hair. And Albie's his sidekick. Tall, blonde-haired Joe and I walked downstairs and into the street and over to the curb where a large limousine was waiting. And behind the wheel was another man. Okay, Albie. Let's move. Joe and Albie... The two men who had murdered my son. And here I was, riding in a car with them. Nick! 
Chris Burko, huh? Well, let me shake your hand. I thought I knew everyone who knew anything about roses in this world, but you are a discovery. Like finding a, a Rembrandt in the attic. I can't call you Mr. Burko. We gotta be Nick and Jerry, huh? The way we feel about roses, why, we, we got more in common than most brothers. My heart, it almost failed me. This man, dressed like a, a dandy who used cologne. This man who it seemed I could almost crush with my two hands. This man was the terrible Jerry Bizet. No, must be a mistake. What do you do, Nick? Ah, I work as a gardener. Go <laughs> I got to correct you. You don't work. You, you create. And you're not a gardener. You're, you're an artist. Who are you with? I work for myself. Well, work for yourself. But work for me. Turn yourself loose on this estate, Nick. And uh, name your price. Yes, but I... Be uh, what used to be called artist in residence, huh? Well, that's what you were meant to be. And let me function as I was intended, as a as a patron of the arts. <laughs> you and me, Nick, it was meant to be. Was I going mad? I had come here to kill this man. And now we were talking about my working for him. This, this depraved killer who had the responsibility for Stevie's death. What stopped me from ending his life right here, right now? Hey, Pop, I might have known you'd be out here. Oh, uh, Junior, I'd like you to meet Nick Burko. Hiya. That's uh, my son, Jerome Francis Bizet Jr. Oh, how do you do? Nick developed that rose I showed you, the blood red rose. Yeah, it's a great thrill, Pop. I need some dough. You got your allowance yesterday. Well, you know me, Pop. I can't stay away from that wheel. Junior, you've got to learn... Come on, the... come on. What's the lecture? You own the joint. Every dollar I lose comes back to you. You just keep the money moving, right? Mr. Roberts tells me you ain't been to the office in a week. Make that a month. The old guy's covering up for me. Junior, you've got to do something productive. Why? My old man's got millions. What do I have to work for? Um... Uh... Suppose we discuss this some other time, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Look at Mr. Burko. He's embarrassed. It's okay, Mr. Burko. I can tell. You're a gentleman of the old school. You're lord and master in your house. And when you talk, the wife and kiddies jump, right? A junior? That is enough. Mr. Burko is a true son of the soil. Honest, rugged, like a rock. Well, you know what we do around here, Mr. Burko? Junior! We kill people. That's right. See, we're very polite. We're very sophisticated. We go to the opera, we visit the museums, we're good neighbors, we give to charities. But if you don't do what we tell you, if you don't buy what we sell you, we kill you. You shut up, punk! Ah, that's the dad I know and love. Well, good day to you, Mr. Burko. Mr. Luther Burbank Burko? Oh, kids, kids. You got any kids, Nick? No. Kid. He's 26. 26. Now, why, why, why does he do these things to me? Why can't he become a serious person? The world is open up to him. Whatever he wants to be, I can buy for him. Doctor, lawyer, name it. What am I working for? What am I living for? What have I got? Just this kid. <laughs> I knew I would not kill him by ending his life. That would be too short, too merciful. I would kill him the way he killed me, by taking away what had made my life worthwhile. I would strike at him through his son, his only child. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and a son for a son.
And that is the price, the blood price. The only problem is, can Nick Burko convince himself to exact it? Can a man suddenly overcome the habits of a lifetime? The snake can shed its skin, but can the leopard change its spots? There will be both shedding and changing when I return shortly with Act Three. Revenge is a fire that needs to be fed. And the longer it burns, the more fuel it consumes. Until finally, it burns everything and everyone as it rages out of control. Such a conflagration has already been started. Hello, Anna. Oh, Nick, you, you're home. Why shouldn't I be home? I live here. Where should I go? Oh, Nick, I, I was so frightened. You, you were taken to the house of that, that gangster chief. Gangster chief? Why? Mr. Bizet is what they call uh, uh, an eccentric millionaire. I don't understand. The man is devoted to roses, as I am. I sent him some blood reds. He asked me to work for him. Oh, you, you would work for Anna, him? Anna, life goes on. He killed our son. Who says that? I, I don't understand, Nick. Our son I... was murdered by hoodlums, engaged in a private quarrel. Who the killers were, we may never know. We have rumor, we have gossip. Nick, what are you going to do to him? I will not do anything to him. It isn't true. Why should I do anything to him? He is responsible for Steve's death. We know that. And if he is, are we not commanded to forgive? Oh, I'm afraid. Of what? Of you. Nick, listen to me. You, you're different. Different from other men. Ah, what are you saying? What other men have you known? Believe me, there is in you a force, a power. Oh, Nick. Anna, you really don't know what you are talking about. Listen to me. I married you because, because I could feel this power. Power? What power? You have the power of the earth. The forces of the earth are in you. You're a man of the earth. Look at what you can bring forth from the ground. Anna, I'm hungry. Is supper prepared? He is a bandit chief. Bandit chief? We are back in the old country. He is surrounded by fierce, heavily armed men. I wish you would listen to me, my dear Anna. And yet, yet you have the power to destroy him. Because no one and nothing can stop you. Must I eat my supper in some cafeteria? Uh, what? What are you going to do to this man? How are you going to kill him? <laughs> Women. And mine is the best of them. And even she has no understanding. I will take this man's son from him. I will rob him of the only precious thing in his life. But... It seemed I must wait. He wasn't there the next day. Or the next weeks. Months went by. It's a miracle. This garden, it's a miracle. You know something. Nothing ever grew here before. But I saw this garden before I went to work. It was a hustle. It was all brought in, all brought in, every inch of dirt. This place could only grow weeds. Oh, I cannot believe that. You know what I told the old man. I said you got too much blood in the ground. Why are you unhappy? Huh? Unhappy? Why should I be unhappy? I'm the one who asked the question. Who are you to question me? What do you know? What do you know about anything? What do you know? What do you know about anything? I had heard those words before. They were spoken to me by my own son. My own son. And with great fire and passion. 
What do you know? What do you know about anything? You're in America now, for crying out loud. You're not some ignorant European peasant. What are you trying to say to me, Stephen? Oh, wise up. You walk around all day with dirt on your shoes and manure on your hands. What do you know about anything? You, you have to be smart in this country, because what counts here is the almighty buck. That's what people understand. That's what people respect. And that's what I'm out to get. Stephen, listen to me. I know what you're going to say, and I won't buy it. Steve, look at this. Look at this rose. So what? It's just a rose. No, 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 no. It's a special rose. It's my very own rose. It never existed before. This, this blood red rose. All the money in the world could never buy this rose. Steve. All the money in the world. Could never buy this rope. Hey, hey, who you talking to, Nick? You all right? Ah, forgive me. Sometimes... Besides, what do you mean? All the money in the world can't buy that rose. It's for sale, isn't it? Well, what I mean is that all of the money in the world could not buy that rose before it existed. With all your wealth, my son, with all your power, let me see you cause a rose to rise from this ground. Not even a weed will obey you if it isn't God's will. The moment it had come and gone. How could I kill him when I was talking about God? And then... A thought flashed into my mind. I wasn't going to kill him. I was going to save him. I knew I was going to save him. And I realized that I wanted to save him more than I wanted anything else in the world. Tell me something, Nick. What are you doing to my boy? Huh? What am I doing? I mean, well, he, he stays home, he doesn't run around, he's very quiet. I see him in the gardens all the time. I don't think I'm doing anything. Oh, he's, he's finally showing signs of turning into a very serious person. And I have to have him that way to run my business. Anyhow, whatever it is you're doing, Nick, keep it up. <laughs> How do you get that rose to be such a red color? Such a blood red? That's not the way to, to say it. This rose does not obey me. It does not do what I command or desire. I only help it to become what it must be. What God has intended it to be. God certainly did not intend for any of us to lie. Rob, murder. He only wanted us to love each other. <laughs> love? Ah, this world needs so much love. What is it that you wanted to be? What was it that you wanted to do? I... I wanted to help people. Oh, that's a fine answer. And you have money. No. My father has money, but I won't touch it. It's blood money. How can you help without money? I'll give myself. There was a young guy. I read about him in the papers. It was a long time ago. I don't even remember his name. He went down into the slums. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't a doctor. He wasn't a lawyer, but he was there. And he did what he could. He was a most... Unusual young man. Not everyone could do what he did. I know. And maybe I can't either. But I'm going to try. You're crazy. Where are you going? I'm leaving, Father. Well, what are you leaving? You, this, everything. You mean you're going to live in some filthy rattle, huh? Can't live here. Why? Because I finally found out who I am. 
what I am and what I want to do. You're my son. You can't give this up. You can't. Goodbye, father. But what was it for? Who was it for? Why did I do it? For you. I don't want it. Stay with me, Junior. Why, we can own the world. Come with me, father. We can have the world. Oh, you'll come back. You'll come crawling back on your hands and knees. You'll get bit by the first rat, hit by the first rock. Goodbye, Nick. Goodbye. Could I have some of those roses? Oh, of course. Thanks. Blood red roses. Goodbye. Nick, what's gotten into that boy? Is the whole world gone crazy? Why don't you go and live with him? You know what you're talking about? He has chosen a new way of life. Unless that way becomes your way, you'll never see him again. How can I stop being Jerry Bizet? How? Answer me. You can't. And that's why he's been taken away from you. You've lost him forever. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and a son for a son. Payment in kind. And that's the most satisfying revenge there is. And so Jerry Bizet loses a son, just the way Nick Burko lost a son. And you may say, well, Jerry's loss certainly doesn't compare with Nick's, but it does. It does. For a son is the reason a father dreams. And now, Jerry's dreams are as dead as Nick's. I'll be back shortly. Roses, the traditional flowers of romance. The red rose of courage and valor. The white rose of purity and hope. What's in a name? Everything. The bard to the contrary notwithstanding. Would a rose by any other name smell as sweet? Probably. But who would believe it? Our cast included Robert Dryden, Bryna Rayburn, Arnold Moss, William Redfield, and Bob Caliban. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Before you joined me, I was sitting thinking of all the murders, mayhem, and malevolence I have brought to you in the name of mystery. Suddenly, in this unaccustomed, mellow mood, 
I thought upon the obverse side of the coin, the antithesis of the devil's advocates, the ministers of God. And it occurred to me that as much terror and suspense are contained in the mystery and magic that is invested in them by a higher power, a greater force, only this time not a force for evil. So I thought a story from the other point of view might be interesting for a change. What is it, Miss Riggs? What happened? Chaplain Morgan, he just, just suddenly collapsed. Is he dead, Dr. Shelton? Nurse, uh, take care of the patient. Orderly, send me another nurse from the floor quickly. What is it, Liz? What happened to Dan? I don't know yet, Mike. Well, so help me if anything has. This one I'm pinning directly on that cold fish, Dr. Hugh Bradley. <laughs> mystery drama, He Moves in a Mysterious Way, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Terry Keene. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines, and Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. the 18th century poet William Cowper who gave us that familiar and wonderful quote, God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. This story is a reflection of that. Belleville Community Hospital, though located in the town of its name, services the entire county of Fairchild. It is the pride and joy of the five main towns and their smaller brothers and sisters who draw on its dependable service. But Belleville Hospital is stretched beyond its usual adequate capacity at this moment as a result of a train wreck on the line to New York. This is Dr. Shelton. Just want to alert you, Brownie. We can expect 20 to 30 more casualties according to police estimates. Our patient facilities are already jammed, so we'll use the children's emergency section temporarily. In case of serious injuries that look surgical, refer all admissions to Dr. Bradley. Uh, Nurse, I'm admitting this patient on the uh, cart. Elizabeth Riggs. I knew you'd have to, Dr. Oh, Bradley, Dr. so Shelton. I had her chart prepared. Yes, very efficient, Doctor. My compliments to the outpatient department. I want my service to satisfy the new chief of staff. As long as it stays efficient, it will. Yeah, uh, Dr. Bradley? Yes, Dr. Bernardo. They're screaming for you in OR. You can hold the dramatics. I'm on my way. Oh, uh, better check out this patient in the meanwhile, Elizabeth Riggs. I've given her light sedation. She's pre-op. No need to diagnose her. I've already done that. Slight concussion, fractured patella, calcaneus, and some messy damage in the ankle to the fibular and tibial termini. You'll find it all on the chart. Well, I'm on my way to the OR. I would like to take his chart. Mike, remember who he is. Sure. A genius at getting my back up. Come on, orderly. Let's go. Fly easy, Pazan. What do you want from a crazy Italian? Liz, I got here as fast as I could. What is it? Train wreck, Chaplain. Sorry to haul you out of bed in the middle of the night. Only time anyone really needs a chaplain or a minister is when there's trouble. You look a little under the weather. Are you all right? Oh, just half asleep. I'm the last one to be worried about. Not my leg! No! Not my leg! What's going on in here, nurse? <laughs> Miss Riggs. I won't let them. I won't let anyone. Miss Riggs. Yes? Oh, you were the doctor I who... treated you when you came in. What's the matter with my arms? You I had can't... to be put under restraint. It's imperative you stay as still as possible. I can't, don't you see? I can't. Miss until... Riggs, you are not the only victim of the train wreck. Train wreck? Oh, that's it. My leg. I lost my leg. Now, don't be silly. You have some broken bones, but you have not lost your leg. Now, give me that, nurse. She's lying to me. I can't feel it. Help me hold her, nurse. Now, where's Dr. Bernardo? I'm here, doctor. And you hold her. Now, lie still, Miss We only want to help. I don't want to be helped. Sure you do, baby. That's what we're here for. You want to walk out of here as soon as possible, don't you? Are you, are you, are you a surgeon? 
Just hired help. I'm the surgeon. Uh, swab that, nurse. This is Dr. Bernardo. If you're the surgeon, I want to know something. Why can't I feel anything where my left leg ought to be? Because I immobilized it till Dr. McNeil, the orthopedist, has time to operate on it. I don't believe you. I haven't time to argue. I want to see you a moment, Dr. Bernardo. Now convince this grown-up child that she has two good legs, will you? I'll try to the best of my limited ability. I don't ask for any more than you have to give. Why, you cold in humans. Nurse, bring me that hand mirror from the bureau. Surest way to convince you, Miss Riggs. Let you see for yourself. Oh, thanks, nurse. You want to pull the bedclothes back? Okay. Now, see? One of them in a light plaster bandage cast, but both where they belong. Oh! Why, why didn't Dr. Bradley show me that? Well, he might have. You should have given him a chance instead of throwing a wingding. Oh, I shouldn't have, but... My legs are very special to me. Now I can see where they would be. I didn't mean the way they look. <laughs> Neither did I. Although I wouldn't knock it. But I know you're a dancer. It's my whole life. If I couldn't have... Oh, especially now. Nothing to worry about at the moment. But I've got... Oh, oh I feel woozy. Now that's the sedation. What is that surgeon going to do to me? You have a cracked kneecap and a broken ankle. He's going to fix them. I don't want an operation. Well, we'll work that out when the time comes. You rest now and let the sedation work. I don't want to be alone. I, w I just wish that... What? You wouldn't understand. I'm, I'm scared. I... I think God is punishing me and... I want to... Oh, I don't know what I want. There's a chaplain in the hospital. Reverend Dan Morgan. Real good guy. Want to talk to him? Could I? I, I? I know I can't sleep until... Would he have time for me? Miss Riggs, Dan Morgan could be drawing his last breath and he'd hold it till he got through helping anyone who needed him. Come in. You looking for me, Pat? Uh, Mike Bernardo just called down, Dan. Could you talk to that dancer with the badly injured leg? Well, sure, of course. About what? She's fighting an operation, and she asked for a minister. All right. Uh, should she have the operation? If she doesn't, she may never walk properly again. She could even lose it. Oh. Dan, you look tired. You don't look well. Maybe you should go home and rest. When I'm needed? No, not in your life. Uh, what's the girl's name? Elizabeth Riggs, room 317. A dancer, you say, huh? Yes. Ballet? Modern, I suppose, not classical. But a professional? Yes. And if the operation is successful, will she... Will she dance again? I doubt it. And more than ever, she needs me. Yes, of course I'll see her. God's will be done. Hello, Elizabeth Riggs. I'm Chaplain Dan Morgan. Oh, how good of you to come. Was I asleep? For a while. I'm sorry. It was good for you. Not good enough. I need help, Chaplain. Help? Wireless. I'm afraid of the operation. I think they want to cut off my leg or, or my foot. Well, now, did they say they would? No, but doctors never tell you. Of course they do. No one thinks you're going to lose your leg. I do. Why? Because I think God wants to punish me. Punish you? Well, what for? There's a, a boy, Peter Sterrett. We're, we were very much in love. That's what I went upstate for, to marry him. And? At the last moment, I couldn't. I ran out on the whole wedding. My parents, his, everyone. I, I took the train back to New York. 
That's why God punished me. Oh, I wouldn't say that. There were 64 people on that train wreck. God's a little more efficient than that. Now you make me feel ashamed. I meant to. I don't believe in a God of vengeance who reaches out to hurt and punish, and neither should you, Liz. We make our own punishments. Well, I didn't make the train wreck. No, but... You climbed aboard that train to run away. But I had to. Chaplain Morgan dancing isn't just a profession, it's a whole way of life. And that's what I realized at the last moment. I, I, I couldn't give it up to marry Peter. Well, you said you loved him. I do. It, it tore me apart to give him up, but I, I had to make the choice. Child, why couldn't you have both? Because Peter's a minister just like you. Can you imagine him running a parish with his wife in a Broadway show and cleavage down to my navel and net stockings up to my bikini? Okay, Dan, buddy boy, I'm on my way. That was Dan. He's calmed our Terpsy Korean terror. And she now is ready to sign for the operation. All right, give me a form, hon, and I'll go make sure she's prepped. Well, here's your form. Just watch your own. Well, what's that mean? You want to be a resident in surgery, don't you? It's my life, outside of you. Me, you got. Just take it easy if Dr. Bradley's the surgeon. Okay, okay. So the guy gravels me. Now, try to stay out of his hair. Mike, he's a new broom. Give him a chance to work in. Oh, I'll be a good little soldier. Anything he can dish out, I can take. <laughs> That's my boy. <laughs> Just hold the good thought. Too bad it's neither sane nor sanitary for one doctor to kiss another. All right, take the wish for the deed. I love you. You can order the cart to take her up to the ready room, nurse. She's all cleared for a while. Oh, hi, Dan. Hey, come and stop, I son. Very easy, Padre Mio. Hey, you don't look so hot. Oh, I'm a little tired. Why don't you hit the sack? No, not till the action's over. Hey, wait a minute. Maybe I ought to run a little check on you. Oh, don't be silly. Why? What are you rubbing your gut for? Oh, come on, come on, Mike. A little indigestion. Somebody sneaks some cucumber in my salad again. No, no, no. You don't double over like that from cucumber. I'd better take... You were assisting Dr. McNeil? Uh, Yes, Dr. Bradley, but... uh, You ought to be up in the scrub room already. Now, let's go. I was on my way, but the chaplain here needs a checkup. The chaplain can take care of himself. Has Miss Riggs been prepped? Yes, sir, but... Get in the elevator, Dr. Ames. Yes, sir, Dr. Bradley. Yes, sir. Private Bernardo reporting for duty. But may I recommend that the chaplain be temporarily relieved from his? Do you want to be relieved, chaplain? Oh, come on, you, you... You have enough to worry about besides me. Now, if you need a rest... No, no, no. I, I think I'll go in and sit with that poor child when she's taken up to OR. She needs me more than I need anything. Well, how are you feeling, Liz? I don't know. Far away, but... Still scared? Oh, now you mustn't be. I won't lose my leg. <laughs> you mustn't think about that. Even if it's saved, will I dance again? Whatever is to be, just leave it in God's hands. Oh, it's so easy for you. Words, just words. No, never just words, Liz. <laughs> I've stayed with you because I... I wanted to help you find strength. Don't let it be for nothing. Let me have achieved at least that. uh, Nurse! Nurse! Somebody, help! What is it? What's happened? Chaplain Morgan. He just suddenly collapsed. Nurse, take care of the patient. Orderly, get me another nurse from the floor right away. How'd the operation go? I don't know. Good, I guess. McNeil's the best bone man around, but that leg, it was a mess. How's Dan? I don't know. Running fever? Low grade, but he's still in in coma. Mm. What were the symptoms when you first examined him? Oh, nothing too definite. He's got a surgical abdomen, no doubt about that, but what? Did you get blood samples? Waiting for them now. You haven't been able to bring him to at all? No. If God owes anyone a break... It's to him. A bitter young man. 
but then a very tired and exhausted one, and a deeply concerned one for a man who is as close as his father. Still, Dr. Michael Bernardo should know that in the eyes of God, all men are equal. Or are they? We have listened so many times to the triumph of evil on this program. Perhaps the power of good is not as strong. I'll return shortly with Act Two. Across Dan's bed, Dr. Patricia Shelton and Dr. Mike Bernardo's eyes lock in concern for their barely breathing friend. From beyond the curtain and the other bed in the room, from the big, heavily muscled, early middle-aged man in it comes a rhythmic and ear-shattering snore. Oh, great. Is that the best roommate we could find for Dan? Well, we were lucky to have a bed at all. Even the standby rooms are all taken. Uh, get him off his back. No, you can't. He's in traction. Back? Yeah. McNeil's patient, too. From the train wreck? No, he's been here a week or so. Oh, I'm tired. Why don't you grab some shut-eye, huh? <clears throat> we can't do anything till we get the test back or Dan comes, too. Go stretch out in the lounge. I'll... I'll wake you the moment the tests are back, huh? Come on, I'll walk you there. How'd the operation go for Liz Riggs? Oh, McNeil patched the knee fairly easily, but the ankle and the socket of the tibia were fragmented, plus the broken calcaneus. She'll be lucky to retain even partial mobility. Which means no more dancing. Mm, certainly not professionally. I'd hate to have to be the one to tell her. Hey. Hey. Where is Sam Hills? Damn. Hey, you. You in the next bed. Hey, you awake? Hey. What is this, a morgue? Hey, you! Yeah? What? What is it? I don't know what's with you, brother, but my back is killing me. I... I want to ring for the nurse, but the gizmo with a button just fell off of the bed. Can you get it for me, huh? Uh, just a minute. <clears throat> Here. I'll get the call button. Shall I... Ring for you. I'll get you a doctor. Oh, forget it. I'm all right for the moment. Yes, but you're in pain. You. Oh, I can take it. What do you got, Mac? I don't know. I don't even know how I got here. Oh, I hope it's nothing catching. No, I'm sure it isn't. I, I, I thought I had a. But there isn't any pain anymore. Count your blessings, fella. Dan. What are you doing out of bed? No, I'm all right. You are I'm not. Right. Nurse, help me get him back in no, bed. No, I... Oh, you're running a fever. And nurse, get Dr. Bernardo down here right away. He's catching a nap in the father's lounge on maternity. Dan, won't you ever take care of yourself? Hey, what's the big fuss? Who is this guy? Huh, I was right. A doctor, huh? He's not an M.D. He's the hospital chaplain, the Reverend Dan Morgan. A minister, for crying out loud. That's all I need. Okay, Dan. Let me know if and where it hurts. Oh, there. Uh-huh. How about here? Uh, tender. Doesn't, doesn't hurt as much. Okay, Dan. That's it. Confirmed? The WBC will bear it out this time around. The peritonitis caused by a ruptured appendix that perforated... How did you ever take the pain, Dan? Oh, it wasn't that bad. Everyone was busy with real emergencies. My help was needed by others. So you just let your appendix explode. All right, roll them to you, Pat. <laughs> Streptomycin too, nurse. <laughs> your technique is too good, Mike. I didn't feel any needles. Of all the bonehead stunts to pull. So many people. I couldn't... I couldn't let them down. 
fever's rising. I don't like it. You in pain still, Dan? Oh, no, no. I, I was just thinking about that poor little dancer. Look, concentrate on yourself. Let us worry about Miss Riggs. There's no problem of her losing her leg. Dr. McNeil did a bang-up job. With luck, she'll regain almost total mobility. Pat, mm -hmm. will you sit on this stubborn mule till that kick goes out of him? I will. Go make like a doctor. At least my other patients treat me like one. <laughs> you, you still going to marry that crazy Italian? The first moment I can pin him down. Then I'll stick around. I don't know who he figures will be best man, but Dan Morgan knows who'll be the most important. Or I'll make sure he ties the knot within the faith. With my own two hands. <laughs> my own two hands. Joining the two of you. In the side of... Morning, Miss Riggs. Morning, Dr. Bernardo. Well, you look pretty and pretty this morning. Oh, I feel wonderful. I can almost feel the bones knitting. I could just... Jump right out of bed, do a jeté, or handle a waltz clog, just like that. Yeah, well, I wouldn't rush things. Well, not without a warm-up, anyway. But I bet you I'll be dancing in no time, thanks to Chaplain Morgan. How is he today? Is he better? I wish I could say he was. Didn't they take out his appendix? No, not yet. You mean it? it's serious? It could be very serious. Oh, I wish I could do something for him. You could. You could see a young man who's waiting downstairs. Peter Starrett. How did he find me? As sick as the chaplain was last night, he managed to contact him. Wh what for? He knows it's all over between Peter and me. Why, because you just can't bear to hang up those little red shoes? Something like that. I think maybe what Chaplain Morgan wanted to tell you was that a dancer has a short life. And sooner or later, she has to hang them up. A marriage can last a lot longer. I can't. It wouldn't be fair to Peter or to me. That's the message you want me to give him? And the chaplain? Dr. Bernardo, I will be able to dance, won't I? I'm not the one to ask that question to, Miss Riggs. You'd better ask it of the surgeons, Dr. McNeil or Dr. Bradley. Morning, Mr. Wolf. Hey. Morning, Chaplain. See you're out of traction. Yeah, yeah. How you feel? Oh, I felt better. <laughs> Thirsty. Ah, uh, hold it a minute. I'll get you some ice water. No, 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 you're back. You you, you mustn't get out. Yes, uh, you can lug a busted appendix around and not complain. I can manage a stiff back. Here. Oh, thanks. Oh, uh, yeah. No, thanks. You want some more? Yeah, please. Yeah. That was, that was good. Yeah. <laughs> Good. It's... Hey, what is it, Parson? A knife. A knife. I'll get the doctor. Don't answer that. It might be Peter for me. Could be a call for me, too. But if it should be Peter, I'm... I'm just not ready to talk to him. Couldn't you just let it go? Sure. Nothing so urgent. It won't last till I get to the nurse's desk. I'll be seeing you, Miss Riggs. Oh, ice water for a man with peritonitis. Where were you, Dr. Bernardo? I went to see Miss Riggs. You know, the dancer. Who is not your patient? No, sir. <laughs> you don't like me very much, do you, Dr. Bernardo? Well, that is a bit direct. Puts me at quite a disadvantage. Because you've applied here for a residency in surgery? <laughs> my personal feelings would not dictate my judgment of your qualifications unless you wish to withdraw your application. Not 
yet, sir. Oh? What does that depend on? The success of our operation on Chaplain Morgan? To a degree. Then we must be sure that it is immaculately successful. As far as I'm concerned, it's the same way no matter who's on the table. Mm. I deserve that rebuke. I bought it because of my own resentments. I'm human, not a robot. You are kind of a stickler for detail. You're damn right. A doctor can make minor mistakes which can be rectified. Isn't quite the same with a surgeon. Habit, discipline, minute attention to detail, constant vigilance and objectivity. That's what a surgeon has to pay. <laughs> Still want to be one. As long as I don't have to retire from the human race. Like me. That perhaps is a personal trait, but I have some reason. You see, one surgeon's momentary carelessness, his anxiety to look up and be a nice guy and assure me everything was going well, cost me my wife. And with it, a large part of me. Well, no one is very much interested in my immortal soul. Now, Dan Morgan is something else again. But for the moment, objectively, just another surgical problem. Agreed? I'll assist to the best of my ability. I'll accept that, Doctor. The patient is waiting. Shall we go? The great poet, W.H. Orton, had a craggy face so masked with wrinkles that Igor Stravinsky once said, Soon we'll have to smooth it out to see exactly who he is. Dan Morgan's face is like that. Only now, under anesthetic, it is smoothed out. The only difference is that as the two surgeons approach, it is less a revelation than a mask. A mask of encroaching death. I'll return shortly with Act Three. operation is completed, and the two surgeons return to the locker room, still gowned, capped, gloved, and masked. With a quick practice move, Dr. Bradley divests himself of gloves, mask, and cap, dropping them in a sanitary container. What are Dan's chances? Uh, you saw what was there when we opened. The infection is massive and well established. The drain should bring relief, I hope more than temporary. But once we can get a reading on the culture, we can pick the right antibiotic to knock out the infection? If we're lucky. If Dan doesn't pull through this... If he doesn't, Doctor, I, uh, I shall resign from this hospital. I was guilty of just what I demand from my staff. Total thoroughness on every case. Well, in all fairness, sir, with 65 victims of a train wreck suddenly dumped on it you... It still you doesn't excuse carelessness or inattention. Now, I'm going to the recovery room to check on Chaplain Morgan. I might suggest you get together with Dr. McNeil and prepare Miss Riggs to face her future. <laughs> yes, Mike, I guess I understand. Oh, he's here in the waiting room, all right, looking pretty forlorn. What? Well, I'll do my best. Yeah, okay, I'll talk to him. Hello, Reverend Starrett. Oh. Oh, hello. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Shelton. Oh, yes. Excuse me, I... I know the others, but I wasn't as sure of you... Because I'm a lady, Doctor? No. Because I, I only met you once briefly. I know. Have you seen Miss Riggs? No, no. She... She doesn't want to see me. That's because she... She doesn't know the truth yet. The truth? That she'll never be able to dance again. But he didn't tell me that. He didn't know it then. Just Liz. Reverend Starrett... 
After the accident, your fiancé was in psychogenic shock. It took Dan, the chaplain, to persuade her to have any operation at all just so she could walk again. All the doctors agreed that since her career was so vital to her, the news that she didn't have one anymore had to be broken to her carefully. Oh, I agree. Elizabeth has to be told the truth. And we've got to figure out how. Good evening, Miss Riggs. I'm uh, Dr. Hugh Bradley. I don't know if you remember, but I treated you an emergency and admitted you to the hospital. Yes, I remember. How soon can I dance again? Well, the first thing is to walk. As for the other, Miss Riggs, I, I think you'll have to make an adjustment in your mind. Now, I don't believe in hiding the truth from patients. There isn't a chance that you'll ever be able to dance professionally again. <laughs> Oh, good morning, Dr. Bradley. Did you have me on page? Yes, yes. McNeil is off today, and his patient, Miss Riggs, had an attack of hysterics last night. I had to sedate her. What happened? Was uh, it Peter Starrett being here upset her so much? Well, whoever he is, no. I simply told her something that should have been made clear to her from the first, that her dancing days are over. Just like that? Well, she had a right to know. But uh, abruptly, coldly... You just don't Miss say... Miss Riggs is not under psychiatric care. She is of age, and we are doctors. Our function is to heal and inform. She asked for you, and I said you would stop by this morning. Hi, Liz. Do you want to see me? Yes. I want you to get Peter Sturt off my back and out of here. I never want to see him again, or any of you. Now, now, look, I just got the bad word about you, too. So you're not going to be Margaret Fontaine, or whatever. But you're not going to be crippled, either. And this way, there's nothing to stand between you and that nice guy who loves oh, you, and... Nothing to stand between us, that's for laughs. Now oh, it's worse than ever, we just don't stand a chance at all. What do you mean? Oh, you, you wouldn't understand. No doctor would. That's why I've got to see the chaplain. Well, all things considered, you seem in fairly good shape this morning. How do you feel, Dan? All things considered, not so hot. But I think if Elizabeth Riggs wants to see me... I... I must see her. Once we've licked the peritonitis, you're in no condition... I to... must see her to convince myself that I didn't fail. And if you did... No disgrace and failure, Mike, as long as you tried to the utmost. If I'm to be called home, let me try to go with a clean conscience. <laughs> You're sure you feel all right, Dr. Bradley? <laughs> well, of course, of course. You know you're supposed to rest after donating blood. I, I realize that. By some strange chance, the chaplains and mine match. I, well, I'd like to think that... Well, I mean, I... I He's I, due I, for a replacement. I'll see he gets this particular bottle. <laughs> oh, hi, Mike. Where are you taking Miss Riggs? To see Dan. He's in no condition for visitors. He was the one who insisted... And, uh, just in case, I wouldn't deny him anything he asked. Well, I've wheeled it to you, Dan, although you shouldn't be seeing any visitors. I wonder, Doctor, if I might claim the privilege of the confessional. Well, not for long. You have less strength than you think you have. And maybe Liz and I can find a lot of it between us. But if you hadn't been worried about me, you'd have gone back to the doctors for help. If I hadn't been worried about you, I would have no right to the principles I serve. <laughs> I should say principle. Will you still turn your back on him? I'd rather talk about you. There may not be much time to talk about me, so I have to be abrupt. Because I have so little <laughs> strength left. 
Are you going to marry Peter? I can't. More than ever now. Why? Don't you love him? I've always loved him. But I broke that love for a simple thing like a wish for a career. Chaplin, when Dr. Bradley told me that I could never dance again, of all the reactions that I had, the most definite and unshakable was that I cannot believe in a God who would take away from me the one thing that I have worked all my life to achieve. And because of that, even though it removed another less important barrier, you can't go back to the man who loves you. Of all men, how can I? He's a minister like you, and I no longer believe in God. Oh, Liz, I don't believe that. I don't think you're like all the people who put on religion like a Sunday dress just for the occasion. You can't deny him any more than I can. Or Peter. Because no matter how hard all of us try, in the end, we must have a personal God. Take him to your heart. How can I? Forget me. How can he destroy a man like you? And I convince you that death is not destruction. Certainly not. Not for me. What would you ask? A miracle? I don't know. I don't know what I want. Just... Just for you not to die. All right, then. Help me to live. Don't deny him. Liz, I once prayed for you. Now, if you want, try to to pray for me. Oh, Chaplin, don't you see? It would just be a mockery when I don't believe. Chaplin, Chaplin, are you? Oh, oh! I've got to get the doctors. Excuse me, Miss. Oh. It's okay, it's okay. I've been Chaplin's roommate these last days. I was I was in the bathroom shaving and cleaning up to go home. And you overheard? Yeah, yeah. I couldn't help hearing some of it. And you got to listen to me. Because I got something to say. No, I can't listen now. The Chaplin... It'll only take a minute. And the way I see it, maybe you can do him more good right this moment than all the doctors in the world. Faith and belief didn't put any fingers on you or the Chaplin. The one on him... He put there himself. I don't know what you mean. I mean, when you were brought into this hospital, the chaplain was dying of pain. He needed a doc a lot more than you did, but he stuck with you. Even with his appendix exploding inside him, he covered it up to help you out. The poison's all through him now, and maybe he's dying. But if it is, it's a risk he took for you. To save not only your leg, but, well, all of you. Now, are you going to make the belief that made him sacrifice himself for you the way he did be all for nothing? Or are you going to give back something of yourself in return? Well, I'll, uh, I'll go get the docs now and leave you to think about it. offended you. I beg you to forgive me. I implore you to listen to me. I am nothing but he. This man is so important. I don't know how to say it, to ask it, but please, in your infinite mercy, dear Father in heaven, who looks after us all and wants to help us. Please help this one man who deserves it more than any of us. Don't let him be wasted. I ask it with all my heart in your name. It's all right, Miss Riggs. Just take it easy. I should have called you sooner. Oh, forget it. As a doctor, I tell you, it's all right. You you mean he's going to live? You ever seen anything more beautiful than plain, ordinary sweat? 
It's broken. Uh, uh, Level of <laughs> fever is broken. We're on the way. He asked me to pray. Whatever it was that did it, he answered. He answered. You mean that God somehow... The oldest cliche in the world, Miss Riggs. Man proposes, God disposes. No matter how far medicine takes us, in the end, that's the result. Then the chaplain will be all right. <laughs> Just give him a look. Bathed in perspiration, his fever tumbling and blissfully asleep. Oh. We're all getting out of this lucky. Except you, maybe. Oh, that's decided. Oh, it isn't all that much of a life as a dancer. As long as Peter is still around, if he still wants he me. He is, and he sure does. We couldn't have moved him out of here with a bulldozer. <laughs> now, we've only one restriction before you leave here. We expect to be invited as guests at the wedding. Well, it won't take place without you. <laughs> Because one thing I'll never give in to Peter about. The chaplain will have to marry us. Why not? We, uh... We might even make it a double wedding. Well, there it is. No sound, no fury, but certainly a tale that signifies something. A mystery... I think it qualifies for the title. As I said in the beginning, and as you have seen for yourself, God does move in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. I'll be back shortly. Daniel Morgan did recover. Fortunately, because four anxious young people no longer wanted to postpone weddings too long delayed. It wasn't a double wedding as once had been considered. Mike was operating the morning Liz and Peter were married, but he was able to make the reception afterwards. As for Pat's marriage to Mike, it was a very simple and quiet one in the hospital chapel. Notable for only one thing. The best man was Dr. Hugh Bradley. Our cast included Terry Keene, Patsy Bruder, Leon Janney, Robert Dryden, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. It was long before I could get to sleep, but when at last I did, if indeed I really was asleep... I was conscious of something huge and black circling by the foot of my bed. A monstrous cat-like shape that suddenly sprang. And I felt the stinging pain as if two needle-sharp claws had plunged like hot irons into my breast. And then suddenly my eyes were open and I thought I saw Carmilla standing there. The figure moved quickly to the door, and I followed it, only to find the door securely locked from the inside, just the way I had left it before I retired. I sprang into my bed with the covers over my head, and I lay there, more dead than alive, until morning. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. To the world of enchantment, spells, bewitchery. These are all words from our childhood. Pleasant memories of nursery stories before bedtime. The dark side of magic we knew nothing of. And when we grew old enough to learn, dismissed as ignorance and superstition. But once again in our times, incantation, exorcism, and the haunting belief in demonic possession are alive and abroad. They are what this strange tale is about. I tell you, Doctor, it's the God's honest truth. They brought the young man in on the rolling stretcher to the emergency room, and he had this big sort of dent in his head. Oh, he didn't look like he was breathing at all. There was me, with me bucket and me pail, trying to clean up. Just me and the young man on the stretcher, and the old wino repeater we call PJ, they brought in earlier, snoring and dribbling. And that's when it happened. Came right out of old PJ's mouth, and across the room, and right up the young man's nose, like that. With a burny, cindery smell like the old scissor grinder stone wheel used to make. Oh, a great black cloud with red eyes in the middle and a long, forked tail. Oh, I'd take an oath on it on me mother's grave. It was the devil himself. <laughs> mystery drama, Possessed by the Devil, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Donald Buca. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. the beginnings of history, it is there in some form. Possession. The incubus who ravishes maidens while asleep. The succubus who tempts man into seduction in his dreams. The dibuk, that lost soul who dies before his time and is compelled to wander in space till he can steal a body to live out his allotted years. Fact. Superstition. Hallucination? Here is such a modern legend. You be the judge. Okay, Doctor, an IV set up for old Wally Wino here, glucose, who started right away. Yes, Dr. Daniels. Oh, he don't look like he's long for this world. <laughs> he hasn't got a cell. He hasn't drowned in alcohol. His liver's like a washboard. But I'm not sure I concur with your diagnosis, Mrs. Gideon. Still, I don't know this time. Oh, another emergency. And this is supposed to be the quiet hour. Do you want me to get out for a while, Doctor? I, I, I'm near finished. No, no, go ahead with your cleaning. Uh, just don't get run over by the stretcher. Uh, uh, put him over here, boys. Now, what have you brought me this time? Oh, you poor old souse. Dead to the world's the word for you, all right. Uh, you got me sympathy. With my arthritis, many's the time I've been tempted to have a go at the hard stuff myself. Oh, but thanks to sweet Mary, she's held me back. A little sacramental wine to ease me bones keeps me going. I had a few tonight, I can tell you. Oh, but there's always them breath sweeteners to take it away. I hope. Well, how's your patient, Mrs. Gideon? Oh, doctor, I hope he's not a Catholic. The father might never make it in time. How's yours? Oh, mine's out of my league. What I need is a brain surgeon. Huh. Speak of the devil. Considine just walked past the door. Uh, Dr. Considine, 
Uh, Dr. Considine, sir, I've got an emergency here. Mother of heaven, and me here alone with two near corpses. Oh, I didn't see it. I couldn't laugh. Oh, what I did. I see it. Oh, the good saints preserve me. Hey, hey, hey there, Mother. Well, where am I? Oh, I... In, in the Mercy Hospital. Oh. oh, you shouldn't be getting up. Oh, ma'am. You're sure a different kind of nurse. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm no nurse. I'm the cleaning woman. Oh. And you hadn't oughtn't to be sitting up? Not with that clout on the head someone's after giving you. Huh? What clout on the head? Why, that great big dent as big as a soap plate they brought you in with. Oh, what are you talking about? <laughs> you, I'm late for the operating room already. Dr. Considine, he has a depressed skull fracture. I don't even know if he's still alive. Uh, uh, Good Lord, what are you doing on your feet? Dr. Considine, will you help me get him back on the... Hey, hey, hold up. Wait a minute. Look, there's nothing wrong with me. Mister, an ambulance just brought you in here with a skull fracture. You were out cold in deep shock. But there's nothing wrong. There's nothing the matter with my head. Look. Holy mother. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Uh, uh, Mike. Uh, Michael Damon. Oh, well, I'm uh, Dr. Considine, Chief of Neurological Surgery here at the hospital. Would you mind uh, sitting down on this chair for a second and letting me check you out? <laughs> sure, Doc. I think I've got to admit I don't remember how I got here to the hospital, so maybe you ought to have a look at me. Uh, Mrs. Gideon, what's the matter with you? You look like you just saw a ghost. It wasn't no ghost, sir. Dr. Daniels, get over here. Uh, yes, sir. Would you mind casting your eagle eye over the back of this young man's head and show me one scintilla of evidence of skull fracture or concussion? Doctor, all I know is Jake Bronstein brought him in on the wagon and he had a decompressed area you could have laid your hand in. That's right, sir. I saw it myself. Someone here has been drinking. Daniels, look. If this is your idea of a joke, I... Uh, but, but, uh, uh, no, never mind. We'll, uh, we'll discuss this later. Mr. Damon? Yes, Doctor? For your own protection as well as the hospital's, may I suggest that we take some x-rays of your head? Oh, nurse. Yes? You can let Dr. Daniels take over on the IV with the old man. And we'll, Mr. Damon, straight to x-ray. I want a full set of head plate. Yes, Doctor. Uh, Mr. Damon, there are... There are a couple of questions I'd like to ask you. Uh, excuse me, sir. Dad? Mike? Are you all right, son? Oh, I feel fine, Dad, except for a headache. Oh, uh, Dr. Considine, this is my father, Reverend Damon. Oh, uh, how do you do? A nurse, can we get going? Yes, sir. Uh, Dad, what happened? Uh, how did I get here? Well, perhaps you can explain, Reverend, as we walk along. I want to get to X-ray. Well, I wish someone could explain to me what happened. I can, sir. Uh, let me check the IV on old PJ. I... Wait a minute. What is it, Doctor? PJ here. He's bought it this time. Oh, uh -oh this is not my night. We might have pulled him through. Oh, there's going to be the devil to pay around here. Oh, you can say that again. It's the God's truth, Dr. Considine. Came right out of the old man's mouth. And across the room and up the young man's nose like that. With a burning, cindery smell like the old scissor grinder's wheel used to make. A great black cloud with red eyes in the middle. And a long forked tail. Oh, I take an oath on me mother's grave. Twas the devil himself. Yeah, yes, yes, Mrs. Gideon. I think you uh, can leave the medical discussion to us. And I'm sure you have important work waiting. Oh, bless us. I, I left me pale and mop there. I hope nobody's been after stealing that mob had a brand new head on it. Well, at least I know now where the smell of alcohol came from. I can't blame you for that, Daniels. Mm -hmm. But I just can't accept it. In an emergency room, you concentrate on a seemingly healthy patient while you lose a really sick old man. P.J. was a repeater, Doc. He's long overdue for uremic poisoning or cardiac arrest. But this young guy, Damon... Well, 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 complete your sentence. Yeah. Oh, I was just thinking, that magnificent body, physically way above par, and the injury I thought I saw, well, would have left him a vegetable for the rest of a long life if we'd pulled him through. What injury? That depressed fracture. 
Most of the brain should have been injured beyond repair. You say what you thought you saw. Apparently, you didn't see anything. You heard Mrs. Gideon back me up, Doctor. Come in. Oh, it's the wet plates, Doctor, from X-ray. Uh, light up the viewing fields, Daniels, and let's have a good look. <laughs> Satisfied? Well, sir... Oh, somebody gave him a knock on the head, all right. There's some exterior evidence of that, but of any fracture? None I can see. Well, you're the doctor of record. Shall we send him home? I see no reason not to. Okay. Now I'd better get up to O.R. <laughs> Coming! Trudy! Well, don't look so disappointed, Rod. You could, do it. <laughs> Say, sweetheart, what are you doing here at this hour? Oh, I couldn't sleep after your call, so I drove over. Is Mike back from the hospital? No, I thought the bell was Dad and Mike. They're on the way home right now. How come you didn't go to the hospital? Well, we've been trying to get in touch with Anton Azarak. Oh? So Dad thought one of us should be here in case he called back. Oh. I mean, to find out what happened. Yeah. All right, and uh, cool it. Oh, what a name for a cat. Why, I see nothing wrong with it. I think a martyr belongs in a minister's family. Oh, is that my fate as your wife to be? Of course not. <laughs> we just called her that because Mike and she never seem to get along. Well, it's hard to figure about the cat. Mike is such a kind, gentle sort of a giant. I, I thought all animals loved him. Well, it depends what the word includes. It... Oh, wait a minute, there's a car now. The return of the prodigal son. Now maybe we'll find out just what happened last night. And that's honestly all I can tell any of you. You were making a fresh fire in the fireplace at half past five in the morning and straightened up too fast and knocked yourself cold on the underside of the mantelpiece? Well, what other explanation is there, Rod? Well, it is solid oak. And that big, round, ornamental sphere is a menace. I, I've regretted it every time I've bumped my own head on it. Yeah, but, Dad, you never hit your head hard enough to knock yourself cold. Mike, why were you making a fire at that time in the morning? Well, I wasn't actually making one. I was replacing one. Uh, Professor Azarek was, was with me last night, coaching me for an exam I have coming up, and... Uh... Well, he got cold. Oh, come on. It wasn't cold enough for a fire last night. Well, maybe when you went to bed, but we were up all night. And the professor's a pretty old man. What were you doing up at that hour in the morning, Dad? I really don't know. Something woke me and I... Are you all right, Reverend Jase? Uh, excuse me, Trudy, dear. Yes. Uh, yes, I'm fine. I'm just recalling that moment this morning. How vivid it was. I was startled out of the depths of my sleep to wide awakeness. I had a vision of Mike surrounded by flames. It was so real, I even said a little prayer. Then I hopped out of bed, went to the window. It wasn't very dark anymore. And looking across, I could see that all the studio lights were on and the front door open. And I... Thought I'd better go and have a look. And when you got there, you found Mike on the floor unconscious? Yes. Lying on his face, white as a sheet, and deathly cold. Oh. Yeah, but what made you call the hospital? It's not like you to panic. Well, uh, I realize that, but, but the back of his head looked as though he'd been felled by some superhuman male fist. It, it was all bent, bent inward. I thought the hospital said Mike was all right. Oh, I am, Trudy. A clean bill of health. Nothing to worry about. Uh, my fault. It must have been an illusion, of course. Well, I think if the Inquisition is over, I'm going to make up on some sleep. Hmm? Oh, a damn cat! I've forgotten about her. Will you keep her in there away from me? What's the matter with her? It's been a very strange night and morning. I have a hauntingly uneasy feeling. You mean about Mike? About Mike. I hope the hospital was right to give him a clean bill of health. He doesn't seem himself at all. Not at all. Hello. Hello. 
Has a record. Michael, what the hell happened last night? Okay, okay, not on the phone. I'm going to rest now. But you be sure to be here tonight. So far in our modern legend, we have caught up with superstition, witches, magic, both black and white, enchantment, spells, abracadabra. Well, there are two more acts to come. I'll be back very shortly with Act Two. A young man rushed to the hospital with a depressed fracture of the skull, which should have mangled his brain. A chronic drunken repeater back in emergency on the edge of fatal acute alcoholism and an aging cleaning woman who thought she saw a malign spirit pass from the drunk to the young man. Now, apparently in full health, we'll be able to appraise just how healthy the young man who made his remarkable recovery is. You're right there. Professor Azarick, please come in. Oh. Must you be so formal? After last night and today, I'm taking no chances. Maybe with your superior intelligence, you have no worries about our abortive attempt at Satanism. But I have. Look, I was the victim, and since a crack on the head denied me any knowledge of what happened, I'm only hoping you can give me the straight goods. Uh, the straight goods. A peculiarly inept term for what we are engaged in, my brother in Satan. And damn it, it's not a deal in semantics, Anton. Now, what happened after I summoned up the fiend? I mean, how did you escape and how could I have been harmed? As long as I was safe in the magic triangle within the circle. I warned you to keep your feet still. If you touch any part of the circle itself or the triangle within it, you are at the mercy of all the devils in hell. And if I'd known what I was getting into when I picked your philosophy course, I'd have quit. You made the mistake of not realizing how vulnerable your soul was as the son of a minister. All right, all right. I'm not crying over what happened. I just want to know what it was. Now, where was I? By the fireplace, lying prostrate. The way you fell after he hit you. Who hit me? The devil you summoned. But where did he appear? Outside the circle here. The inner or the outer? Beyond the outer, of course. There was water scattered between the circles. And the wolf's pain scattered through it. And within the circle you had the brazier burning. Everything as you ordered it and arranged it. Yes, but... But what went wrong? Your ego. My ego? What does that mean? You lost your head. Or at least almost did. This was a simple experiment by someone who seemed a true psychic to raise a minor antichrist. The motive was strong enough to create belief. Or at least the hope of belief. You wanted a familiar to procure your brother's woman for you. Beshal, you were to call forth. Why did you call on Ashtaroth, a giantess beyond your control? I... I don't know. But do I have to explain? No, no. Ever since you became my disciple, you told me that you have lusted after the woman your brother brought home as his bride. The only thing I've never been able to take from Rod whenever I wanted. When you finished the incantation and summoned Ashtaroth... I thought the house would come down about our ears. The earth rocked like the San Francisco quake. And suddenly she stood without the circle, a huge figure in chain mail and medieval armor. Meddler and slave, she said. How dare you summon me for your petty desires? Learn this lesson once, if not for all. Turn your face from me in shame. And as you turned, she reached out with her mailed glove and struck you on the top and back of your head. You dropped like a stone. Across the magic circles? 
They weren't designed for major devils. You swore no presence could cross them. Nothing but her arm and her fist. But it's five feet from that outer circle to the center of the triangle where I was standing. I told you the circle was for lesser demons. What happened after she struck me? The spirit disappeared. The room was clogged with smoke. I opened the door to let it out and came back to you. You had fallen almost into the fireplace. I pulled the rug back, arranged the furniture as best I could and fled. I thought you were dead. Oh, <laughs> I'm alive. Yes, yes, but it's not possible. When I left you just before sunrise, you were dead. What witchcraft can do, it can undo. Whoever and whatever I am, I'm alive. Make no mistake about that. Goodbye, Anton. I don't need you anymore. Hi, Trudy. I thought you'd gone with Rod and Dad. Hello, Mike. I thought you were over in the studio. <laughs> we ran out of beer. Ah, uh, you're out of luck. <laughs> Rod's bringing some home. Well, I found something more refreshing. What? You. <laughs> oh, if you'd waited just a little longer, you'd have found me anyway. I was going to wander over to the studio and visit you. Oh, so that's why you stayed home. <laughs> oh, don't be silly. Someone had to wash the dishes. <laughs> as long as I'm house guest, I thought I ought to do something for my keep. Well, you're staying here tonight? One whole week. Mom went up with Pops to his 35th class reunion. And they figured that with one full-fledged minister and a recent hospital dropout, I was suitably chaperoned. <laughs> Safe as a church, <laughs> huh? <laughs> now, Rod and Dad say uh, when they'd be back. Well, not too pretty late, I guess. Mm. Pretty rough section of town. That's why Rod insisted on going along. Mm, what's the occasion? That's one of your father's oldest parishioners. I guess the old lady is dying. She asked for the minister. Well, her loss, my gain. What? Oh, nothing. It's just a stupid joke. Uh, you said you wanted to see the studio? Oh, yes. Would you mind? Mind? Uh, look, I I'm out of beer, but uh, I've got some champagne that's begging to be what it is. Oh, what is it? A split. Just right for sharing. Shall we go? Well, won't you walk into my parlor, said Beelzebub to the flies. <laughs> oh, no, what's that supposed to mean? <laughs> that is the advantage of a classical education. Uh -huh. Beelzebub, god of the Philistine city of Ekron. You know, he was known as the Lord of the Flies. Why? Well, now, there you've got me. Uh-oh, he, he sounds horrid. <laughs> well, he wasn't very popular with Christians. In fact, they called him the Prince of Devils. Lord of the Flies? Mm -hmm. Ooh, it gives me the creeps. <laughs> Here's something to chase your creeps away. Oh, I, I don't want that, Mike. It goes right to my head. Oh, just a sip, hmm? A good luck toast to sister and brother-in-lawhood, our getting-to-know-you party. Well, far be it from me to be a party pooper. Ah, oh, there's nothing more cozy and reassuring than a room full of books. What's this section here? Oh, that? That's the main reason I needed Dad's particular library, since my exam was in metaphysics. The black arts, the world of witches, essentials of demonology... Satanic Mass. Oh, it's a strange collection for a minister. And well, it's always good to know your enemy. Now, Dad's quite an authority on the devil in his work. And you? Are you thinking of becoming a minister, Mike? <laughs> Min me? <laughs> no, 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 no. Perish the thought. No, nope, my philosophy is too easy for that. I long ago decided that if you can't fight him, join him. I mean, can't you see how evil I am? Tempting you with spiritous beverages, coaxing you here to my lair, and now, having anesthetized my prey, making ready to spring. I don't think you're being very funny, Mike. Oh, is this where you hit your head? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, so they say. No, I wasn't being altogether funny. What do you mean? Trudy, have you any idea how jealous I am of my older brother? Of Rod? Why? A month ago, or whenever it was, they turned up with you. My first thought was, 
Why couldn't I find something like that? Oh, that's very flattering, Mike. But you're a little young for the big step. Not so young as you think. Perhaps. I don't care what you and Rod have been to each other. It was me you wanted. Still want. Only you're afraid of breaking your word. But this is a joke. It's no joke. Mike, let go of me. You wanted me from the moment you laid eyes on me, just as I have you. Oh, you've been reading too many naughty books. Don't laugh. There's nothing funny about this. No, not really. Offensive. You're afraid of me. Don't be silly. You're afraid of yourself. Now that really is the last Test it, straw. test it. Fasten your mouth to mine. Wind yourself about me. Try forbidden love and it will never let you go. No, Mike, let me go. You're hurting me. Oh, that's Rod home with your father. If you won't let me go, I'll scream. What are you going to tell them? Nothing. Nothing. I wouldn't want them to know what a pig you are. I think that blow on the head must have done more damage than you think. Mike, you better see a psychiatrist. Oh, hi, Rod. Dad. Uh, well, we didn't expect you. Astroth, my Lucifer, I'll have you yet, cowering at my feet like a slave, to use you once and destroy you, as I shall use your surrogate tonight, whoever she may be. Oh dear, oh dear, how best you what, Reverend Damon? Just something that happened to a girl on the other side of town. Let me see. Rachel. Oh, awful. Well, now you got me going. <laughs> you too, Jean. Well, since you can't read, I'll read it to you. The body of Elizabeth Migler, 21, was discovered in Marsden Park today by a passerby. Although it was later determined the girl had been raped, the strange features of the case are that she was not robbed, and as though by some ferocious animal tooth marks, showed that her throat had been literally ripped to pieces. Good Lord. Where, where is Marsden Park? Clear over the other side of town. When did it happen? Uh, night before last. Morning, all. I hope breakfast is all ready. I'm famished. <laughs> What's wrong with that cat? Oh, it's beginning to bug me. A lot of things are beginning to bug me. What'd you say, honey? Uh, nothing, Rod. I, I, I don't think I'll have any breakfast this morning. I, I don't feel like eating. No, Rod, please, don't come with me. I'd rather be alone. Lovers quarrel? Look, will you just take out, brother mine? It's none of your business. <laughs> Trudy's sake, for everyone's sake, would that it were. But, unfortunately, we know better. Or do we? The crime happened miles away. And the devil that may possess Mike is there only on the evidence of a tipsy charwoman. Who summons the devil, never calls for him in vain. And once met, few are lucky to get rid of him again. I'll return shortly with Act Three. In the kitchen of the Damon house, Rod glares angrily at his brother, who shrugs it off and goes to the refrigerator for orange juice. A troubled Reverend Damon eyes both his sons as he closes and folds the tabloid in his hands as if it were just as unclean as it is. Rod, unchallenged by Mike, breaks the silence first. I had better go on upstairs and check on Trudy. Well, she said she wanted to be alone. Look, will you stay out of this? Well, I'm not even in it. Uh, just an objective comment. So keep it to yourself. Now, come on, Rod. I didn't mean to butt in... Catch me up. What's all the hostility about? No hostility. Just a reaction to a peculiarly unpleasant crime. I think I'll go up and apologize to Trudy for spoiling everyone's breakfast. That's a good idea, Dad. If I can leave you two alone. Well, I have no quarrel with anyone. Now, forget it, Dad. I just got upset over Trudy. I, I shouldn't have jumped on Mike. 
Uh, then, let me see if I can make a uh, future in-law a little happier in our house. What happened, Rod? Oh, it all started over this tabloid story about some poor kid who got raped and mangled on Mars and Park. Oh? Here, read all about it. Kind of gruesome, all right. But there's one of these every day. Yeah, but not in such gory detail. It really got to Trudy. Now, I've never seen her upset like that. I mean, so, so subjectively involved. Oh? What do you suppose triggered that? Oh, I don't know. I just sure wish I did. Or maybe it's better to let sleeping dogs lie. <laughs> Your future father-in-law. May I come in for a minute? Just a sec. The door's locked. Uh, come on in, Reverend Damon. Feeling any better? Oh, not really. Oh, I should be ashamed of myself reading that yellow sheet. I, I like to think it helps keep my sense of balance, but uh, maybe I'm just a seeker of vicarious excitement. Like that rather complete collection on Satanism and the occult that you have in your studio? Ah, you noticed that, did you? Night before last. When I was over there with Mike while you and Rod had gone to see your old parishioner who was dying. Did she? As a matter of fact, no. She made a remarkable recovery. Oh, really? Well, you look so sort of worried when you came home. I, I thought she... I was worried about you, Trudy. And Mike. Why? You, because I knew you were upset about something. Well, you can't be a minister for over 40 years without learning to read something about people. And Mike? Mike is an enigma to me since I brought him back from the hospital. A rather terrifying thought to realize I've lost contact with my own son. I'd like to ask your help, Trudy, and I'll lay it... Right on the line. Why were you at the studio with him? And what happened there? You you won't tell Rod? Not if you don't want me to. And what I'd like more than anything is to tell someone, most of all you, for Mike's sake. Because I think he needs help. And you're the only one who could bring it to him. Or make him go find it. <laughs> Damon, this is a pleasure. I'm on my way to a class. Can we talk as we cross campus? Yes. Just, uh, what is the name of your course that Mike is taking? Philosophy. Uh, perhaps more specifically, metaphysics. Rather freewheeling. I mean, it's, it's advanced and we spend more time on the perimeters than we do on the core subjects. Hmm. Just what were you and Mike up to that long night before his injury? I was coaching him for an examination. An examination in what? On what subject? By the class I teach, general philosophy. And you left before Michael was hurt? Oh, good Lord, yes. Would I have left the boy if he were injured? Would you have fled the scene unless you were up to something dark and vile enough to stain your reputation? I am sorry your boy was hurt. I had no part in it. And I resent your holier-than-thou accusations. If you'll excuse me, I have a class waiting for me. <laughs> now for the rug. There. Does it? Oh, my dear Lord. Just what I was afraid of. What are you afraid of, Dad? You, Mike. That you'd turned away from God to seek the devil. Why, Mike? Why? Who knows? Now, what shall I tell you? Hmm? That life's a drag. It has no purpose, no goals, no triumphs that aren't tarnished. That there's no good in man. Nothing but pettiness and meanness and me first and the devil take the hind. Oh, that's not what I brought you up to believe. No one blames you, Dad. But Trudy was the last straw. 
that Rod could find the woman he wanted, and she could turn out to be the one that I need. So I chose his worship, and here we built my altar. Don't desecrate that name. The altar belongs to God. This altar belongs to Satan. See the circle traced in vermilion paint? Exactly nine feet wide, an eight-foot charcoal one within. Light the votive candles, burn the incense, let the mass begin. Mike, what are you doing? I won't tolerate this, this sacrilege. You can no more move than the woman I desire can resist my power. I am the way. I am the darkness. I am the truth. Lord of the universe whom the winds fear. I am he whose mouth ever flameth. You answer me. Be I in hope. The bornless one that did create the darkness and the light. Thee I command to serve me and send me the woman I desire. Come in here. But the rain. What's going on here? Rod, it's your brother. He's gone mad. Spawn of the outer world. Stay back. Stay back. Or I will smite thee dead where thou standest. Leave or leave except the woman who is mine. Dad, what's going on? Look out. He's going for Trudy. Now look, Nick. Oh, he has a knife. Would you murder your own brother? Okay, yes, and I'm pulling around. Do you know I could always take you? Oh, Rod, I hope you haven't hurt him too much. Oh, don't worry, baby. He always had a glass jaw. He had something more perishable than that. Call the hospital. And better tell them to bring a straitjacket. <laughs> the top of the night to you, Mrs. Gideon. And what's that wee bottle in the paper bag? A little poteen? Nothing of the sort, Dr. Smart Attic. <laughs> it's a noggin of holy water blessed by me own Monsignor, which I carry with me when I come near this place ever since three days ago. What happened to old P.J.? Did anyone ever turn up to claim him? No. Oh, by the way, while we're on the gossip column, uh, guess who's back in the hospital? Oh, <gasps> not the other one. Mm-hmm, the same. Lying in the emergency room under a deep sedation in a straitjacket. Oh, what did they bring him back here for? That's what Dr. Considine and his father, the Reverend Damon, are discussing now in the prep room. Well, if you're going to swap out the emergency, you'd better get at it fast. Well, I'll tell you something, Doctor. Mm -hmm. If I'm to be there and alone with that devil, you'll never see emergency this clean again. For I'm adding the Monsignor's holy water to me pail right now, just in case. Of course, we'll run every neurological test in the book on him under the circumstances, Reverend Davin. I'm not sure it will do any good. I'm afraid the trouble is psychiatric. Well, it has to be one or the other unless we're to accept Mrs. Gideon's diagnosis of possession. Mrs. Gideon? Oh, I remember now. She was one of the people, like the intern, who remembered that they thought they saw a considerable skull compression. Which never existed, believe me. Just a, an illusion like Mrs. Gideon's. What was Mrs. Gideon's illusion? Well, I'm afraid she'd uh, had a drink or two and she had some wild story about a black devil streaming out of an old dipsomaniac who was also in the emergency room and, and being sucked up through your son's nostrils. <laughs> I'm really even embarrassed to mention such nonsense. Come in. Excuse me, Dr. Considine, but the patient is coming too. Mr. Damon? Yes, sir. He's still in the straitjacket. I, uh, I think, Reverend, if you don't mind until we see what state he's in. I don't mind. You might as well both know that the police are by now well aware that my, my son was responsible for the violent death of a young woman the night before last while under the possession of whatever devils or devil owns him. Shall we go? My Nergal and Thomas and Belfagor, no one can hem me in. I am Belial, Lord of the Flies, and your bond. 
He's out of the straitjacket. I'll get help. What's going on here, Mrs. Judy? Oh, the Lord preserve us. It's the devil incarnate. Oh, stay away from him, Doctor. He'll burn you to a crisp with his fiery breath. All of you, stay away from him. Leave him to me. Michael, my son. Call me not by that filthy angel's name. Stay away, old man. For I carry death in my hand as a sword. Michael! I warned you. Oh, you'd made it some man of the cloth. Get back. Get back. <laughs> what happened? Oh, sure it was the Monsignor's holy water. Just as strong as life. Michael, no. All right, boys. All hey. right, Daniels, you're too late. What? Excuse me, Reverend. Let me see. Daniels, come here. Hey, yes, sir. Was that the depression you were talking about when this man was first brought in? Yes, sir. That's what I thought I saw. Well, at least it's what we all see now. But how? I haven't any answers. I only know... <laughs> I'm sorry, Reverend Damon, but your son is... is dead. He hasn't been my son since his first visit here. The mercy of God is that whatever possessed him died with him, thanks to this lady here. Oh, if I hadn't had the holy water, I... Oh, the Lord does move in mysterious ways, don't he, Reverend Sir? <laughs> In mysterious ways and kind ones. What a field day the Reverend Damon's tabloids might have had if Michael had ever come to trial for the death of that poor innocent girl. Innocent. Perhaps that's the theme of this dark history. If Michael had been less innocent, and it had the guts to be less self-interested and bored, how different his world might have been. But that's the answer, isn't it? We all make our own world. We can't rely on anyone else to make it for us. I'll be back shortly. I suppose I should resist the impulse. But I have to admit I can't. It's one of the rewards for being host, particularly with guests who can't answer back, at least directly. So just for once, a homily. Reach out and find life. Take it and make the most of it. For if nothing else, our story proves to the hilt the oldest of adages. If you don't, the devil finds work for idle hands to do. Our cast included Donald Buca, Joan Shea, Ian Martin, Guy Sorrell, and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. No trouble, though. He went numb pretty fast. I thought he would. He wanted me to give you a message, but then he couldn't remember what it was. Oh, uh, and he thinks you're some kind of a warden. Poor man. You know, Mr. Z, I didn't much like it inside that room. You knew you were coming out. Who ever dreamed up the black room anyway? I've no idea. Somebody must have. There's always been a black room, far as I know. Hell of a place. Yes. How long will he last, do you think? Matter of days. Weeks, possibly. Then what? He'll go mad. Or die. Wonder what he's doing now. Oh, counting by twos, then by threes, then by fours. Anything to keep from thinking. That's what they all do. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. There are those people for whom the truth is like poison. It can irritate and sicken and also kill. That's why some of us will go to any length to evade, avoid, or even suppress it. How many of us? There's really no way of telling. Each of us can only speak for himself. Or herself. I'll never forgive you, Will. Never. But, Marsha, I didn't really do anything. I am not one of your liberated modern women. To me, infidelity is the ultimate wrong. Now, Marcia, you must believe me. I never had any intention I can of... never believe you. I will never forgive you. And I will make you pay for this. Our mystery drama, Smile at a Homely Girl, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Larry Haynes and Terry Keene. It is sponsored in part by ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Why bother to look for deep and complicated hidden meanings, especially when you contemplate the mystery of life? No less an authority than the immortal Goethe himself put it as clearly and as simply as this. Getting along with women, knocking around with men, having more credit than money. Thus, one goes through the world. Can things be really as basic as all that? For a great many people, absolutely. And especially for the hero of our story, Mr. William Bennett... William is having breakfast with his wife, Marcia. One thing you're going to learn about Marcia, she is a woman who doesn't mince words. Notice how she gets right to the heart of the matter. Well, mm -hmm. who is Linda Tonnen? Ah, uh, Linda Tonnen. Why do you repeat her name? Obviously you know who she is. Are you stalling for time? Ah, uh, Linda, Linda Tonnen is George Morrow's secretary. Well, that answers half my question. To George Morrow, she's the secretary. What is she to you? To me? Hmm? Well, uh, to me, she is uh, no one. What you're saying is you have no relationship with her at all, hmm? Relationship? Well, that's a rather heavy word. Is it? Well, yes, it's filled with implications, innuendos, and so forth. It happens that I have to see a good deal of George lately, and there are all kinds of things that she is in a position to do for me. Really? Yes, like uh, typing and so forth. Mm -hmm. And that's why you've been taking her to dinner? Yes, yes, now that you mm -hmm. mention it. Now, these past few days, we've uh, been working rather late. Have you? Yes, taking her to dinner was just my way of saying thank you. Why didn't you tell me about it? Well, quite simply because I was afraid that you would misunderstand. Oh. And you do. I'm positive you believe I'm having an affair with it. You mean you are? Oh, come on, Marcia. I'll never forgive you for it. All I'm doing is being nice. Not only will I never forgive you... Marcia, will you listen? I have been insulted and demeaned, and I intend to make you pay for it. Marcia, please. I am not having an affair with Linda Thompson, nor have I had one with anyone else since you and I have been married. I... I had intended to discuss another matter with you this morning. I'm sure I know what that little matter is. So let me tell you that the answer is what my answer has always been. No. Oh, Marcia, Marcia, it isn't all that much money. You're talking about $30,000. It's only a fraction of what your folks left you. Therefore, I should let you squander it. But I won't. I... Uh, oh. Marcia? Oh. Something wrong? No, uh... I have a headache. 
I don't seem to feel very good. Uh, you're not supposed to get excited. Dr. Carraway told you, not with your heart. I, uh... Now, Marcia, I'm, I'm going to call Dr. Carraway. No, Carraway. I don't want Dr. Carraway. He said that at the first sign of I any kind of... I don't need Dr. Carraway. What I need is a loving and understanding husband, and I don't have one. Oh, Marcia... Oh, get out of here. Go to your precious Linda Charman and leave me alone. <laughs> Will? Oh, hi, Sarah. Are you headed for the station? Oh, I couldn't get my car started this morning. Oh, well, hop in. I'll give you a lift as far as the library, anyhow. Well, I shouldn't, but I don't want to miss the train. <laughs> what do you mean you shouldn't? Oh, nothing. Come on, Will. You can tell me. It's Marcia. Marcia? Yeah. All that has to happen is for me to be seen talking to a woman, and Marcia is convinced we're having a flaming affair. Well... Is it true? What are you saying? Does she really have grounds for these suspicions? Now, Sarah, here I am, sitting in the car with you. Have I made a pass yet? Oh, uh, you never made a pass at me, Will. Not even when we were in high school. Oh, you're kidding. I think I'm the only woman in this town who can make that statement. Well, I wasn't as bad as all that, was I? Hmm. It seemed that way. Hmm. You know, I, I don't know what's gotten into Marsha lately. Now, since the day she became my wife, I never, I have never been with another woman. And I've had plenty of chances. Oh, I'm sure of that. The fact is, I... I like to have a good time. Go out. And Marsha likes to stay home. Poor Will. Yeah, that's right. Poor Will. And poor Marsha. The handsomest boy and the prettiest girl in the senior class. Oh, come on. That was almost 15 years ago. I remember at your wedding, the minister said, Now, here is proof that marriages are made in heaven. Well, they may be made in heaven, but something happens to them on the way down here. What happened to yours, Will? Oh, I don't know. I guess one day we just woke up to the fact that it wasn't fun anymore. Marriage isn't supposed to be fun all the time. Oh, no? <laughs> My goodness, listen to me, the sage little spinster giving advice on connubiality. <laughs> oh, that's a pretty good word. Connubiality? Well, don't forget, I'm surrounded by the best words you can find. After all, I work in the library. <laughs> oh, which reminds me, uh, Marcia came in just the other day. Marcia? Mm, it's the first time she's been in there in 12 years. You're kidding. <laughs> well, sooner or later, everybody in town comes into the library, even if only to get out of the rain. <laughs> Or use the restroom. But Marcia actually came in to take out a book. And since it was such an unusual event, I, I even remember the title. It was The Count of Monte Cristo. What? By Alexander Dumas. Count of Monte Cristo? Uh, why would she want... Uh, isn't that the one about the man in the iron mask where this... Fella is railroaded into prison and spends ten or twenty or however many years in solitary confinement. Mm hmm Do you uh, think maybe she's trying to get some ideas from it? Ideas? Sure. On how to get rid of me. Hi, George. I'm sorry I'm late, but I forgot we were supposed to meet here, and I went to your office. Hey, you sure you didn't go to my office to see my secretary? Hey, come on, George. Yeah, she happens to be a very beautiful girl. Now, you won't get any argument from me on that. What kind of line have you been handing her? Line? You told her you were going to divorce your wife and marry her? <sighs> How people turn and twist what you say. What I actually told her was that if... If I ever divorced my wife, I'd certainly marry her. Of all the times for you to be fooling around. I'm not fooling around. Oh, then it's serious. It isn't anything. Besides, it's my affair. In one sense of the word, I'm sure it is. But in another, it's also mine. I've got a lot of money sunk into the project, Will. I'm sorry. This is no time for you to be alienating Marsha. I think we've been alienated from each other for the past five years. What happened? I don't know what happened, George. Maybe if I did, I could do something about it. Oh, well, maybe. Maybe I do know what happened. Don't tell me about it? Yeah, I might as well. Now, part of it is your fault. <laughs> How can you say it's my well, fault? Well, you and I... just about everyone else in town. Since we were kids, everybody kept saying what a sensational couple Marsha and I made. What a natural we were. Everyone took it for granted we'd married. And we did. 
Everyone said, look at those two beautiful people, how much in love they are, so we believed it. Until about five years ago, when I guess both of us realized we never really loved each other. Why don't you get a divorce? Because things aren't that simple. Mm-hmm. You could walk out on her. Okay. Suppose I shall. One of these days. But, George, believe me, that is why I like to look at your secretary, Linda. Uh, look at her. Now, it hasn't gone very much beyond that. She is so much like Marsha was at that age. The very... The very young Marsha. Will, you know who you should have married? Sarah. Sarah? Sarah Lewis, librarian. She's always crazy about you. Oh? I never knew that. (laughs) She's always been kind of quiet. Not pretty the way Marsha was, still is. Sarah Lewis. You were always nice to her. Said hello, gave her a smile. (laughs) You, the high school Adonis. You know, I was, uh... Very much impressed by something said by H.L. Mencken. He said something like, uh, If after I'm dead, you want to do something for me, smile at a homely girl. <laughs> I still say you should have married Sarah. She'd have been so grateful. You'd have been able to get away with the murder for the rest of your life. Uh, George, is this uh, what we're supposed to be talking about? <sighs> right. Can you get the 30000 by the end of the month? I'm trying. You'll lose the option, Will. Ask Marsha. The answer was no. I have a meeting at four o'clock. No, with whom? With uh, Tom Pratt. Cancel it. Tom said he's pretty sure he can arrange the loan, George. Have you any idea of the interest Tom will hit you for? It won't be low, I know that. Do you know where Tom Pratt gets his money? I know there are rumors. It's shady money, underworld money. Well, right now, it's the only kind of money I can get. Oh, don't get started with Tom Pratt and his people. Well, I don't know where else to go. Marsha. Marsha has already said no. But she can't say no. Oh, you don't know Marsha. But I do know Marsha. And what's more, I'm going to ask her. Another cup of tea, George? No, no, thank you. Uh, Marsha, I want to talk to you about a matter of life and death. The answer is no. (laughs) But you don't even know the question. Oh, yes, I do. Will sent you here, didn't he? Of course not. Then you decided to come by yourself to see if you could have more success with the old bag than he did. Uh, That is not how Will refers to you. Well, that's how he treats me. Marcia, he's in trouble. He should be. It's a sound enterprise. Well, then you advance in the 30000 Oh, I'm overextended now. Marcia, he'll go to Tom Pratt. He should. Tom's in the business of lending money. Once you start dealing with Tom Pratt, you wake up one morning and discover that Tom's in and you're out. Oh, that's too bad, isn't it? Look, you're his wife. Let him think about that when he's with Linda Thompson. Oh, no, Marcia, that's and not... And I'll the... wager she's not first. I know Linda and I can assure you that... And to do it openly, publicly, to be seen with her, to announce to the world that he's being unfaithful. Oh, no, George, he's going to pay for that. Look, the Rose Common property can be developed into a major all-year resort. Will and I, we have the know-how. We can do it. All Will needs is the money due on the option. The answer is no. But you've got the money. Yes. And you can spare it. Mm Mm-hmm. And there's no danger of loss. You can always sell the option, even make a profit. Yes. Look, it's the biggest thing in his life. Please stop it. I have a headache. I'm sorry. Just talking about Will and the way he's been treating me makes me ill. I must ask you to excuse me. Of course. But please try to understand that this could destroy Will. I don't care. Marcia, you're not Will. You don't know what you're saying. I know what I'm saying. Let him be destroyed. Uh, Marsha. Marsha, you want me to call the doctor? No, 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 I'm all right. I'm perfectly all right. Now you and everyone else let me alone. Consider the computer. It works smoothly, efficiently. It does its job. Then, suddenly one day it becomes erratic. It doesn't make sense. Then, finally it breaks down. And why do we bring up the computer? Simply because it's the closest thing to the human brain, which can also become erratic and finally break down. 
There will be further exploration into the mysterious abyss of the human mind in Act Two. It was one noted philosopher or other who sagely remarked that the cart has no place where a fifth wheel could be used. Well, it's easy enough to see the basic soundness of this proposition when we consider the physical appearance of a cart. However, the concept itself may escape us. After all, a fifth wheel may describe more than just a round, disc-like object. It can also refer to a person. And so one may ask, how do we know when we ourselves may have become a fifth wheel? Leave me alone, George. Marcia, I'd like to help you. Why would you want to help me? Because I'm your friend. Oh, no. You're Will's friend. You don't look well, Marcia. There's something the matter with you. You're right. There is. Will is what's the matter with oh, me. The two of you were so much in love, Marcia. What happened? Look at me. And you'll see what happened. I don't see anything. I'm not pretty anymore. Oh, Marsha, you're still beautiful. Oh, I was never beautiful. I was just pretty. Beautiful stays, pretty fades. That's why he runs around with other women. He doesn't run around with Don't other women. Don't cover up for him, George. Especially since one of those women is your own secretary. Marsha, there's nothing between and them. Don't try to tell me it's in my mind. It is all in your mind. You're doing this to yourself. You go back to him and tell him it didn't work. He isn't ever going to see one single penny of my money. Never. Arthur, shouldn't you see a doctor? It's none of your business. Didn't you say it yourself? You don't feel well? What kind of doctor did you have in mind, you and Will? Well, I just look at you a and Psychiatrist, I... maybe? Oh, Marsha. Of course, that's the plan. What plan? The one you and precious William cooked up between you? There isn't any plan. Maybe you can get some shrink to decide I'm crazy. Oh, that's ridiculous. And then you can put me away. Marsha. That way Will can get his hands on all my money. That's the plan, isn't it? No, Marsha. There isn't any plan. Will is never going to get one penny from me. Period. Marsha, let's say you're right. You admit it. It doesn't matter. But there's still the rest of your life to go through. Whether he's guilty or not, forgive him. You're married. You don't believe in divorce. Do you want to stay this way all the time, bitter, angry? It's his fault. It doesn't matter. It takes two. Try to be reconciled. He only wants my money. Maybe that's what's wrong with your marriage. There's my money and his money. He doesn't have any. And the two of you used to be so crazy about each other. Wouldn't it be wonderful? If only you could recapture all that. Oh, no. Uh, 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 sure. Look, don't say a word. Tonight, have a beautiful dinner. Uh, prepared with wine, candlelight, everything. Maybe you'll find each other again. So, the meeting with Tom Pratt went badly, hmm? You know what he wants? Just about everything. I'd wind up being a very small junior partner. George, I don't know what I'm going to do. Tom Pratt is what I'm reduced to, and if I let him in, I'm dead. Why don't you try Marsha again? No, I'm poison around her. Why don't you go home tonight, right now? Have dinner with her. Right now, all I would need is that sweet, warm, understanding wife of mine. No thanks. Will, I spoke to Marsha. All she needs is for you to meet her halfway. Come on, try it. Well, I have a... Uh... Sort of a date with Linda tonight. There's no future there? Maybe, but at least the present is so pleasant. Oh, grow up, Will. You and Marsha have a problem, sure. But face it like two adults. George, I've tried. I wish I could tell you how I've tried. Will, when you're in that type of situation with a woman, what's your best argument? It's such a beautiful dinner, darling. You're using silver, good china. Is it uh, a special occasion? Shouldn't every dinner married people have together be a special occasion? And you're looking so pretty tonight. I'd hope you'd say beautiful. Well, that's what I meant. Beautiful. <laughs> well, I'll settle for pretty. You know, looking at you right now, 
It's as if we were both so much younger. Do you really feel that way? Mm, I do. <laughs> Marcia, darling, are you all right? Why do you ask? Well, you seem... Seem to be very pale suddenly. No, I'm I'm all right. I, I'd like a, a glass of wine. Should you? Why not? Well, uh, all right. Uh, pour us each a glass. We'll drink a toast. Uh, oh. Marcia, Marcia. Oh. Oh. What, is, what what is it, darling? Something, something. Uh, I don't know. Oh, just sit back, darling. Just sit back. I feel. I feel... All right, all right. I'm going to call a doctor. No, I... Oh. Now just relax. Oh. Just try, try to relax, will oh. you? Charlie? Mm. Mm. Hello? Uh, is this Dr. Caraway's service? Well, this is an emergency. Mm. He is? Oh. Who? Yes, yes, all right, all right. I'll call him. Uh, darling, Dr. Carraway is on vacation, but there's a doctor covering for him. Uh, Dr. Henrietta Rice, and I'm calling her right now. Mar Marcia. Marcia. I, I feel this. Uh, 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 hello. Is this Dr. Rice? Uh, I'm a patient of Dr. Carraway's. Uh, that is, my wife is. Uh, look, could you get here right away? She's ill. She's deathly ill. Well, I, I don't know. She just feels bad. She's flushed and, and, and feverish. And... Yes. Yes, all right, I will. Now, darling, darling, she says I'm to get you over to the that's hospital I, immediately. I, I don't want to. Now, that's where I, they have I, the facilities. Oh, no. And I'll just put you in the car, and we can be there in less than five minutes. Now, just lean on me. Every, everything is, is spinning. All right. R all right darling, I'll, I'll get you to the hospital in a few minutes. Just a few minutes. Are uh, you Mr. Bennett? I'm Dr. Rice. Yes, Dr. How is my wife? Mr. Bennett, your wife is dead. Dead? Yes. She was dead before we could even get her out of the emergency room. Marcia, dead? I'm sorry. I wish there were some easier way to tell you. It was her heart. We aren't sure. Well, she did have a heart condition. I'm aware of that. Well, now, I don't understand. What else could it have been? Mr. Bennett... Was this a sudden attack? Well, well, sure. Had she complained of illness or pain recently? Yes, certainly. She she would get these spells. Well, you, you could ask Dr. Carraway. Well, I'm sorry to have to ask these questions at a time like this, but I have no choice. Yes, she uh, she did. She did complain about not feeling well. Starting when? Oh, maybe a week ago. Mm, pains, mm. dizziness, nausea. The face flushed. Yes, yes, I, I would say it, it appeared that way. Mr. Bennett, we're yes. going to perform a post-mortem. Now, wait, wait, wait just a minute. Yes? What for? To determine definitely the cause of death. Oh, but she is dead. We know why. Her heart. Don't you want to be sure? Well, what does it matter now? We do. Well, now, just a minute. Don't, don't you need my permission? Your permission? Yes, I think that's the law. I see no reason why I sh should subject her to something like that just to satisfy your medical curiosity. I respect your feelings, Mr. Bennett. But in this case, we can proceed without your permission. Now, wait a minute. We are virtually certain she has been poisoned. <laughs> Dr. Rice. Yes, Mr. Bennett. Well? Your wife has been poisoned. What? You're the second person I've notified. The first, naturally, had to be the sheriff. Poisoned? I, I don't understand. Arsenic. She was filled with it. You could practically see it starting to come out of her nails and her hair. Well, how? How, how could she have gotten arsenic poisoned? I am only concerned with what happened. How? is someone else's responsibility. I just can't believe it. I don't know if that matters. Good night, Mr. Bennett. Now, wait. Now, now, look, it isn't true. You don't like me. As a matter of fact, I can tell you took an active dislike to me the moment you heard my name on the telephone. It's true. I don't like you, Mr. Bennett. But that doesn't alter the basic fact in the case. All right. Are you allowing your attitude toward me influence your medical judgment? My medical judgment has been sustained by two other pathologists. Now, just what have you got against me? My sister's name is Joan Tongue. She has a daughter, Linda. Yes? 
Good morning, Miss Bennett. I'm afraid you'll have to come down to the courthouse. Oh, why? Uh, for one thing, we've got a coroner's jury ready to deliver a verdict on your wife. Now, look, we know how she died. Arsenic poisoning. That's true. But that has to be all tied up legally, you know. That's just because a man's wife dies of poison, that doesn't necessarily mean that the man is guilty, now does it? No, not necessarily. But it sure doesn't provide a very good argument for his innocence, if you know what I mean. The purpose of this coroner's inquest is to determine the manner in which death came to Marsha Bennett, Mrs. William Bennett. The first witness is Dr. Henrietta Rice. The arsenic had been ingested in minute amounts over a period of time. How long a time, Dr. Rice? Perhaps a month. And uh, where was she getting this arsenic from? From the food in the house. And how did you establish that? We tested various samples from the refrigerator and the shelves. And how did she die, finally? From an accumulation of the poison. And therefore, Doctor, what would you recommend to this jury? In my opinion, death was due to arsenic poisoning administered to Mrs. Bennett by... Well, I'm sure we all know by whom. I object to that. Now, you have no right to make that accusation. You're absolutely correct, Mr. Bennett. But don't worry. You'll get your day in court. Yes, he most certainly will. But it doesn't look as if it's going to be a very good day, does it? Certainly not, when you consider all the evidence. But then again, things aren't always decided in the end strictly by the evidence, are they? We'll see about that in the third act. What was that story? It took place in ancient Rome. A man saw a lion who was suffering from the effects of a sharp thorn in his paw. It was a minor thing. Anyhow, the man pulled out the thorn and went on his way. Years later, the man was sentenced to be killed in the arena by wild beasts, and he was thrown to a hungry lion. Guess what? It was the same lion. And didn't they ever have a happy reunion? Of course, it's called Androcles and the Lion. But what has it to do with our story? Don't worry. We'll have a parallel of sorts. How could you do it, Will? To what? You poisoned her. George, I swear to you. Do you expect me to believe you? George, they're going to ask me questions, Will, under oath. Yes, I know. Do you want me to perjure myself? All I can tell you is I'm innocent. Sure. Now, George, somebody has to believe me. I know what they're going to ask me. How were you getting along with Marsha? The money, the bind you were in? You were tired of her, Will. You told me so. You said you no longer loved her. That you, that you never really loved her. Oh. Sometimes we just say things. And Linda, be prepared for Linda. What am I supposed to say about all that? And they ask me. George, I'm not asking you to lie. Oh, that's good. But there is a certain way of putting things, if you know what I mean. <laughs> we did speak about this, Will. I distinctly remember. If things were going so badly between you, why didn't you divorce her? You couldn't answer me. But it doesn't matter. Everybody's going to know. You wanted her money. I know, I know. It looks bad, but you have to help me, George. I wouldn't know how. Mr. Bennett, you've heard all the witnesses testify how you had this very strange interest in your wife's death. Is there a statement that you care to make at this time? I'm innocent. Your guilt or innocence is not at issue here. The purpose of this investigation is to come up with the cause of death. Now, let me ask one question. Do I impress you people as a stupid man? I mean, you may not like me, but certainly you'll admit I'm not a fool. Just what is the point you wish to establish? Well, just how? How could I expect to get away with it, huh? After all, if I murdered my wife, I'd certainly be aware of the fact that I'd be the prime suspect, wouldn't I? If I intended to kill my wife, wouldn't I use a method that would be more clever? 
Now, why would I do something that could be discovered so easily? May I answer that question? Yes, Dr. Rice. And I would remind you that you're still under oath. Mr. Bennett, you depended on Dr. Carraway. What are you talking about? I am sure you know. Dr. Harold Carraway has had a long and distinguished career. He's well along in years and semi-retired. Your wife suffered from a heart condition. That's part of her medical record. You counted on that. You were sure that if your wife died suddenly, Dr. Carraway would automatically assume it would be from a heart attack. And that would be the end of now, it. Now, you have no right to accuse I me. I only know this. When I telephoned Dr. Carraway up in the country to tell him that Mrs. Bennett was dead, his immediate reaction was heart failure. Well, I don't care what anybody says. I didn't I am it. only answering the question that you raised yourself. You would probably have gotten away with it had Dr. Carraway been in town. But you had no way of knowing that he would be on vacation. I have nothing more to say. Thank you, Dr. Rice. <clears throat> we have additional witnesses, but since it is noon, we shall adjourn for lunch and reconvene at one o'clock. Hello, Will. Sarah, what are you doing here? I thought I'd drop by. Is that wise? The whole town is just about ready to hang me. You don't want to be known as a friend of mine. Well, somebody has to stop by and say good luck, Will. Oh. You're the only one, Sarah. Doesn't look good. Not at this point. And it's not going to get much better either. You see what they're doing. They'll definitely establish the fact that she was poisoned. Yes. And they'll have a murder. And at whom will all the evidence point? I'm going to be indicted, Sarah. Just no way out of it. But I didn't kill her. I believe you. That makes you the only one in town. Will. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the senior prom? Hey, that was a long time ago. Oh, well, of course, why should you? After all, it was just another dance, another ball, another party for you. Well, I guess you reach a certain age where everything was a long time ago. Oh, I didn't want to go. I... No, that's not true. I did. I wanted to go more than anything else in the world, but nobody asked me. So, Mama bribed her sister's son, her nephew, from Chicago to come all the way out here to be my date for the prom. You didn't know that, did you? No. Well, of course, he resented it, and I suppose he had a right to. But he went through the motions. He bought me a corsage <laughs> with Mama's money, and he drove me to the prom in Mama's car. And that was just about the last time I saw them until it was time to go home. I spent most of the night just, you know, standing around with the girls like me, the ones who had no dates or who had phony dates, like mine. It was the worst night of my life. Until you saved it. Me? Yes, you. <laughs> How? What did I do? You asked for a dance. Oh. You really don't remember, do you? I just can't tell you what that did for me. I was actually dancing with Will Bennett. The fabulous Will himself for four beautiful minutes. That's how long it took the band to play Stardust. I was no longer Sarah Lewis, the wallflower, but Sarah Lewis, the queen of the prom. And I fell in love with you at that moment. I didn't know that. Why did you ask me to dance, Will? I don't know. I, I just... Oh, okay. I, I won't press it. I might not like the truth. After all, it could only be that you were sorry for me. Oh, no, no. And I, uh, I couldn't face that either. So, I constructed a, a little fantasy, which was that secretly you adored me. And that one day, you would declare yourself. And you kept nourishing that little conceit of mine, because every time you would meet me, you would smile and you would say hello. You saved my life that night at the prom. Oh, prom. And I kept saying to myself, if only one day I can do something for Will Bennett, something as beautiful as the thing he did for me, if only I could save his life as he saved mine. 
Well, maybe I can. Sarah, what do you say? Well, I can save you. I'm the only person in this whole world who can do it. No one else would know how. Do you know what you're talking about? Yes, Will, I know what I'm talking about. But you, you'd have to... Well, there'd have to be evidence. I know. Sarah, do you, do you have evidence? Yes. You do? Oh, you do? Oh, oh, Sarah. Sarah, I, I look at you now and I see the most... The most wonderful person I... I uh, uh, Sarah, Sarah, what what is the evidence? A book. Are there any further witnesses who wish to be heard? Uh, yes, sir. Is that you, Sarah Lewis? It is. You wish to testify to the matter at hand here? I do. You'll have to come forward and be sworn. I believe there is medical evidence to prove that Marsha Bennett's death was due to arsenic poisoning. Yes, there is. And we have every reason to suppose that the coroner's jury will come up with that verdict. Well, the jury has not yet reached that decision. They will call it murder. What is your point, Miss Lewis? I know for a fact that Marsha Bennett died from arsenic poisoning, but I also know for a fact that it wasn't murder. What's that? It was suicide. Suicide? Are, are you saying that she took her own life? Yes. Uh, not intentionally, but she did. She poisoned herself. Well, what do you have to, uh, to, to back up that statement? You need evidence. I know, and I have it. Uh, here, in this book, taken from the town library on the 17th. That's exactly 16 days ago. The title of the book is The Count of Monte Cristo. It's by Alexander Dumas. And here is the borrower's card number, 17763. It belongs to Marsha Bennett. The clerk will accept these as exhibits uh, as soon as their relevance is established. On the morning of the 17th, Marsha Bennett came into the library and asked me if we had a copy of The Count of Monte Cristo. She remarked that she remembered reading the book in school and enjoyed it and would like to read it again. I still don't see what this has to do I with I kept it. asking myself why she would want this book. It's an old, practically forgotten classic. And uh, further, Mrs. Bennett hardly ever used the library. So why would she want The Count of Monte Cristo? Uh, I must remind you, Miss Lewis, that you have been given the floor to answer, not ask questions. Yes, sir, I understand. Uh, she was highly nervous and very upset, and I was sure she had a reason. So I took down another copy of The Count of Monte Cristo and read it carefully, cover to cover, and I found out why. Are you prepared to tell us? The Count of Monte Cristo was required reading in our junior year at high school. Something from that book stayed in her mind, perhaps in her subconscious. Somehow it must have suggested itself to her, so... She came to refresh her memory. Uh, can you tell us that something? Yes. Uh, I will show you the passage. Uh, there's talk of how to murder someone by feeding him arsenic. And the way to do it is this. First, you yourself take just a few grains of arsenic one day. Then on the next day, you take a few more. On the third day, a few more, and so on. Now, by the end of the week, you would have ingested a considerable dose, large enough to kill, if taken all at once by somebody else. What Dumas did not quite understand, but what he was talking about, was what today we call immunity. Yes. The passage goes on to say, now that you are accustomed to ingesting arsenic with no harmful results, you can safely poison someone else. Uh, the clerk will mark this exhibit. And that's exactly what she had planned. She would take these minute doses daily, build her immunity. Then she would fill a bottle of wine with a lethal dose. Now, they would both drink from it. He would die, and she wouldn't. No, but surely... The doctors would examine his body. They would know it was arsenic. But they couldn't blame her, because she would show traces of the poison, too. It would therefore appear that he had been trying to poison her and had somehow made a mistake and taken a drink from the wrong glass. <clears throat> Continue, Miss Lewis. Everything would be in her favor, you see. 
Everyone knew they weren't getting along. Even better, everyone knew he had several very good motives for murder. Enough of them have certainly been brought out here today. Uh, but not everyone can build up an immunity to arsenic. She didn't know that. But neither, I suppose, did Alexander Dumas. Well, that's all I have to say. Uh, thank you, Miss Lewis. The jury will consider this new evidence carefully and retire to consider its verdict. <laughs> Hello, Will. I... I, uh... I thought I'd come by the library to thank you. I didn't get a chance back there in the courtroom. Sarah, that book did it. You just about saved my life. That makes us even. Do you know what you said a few days ago, that you had this, uh... this fantasy in which I secretly adored you and that one day I would declare myself Yes. Well, that wasn't a fantasy, Sarah. It's real, I think. I think I always adored you. I, I think I was always in love with you, Sarah. Were you, Will? Really? Yes, yes, Sarah. Ah, uh, we're making a bit too much noise. After all, this is a library. You know, I, I know now that I was always in love with you. Will? Hmm? I'm sorry, but... I'm afraid I'm not in love with you anymore. Sarah. Oh, Will. You should see your face. Shock. Dismay. How is it possible for any woman not to be in love with Will Bennett? Well, it's possible. Oh, Sarah, Sarah, I mean it. Maybe I was never really in love with you, Will. Maybe it was... You know, all gratitude. But after what I did today, I feel as if I can do anything, even meet a man who really loves me. Sarah, I, I'd love you. Poor Will. Thank you for asking me to dance at the senior prom. Now, finally, we're even. Poor Will. That's not exactly true. He was rich Will. After all, he did inherit his wife's estate. Perhaps we might call him aging Will. There's nothing so pitiable as an Adonis who grows older. The hair goes, the paunch comes. And as they say, the spirit is hot, but the flesh is cold. We'll have more about spirit and flesh when I return shortly. The exact quote which seems to have fueled so much of the motive force of this story is by H. L. Mencken. If ever I depart this veil and you remember me and have thought to please my ghost, Forgive some sinner and wink your eye at some homely girl. You remember that now. And a similar sentiment may also be found in the Old Testament. It has to do with casting your bread upon the waters. No good deed is ever wasted. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Terry Keene, E.V. Juster, and Ray Owens. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall your special envoy from a wild and weird country that exists way down deep in your very own imagination. To many people, especially city dwellers, grass is something to smoke. Or perhaps something that has keep-off signs on it. The fact is, grass is the foundation of life as we know it. All the grains we eat are grasses. All of our meat is nothing but grass transformed. In many ways, the quality of our existence depends on the quality of our grass. Which means that those who can change that quality for better or worse literally hold our lives in their hands. All we need is your confession. I didn't kill him. You swore you were going there to shoot him. I know, but... You did go there. Yes. You confronted him. I... I did. The gun. Now, this is the gun that fired the bullet. Can you identify it? I already have. It's mine. I don't deny it. I tell you, I didn't kill him. Just look at all the evidence. I don't care about the evidence. I know I didn't kill him. mystery drama, Snake in the Grass, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Sandy Dennis. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Augusta Sanderson. She's 36 years old. And uh, while there are those who say she's never been kissed, we cannot vouch for the complete accuracy of that statement. What does she do? She's an agriculturalist. An unusual occupation for a woman? Don't say that. We live in liberated times. You'd be surprised at the things women can do. You might venture to inquire why they want to do them, but uh, that's another story. Our story begins in a quiet university town in the Northwest. Evening, ma'am. I'll thank you not to patronize me. Well, well I said... I'll was... thank you not to call me ma'am. Ma'am is short for madam, and I am neither the mistress of a household nor the keeper of a brothel. Well, I only wanted to say hello and welcome to Pete's for 25 years and oasis for the thirsty. I have a B.A., an M.A. and a Ph.D. I hold a rank of full professor at the School of Agriculture. I don't have to be addressed as ma'am as if I were some fragile Victorian lady. Well, uh, how's Doc? Or, uh, Prof? Now, I intend to become extremely inebriated. Oh? And it's just as well that I don't make a spectacle of myself. Let me have a... A what? I don't know. Tell me what's best to make you forget. Well, uh, nothing can ever really make you forget. Very well. What is good for building courage? Again, nothing. That's not what I hear. Well, it's true. You get maybe the illusion of courage, but not the real thing. Well, dispenser of illusions, pour one for me. Oh, you must be the lady prof at the ag school, huh? The lady prof at the ag school. You know Dr. Howells? Do I know Dr. Howells? Yeah, I was reading about him in the paper. Let me tell you how well I know Dr. Wasn't Howells. Wasn't that a terrific thing he discovered? I know Eugene Everett Howells well enough to kill him. His new feed grass will mean that millions of starving people... Be... What'd you say? I said I intend to kill him. <laughs> yeah, well... Um... All I need is the courage. All the illusion of it. And I'm feeling bolder every minute. Yeah, but look, don't you think you better... Don't I think I'd better what? Go home? Stop talking foolishly. <laughs> but I have every right to talk foolishly. You know why? Because I've been a fool all my life. Yeah, well, I'll get somebody to take you home. The article in the paper said that Dr. Howells discovered, created the new feed grass. 
He didn't do it. He didn't? No, I did. You did? Okay. I mean it. I really mean it. It's mine. Oh, sure. You see, you don't believe it. Well, I... In the Himalayan regions in Asia, the terrain, the mm. climate, is almost like what we have here. Yeah, well, look, no, I... No, no, you have to follow this. They have an economy, an agricultural economy that's based on goats. Goats, yeah. Goats. The goats are actually sacred. The soil is calcareous like ours, and a red clover grows there. But it's deficient in proteins and nitrogens. You know what you need? A nice cup of coffee. Now, I have been developing a species, highly nutritious, of purple clover. It would practically double the output of milk. Is that a fact? Think of how many lives this will save. That's really great, you know. It could have been the supreme achievement of my career. It could have meant a Nobel Prize, perhaps. Now there's talk of Dr. Howells winning it. It isn't fair. It's mine. Don't you understand? It's my grass. I created it. It's mine. Tell me, for doing that to me, for taking it from me, isn't that enough to justify my killing him? I tell you what you ought to do, Prof. You ought to go home and sleep on it. You don't believe me. You believe because I'm a woman I'm incapable of scientific achievement. Oh, that's not so. There's a whole lot of lady scientists. <sighs> Thank you, Pete. Is that your name, Pete? Thank you. What for? For listening to me. Oh, it was my pleasure. And I see now. How clearly I see it now. If my life is to have any meaning at all, I must kill him. Yeah, well, it's really getting late. You'll see. You'll feel better in the morning. I feel better already. I'm strangely at peace with myself. I'm quite contented. You've made me see it. His death will rid me of all my demons. Now, you really don't want to kill anyone. You're a lady. Good night, Pete. You're a gentleman. Yeah, well, uh, uh, look, uh, uh, uh... James, James, well, she's got to be crazy. But what if she ain't crazy? She, maybe I'd better... I don't know. If I tell a story like this, won't they think I'm nuts? Lieutenant Novak. Uh. Hello? This is Lieutenant Novak. Hello? Who's on the other end of this? Oh, no, no, not him. Of all the cops who could have answered that phone, definitely not Novak. <laughs> Someone's at the door. Someone... Just a minute! Oh, who could be ringing the bell at this hour? It's noon. How could I have slept till noon? Just a minute! I'll get on my... Just a minute! How could I have slept so late? Who is it? Police. Police? Why would... Dr. Augustus Sanderson? Yes. I'm Police Lieutenant Novak. May I come in? Well, yes. Why? You are Augustus Sanderson? I am. Miss Sanderson, you're under arrest. What? What are you saying? Charge is suspicion of murder. Murder? Who's Murder? Dr. Eugene Everett Howe. Oh, but you're making I a... I must inform you of your constitutional right. But I didn't kill Anything him. Anything you say may be used against you. Please, please, you can't be serious. Are you saying Gene Howells is dead? That's right. But why do you insist that I... You said that you would kill him. But I was only... You're only one. Now, Professor Sanderson, you insisted to Pete Grimes at the Oasis Bar and Grill last well, night. Well, well, you... I was feeling very unhappy, and there are times when you say things you shouldn't. You had a motive. Motive? Didn't you say that he has robbed you of a discovery? Oh, that. Yes, that. A discovery you considered great enough to make you eligible for the Nobel Prize? He didn't exactly rob me. No? No, I gave it to him. I had to. Otherwise... Well, it wouldn't be used, so I said, take it. It might as well be yours. Why did you give it to him? Because they wouldn't take it from me, from a woman. I don't know what you're talking about. In that part of Asia, women are considered 
Well, not exactly unclean, but uh, it's hard for you as an American to visualize this. But the fact of my being a woman would make the grass defiled, unfit for the goats, which are holy animals. According to the way you told the story to Pete last night, Howells robbed you of the credit. He did. But I had no choice. If I was to save millions of lives, I would have to sacrifice my own vanity and say to Jean, let it be known as yours. But afterward, when I saw how Howells was preening himself... You killed him. No. You left Pete's oasis at 9 p.m. The coroner places the time of death at midnight. Where were you at midnight? Here. Right here. Can anyone support that statement? Well, no. According to Mr. Pete Grimes, you were acting somewhat strangely. You could say that, yes, but I didn't kill him. You went directly home after you left Pete's oasis at 9 p.m.? Yes. The ballistics lab has established that Dr. Howells was killed by a twenty-two caliber bullet. You own a gun? I... Yes. Yes, I have a twenty-two caliber revolver, which I carry sometimes when I am in the field, especially when the snakes are shredding. May I sin? You see, snakes are very nervous when they shed. Are they pistol blades? And they strike at shadows. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. This gun's been fired recently. Oh, no, not in months. Well, you can smell it. You can see the fouling. Here. Yeah. Five live cartridges and one empty shell. But I haven't used... The gun should be empty. The lab will determine whether or not this is the gun, but... But uh, what? I... I put the gun away. I didn't even have any bullets. I was supposed to buy. Can I see the uh, shoes you were wearing last night. Why? May I? What will my shoes show you? Doctor House is having a sidewalk repaired. There's dirt and mud in front of his doorstep. We have a mold of shoe prints. I'm sure these shoes will fit them. But I. There's dried mud on these shoes too, Professor. I. I can explain that. Can you? I was angry, so I went to his house after I left the oasis. But you said you went directly home. I know I did. I know. I just thought that it might be embarrassing if I admitted I... nothing happened. I just saw him briefly, and I left and came here. Professor, there are people who get themselves into a highly agitated state. Then they commit a crime. A serious crime like murder. And afterwards, they forget all about it. I am incapable of killing. I am not a murderer. What you're saying is you never killed anyone before. That's who the majority of murderers are. But I know who I am and what I believe. Well, that's why you made sure you'd be caught and punished, because you were brought up to believe no one should get away with murder. But I didn't. Now, first, you were sure to make a public announcement. I wasn't making any... I was overwrought. You were sure to state that you had a powerful that motive. Doesn't prove. Third, you used your own gun. Why do you insist? Fourth, you must have been aware of the fact that you were leaving shoe marks in the dirt. Why didn't you avoid doing that? Why couldn't you at least wipe off the mud? Now. Well, now you just think about it. Detective. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Did she or didn't she? Even she doesn't know for sure. The blocking out of unpleasant memories is by no means a rare occurrence in our culture. Well, let's give her an opportunity to collect her thoughts and see what, if anything, she can come up with in Act Two. say the wish is the father of the deed, which is why we have inhibitions, no? After all, if every time you felt like killing someone, you did it, who among us would be out of jail? And so, here we have Augusta Sanderson, Ph.D., a learned professor of agriculture, about to be booked on a charge of homicide. Talk about still waters running deep. Here is a quiet brook that apparently has no bottom. What are you going to do with me, Lieutenant Novak? Take you in, book you. Lieutenant, please give me a chance to think. Now, that's not my job. But I have to get my thoughts together, and how can I think in jail? 
I'm sure you'll get out on bond. But I'll be a different person. I'll stand accused of murder. People will look at me in a, a different way. I'll even look at myself differently. Please help me. Oh. Help me think it through. From the beginning. Someone killed Gene Howells. If I didn't kill him, who did? Look, Professor... I need your help. The help of an experienced professional That's detective. not my job. And once you arrest me, you'll be through with me. I already arrested you. I even told you your rights. I know. You said I had the right to counsel. Well, you're my counsel. I'm not a lawyer. A counselor is one who advises. Now, please listen and advise me. Who else could have killed Gene Howells? Who else had a motive? Let me, uh... Let me explain that to you. Now, we're wasting time. You never waste time. You only waste effort. Arrest me and you'll get further away from the truth. Well, what is the truth? What did happen? What is the chain of events that led you to my door? The first link. Among the exchange students at the university is the crown prince of a protectorate located high in the Himalayan mountains. In Asia. I know where the Himalayan mountains are. And it occurred to me that I could help the prince to help his countrymen, who are mostly poverty-stricken herdsmen. And so, you see, Prince Lutov... Oh, you must call me Shorty. Ah, uh, Shorty. It is a fabulous joke. You see, I am six feet tall. None of my countrymen grow that high. You see, my brother Ali here is barely five feet. Uh, that is average for our country. The small people... With small bones. That's why I'm here, Prince, because your countrymen do not grow. Fabulous! You hear that, Ali? A lady, Professor Ashahiba, visits us because our country people are small. There is great wisdom in this country, magnificent one, which is why we are... Ali, in public, even you must call me Shorty. The staple food of your people is milk, goat's milk. The sacred goats of Kandar. But the milk is scanty and significantly low in protein. The milk is sacred. What the Saiba says is blasphemy. The problem can be solved by introducing a new kind of pasturage. A new clover which I have developed. One that contains more nutrients. One that will double the output of milk. Fabulous! We would have to arrange for proper plowing and seeding. His Magnificence wishes to thank you. You will be informed of his decision in due time. Yeah, but Ali, what the, Just is that? because to, uh, you are not at home, Magnificent uh, Shorty, does not mean you may act without meditation or counsel. Ah, uh, he's right, Professor. He's always right. He may be my younger brother, but he has the brains in our family. We will communicate with you in due time. I didn't know what to think. Here, I was offering these people a way to save millions of lives. And how? How could they be so cavalier about it? And would you believe, a week later, I received a note from Ali. Dear Professor Sanderson, after considerable meditation and prayer for guidance... His Magnificence, the Crown Prince Ludov, has determined that your estimable project is not practical at this time. Why is it impractical? Sahiba, it is impractical because you are a woman. What does that mean? And because you are a woman, you are impure. Really? In what way? In our country, you would not be permitted to come in contact with the goats of Kandar which are sacred beasts. But I'll have nothing to do with your goats. You will have provided them with food. The people will ask, this new grass, from whence does it come? And the answer, it is the creation of a woman. We shall have civil war. No one has to know. It will come out. How? It will be a major news event hailed all over the world. Many of our people read. You mean, they would rather starve than accept food created by a woman? Madam, this is our religion. It is not to be mocked. Forgive me. No, uh, uh, we appreciate your concern, Professor, but we must analyze the entire problem. Your new grass may save thousands from hunger, but cause just as many to die in riots. Is this being turned down because I am a woman? Is that the only reason? Yes. His magnificent shorty has no choice. Well, then, perhaps... There is something I can do. 
What are you saying, Augusta? Jane, this is your discovery. But I... That's not right. I... I've agonized over this... This thing... What am I supposed to do? Let people starve? Because of their prejudices? And what right have I to call them prejudices? Those are devoutly held beliefs. But this grass, this thick purple clover... I didn't know it could be developed. I didn't either. Well, how did the idea occur to you? Perhaps... Well, perhaps it was supposed to occur to me. Well, now, what does that mean? Oh, anything you'd like it to mean. Augusta, I... I... I, I'm afraid to take the credit. Afraid? Yeah, I'm afraid of what it might do to me. This will be hailed. You know that, don't you? Yes. It will earn its discoverer recognition, awards. How will I react? How will my personality change? I've always been content to do my work quietly. We're talking uh, about life or death for hundreds of thousands, millions of people. And how will you change, Augusta? You'll see me regarded as a savior. What will it do to you? You'll start to hate me. I... I could never hate you, Jean. It isn't right. You've been struggling with this discovery for so long. You're going to regret it. I'll think of all the children who'll have a chance to live. I'll regret nothing. I'll regret it. I thought and thought. There's no other way. So you finally convinced Dr. Howes to become a hero. Is that what you're telling me? Yes. It's very noble of you. Very self-sacrificing. So why did you accuse him of stealing everything in Pete's Oasis? Because Gene was right. He started to believe after a little while that the clover was actually his. It was supposed to be kept secret till we were ready for planting. But he let out a word here and there. And, well, compliments... Praise poured in. He started to preen himself. And that's when you found out you were human, after all. Yes. And you gave up without a fight. I'm not a fighter. I think it's more important for the grass to grow. Now, I have to repeat this vital question, Professor. Why give the credit to Dr. Howells? Because of... Because he he is an authority on agriculture. Yes, sure. But is he the only one? Well, no, the fact is, you could have given it to any number of people, isn't that true? Yes, yes. All right, why howls? All right, I'll tell you why. You're in love with him. That's... That's what? That's... That's... That's either true or false. You see, I listen to every word you said. Not only to the words, but to how you said them. I... I could never hate you, Jean. There's a tone in your voice when you say his name. That's funny, you call him Gene, he calls you Augusta. It's kind of formal, isn't it? Everyone calls me Augusta. But as far as you're concerned, Dr. Howells wasn't everyone. I admit, I confess, perhaps... Why shouldn't I have felt that I... As I was in love with him. We certainly had similar interests. And so you gave him this uh, grass discovery, hoping somehow... That he might respond to you. That's not true. It isn't, huh? I gave him the credit because of the starving people. Sure, and also because he might feel he owed you something. Like a proposal of marriage. That's a lie. Only you know that for sure. All right, maybe it wasn't so cut and dried. Few things are, but... There was an element of give and take, wasn't there? Yes. But your generosity didn't change the nature of your relationship with Howells, did it? No. It was still friendship, at best, wasn't it? Yes. And that's what really infuriated you, wasn't it? No. You were, as they say in the books, the woman spurned. Please believe me, I didn't kill him. I'm afraid we have to go. Where? To police headquarters. But I'm innocent. Professor Sanderson, I admire you. You're a woman who worked hard against a lot of odds to get where you are. On the way, you must have missed out on many things. Please, please, I am telling you I am in. There was something between you and Howell. No. Well, what did happen? You're giving me a story about some purple grass, some Asiatic prince. 
Some deal you made to give Howells the credit for something. Now, how do I know any of it is true? What are you saying? This business about the grass, all I've got is your word for it. I tell you, it's true. Well, all right. There's only one way to find out. Isn't there? Uh, yes. Uh, how may I help you? Uh, Prince, uh, your highness. Uh, Shorty. You must call me Shorty. I'm a police detective, as I believe uh, this gentleman has told you. Oh, yes. My brother Ali informed me. It's fabulous. Do you know this lady? This lady? Of course, they know me. Ali, is this charming lady familiar? No. You must remember me. I was here to tell you all about my new grass. Grass? Ali... What would we have to do with grass? We have never seen this lady before in our lives. Oh, it is a pity, because she is a most charming lady. We spoke about the goats, the sacred goats of Kandar, and you said because I was a woman, I was impure. Oh, that is impossible. Why should we insult you? I told you the discovery would belong to Dr. Howells, and you said in that case you would accept it. Ali, do we know a Dr. Howells? Uh, no. But I was here. We spoke. Professor, it's time we were leaving. Ever get the feeling that everybody around you is crazy and you're the only sane, sensible person in the room or even in the world? If you ever did, you are in a perfect position to appreciate what is going on inside Professor Augustus Sanderson at this very moment. Well... We still have the third act to come, and uh, we usually manage to sort these things out. What do you do when you're accused of murder? I suppose you admit it if it's true and uh, deny it if it's false. But suppose you're not sure of the answer. Suppose the charge could be true or false. Suppose you reach that point where you just don't know. Is such a state of affairs possible? But I was here. I spoke to you both. Oh, would we forget so delightful a lady as you? The Sahiba is mistaken. I, I can't be. I... Gentlemen, I'm sorry we bothered you. Oh, it was no bother. Just think, Ali. When we return home, we can say we had a visit from a real American detective. Oh, fabulous. Professor, I'm sorry, Professor Sanderson. The train has come to the end of the line. Last stop. All out. What, uh, what does one bring to a jail? Well, a toothbrush, a change of clothes. Might I say, you've got a good chance of being out on bond. Thank you. Lieutenant Novak, I can prove that I gave the credit for the discovery to Dr. Howells. Well, I suppose you did. Then that would prove that those two are lying. No, it will only prove that you gave the discovery to Dr. Howells for reasons of your own. What reasons would I have? Personal reasons. And that's why you killed him. I still say I didn't do it. Well, if that's your story, stick to it. I didn't. Someone stole my revolver. Professor, you'll have to convince a jury. You don't believe it. What I believe right now doesn't matter at all. Now just pack a small bag. Ali? Yes, Magnificent. Tell me, little brother, why did we have to engage in that charade with the police detective? I thought it would be instructive. Instructive? Why have we come to this most democratic of all countries? You were the one who insisted. I know, I know. I wanted to live like a... like an ordinary common member of the people. A desire I could never understand. Well, 
The common people, whether they be ignorant shepherds or sophisticated Americans, act alike as far as the police are concerned. Is that true? When questioned by police, the common people in America do exactly as our people do. But they have a most picturesque phrase for it. They clam up. Clam up. How beautifully descriptive. In both countries, one simply does not become involved with the police. And so, when I heard there was an officer at the door, I decided to act in our best interests. Who knows where a thing like this could lead? Clam up. It is, after all, my duty to advise you. Fabulous. Are you ready, Professor? As I said, you don't have to pack too much. Lieutenant, Rutoff and his brother Ali were lying. It's all in the hands of the jury now. Don't say that. Well, what do you want me to say? Look, I want you to know something. I like you. Please don't. Don't what? Don't say meaningless words in an attempt to make me feel better. I like you because you're a woman who's smart. Who? Well, who's good looking. If you really liked me, you'd listen to my story. Because I like you, I'm advising you to change it. You want to beat this, don't you? Tell the truth. The truth is always the best defense, no matter how bleak it looks. The jury responds to the truth. They feel it. They respect you for it. But I am telling the truth. No. It was a lover's quarrel. I have your lawyer get women on the jury. They eat that up. If you're going to arrest me, get it over with. Okay, I just wish you'd listen. The truth is, someone came here, stole my gun. My gun, you have it. I want a receipt for it. You'll get it. It'll be an exhibit at the trial. One twenty-two caliber revolver. Five cartridges. One empty shell. I don't care about those. They don't belong to me. I wouldn't keep a loaded gun in the house. I don't even have any bullets, I told you. Why can't you believe because me? Because if I believed you, I'd have to believe in Santa Claus. And furthermore... Hey, maybe I do. What? <laughs> These cartridges... These cartridges, they're not American-made. Look at what it says on the rim of each cartridge. Here, yeah, yeah. Where the manufacturer has his name. That's not American writing. Those letters, it's a different alphabet. They could be Hindi. Foreign shells made in India. Nobody sells them around here. It was the younger brother, Ali. Hold it I know why it was Ali. Let me tell you, from the very beginning, he was the one who, who was opposed to the... Now, hold it a minute. Uh, this is Lieutenant Novak. I need something in a hurry. You got that uh, crown prince going to the college and his brother? All right, get the phone number. Call him. Say it's a routine annual inquiry about guns. Ask if he has one and what kind. All right, call me right back at this number. Uh... 227-8308. Yeah. The bullets have to belong to Ali. Only if he has a twenty-two of his own. It was Ali. I know it. How can you be so sure? He came here. He stole my gun, but it was empty. It was nighttime. The stores are closed. Where can he buy bullets? He can't, so he goes home. He gets his own. He would only have those bullets if he owns a twenty-two. He has to. He must. It's the only thing that makes sense. All right, all right. Even if we can prove these are his cartridges, you know what he can say? He can say you stole them. Why would I... Because you're trying to construct a case against him. And you are. I just know he killed Gene Howells. Let's examine your whole story. They won't take the grass seed from you because you're a woman. All right, fine. You give it to Dr. Howells. Now. Now, what's the objection? The objection? Now, it's plain sailing, isn't it? Plant the new grass, feed all the hungry people? What's wrong? Ali, it's Ali. When I saw Gene Howells last night, he was terribly depressed and very frightened. Lieutenant Novak. Yeah. Oh, he does. Okay. Prince Ali has a twenty-two pistol registered in his name. Which means these are his bullets. You said Dr. Howells was depressed? 
Why? 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 Let me think. I was so angry and upset when I went to see him. I know I went in there hating him and I left feeling... Uh, feeling sorry but for him. But you haven't told me why. What did he say to me? Let me try to remember exactly what he said to me. I wish I'd never heard of that clover of yours. Really? The last time I read the papers, it was that clover of yours. It's mine only because that's how you'd have it. I, I, I told you this would happen. You'd have second thoughts and I'd have a guilty conscience. I'm sorry. It is all my fault. And it may have been all for nothing. Why? They don't want the grass. They didn't realize it was purple in color. Oh, what's wrong with purple? Allie explained it. Purple is an unlucky color, and so the time wasn't right. But perhaps in the future... What was supposed to happen in the future? If purple is unlucky, it will always be unlucky. I became angry. I told Allie somehow I would let his people know about this grass and how badly they need it. And what was his answer? Nothing. He looked at me. Just looked. With those funny eyes. Well, you think they're funny, but they can be frightening. Augusta, why did you have to tempt me with oh, this? Please, Jean, try to be calm. It's going to end badly. I know it. We tried. They won't take our help. This is all we can do. Prince Lutuf was willing to go along. And it was Ali who raised the objection. And when that objection was removed, it was Ali who found a new one, the color. Well, why would Ali want his people to go on starving? Because... Wait, wait. Jean said Ali had told him that the time wasn't ripe. Perhaps in the future. When it could do Ali himself some good. Are you saying Ali has ideas of his own? If Prince Lutov is overthrown, and he could be, if the people get hungry enough... Does Ali get the top spot then? And then, as the new ruler, Ali can claim heaven showed him a new grass, and henceforth purple will be the color favored by the gods. But there's one thing. Where would he get the grass? With Jean dead. But he could come to you with a brand new story. No, no. The woman thing is too deeply rooted. Well, as it stands right now, well, what is the grass? Where does it exist? <laughs> the grass is a box full of seeds, plus volumes of notes detailing hundreds of experiments, how it's formed, how it should be planted. Well, where is all this stuff? I turned it over to Gene. It should all be in his files at home. And I'll bet it's gone. <laughs> I delivered the seeds and the notes to him myself. The only place he could keep them would be in these files. Are you sure they wouldn't be anywhere else? I'm positive. Besides, look at the notation on this drawer. P.C. Purple Clover. And the drawer is empty. Well, that's that. What does that mean? We have a very good hypothesis, but no evidence. So far, you are still the best suspect. But you know I am innocent. There must be some way we can prove that Ali is... Ah, uh, I have an idea. I'll go to see Prince Ali, and I'll confront him with what we know. That will force him to threaten me, perhaps to try to kill me. You can save me at the last minute. It's not going to work. Why? Because this is a country of laws. What you're suggesting is illegal. Why is it illegal? Because it's considered entrapment. But you see it all the time in the movies. And those movies all end up before the judge throws the evidence out of court. An idea. What idea? It's a very simple routine idea. Now you go home and wait there. What are you going to do? Just police business. Just go home and wait. But I can't wait. You'll just have to. No, Sahiba. I'm really quite embarrassed. Your younger brother is plotting against you. Ali? Oh, that is impossible. The woman is mad. Ali wants your people to starve so they will revolt. You will be killed, he succeeds you, and then he gives them the purple grass. That's a lie. Fabulous. It's true. He has discouraged you from accepting the clover. Why? He wants to give it to the people himself. She's mad. Oh, what a woman. Look at the fire in her eyes. Uh, you may think I'm young for you, Professor, 
But I value an older woman. Don't you understand the implications of what I am saying to you? Be my first wife. The others don't matter. They're only concubines. You will rule, and with fabulous wisdom. I'm telling you about your brother. Oh, I know he's plotting against me. It is expected of brothers. You knew? Didn't I plot against our older brother? Then you should have done something about me when you had the chance. What are you doing with that pistol? She'll be blamed. She'll be thought mad because of her purple grass. She's already killed her lover. And now you. Because you made her give up her discovery. No, it's not going to work that way at all. Just lower that gun. That's nice. Why'd you come here, Augusta? Because I... Because you didn't think I could help you, huh? Well, I thought I... I just went back for a search warrant. All we have to do is find the seeds and the notes in his possession. Will we find them, Allie? I don't... They are in his trunk. You knew, Lutov? Of course I knew. I planned to take care of you as soon as we return to our own country. Here, I am restricted by all kinds of legalities. Prince, I intend to arrest your brother. Will you claim any diplomatic privilege? None at all. The law is sacred... It must be observed. Smitty, go get his trunk. Wilson, take him to the station house. Well, Professor Sanderson, shall you consider my proposal? She can't do that. She has to come along with me. Where are we going? This way, ma'am. Where are you taking me? Surely I'm not under arrest. Now, listen. You, uh, you'd consider going off to Asia with that, uh, that character? Oh, uh, I have to take it under very serious consideration. Why? It's the first time anyone at all made me a proposal. Well, relax. You're about to get another one. And she did. Maybe he wasn't the man of her dreams, or she of his... But you don't marry dreams. You marry reality. And reality can be much more satisfying. We'll have more reality when I return in just a few moments. How slender a thread holds up the world. If a million goats can each give an extra pint of milk a day, that can mean the difference between life and death for thousands of children. The true heroes are the overlooked and unknown heroes who probe daily to solve the really great mystery. How to get an acre to yield another few bushels, or a hen to lay another egg. Little things and those little things will eventually make or break the world. Our cast included Sandy Dennis, Ralph Bell, Arnold Stang, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. You have to leave. Answer me one thing first. Anything. You won't let whatever happens change you you'll stay the way you are why should i change supposing i wasn't alive oh sir then i wouldn't be alive either it isn't always that easy to die sarah sarah what are you talking about promise me darling if anything happens just just keep on being my same loving kind gentle alvin what crazy talk is this i'm i'm alvin freiberg i'm i'm 30 years old if i don't know what i am now i'm in sad condition i'm only thinking of the future oh, the devil with the future we're living now that's just the trouble my darling we're not radio mystery theater was sponsored in part by sign off the sinus medicines and anheuser bush incorporated brewers of budweiser this is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, play.
pleasant dreams? young actors in America. Myself. And I'm getting rich. Oh, really? You've been acting on the stage in New York? <laughs> Not exactly. You see, Edwin, I'm very good at disguises. So I act our little part. I'm a young Englishman, a college student, what have you, to induce gentlemen of means to play cards with me. Card playing. That's where the money is. <laughs> Mystery drama, The Cabinet of the Unsolved, is adapted from a story by Conan Doyle, especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis, and stars Robert Dryden. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. the cause of woe. Perversity, pig-headedness, obstinacy, all these principles of evil can lead a young man down a path from which there is no turning or returning. We are all born into this world the same way, but the roads we choose are too often our undoing, to which Inspector John Hilliard of Scotland Yard can well testify. There is a display cabinet at the yard marked unsolved. In it are items of clothing, weapons, empty bottles of poison, a parasol, even a pocket Bible. Evidence still insufficient to bring the guilty of various crimes to justice. I had in my hand a letter just received, which at long last might be the key to solving the Manchester Express murder. A case which began in London's Euston Station at half past four o'clock one blustery March afternoon. Are you taking the Manchester Express, sir? Yes, we are. First class coach, please. Are you the train guard? I am. If you and your lady will follow me, I'll find your compartment. Oh, one that is empty, if you please. My wife doesn't wish to be disturbed during the journey. I will if I can. But the five o'clock in Manchester is generally crowded. Hey, here we are. Hey, let's try this compartment door, shall we? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, sir. I'm looking for a vacant compartment for this lady and gentleman. That, that was a smoking compartment. That man in there was smoking a cigar. The lady cannot abide smoking. We'll give it another try. If we have to look sharp, the train's about to leave. Ah, oh, this one is vacant, sir. May I hand you up your Gladstone bag? No, never mind. Well, in you go, madam. You'll have the entire compartment to yourselves. Now, you, sir, you sure you don't want a hand with that bag? I said no. Now, shut the door. Moppy! Moppy! The station is Moppy! Hey, thank you, Jam. 
trains five minutes late. We'll make it up before she pulls into Manchester. I say that, you know, that one of your compartment doors is open right behind you there. Uh, one in first class. Huh? Did someone just get off? Not at all. This door was open when you rose rolling in. Hey, let's have a look, huh? Uh, that's strange. There was a man with his cigar in there at Houston. Uh, nobody in here now. A short, red-faced man with a black beard smoking a big cigar. Oh, that's why I put the gentleman and lady in the next compartment. Oh, let's ask them. Perhaps they know something. Oh, my lord. Will you look at this? Is he dead? There's a hole where the heart is. A bullet hole, I warn you. Lying there. Such a young fella. Did he get on at Houston? Well, not to my knowledge. I've never seen this unfortunate young man before. As I say, I, I know I put a gentleman and a lady in his compartment. Are you quite sure, Jim? A lady? Well, look up there over your head. What do you see? Ladies' parasol. Oh, you're taller than I am. Would you reach it down from the luggage rack? Oh, yes, yes. That's the parasol she was carrying. Huh. Three missing persons in a corpse. Oh, I can't let the train go on to Manchester now. Oh, you're right. Yeah. What are you going to say, Jim? Well, not to expect the express to be on time today. And right quick to get on to Scotland Yard. That was how I got into the case. Three hours later, I was in Maltby. I identified myself as from Scotland Yard and found Jim Sloan, the Manchester Express train guard. He took me to the scene of the crime. Well, there's your body inspector here. Just as uh, the Maltby station master now found it. We haven't touched the thing. Mm -hmm. I'd say the bullet penetrated the heart at close range. Death must have been instantaneous. All right, let's have a go through the man's pockets. Oh, goodness. Look at this, Mr. Sloan. Two gold watches in his waistcoat. He has another watch in his ticket pocket. Oh, is there a ticket, Inspector? Uh, I haven't run across it yet. Another watch in the breast pocket. Oh, that's not all. Look here. This leather strap round his left wrist. There's a watch there also. Six watches. Oh, well, I'd venture to say this man was a pickpocket. Mm, that might explain it. On the other hand, no. No? These two watches are American make. So is this one. Ah, huh, they all are. Rochester Watch Company. Mason Watches, Elmira, New York. Ah. Well, now we're finding a few interesting items. A small circular mirror. A silver box with matches. One brown leather cigar case. Hmm. I'd say whatever led to the young gentleman's death, the motive was certainly not robbery. And no railway ticket? No ticket. And as far as I can see, back of his shirt, inside his jacket, no marking or labels whatsoever. The two you put in here, what luggage did they carry on at Euston Station? In London? Well, let's see, the gentleman carried a large gladstone and, oh, he was quite definite about not letting me handle it. Uh, and the lady, all she had was that parasol there. Ah, yes, on the seat. Is that where you found it? Uh, no. No, I'm sorry, we did move it. The station master took it down from the luggage rack at my request. I'm, oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, Will you be needing me any further, Inspector? Mm. Oh, yes, yes. But I'll have the yard notify the Northern Railway people that I want you to remain here in Maltby. There'll be an inquest and we shall need your evidence. Is Inspector Elliot here? Uh, yes, Coroner Willoughby. We're ready to give evidence at this inquest. Thank you, Inspector. Will you lead off? Uh, we of the Yard have concluded that a crime has been committed. Assault and murder. We found no weapon in the compartment. Ah, oh, yes. That disposes of any suicide theory. Quite. Inspector, we have a report here concerning the weapon used. From the bullet obtained in the deceased, it appears to be of small caliber, fired at fairly close range. Do you confirm this? Absolutely. Anything to add, Inspector? 
Mm, at this point, only pure speculation. Sir? The question of how or why three passengers could leave a moving train, one of them getting on the train during the run between London and Maltby. I plan to go into that, Inspector. You may step down, sir. Will the train guard, James Sloan, please step forward? Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Coroner. Present. Regarding the inspector's speculation, do you have anything to add? Oh, you mean you'd like me to repeat what I told you before the inquest began? If you would be so kind. Well, the Manchester Express does make one very brief stop before Maltby. And where is that? Uh, at Monmouth. Oh, to put on some mail. And, uh, Mr. Sloan, did you see anyone get on or off the train at Monmouth? Well, I didn't, but I was fairly occupied loading the mail. Oh, the express make no other stops before you reach Motby? Oh, no, sir. Oh, there's one spot where we slow up between uh, Pettisford and Chelney. Oh, we're making repairs there on the tracks. At that point, we lower our speed to eight, nine miles an hour. Well, would you say, Mr. Sloan, that at that place it might be possible for a man or even for a particularly active woman to have left the train without serious injury? Well, I would say it was possible, yes, sir, Mr. Coroner. Of course, perhaps not unobserved, sir. Well, who could have seen them? Well, Betty's 40s an hour out of London, we left Houston at five. That will make it six-ish. It's possible, uh, possible the railroad gang of plate layers might still have been working there. Uh, Mr. Corner, may I add something here? Well, certainly. You are the station master in Maltby, isn't it so? Yes, sir. Oh, I spoke to the foreman of the railroad gang, but they saw nothing. Oh, so it's the view of you gentlemen, I take it, that someone might have jumped off the train on scene or jumped on. Uh, Coroner, that is our view as well. At six o'clock or so, it is fairly dark this time of year. There's probably an embankment. Oh, oh yes, sir. Right, right along there, sir. A steep embankment. Uh, which could have served to screen anyone from sight. Uh, may I suggest, Coroner, that we recess this hearing until I've had the opportunity to actually walk the distance between... Uh, uh, where did you say the two spots were, Sloan? Uh, Pettis, Ford and Kelney. Ah, yes. It is also quite possible that along that route we may discover the murder weapon. <laughs> How far have we come, Sloan? Well, I'd say from down here, Inspector, uh, checking the markers on the tracks up there, we walk a bit over three miles. Another mile or so, we'll, we'll be at Paddy's fault. Uh, we've been walking quite the reverse of the direction the express took, right? Going due south. Oh, yes, Inspector. Where we started walking at Tony is where the Manchester Express again picks up its normal speed. Now... In about a hundred yards or so is where the train slows up for the track gang. Ah, well, we haven't run across them. Oh, well, no. It's Sunday, sir. Nobody works on Sunday. <laughs> so it is. You keeping your eyes open, Sloan? Oh, indeed I am, sir. If there's a gun lying somewhere along here, it won't escape me. Uh, wait a minute. What's this? Oh, it's a pocket Bible, sir. Well, well, well. Uh, what's it say inside? Ah, uh, printed by the Bible Society, London. Uh -huh. To my beloved Mary, on our wedding day. But the date is obscured, smudged. Mm. Under that, for Michael from Mary, August 10th, 1865. And then a third inscription, for Edwin from his loving father. No date. All first names. Ah, oh, it's too bad. Oh, why is that, sir? This Bible might belong to anybody. No way of identifying to whom it belongs. Oh, well, let's keep on walking. Well, well, Inspector, look there. Those, those marks on that big flat rock. Ah, Sloan... I think you found something. Is it dirt? Uh... I wouldn't take an oath on it, but those stains are not very old. Someone was badly hurt here. I'd say those marks 
of blood. Nothing can be more frustrating to students of sleuthing than mysterious disappearances. Couple that with a corpse that rode a train without a ticket, and you've got reason for a lot of head-scratching by Inspector John Hilliard. Does he come up with splinters or solutions? Wait and see when we return with Act Two. saying, for want of a nail, the shoe is lost. For want of a shoe, the horse is lost. For want of a horse, the rider is lost. What does that tell us? Don't overlook the tiniest detail. It is that ability to probe and to question that has made Inspector Hilliard his reputation. And sometimes you add up two and two and four is not the answer. Inspector Hilliard, are you prepared for the resumption of our inquest into murder discovered in a first-class compartment of the Manchester Express? I am, and I am not. Aren't we being a little cryptic, Inspector? Coroner Willoughby, we found no identification or manufacturer's labels on the garments worn by the deceased. No papers, some money, a strange, small, circular mirror... And six American pocket watches. Well, have you any theory how the deceased came to be inside the train compartment and yet apparently not visible when the train guard let in the gentleman and the lady? Yes, I have. He could have been concealed under the seat, which leads me to the second part of the theory. After the train left Euston Station in London, choosing to remain where he was, possibly the deceased overheard some secrets which were of such a guilty nature that the man and woman dragged the victim from his hiding place and killed him. You put the death then down to an accident of mating? Not the means. That was quite deliberate. But it is hardly likely the three could have met in that compartment by design, since Mr. Slow and the train guard was the one who opened the door of the compartment for them. The compartment he had intended them to occupy was taken by a gentleman smoking. A gentleman who at this point is also missing. Ah, uh, quite. Inspector Hilliard, I understand you've found a pocket Bible and traces of what may be blood on a stone during your examination of the train embankment. Ah, uh, yes, yes we have. Uh, but so far as I can see at present, there's no connection with your coroner's inquiry here. The small Bible could have been dropped there by anyone... And even if the stains are identified as human, where would that lead us? I agree. Insufficient evidence to be meaningful to the purposes of this inquest. Anything else? I'm afraid not at this time. In view of that, Inspector, we would have no reason to alter or amend the coroner's verdict of murder by a person or persons unknown. Which brings us up to date. There, right before me, was the yard's display cabinet representing crimes unsolved, filled with what the Maltby coroner had said was insufficient evidence to be meaningful. The parasol, the pocket Bible, the small mirror, the watches, the bullet taken from the deceased, but no gun, no fingerprints, no culprit. In short, no case. That is, until this morning, when I received this letter in my hand. Dear gentlemen of Scotland Yard, the last time I was in London, I was particularly fascinated by your display cabinet in the main hallway marked Cases Unsolved. I would imagine the case, case of, of the, the Manchester, Manchester Express, Express murder. murder. And whatever evidence you have collected is now in that cabinet. Perhaps after you've read this letter, you can mark that case solved. My people came from England, immigrating to the States in the 1850s, and settled in the town of Rochester, New York, where my father ran a dry goods store. We were only two sons, my younger brother, Timothy, and I. And one unfortunate day, out of the blue, my mother was stricken and died. My father, who loved her very much, went to pieces and suffered a stroke. Good morning, Father. How did you sleep? Uh, what time is this? 
Oh, my goodness, I've overslept. There's a store. The doctor said the best thing for you to do is rest and take care of your heart. Uh, my heart. She took it with her when she died. Uh, my beloved wife. Uh, Edwin, on the window seat is her little testament. The one she used to take to church. Uh, bring it here. Uh, I see it. I, I want you to have it, Edwin. Dearest Mary would want you to have it. When we were first married, I... I gave it to her. Uh, never be without it. Do you promise? I promise. Not that you need prayers as much as your brother. That Timothy, that boy. Uh, you think you can take care of him? Of course I can, Father. Now, don't you worry about Timothy. Uh, now, you remember he's ten years younger than I am. And even though he's a senior in high school, I can still take him across my knee if he gets out of line. Uh, that's good. He's a wild boy. It's really about my younger brother, Timothy, that I'm writing you, gentlemen of Scotland Yard. He barely got through high school by the skin of his teeth. And then suddenly... He left home and went to New York City. My father was never again able to get out of bed. He'd ask about Timothy and I'd make up stories about what a good job he had in the big city and so on. And then, one night... Timothy! Oh, come on in. Well, hello, Brother Edwin. I want you to meet my friend, Mac McGuire. Well, come in, both of you. Well, thank you. <laughs> you see, Mac? I told you we'd be welcome. Well, how have you been, Edwin? Aren't you going to ask after Father? Of course I will. How is he, by the way? Well, he's had two more heart shocks. I keep him in bed. Oh, I know how it is. My father had a coronary and passed on when I was quite young. Ours is still alive, but barely. Oh, he asks after you every day, Timothy. Of course, he has no idea what you're up to in New York City. And do you? Well, I have a pretty good idea. You sound like I was doing something criminal. Mac and I play cards. That's all we do. We give card-playing lessons. <laughs> You'd be surprised how much people will pay to learn that they have a lot to learn. Oh, Timothy. I want you to know, Edwin. Uh, may I call you Edwin? By all means. I try to take good care of Timothy here. Believe me, he's almost like a brother to me. I tell Edwin some of my accomplishments, Mac. Uh, brother Edwin, you see before you one of the finest young actors in America. Myself. Really? Well, you've been acting on the stage in New York? <laughs> Not exactly. Oh, he is very good at disguises, your brother is. He acts out little parts, pretends to be different people in order to induce gentlemen of means to join in a game of cards. It's a lot more fun than being a storekeeper, Edwin. Why did you come back to Rochester? Oh, just to have a place to rest our weary bones until the heat's off. Well, some of your card-playing clientele didn't feel they got their money's worth, huh? Look, Brother Edwin, we didn't come here to be criticized. I don't like the tone of your voice. Well, let me remind you, Brother Timothy. I'm still ten years older than you are and a lot heavier. I can still give you one good thrashing. Now, you and Mr. McGuire are welcome to stay here for a time, but I warn you. Try any of your card-sharping tricks in this town, and I'll hand you over to the police so fast it'll make your head swim. Brother or no brother? Father wanted to see Timothy, so we went up to his bedroom. I'll say this. It did a lot for him. Timothy was always the favorite. But he and Mac McGuire hadn't been in town a week when I got a call from the police. Timothy had been arrested for passing a forged check. I said I was sorry, didn't I? Being sorry isn't good enough, Timothy. I needed the money. Mac and I had this pigeon all staked out. He was aching for a game, just begging to have his feathers You plucked. needed a bankroll to cheat someone, and you didn't care how you got it. That's irresponsible, Timothy. I know I'm unreliable and crazy. And downright crooked. Now, I've squared it away with the police. The money's being returned. And you're leaving here first thing in the morning. Where's Mac? Your good friend. <laughs> I saw him at the railroad station with his bag. He's smarter than you, Timothy. 
He's gone. I promise. I, I won't do anything like this again. Well, I hope so. But ever since we were kids together, you've left a trail of broken promises ten miles long. Now, brother, you are going to do it my way. What way is that? I'm afraid just taking you as far as New York isn't far enough. I mean, have you any idea what this would do to Father if he ever found out that his son was almost jailed for passing a bum check? And I wouldn't like him to find that out. Well, I guarantee you, he's not going to. I'll straighten out, I promise. Well, I'm not waiting for that. You're going to do as I say, or I'll take you down to headquarters right now, tell them I've changed my mind, and let them throw the book at you. <laughs> The next morning, I got a nurse from the hospital to come in and take care of Father. Told my assistant I'd be gone for a few days and to keep the store running. And I brought Timothy down to New York. I had a friend there, an exporter of American watches who needed a representative in England. Now, the idea of going to London appealed to Timothy. He had no trouble in talking himself into the job and agreed to go to London with a full case of samples at 15% commission on all sales. I remained with Timothy in New York until the boat sailed. Well, there goes the all ashore signal. Edwin, thanks a lot for everything. I promise you I'm turning over a brand new leaf and become an honest man. Well, I hope so. And I know Father will be pleased as anything when I tell him you've got yourself a good job. Now, you take good care of him, will you, Edwin? And I'll do my part. I, I promise you I'll never again hold a deck of cards in my hand. Now, don't make any promises you can't keep. I can. I can. Uh, wait. Wait, over there. By the lifeboats. Isn't that... It's McGuire. Who? Uh, Mr. McGuire. Uh, Mr. McGuire, will you come over here? Why, of all people, Timothy, what are you doing on this ship? Well, I'm going to London. Uh, now, isn't that a coincidence? So am I. Timothy, you lied. You had no intention of going straight, did you? Are you going to London also, Edwin? Now that you mention it, Mr. McGuire, that may not be such a bad idea. Yes, yeah, so I'll go and find the purser to see if I can share a cabin with my dear brother. Edwin, are you going to nursemaid me across the Atlantic all the way to London? It's a toss-up between that, Timothy, or my informing the police that you're on board. It takes a bit of doing to expose one's brother in the hope you can cure him, save him from himself. A brother is a friend given by nature, to quote the old saying... Let us hope Timothy will believe Edwin is his friend. Or is Timothy's willfulness and crooked bent uncurable? I dread to find out, but find out we shall when I return with Act 3. Oh, where are we? Oh, yes. Standing beside Inspector John Hilliard in front of a display in Scotland Yard of evidence relating to crimes unsolved. In his hand is a letter, perhaps the key to a mystery that has plagued the Yard for years. Three passengers disappeared from the Manchester Express one day, leaving only a corpse behind them and not enough clues for a solution. The word evidence derives from the Latin meaning to see more. Perhaps this letter the inspector is reading will enable him to see more. Gentlemen of Scotland Yard, if I have gone into some detail, it is because I want you to understand the predicament I was in. The ship sailed, and I, I shared, shared the cabin, cabin with, with my, my brother. brother. But as the days went on, I realized my hands were tied. Timothy had decided on the easy way, the wrong way to riches, and, well, he thought me a sanctimonious fool. Are you going to follow me all over the world, St. Edwin? Watch over me as if I were a child? Surely you must feel just a little bit idiotic. I'll tell you what I feel. I feel ashamed. I thank the Lord Mother's not with us any longer, and that Father need never know what his favorite son turned out to be. Now, if your lecture is over, I'd like to join some friends in the salon. Oh, Timothy, listen, please. Look, here's Mother's little Bible, remember? The one she used to take to church. Yes, I remember. Oh, for her sake, give it up, this, this life of yours. You still can. Put your hand on Mother's Bible and 
And this time, promise. Mac is waiting for me. I'd like to go now. You have a good job in London. You're a good salesman. I'm not cut out to be a salesman. Father was, you are, but not me. Then why did you take this job? Why not? The old fool paid my passage. I always wanted to travel the Atlantic on a steamship. Mac said we could clean up from Block Island to Southampton. I couldn't give up. Somehow, I, I had to make Timothy see the air of his ways. In the ship's salon, I found him and that McGuire playing poker with two passengers. Two, two lambs about, about to, to be, be fleeced. fleeced. I knew that if I didn't warn them, I was no better than an accomplice. Gentlemen of Scotland Yard, as I walked over to the table, I kept saying to myself, this is the right thing to do. I'm not being a Judas betraying my brother. I'm saving him while there is still time. Hello, Edwin. Gentlemen, may I interrupt this game for a moment? No, you may not. Go away. We're playing and we do not wish to be disturbed, your dear Timothy. Please, Edwin, will you go away? Now, don't make a nuisance of yourself. Timothy, will you get your brother out of uh, here? This gentleman is Mac McGuire. Have you been introduced? You see, Mr. McGuire is one of the most notorious card sharpers in the United States. Fool, but you meddlesome idiot. Oh, I'd be glad to. I'll sue you for slander. Will somebody fetch a captain? Oh, uh, Mr. McGuire, if you will turn up your right sleeve to the shoulder... Well, well, go on. Don't you wish to sue me for slander? Well, go on, Timothy. Don't stop dealing the cards on my account. Why, gentlemen, look what we have here. Indeed, what have I picked up from my brother's lap? Well, do you know what this round little mirror is, gentlemen? Give that back to me. Oh, certainly, Timothy. Take it. Well, gentlemen, let, let me tell you how it works. One sits back a bit from the table, lays the mirror face up on the lap, and as you deal, ha <laughs> why, you can see the face of every card you give your adversary. You see, one can learn a great deal about card sharping if one's brother is in the business. I'm getting out of here. The game's over, gentlemen. As I write this letter so many years later, I recall that Timothy was very quiet and reserved as we arrived in London. I installed him in a flat, and he seemed quite shaken by the scandal aboard ship. Or so I thought. He started the rounds of selling his American watches, and I was delighted he appeared to enjoy his work. It seemed to me he'd turn the corner, and I decided I could safely return to Rochester. I went along to the steamship line, purchased my ticket, and returned to the flat. Well, who just walked in the door if it isn't Brother Edwin? McGuire. What are you doing here? He's helping me pack, can't you see? Where are you going, Timothy, and why? Well, it's rather a long story, dear brother, and we don't have the time to tell it. A little problem has presented itself, so we thought this might be a good time to go up north and enjoy the country air. Have you been up to your old tricks with McGuire again? I thought you promised me that you would... We met purely by accident and just happened to get into a little game at the railroad hotel. Stupid loudmouth, all that shouting just because one of them bent down to tie his shoelace and found an extra ace on the floor. Hurry up, Timothy. Trains wait for no man. Tim's not leaving here. If he's broken the law, it's about time he paid for it. I'm locking this door. Give me that key, Brother Edwin. Not only silly. Take your hands off me. Give me that key. came to. McGuire and Timothy were gone. I thought I'd heard Timothy say something about the Manchester Express. I pulled myself together and hailed a cab to Houston Station. The Express had not yet left. I promised myself I'd go all the way to Manchester, find my brother, and do everything in my power to get him back on the straight and narrow. I found a compartment at the smoking inn got inside, lit up a cigar, and waited for the train to leave. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I was looking for an unoccupied compartment for this gentleman and lady. There's a man smoking in there. No, no, that won't do. The lady cannot abide smoking. Find us another one. It was McGuire, disguised. And standing behind him in a long cape was Timothy, made up to look like a woman. A wig and a black veil down his face. 
His disguise, complete with ladies' parasol, didn't fool me for a moment. When we stopped at Mammoth to take on mail, I quickly changed compartments. Uh, there were no corridors between compartments like on American trains. The doors opened only to the platform. But nobody saw me. I should have locked our compartment door. Didn't I tell you, Timothy? Brother Edwin would find his way in here. Well, how's your jaw? Timothy, for heaven's sake, listen to me. I've been listening to you all my life. Preach, preach, preach. That's all I've ever heard. Oh, look at you. Wearing those ridiculous curls, a veil, pretending to be a woman. I had to wear all this. How do you think I could get by the cops? It's good, isn't it? Oh, Timothy, please come to your senses. Are you going to spend all your life cheating and running? Haven't you got more pride? What's happened to you? Oh, do I have to sit here the whole way to Manchester listening to this Boy Scout brother of yours? I'm not talking to you, McGuire. Well, that suits me fine. Just don't cross me. Oh, come on, Mac. You don't have to threaten anybody. He means well. It's just the way he is. You don't see yourself at all, do you, Timothy? The conductor's been around to punch tickets, so I'm taking this stuff off. I'll shove the wig and the veil and the cape into the Gladstone. Where'll I put the parasol? Timothy, you can't go on like this for the rest of your life, stealing people's money and having to skip town. I like this kind of life. There's excitement to it. Oh, you're so stupid, you don't even see that you're being used. Why don't you go run a Sunday school, brother Edwin? Don't listen to him, Timothy. I'm not. I can't breathe this stuff here with you two. What are you doing? Opening this window. Getting some fresh air. Give me that bag. What are you doing? There it goes. Out the window. What did you throw the bag out for? It's got all my costumes in it, everything. If nothing but disguises stands between you and jail, when we get to Manchester, to jail you'll go. Listen, you, he's my partner. You're not going to bully him. If prison's the only way to keep you out of Timothy's life, I'll make sure he gets there. You see this, Brother Edwin? Mac, don't do that. Put that gun away. I'd like you to leave this compartment right now. He can't get out now. The train's moving too fast. Just jump out the window after the bag. You know something, McGuire? You're crazy! I made a jump for McGuire's gun, and it went off, hitting Timothy right in the heart. He fell to the floor. We stood there, horrified. I knelt down and listened. He was dead. At that moment, the train started to slow down. Why, I don't know. McGuire saw his chance to escape, opened the compartment door and jumped. I jumped right after him. He wasn't going to get away from me. The two of us rolled down the embankment. And then I blacked out. When I came to, McGuire was mopping my head where it was cut with a handkerchief. I couldn't leave you out here alone, Brother Edwin. Oh. Oh, my... My head. You stop bleeding now. Oh, I don't understand you. Why aren't you a dozen miles away? Well, now, I couldn't run off with you lying here at the bottom of this embankment. You... You shot Timothy. You had a hand in it. The gun wouldn't have gone off if you hadn't jumped me. Oh, good Lord, forgive me, so I didn't. My head's clearing now. Well, you crashed right into that rock. Oh, why are you still here, McGuire? You should have run away while I was unconscious. Oh, I couldn't do that. I'm a gambler, not a murderer. You could have bled to death. Oh, and that would have made everything so simple for you. Oh, you don't know me at all. The blood of the both of you on my hands in one day. I know you cared for Timothy. But so did I. Maybe by your standards, it was a funny way of showing it. But we didn't mean any harm. We only played men who had money to throw away. I think of Timothy right now. Lying there in that compartment on that train. Alone. Dead, and then I should have... Oh, that I should be the cause of it. Uh, it was my gun. We were both the cause of it. I ask myself, shall I give myself up? I'm ready to. This way, I don't think I'll ever, I'll ever get over his death. How else could I pay for it? Oh, 
But if we do, everyone will know. It'll all come out about him. The news will certainly get back to America. Father will hear of it. It could finish him. And if we each go our own way and, and not ever tell anyone, we'll be punished every day we see the sunshine. Yes, and that may be the greater punishment. There you have it, gentlemen of Scotland Yard. I've come to the end of this letter. From being an avenger of crime, I had become a conspirator against justice. McGuire got out of the country. I went to Cairo, I think. And I returned to Rochester. And unless your methods have changed in the past five years, inspectors, whatever you found on my brother's body, maybe even the Gladstone bag of clothes if some tramp didn't make off with it, Everything, Everything you, you found, found is probably at this very moment in your display cabinet of crimes unsolved. My father passed away six months ago in peace, never knowing what both his sons had done. I have one favor to ask of you. If you have in your possession a pocket Bible, it was my mother's. May I have it back? It's of no use or evidence to anyone but me. Here is my address. Inspector John Hillier unlocked Scotland Yard's Cabinet of the Unsolved and withdrew a small pocket Bible. In its place, he pinned the letter he had been reading. Though the case of the Manchester Express murder was technically solved, it could never be called closed. I shall return shortly. And Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother? And he answered, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? That is a question for all of us to answer in many ways. Are we our brother's keeper? I think we all are. Our cast included Robert Dryden, Bob Caliban, Lloyd Batista, and Ray Owens. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... said, art for the sheer beauty of it, for the ecstatic thrill of that inspired moment of creation, art for the refreshment of the soul and the enrichment of the spirit. Hold on, did somebody just say enrichment? Now, this thing is taking a practical direction, but you know something? Anytime you take art and mix it with money, look out. Somebody is setting somebody up for a hustle, a swindle. Or even a murder. He's gone. 
Don't you understand? He's gone. Sure, he's gone, but he can be found. You know where he went, don't you? Oh, yes, but I don't know how you can go after him. You just tell me where he went. He, he went back into the 16th century. <laughs> mystery drama, The Further You Go, The Less You Know, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mandel Kramer. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. can be born at any time, in any place, to anyone. And all we can really say about geniuses is that they are not like the rest of us. And because geniuses happen to be different, they usually suffer the fate of all who are different. Because in any society, the worst of all crimes is to be different. Enough of philosophy. Let us meet a gentleman named Bridges Barzell. Uh, before we begin, uh, why, sir, are you named Bridges? Why? It's one of them things. In the old days, I'd go over by the East River in New York, you know, and I'd wait for a hit. And just as soon as I'd spot some hayseed rubbernecking the Brooklyn Bridge, I'd hit him with a proposition. You know what I mean? <clears throat> I can't even remember how many times I sold that bridge. But them days are gone. Long gone. Today... The rubes are as smart as you or I. It's tougher to make a living today. But who are you going to complain to? Well, on this particular day, I'm strolling along Broadway, and I see a familiar face. Those deep blue eyes, that honey blonde hair, just everything about her gorgeous. Even her eyebrows. Now, you figure you have to be stuck on a dame if you can make a symphony even about her eyebrows. But can it be? How can she look so good after all these years? And then I hear that voice. Bridges! I take a deep breath. I try to be, uh, you know, kind of uh, offhand. And I say, why, it's Dimple. Yes, Bridges. Well, well, and my, my. How, how are things proceeding, Dimple? Oh, as you predicted. Oh, Bridges, you are a true prophet. Now, just a second. I don't seem to recall. Oh, that... You you said it wouldn't work. Oh. Well, uh, how's Leonard? He's gone, Bridges. He's gone. You mean he walked out on you? Oh, no. He's around, but he's gone. He's around, but he's gone? Dimples, you just lost me. Oh, I lost you a long time ago. I had to choose between you and Leonard, and I chose Leonard. I never do anything right. Sometimes I think I don't know anything. No, Dimples, not you. You always knew what time it was. Oh, I'm in another world. What kind of other world? Can you tell me? I, I want to tell you, but I, I'm scared to tell you. Why? Because you think I'm crazy. <laughs> Let me tell you about Dimples. She used to dance in the floor show of a nightclub on 52nd Street. Back when we used to have nightclubs. Today, you got discotheques. It ain't the same thing. Dimples was my girl. And a guy named Leonard was my best friend. So, I introduced my best friend to my girl. Well, you've seen this picture before, haven't you? Anyhow, me and Dimples are now sitting in this joint... 20 years later. Why are you staring at me, Bridges? Look, I ain't doing too good at this point in time, Dimples, but still, I can leave you have a couple of hundred. Oh, no, Bridges, this isn't a touch. Well, and all, you could use the dough. I don't need any. Dimples, Dimples, that coat of yours, the sleeves are a little bit frayed. Look, you, you, your nails are short. You got smudges on your fingers. Uh, uh, all right, Bridges. You're finding a typewriter, maybe? Maybe. Oh, you had to take a civilian job, huh? Well, I'm too old to dance, Bridges. What's with Leonard and you, anyway? 
You said he was gone, then you said he was here. Well, he, he's both. Uh-huh. And I know it sounds crazy. When I say here, I mean he, he's in the house. Well, then he can't be gone. Oh, how can I explain this, Bridges? He isn't gone as far as space is concerned, but he's gone in time. What do you mean, where is he gone in time? <laughs> he's gone into the 16th century. Now I'm gone. I told you you'd think I was crazy. No, 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 no. no. Keep going. Why, why, why don't we just start at the beginning? Well, it, it began with the guru. The guru? This, this wise man from India. Oh, right off. We know we got a hustle. Oh, that's just it. I'm not sure. I hope it's a hustle because if it isn't, then... Then what? Well, then all bets are off on anything. Tell me about this guru. All right. It's a nice spring day. Leonard and I, we, the two of us, were walking down Fifth Avenue and were saying, oh, you could only get a day like this in New York in May. Get to the guru. Oh, there we are, just enjoying the air. Sure, why not? It's free. And all of a sudden, Leonard squeezes my arm and says... Hey, yeah. Uh, hey, look. Uh, what? Coming toward you. Oh, who? This character, this barefoot clown. Hmm? I... I... I, I don't see a clown. The one wearing the burlap robe with the long stringy hair and the scraggly beard. Get a good look. Why should I? He's the guru. Uh, number one, what guru? Number two, who cares? He is the guru. Sri Huri Chundat Mukherjee. You read about him in all the papers, see him on the TV, hear him on the radio. Everybody comes to him. Yeah, for what? Wisdom. Everybody goes to him for uh, uh, enlightenment. And, and do they get it? Sure. And while he enlightens them, he also lightens their wallets. Oh, why don't I learn his racket? Where are you going? I'm, uh, I'm going to put a few moves on this character. Leonard, come back here. Oh, Guru. Great one. I bow before you. What? Thank you. I too. Am a prisoner of death? Ah, uh, great master. I seek enlightenment. Enlightenment. It eludes us all. Enlightenment. The true quick silver of the universe. Uh, may I come to you, master, and seek wisdom? Yes. You may come to me. All who are troubled may come to me. <laughs> Leonard actually stops this guy on the street? I, I couldn't understand it. But, I don't know, something was bothering him. What? I don't know. He'd get moody and he'd say, I've got something closed up inside me, something that must be free. I never heard Leonard talk like that. Bridges, would you do something for me? W would you come home with me and, and talk to Leonard? What could I tell Leonard? Well, you're the kind of person, I don't know, just... Talking to you can make people feel better. Is that a fact? Oh, sure. Look at me. Well, I feel better already. All right. All right. Leave us go and see what it's doing with Leonard. Oh, Bridges, I, I better tell you right now. Be prepared for a different kind of Leonard. <laughs> Leonard, I'm home. Uh, just be prepared for anything. Anything? Like what? I don't even know. Oh, Leonard... We, we have a guest. Ah, look, uh, buongiorno. We are well met. There is much to be done. The lawsuit... Uh, the... Leonard? Uh, how are you? What did you call me? Huh? Oh, hey, 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 it's you, Bridges, Bridges. After all these years. Hey, great to see you. Uh, no hard feelings, I hope. <laughs> well, there's hard feelings, but we got to learn to live with them. Hey, still up to your old tricks, huh? Well, you know what they say about old dogs. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Dimples, why don't you make us some coffee, huh? All right. I know you boys want to chat. Well, uh... <clears throat> How's tricks, Leonard? Oh, I have a few political problems, Luca. But you know about those. Now, wait a minute. Why, why do you call me Luca? Huh? Oh, yeah. Why, why, why do I... Yeah, I, I seem to keep going back and forth. Yeah, you, you, you just have to disregard a great many things I say. Now, what is this Dimples is telling me? You giving her a hard time? Well, how much did she tell you? Well, nothing I could really hold on to. What's all this about you in the 16th century? 
Oh. And, and, and what's with this uh, this guru hustler? Hey, you should go see him, Bridges. Yeah, sure. So I can become as nutty as you, huh? Come on, Leonard. What's it all about? Well, let's start with this. Do you know who you are? All right, I'll play straight, man. I'm Bridges Barzell. Nah. No? Bridges Barzell is who you think you are. Oh, we're going to play this kind of game. Now, I mean, you and I, what were we? Hustlers, flim-flam artists, con guys, right? Keep going. We made a nice buck. Why? Because we were smart, huh? Well, maybe a little. But why were there always so many suckers? Do you know why it's so easy to trim suckers? I never said it was easy. Oh, it is. It's because everybody, yeah, everybody is 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 seeking something. Seeking desperately for something. And you know what that something is? You know me. I'm a great straight man. Go ahead, tell me, Leonard. What is that something? Everybody is seeking the self. The self. All right. You see, we're born. We die. But what is born? What dies? Look. Leonard, this is getting a little too deep for Everybody me. has a master life. Do you follow this? Not really. The master life. It is that incarnation during which he has discovered the totality of uh, existence. I'm lost, Leonard. Lost. The spirit, having achieved the ultimate understanding, leaves the body and tries to become one with the universe. Leonard, I'm drowning. But the time is not yet, and so it must be born anew in another body to wait. Yeah. And there's supposed to be forgetfulness, but it is never complete. Leonard, is this you? Bridges, I am finally free. I know at last. I know. The guru showed me who I am. Who are you? I have been born again. Recreated. Although, well, realistically, I never died. Yeah? Once again, I walk the world. I think. I dream. I create. But who are you? That is, who do you think you are? Oh, I know who I am. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I'm Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> It's a free country. And the most elementary of all the rights we enjoy here is that of free speech. A man who wants to say he's Leonardo da Vinci, we certainly have to defend his right to say it. However, we also have the right to ask for proof, evidence, facts. And we shall do that in Act Two when I return shortly. extremely familiar way to diagnose madness. Indeed, it's become a cliche. People claim to be Napoleon, or Julius Caesar, or George Washington, or Abe Lincoln. When someone insists, we usually place them in those institutions erected for the purpose. However, we never really come to grips with a basic problem. How do we know they are not telling the truth? We're even now attending such a situation. Who did you say you were? Leonardo da Vinci. I never heard of him. Oh, he was the greatest of all the Renaissance men. I still pass. One of the greatest painters, scholars, thinkers, designers, inventors in all of history. I'm no closer. His uh, incarnation was from 1452 to 1519. His incarnation, huh? Yeah. Ah, uh, Bridges... You don't believe me. No, I don't believe you. But it's true. If that's what you want to believe. But if it's true for me, it's also true for you. What's true for me? If I've come back, then so have you, my closest friend. Come back? From what? From your incarnation. I never knew I had one. Oh, you were my closest friend, my comrade in arms, my, my, my collaborator. Look, Leonard, we may have worked one or two little rackets together. Yeah, but... how we degenerated from the brilliance of the Renaissance. As Leonard Kovacs and Bridges Barzell, we worked minor swindles and petty thieveries. But... As Leonardo da Vinci and Luca Pacioli. <laughs> we were men of genius. 
You know, you were the greatest mathematician in the world. I was. Well, don't you remember? Can I ask you something, Leonard? What have you been drinking? You can't remember how we worked together. Look, Leonard... Without you, I should never have been able to accomplish half of what I did. You know, Leonard, maybe a little fresh country air... You are never accorded the celebration you deserve. Oh, your part in the collaboration has somehow escaped the attention of history. But it wasn't my fault. I swear to you, it wasn't my fault. Sure. Sure, nothing was your fault. You don't hold it against me. No. It was your mathematical formulae, your calculations that enabled me to build mighty fortifications, recast the entire shape of cities. Oh, work with me again, Luca. Sure, sure, Leonard. But first, I have listen. taken some time off to refresh myself. You always called it frivolous. <laughs> but painting is also an art. I never said it was. You think every moment wasted which is not devoted to science. Science is your mistress. Look, uh, a shrew of a mistress. There are other things in life. Leonard, I think we better have a talk. Ah, you and your talks. I... I am painting her again. Who? <laughs> you know who? Her. She's here. The three of us are here. Zanobi's wife. Zenobi? Zenobia del Giaconda. You know him. He married that uh, Neapolitan girl, Lisa. The minute I laid my eyes on her, I knew I had to paint her. Okay, Leonard, okay. Luca, old friend, you... You have got that look in your eye. Look, my name isn't Luca. It's Percy Reginald Barzell, also doing business as Bridges. Ah, now, now Luca... don't interrupt. I listen to you. I am not Luca Pachi, whatever his name is, and you are Leonard Kovacs. You were born in Brooklyn. You are not this Leonardo da Vinci, whoever he was. Now, is all that clear? Uh, you don't understand. I understand what to do with a nut. Now, there are those people who say go along with him, humor him. Not me. Won't do you any good. So leave a snap out of it already, huh? Poor Bridges. You think I'm crazy? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Come, Bridges. Step in here. Where? I have a little studio. I fixed it up for myself. I have something to show you. I want you to look at this. Now, Bridges. Eh? What do you call that? That was a canvas. You know, what artists paint on. And I could see that it was a picture of a woman. Kind of young. It wasn't finished. But it looked familiar. Very familiar. And then I knew what it was. Everybody in the whole world knew what it was. Even a mug like me. It was that painting they called the Mona Lisa. I don't get it. What is it you don't get? Look, I, I always knew you could draw pictures. But this thing... Now I know who this Da Vinci was. He was the artist that painted that Mona Lisa. Oh, what have I been telling you? But he already done it. I know. Then why are you doing it again? Because I want to do it again. But it's already in some museum in France. The Louvre. Wherever. I did two of them. You know? Yeah. You know you were there. Oh, boy. Can you imagine the impact on the world when this painting is shown? Another Mona Lisa. Another Da Vinci. <laughs> it will be worth millions. Oh, your, your coffee's ready, Phyllis. In a while, Madame Lisa. Sit. I want you to pause. Oh, but I... I think... have something to prove to our friend here. Uh, where is the tape recorder? Uh, ah, uh, turn it on. Remember... She always needed music to help her hold that expression. Uh, I just want to mix these pants. Look, I, I really have to be gone. Ah, look, uh, you were always bored by painting. No, 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 I really have to go. I have to meet this guy. Stay, it won't be long. Now, Madonna Lisa, smile. No, 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 not with your lips, with your, with your soul. Uh, you see, see, look, old friend. In her face is that haunting, enigmatic charm. You mean to say that dimples 
is posing for that picture? Uh, you call her dimples if it pleases you. Oh, that's her name. In her present incarnation. But her master life was as Madonna Lisa del Gioconda. But she don't look nothing at all like the Mona Lisa. Uh, strictly speaking, neither did Madonna del Gioconda. The face that you look at is not the face that uh, I see. Yeah, but... What I paint is the picture I see from the, the inner light. It is my own, my unique, my, my vision. Oh, I remember how we used to argue about art. It's good to have these talks again. Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> Leonard, like I said, i got to meet this guy. You will be back. Oh, sure, sure. I'll be back. What was that to say? The guy had completely lost his mind. Poor Dimples. The next day she comes up to my place. She was almost in tears. Oh, you've got to help me, Bridges. You've got to. Well, Dimples, what can I do? Oh, you used to be one of the smartest guys on the street. Can't you think of something? Yeah, if only I could, but I don't know what. It's not bad enough he's Leonardo da Vinci, but I have to be the Mona Lisa. You were also in the act as an old buddy of his. Dimples, you have to face it. He's gone. Oh, no, you've got to help me. After all, it's your fault. My fault? Yes. If, if you hadn't introduced me to him, I'd never have met him, never have fallen in love with him, never have married him. I'd have married you and lived happily ever after. You've got to make up for it. You owe it to me. I don't know if you ever win any arguments with dames. But I knew I had to do something. So I decided to get at the roots of the problem. Now, the whole thing started with this guru. Maybe that was the answer. So I tracked him down. He had this temple, you know? Well, not really a temple. It was more like a great big hall. Everybody sat around. And they cooked beans. And they meditated. Also, there were some people who were standing on their heads. Finally, I got to see the old boy himself. He was behind a big curtain. Ah, yes. Oh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Guru, if that's your name. Uh, what is the name? We listen to it and we do not hear it. We touch and do not find it. It is the vague and the elusive. Read it and you will not see its head. Follow it and you shall not see its back. What did I get myself into? You seek enlightenment. Yeah. What have you done to my boy? The words are spoken. They fly like swallows. Yesterday's rain clouds were in the west. Leonard Kovacs. And I want the truth. True words are not beautiful. Beautiful words are not true. You could slice it up any way you like. Ask this not of me. Speak rather with Luca Pacioli. Oh, no, no, no. I've been through that bit. You may have convinced him he's Leonardo da Vinci. But let me tell you this out front. I know that I am not Luca Pacioli. A wise man does not know. He who knows is not a wise man. You know something, Guru? We could keep this up all day. All I want to do is to try to make a certain little lady happy. Happiness comes from being, and being comes from non-being. Could we talk English? Now, what do you want with Leonard? I have returned Leonard to his master reincarnation. Let's stick to the facts. What's in all this for you? You? Hi, Leonard. We are all reeds that blow in the wind, and we yearn for wisdom. But can it be heard in the songs of the swallows? It beats me. Wisdom is the air we breathe. Yeah, whatever you say. One thing I can't figure out. What's in it for you? Leonard doesn't have any real dough. You are wise, and your eyes have seen. Yeah. He has the Mona Lisa. Look, pal, let's lay it on the line. That thing he's painting, you know, that ain't the real Mona Lisa. But my positive friend, it is. Yeah, who says so? You would be surprised to learn how many would say so. It will be hailed. There are those who will clamor to own it. To own it? In other words, to buy it? The exchange of gold for inspiration is the way the rich support the gifted. Bingo. And big casino. 
Just say that one shiny word and it all falls into place. Gold. Mr. Guru, I bow to one of the master hustlers of all time. Are we finally getting a little daylight in here? It's hard to say. Of course, that word gold, money, is what could make everything fall into place. But how? Is Leonard Kovacs really the reincarnation of Leonardo da Vinci? Is Dimples the reincarnation of Madonna Lisa del Giaconda? And fight it though he will, is Bridges truly the reincarnation of Luca Pacioli? Three questions for Act Three in just a few minutes. is alive today, managed to be born once. So that's no great accomplishment. The real trick is to be born twice. Well, we have the Guru Sri Huri Chundat Mukherjee working on it. And so far, he seems to be doing a pretty good job on Leonard Kovacs. The Mona Lisa. So that's the gimmick. This Mona Lisa by... Leonardo da Vinci. Let's concentrate, Guru. You can convince my boy Leonard that he is the incarnation of Leonardo da Vinci. He knows how to draw and paint. He always did, and he's good. So maybe you can convince him that he's painting the Mona Lisa. The wise man listens and sleeps. But before that happens, just answer me this. How are you going to convince everybody else? The nightingale warbles in the courtyard of the temple. A passing stranger has his stone in his shoe. In other words, you're not talking, huh? He who knows does not speak. He who speaks, he does not know. But I know you're setting up a swindle. Friendship is the celestial manifestation of the eternal love. Now, what are you driving at? Luca Pacioli. These words are for thee. Oh, no. You dialed the wrong number there, chum. I am not Luca Pacioli. Who is Luca Pacioli? Uh-oh. We look in the mirror, we see the shadow. And the foolish man points and says, Behold, his eye. Yeah. Well, it's been good talking to you, girl. You are Luca Pacioli to the incarnation of Leonardo da Vinci. If he believes you to be Luca, then this is the shadow he sees in the mirror. Tell me something, Brother Guru. As one hustler to another, why is it so important for me to be this guy, uh, Luca Pacioli? Luca Pacioli is the alter ego of Leonardo. And thus, all men are too. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'm hanging in there. Not by much, but I'm in there. And I certainly hope you bring it off. And that everyone makes a buck. Now, obviously, the scheme called for this thing to be painted. And then to be sold as a genuine Mona Lisa. Okay. There could be millions in it. But how would you get it past the experts? Well, I knew an expert. And I decided to ask her. Now, hold the phone. I know what you're thinking. Where would I come off knowing an art expert, huh? Well, you see, one time a picture got stolen from this big gallery, and the punk that did it was in over his head. So he asked me to, uh, you know, kind of negotiate for him. And that's how I got to meet this Miss Threshold. Another Mona Lisa? <laughs> well, there's no record that Da Vinci ever painted another. But it could be possible. Anything could be possible. All right, now leave us say a guy comes to you and says, I got here a Mona Lisa that was painted by the old boy himself. What would happen? How could you tell it was real? Well, it would have to be in the style of Da Vinci. The techniques, the brushwork. Uh-huh. But, of course, the painting would have to be very close to 500 years old. Yeah. And, therefore, the canvas, the pigments, the oils would all have to show their great age. 
And there are scientific dating methods. Well, is there a way that uh, you could counterfeit that? No. Well, perhaps. <laughs> to try to palm something off as an authentic Da Vinci, it's just too difficult. I see. Why, Bridges? Are you thinking of doing it? I went into an art store and I bought me a very good reproduction of the Mona Lisa by Da Vinci. And I studied it. Then I went back to Leonard's place. And there he was hard at work with dimples posing. And I studied what he was doing. It wasn't finished yet. But I could tell it was going to look just like the real thing. And I was starting to get just a little bit scared. I mean, maybe I didn't know all the answers. Ah, look, old friend. So you have come by to see the work, eh? Yeah? Mm. It goes, it goes. Yeah, it looks pretty good. <laughs> I have made a believer of you at last. You no longer come to chide me for wasting my time with the palette and brush. Well, look, uh, Leonard, I hope it turns out okay. We need the money, look. The Medici's were not as generous as I'd hoped. Well, he kind of rambled on, and I started feeling very bad. Because I got a nose for swindles. And I didn't see just how this one could ever come off. And yet, what did the guru have up his sleeve? What did he know that I didn't? I asked Impulse. I, I don't know, Bridges. It, it beats me. Is Leonard being set up? I don't know. And if he is, why? You wonder I'm scared? I mean, I can't figure it. I, I, I'm sorry I got you into all this. Look, I guess I should be rooting for him to fall flat on his face. Maybe even go to jail. That way he'd be out of the picture. Oh, you don't mean that, Bridges. I do, I do, but... Look, what more can I do? I don't know. We'll just have to hope for the best. She looked up at me and she said it with those big blue eyes. And I said to myself, what's the use? I'll give it another shot. So I went back to see the guru, and he was in great form as usual. Heaven and earth, uh, not human. <laughs> they regard all things as straw dogs. Yeah, yeah, I remember. I, I was saying that very thing myself, Guru, just the other day. And so, my son, do you come again for enlightenment? No. No, this time I don't come for it. I have come to give a little bit of it. He who knows others is wise. But he who knows himself is enlightened. Now, leave me enlighten you on this little swindle of yours. What it's all leading up to is the sale of this picture of Leonard's, right? But even if you could kid people into thinking it looks just like Da Vinci's work, the mechanics of the thing are against you. Ah, 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 say you so. How are you going to make the paint and the canvas look as if it was 500 years old? The softest things in the world overcome the hardest things in the world. All of which means what? The gazelle races along the mountain slope. The turtle splashes through the mud. Skip it. Which means he had figured out that angle of it also. How was he going to pull off a swindle like this? Every day I went to the studio and I looked at the picture. It was coming along. I mean, I'm no critic. But even I could tell it was good. No, it, it was great. I kept comparing it to my copy of, uh, of the original. And I had to admit, you couldn't tell the difference. I couldn't guess what would happen once the professionals took a crack at it. Then I got a call from my friend, Miss Threshold. She wanted to see me. What's happening, Bridges? With what? Uh, some time ago, we had an idle conversation, or so I thought. There's talk of another Mona Lisa. Oh? Is another swindle about to be perpetrated upon the art world, Bridges? I don't know. You don't know? What I mean is, I don't know if it's a swindle. A few weeks later, Leonard announced that he was just about finished with the portrait. And I have to admit, it was fantastic. I was at Leonard's place when the news broke on the radio. And now for a sensation that is sure to rock the world of art. A new painting by Leonardo da Vinci. 
It has been discovered by the famous guru, Sir Huri Shundat Mukherjee. This morning, your reporter was at a special press conference called by the guru. Ah, uh, yes. It is the Mona Lisa. But, uh, Guru, it cannot be the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa is hanging in the Louvre in Paris. Uh, Paris? The Louvre? Uh, what are they? What are we? Illusions. This is the Mona Lisa. Freshly painted. Freshly painted? Is that what you said, Guru? Fresh as the morning rain. Fresh as the budding flower. But how can it be freshly painted if that means she died about 500 years ago? He has been reborn. He lives again. <laughs> Therefore, it is ordained he must work again, create again, be again. And so he is once again painting his masterpiece, the Mona Lisa. But what about the one that's in Paris? It is the same. If a man can be born again, why not? A painting? <laughs> Especially one that is so filled with life. Is it not written? The end of the world is the beginning of the world. When is everyone going to see this Mona Lisa? We shall wait one week till the second day of May, on which day in the year 1519, Leonardo left this world. What you're saying is, he's back now? We go in order that we may return. We return in order that we may go. Yes. Yes, I think I'm getting the hang of it. Well, thank you, Guru. You heard the man. I guess it's all over now, Dimples. I mean, what can I tell you? I tried. I, I know you did, Bridges. How does he figure to make it go? Bridges, it's sold. Why do you say that? All you have to do is get enough people to believe it. Enough of the right kind of people. Well, yeah, but how? It shows you how I wasn't thinking. All during the week, the guru's people started beating the drums. People were being given a special peek at the painting. People met and talked with the reborn Da Vinci. And people were convinced. I mean, there were these weren't just people, you know. They were, they were people. If you know what I mean, you know, what they call the beautiful people, the in people, the with it people. These were the, what they call the tastemakers, the trendsetters. They were the ones who told you what books to read, what shows to see. They were the guru's people. And through him they had found, okay, let's call it enlightenment. Oh, yes, he is Leonardo. There is absolutely no doubt about it. Every one of us has a master identity. And I helped him find it. Like they say, the day dawned. They were going to take the painting from Leonard's house to the guru's place. Dimples, there's nothing more anybody can do. Why do you call me Dimples? Uh-oh. My real name is Lisa Del Giaconda. Oh, come on, Dimples. Not you, too. You never approve of me, Luca. You were jealous. You wanted him for yourself. Yeah. Well, I don't blame you, Dimples. The thing is working, and you can see a million bucks. That's why you went with him the first time, isn't it? But somehow, the million never came around. And this time it won't either. Ah, look, uh, the first time King Francis paid 4,000 gold florins for it. <laughs> what shall it be worth now? I looked at the picture. I had to admit it was just great. Yep, you could believe this was the way Da Vinci did it. But then... Something bothered me. It, it, it wasn't much, just, just a little something, and I couldn't put my finger on it. But something, something was missing. No, something had been added. But what? Well, I went along to the guru's place, and I tell you, the thing was a sensation. People were buzzing and wooing and eyeing. Had he actually brought it off? No, Bridges. He hasn't brought it off. Oh, oh, it's you. Uh, how... I was reading your lips. He almost did. But he forgot something. A tiny little something. Then I was right. He did something wrong. You've seen it too? What is it? Well, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. Think. 
Look at her face. Her forehead. That's it? Yes. He gave her eyebrows. That's what he did. And on the original, she doesn't have any. Of course not. All women, all wealthy women in the Italian Renaissance shaved off their eyebrows. Eyebrows. <laughs> Why, a woman of quality wouldn't be caught dead with them. That's what it is. And so we've got him. He isn't Da Vinci. It isn't the Mona Lisa. Yeah. Poor Dimples. She's stuck again. Not everybody went home then and there. The professionals caught it first and started to smile. And while the guru and his crowd put up a good fight, they didn't have the right kind of ammunition. When the guru's followers saw that they were being laughed at, they turned on him and denounced him as a phony. Poor guru. Well, that's the way of the world, isn't it? It just keeps turning. has been the story of a renaissance genius, or at least a swindle, or was it a swindle, based on his work, or was it his actual work? Was Leonard Kovacs an authentic genius in his own right, or was he actually the reincarnation of the great Leonardo? In these matters, we may quote the guru, the further one goes, the less one knows. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Ian Martin, and Bryna Rayburn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The moving finger writes, and having writ moves on, nor all your piety nor wit shall lure it back again to cancel half a line, nor all your tears wash out a word of it. Or put it this way, you can never erase nor rewrite what has been inscribed in the book of your life. Or can you? What are you doing here, Walter? I had to see you, Rita. I had to see you. Don't you know it's dangerous? Well, Rita, after all, we killed him. Oh, you've got that all wrong. You killed him. No. No, we both planned it. We both did it. Your fingerprints are on the gun. Rita, you were there. It was your idea. What was my idea? Walter, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Gift, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Robert Dryden. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. We have law 
laws against it, both man-made and divine. Practically all civilized and most uncivilized societies as well prohibit it. So then, how do you account for the fact that murder has flourished since the dim red dawn of history? Murder by individuals, murder by groups, murder at wholesale, murder at retail, but murder everywhere and enough to spare. We're in a pretty little cafe lounge. A man and a woman are at a table holding hands. They seem to be very much in love. And yet, as we listen, the very first word we hear is murder. Now, what brings this on? We plan to do it, don't we? Of course, darling. But we don't have to talk about it. What do you mean, we don't have to talk about it? What I mean is, we don't have to talk about it anymore. Rita. Everything we have to say has already been discussed. It only remains to be done. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe... Walter, are you beginning to have second thoughts? I, I don't know. Well, for your information, you were the first to mention it six months ago. Didn't you say, if only Dennis weren't around? Well, yes, but that didn't mean... What did it mean? You have a way of... I have a way of cutting through the nonsense, of cracking the shell to get at the meat. Well, do you want to call it off? Do you? Walter, the time has come for you to take a stand and to stay there. Suppose we get caught. <sighs> We're going through all that again. Now it's something to think about. It was something to think about. It was one of a great many problems and dangers, but we considered each one of them. Arrived at a decision and put them all behind us. Yes. Well, there's no guarantee we'll get away with it. Does it have to be done today? Will it be easier tomorrow? Oh, I guess you're right. No. We're right. This is being done by the two of us. Yes. It's five o'clock. Time to go. I, I don't see the waitress around. We'll have to wait. Just leave a $10 bill on the table. That'll more than cover it. Uh, re re Rita. I'm leaving now, Walter. With you or without you. Hello, dear. And Walter. Dennis, darling? Just in time for cocktails. Oh, I know how negative you feel about classical music, Walt. Well, I, I don't exactly... You've got a tin ear, that's your problem. <laughs> well, turn the thing off, Reed Angel, whilst I pour us each love and libation here. No, 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 da darling. You, you turn it the other way. That's louder. Oh, no, Rita, really? It's enough to blast your eardrums. Now... Walter, now what? Walter! Hey, what? Where'd you get... What are you going to do with a gun? You have to do it. Oh, no. What, Walter, don't. I'm sorry, Mrs. Holland. I... I'm all right. Now, in your own words, can you tell us what happened... Well, Lieutenant Savage, I've already oh, described... Oh, I, I, I know, Mr. Powers, but another eyewitness report of the same event usually adds some detail that we... I, uh, I don't mind, Lieutenant. I want to help as much as I can. Uh, thank you. As, uh, Walter, uh, Mr. Powers said, we came into the apartment at... Well, it must have been about, oh, 5.15. Mm -hmm. uh, Dennis was, uh, listening to his music in the study... I'd recently bought a painting, a Faraday landscape. Uh, have you ever heard of him? Uh, yes, Mrs. Allen. Oh, then you know. Um, I had it hung in the living room. Walter hadn't seen it yet, so he and I went inside and... Uh... Yes, Mrs. Allen? <laughs> you know how you can get lost in a Faraday landscape. So uh, we must have been looking at it for all of ten minutes. Then we went back to the study and... And... Uh... Would you care for a drink of water, Mrs. Holland? No. Uh, no, I... Uh... Uh, we uh, saw Dennis lying on the floor. He was very still and 
you could see that dark stain of blood on his shirt over his heart. You knew, you you could tell that he was... And uh, what else did you see? What else did I see? Mm-hmm. Oh, not very much. Uh, nothing, I'm afraid. Well, did you notice that the... Um, oh, oh, what did you call it, Mr. Powers? Uh, the Tacitor Collection, Lieutenant. Ah, that's it, the Tacitor Collection. Uh, did you notice that it was gone? I'm afraid the only thing I really saw was my husband. Lying dead. I tried to close my eyes against it, Lieutenant. Now, as I understand it, your husband had these coins called the Tacitor Collection. Yes. Uh, they were 12 English gold sovereigns minted in 1662 by King Charles II. Uh, to honor one of his friends, Lord Tacitor. Uh-huh. And what was this collection worth? Oh, it had been insured for $100,000. And your husband wanted to sell it? Yes. Why? Dennis was a mercurial person, filled with sudden whims, subject to unpredictable moods. He was always buying and selling, changing his mind. It was all part of his charm. And where was the collection usually kept? In a vault. Then how was it he had these valuable coins in the house? The word was out. You know, among collectors and in the trade. People were coming to look. Hmm, well, isn't it usual to sell these things at auction? And to turn them over to a dealer? Well, Dennis did things his own way. He wanted to be sure that the buyer would be someone who could appreciate the meaning of the collection. Then uh, Dennis was home all day. Oh, yes. He was expecting buyers. At about, uh, oh, three, I, I went out for a walk and I, I, I ran into Mr. Powers here. Mm. Uh, we stopped for a drink and then decided to go home, pick up Dennis for dinner, the theater. And you came home. Mm. Now, uh, you remember seeing the collection on his desk? Yes, I, oh, I'm sure I did. It, it would have to be there because if he'd already sold it, he'd have said so. Now, you went into the other room to look at the painting, mm-hmm. and uh, you were there for ten minutes. Now, during these ten minutes, someone came in. How would that person enter? The only way is through the front door. Mm. Well, he'd have to ring a bell. The door locks automatically, and there's no sign of forced entry. You didn't hear a bell? No. Well, you see, he had his music going. It, it was very loud. Uh-huh. And this same someone then shoots your husband. You didn't hear a shot? No. Mm-hmm. And you didn't either, Mr. Powers? No. As she said, the music was going full blast in the next room. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Mrs. Holland. Is that all? Yes, that's all. Uh, Lieutenant Savage. Mm. Dennis Holland was my closest friend. He was also a fine human being. His murderer must not go unpunished. We'll do what we can. Uh, Tom, Eddie, got your pictures? You ready? Mm -hmm. All right, let's leave. Oh, goodbye, Mrs. Holland, Mr. Powers. Oh, don't don't, don't bother. We can let ourselves out. Rita, Mm -hmm. we got away with it. This detective bought the story. I could tell he bought the story. Because we made it easy for him. A simple story. No frills. He had the coins on the desk. We were in the next room. Someone comes in to buy. Kills him. He's got the music going. We don't hear a thing. We come back. It's all over. Beautiful. And do you want to know why? It's a good story. Because it's built on a platform of fact. Each one can be readily verified. First, Dennis did own the Tassiter collection. Second, he did want to sell it. He'd taken out ads. Third, he did bring it home from the vault. The clerk would remember. Fourth, people were coming in and out all day. Fifth, I said we went into the living room to look at a new Faraday painting. Oh, there is a new Faraday painting. Sixth, we said we couldn't hear anything because the music was so loud. Oh, the neighbors will be glad to tell the police how constantly they complained about that loud music. Uh, wait a minute. What? Wait. Good Lord. What is it? Should we be talking like this? Like what? Should we be saying what we're saying? 
It just occurs to me there were two or three detectives poking about the place while Lieutenant Savage was talking to us. What were they doing? Well, they were taking pictures, looking for fingerprints and, well, anything that might serve as a clue. Ah, that's what they'd like us to think they were doing. How do you know they weren't planting secret microphones? Oh, whatever for? To record this very conversation. Oh, well, if they did it, they did it. Then you admit they did it. Oh, come on, Walter. It's so far-fetched. Is anything far-fetched today? Look, a man is murdered. The police automatically suspect his wife and his friend. Oh, not when there's a $100,000 robbery. The robbery story is our story. Now, look, we have a lot to do. First, hide the gun and the coins up on the farm. Second, like a true and loyal friend, make the funeral arrangements, will you? But before you do that... Take me home to my mother's and then you can return to your place and I'll call you. What? What's this music? Huh? Where's this music coming from? From a record player. A record player? But I don't have a record player. I bought you one. You bought... De... Dennis. Yes. Dennis. But... You're dead. You... You have to be dead, Dennis. You're... Dead, and yet you're... You're standing here... That's a pretty good declarative sentence, isn't it? You're dead, and you're standing here. It consists of two independent clauses. And you would think that one negates the other. Well, grammar is grammar, and murder is murder. But surely in this case, something has to give. Give me a few minutes of breathing space, and I shall return shortly with Act Two. drawback of being dead is that it lasts forever. This bit of wisdom was uttered by an anonymous character in a forgotten novel by a completely undistinguished writer named T. Presley McClellan. However, it does seem to have captured what was always considered a fundamental human truth. Are we about to discover a new vision? At 5.15 p.m., Mr. Walter Powers shoots and kills his best friend, Mr. Dennis Holland. At 9 p.m. that same evening, Mr. Walter Powers returns to his apartment, and who is sitting there, listening to a Beethoven symphony? Why, Mr. Dennis Holland. Dennis, you... I'm here. Stop with that. You're dead. Well, who knows I better than you, Walter? You killed me. But, but you're here. Obviously. Well, you can't be here if I killed you. Uh, unless, unless you're imagining it. Yes. Yes, that's it. It's all in my imagination. If it's your imagination, how do you account for the music? I can't account for it. Turn the damn thing off. If you say so, Walter. But still, you must account for it. You know you don't own a record player. Did you subconsciously go out and buy one? Why would I buy one? Because you're now in the hands of your conscience. Remorse. What I did, I would do again. It's just that I have to expect a few bad moments. I think I see you. But you do see me. I'm here. The record player proves it. If I'm just a creature of your guilty imagination, then how do you account for the player? And maybe you needed it to help the illusion, eh? But the fact is, it's here. How did it get here? Well, I must have gone out and bought it myself. When? 
You spent the afternoon with Rita. You killed me at exactly 14 minutes after five. You were at the apartment with the police and one thing or another till eight. Then you had to take Rita to her mother's and here you are at nine o'clock with every minute accounted for. Yeah, but still, I no, don't... No, 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 Walter. The record player is here because I brought it. And I brought it as a gift. A gift? I owe you a present. For what? For killing me. What are you saying? If you hadn't done it, I'd have had to do it myself. And I just wouldn't be able to summon the courage. So, let me begin by thanking you. Uh, yeah, I don't understand. I was very sick, Walter. The doctor said I'd been lucky to live a year. Oh, I didn't know. Well, I just found out. Lucky to have a year. And then he said in a few weeks there might be some very intense pain. And then you would have died. Yes, I would have died anyway. But in terrible agony. That's one reason I thank you. One reason? Well, the other is I, uh, I'm broke. You were broke? Busted, cleaned out, washed up. Why do you think I was selling the Tacita collection? I don't know. I thought you were bored with it. Oh, never. It had to go to meet my debts. In about four or five months, the truth about my financial juggling would come out. I'd be disgraced. And there I'd be, deathly ill, stone broke, and under indictment. You saved me from that, Walter. I thank you. That's what I came back to tell you. It, but the, 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 the dead cannot come back. You know, I used to think that myself. But the dead do come back all the time. It's just that so many of the living are too blind, too insensitive to see them. To feel them, to hear them. I hear you. I see you so clearly. But it has to be my imagination. I'll turn this on. Listen. That's not short imagination. I want you to develop a taste for it, Walter. You'll thank me. But what's going to happen? I'll go back where I belong. Where you belong? I don't belong here. I just have some unfinished business, that's all. Unfinished business? I have to take care of you. Me? You're my best friend. Look at what you did for me. But I murdered you. I murdered you in cold blood. You had that look in your eyes just before I pulled the trigger. Do you think I'll ever forget that look? Oh, you were always so melodramatic, Walter. As I fired, there was a brilliant flash. Oh, you're telling me. I thought I'd go blind. For a second, your eyes became very bright. And then they started to become darker and darker as the light in them flickered and slowly faded. Then all the light went out of them. I was dead, yes. That's exactly what it feels like. All the light goes out of you. And you're lost in a dark void. I'm sorry, Dennis. Oh, you're not to blame. She put you up to it. I know she did. She knows how to drive a man wild. Well, she'll grow tired of you. And after a while, you'll sense it in her eyes. <laughs> her restless eyes. Already she's planning for your successor. Now, w wait a minute, Dennis. Unconscious, you... Lynn. After all, she hasn't even met him yet. But she will. One day. And then she'll be prepared. What are you driving at? What did you do with the gun and the coins? I hid them. Why didn't you destroy them? Because she said to hide them. Hide them? Hide them where? Up at the farm. What for? So she can have that gun handy in case she'll need it? Why would she need it? Well, she needed a gun for me, didn't she? Are you, are you oh, saying... Oh, she may not use it to shoot you. She'll bring that gun to the police. The police? Do you know what she'll say? Come on, Dennis, what can she say? She's in it up to her neck. Which is why she wants to get out. But what can she say? She is such a resourceful, inventive, creative woman. Can't you imagine what she could say? Think, Walter. Think. Listen to me, Lieutenant. He did it. Walter Powers did it. Are you accusing Walter Powers, Mrs. Holland? Protect me. Don't let him kill me. He's insane. Walter's insane. 
I'll tell you everything. We came back to the apartment. Walter hated Dennis. He... He shot Dennis. Shot him in cold blood. Uh, just a minute, please, Mrs. Holland. Walter wanted those coins. That tacit collection. He shot Dennis, and he forced me to go along with the story, or else he'd kill me. You don't know what he's like? Mrs. Holland, have you got any sort of proof? Proof? I know where he hid the coins. And the gun. Could she play a scene like that? Is Rita capable of it, Walter? But she loves me. Oh, she also loved me. It comes and goes with her. Why cling to a dying tree? Why treasure what can no longer blossom? Those words. Those words. How would I know those words? Oh, foolish Walter. Didn't she also speak them to me one day? She whispered them on a sailboat. We were running before a freshening breeze. A long, honey-colored hair was flying straight back in the wind. A wind that also held her shirt taut against that beautiful, curving line of her body. She didn't make you believe anything in a moment like that. Tell me, where and when did she whisper those words to you? That can't be real. You can't be real. Listen to the music again, Walter. Only I could have brought it here. It proves this is real. It proves I'm here to help you. Here to save you. Save me from what? From her? Is that it? Yes. Because she'll want to get rid of me one day? Right. Now, there's something you forget. Sure, there was another guy before you, and she ditched him for you, and she got rid of you for me. And you say my turn's coming up. Exactly. Well, maybe it isn't. Maybe there's something you can't face up to. Maybe you and how many other guys before you simply weren't man enough for her. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Mr. Macho. All right, let's assume that's true. Then your whole theory flies out the window. Only to walk in again through the door. That little scene in the police station. What little scene? You mean... That imaginary little episode it will have to take place, you know. Why? Because you say so? Because logic demands it. What logic? The logic of reality. A man is shot to death. In the house at the time are his wife and his best friend. Now, what the investigating detective asks himself at the very beginning is, are these two having an affair? I would say he's convinced they are. Why? Because he's trained. His experience teaches him to look for those things. But how can he tell? People in love give themselves away in any one of an infinite number of little things, Walter. A glance, a gesture, a smile, a frown. Who knows? And so we begin with your Lieutenant Savage. You think he's a dull, plodding policeman. Don't sell him short. Lieutenant Savage, what do you think he's doing right now? Well, how would I know? You can picture it. He's in his office. At his desk. Uh, Lieutenant Savage. Oh, yes, Inspector. I'm doing the report right now. Well, Dennis Holland had these coins worth about 100000 A crook could have come in, killed them, and grabbed them. So we have to run a net among dealers, collectors, and so forth. On the other hand, we got the wife and the best friend. Now, they're in the next room while a 38 caliber revolver goes off. And they claim they didn't hear a thing. Well, that's what they say. I, I think I get a little bit of a click there. Well, I want to give it a play. Yeah, I'll get right on it. And he's on it this very minute. What'll he discover, Walter? What'll he discover? Nothing. Are you trying to tell me there was nothing? We were very discreet. Discreet? Nobody knows about us. Nobody? Let's check that out. We are now in the area of routine. Basic police routine. The police are experts when it comes to routine. And if it's a crime that can be solved by the use of routine, 
The police track it every time. I... I, I don't know what you're talking or about. Or you wish you didn't know what I was talking about. Tomorrow morning, Lieutenant Savage is going to ring Rita's doorbell. And do you know what he's going to ask her? Well, how could I know? Well, it's a question he couldn't ask her this afternoon. She was too upset. But it's a question both you and she can very well expect. What, uh... What is the question? Well, you should know. It's the question that marks the beginning of the routine. The beginning of the routine, the end of which leads to a lifetime in a cell or just a fleeting moment on a scaffold. Neither is a prospect which actually pleases. And what is this question that can give birth to all the woes and troubles that threatened to engulf Walter Powers, not to mention Rita Holland. Well, we'll give birth to Act Three shortly. Whoever it was that said... We are a world of strangers. We see each other dimly as flickering shadows in a darkened room may have had something. What do we really know about the next fellow? Walter Powers and Dennis Holland were lifelong friends. And yet, did Walter know he'd be doing Dennis a favor by killing him? What question is Lieutenant Savage going to ask? Can't you picture it? He will ring the bell... Rita would answer the door. He would apologize for disturbing her. He will say... I just have a few questions, Mrs. Holland. Yes? Now, you said you were at home with your husband till 3 o'clock yesterday afternoon. Hmm? Uh, 3 o'clock. Uh, yes, that's uh, about right. And then you went out for a walk. Yes. And then you said... Uh, now, now, I don't remember whether you said you met Mr. Powers or you ran into Mr. Powers. Oh, well, oh, it wasn't a set appointment or anything. It's, it's just that's the way it would happen every day. I see. Now, uh, you said you went in for a drink. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, we generally would. Where? Where do we go for a drink? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, um, that little place just off the square, Maletti's. I see, Maletti's. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. A lieutenant. Yes, Mrs. Allen? Is that uh, important? It's just routine. Routine. That's the first routine question. Now, Walter, what do you suppose will be the second? I... I don't know. Well, where do you suppose he's going to ask it? Milettis, of course. Milettis. Milettis? You would sit at the piano bar, wouldn't you? Yes. And Jerry, the piano player, knew you, didn't he? I... Uh, Yes. What's he going to tell Lieutenant Savage? How, how would I know? Oh, now you know. This is a murder case. Jerry is not about to lie to a cop. Jerry is going to tell Lieutenant Savage exactly what he saw. And you know what he saw. Well, Lieutenant, I mean, they'd uh, come in most every afternoon for a happy hour, you know? Uh, what would they do? What would they do? Mm -hmm. Well, they have a couple of drinks and listen to me play the piano. I mean, what were they supposed to do, huh? Did they hold hands? Well, did you ever see them hold hands? Now, that's a direct question. Uh, yeah. How often? Every time they were here alone? Well, I don't know. I don't come. But they did hold hands, hmm? Oh, yeah. But they don't have to mean anything. It could just be friendly. Did he ever put his arm around her? Yeah, he might have, once or twice. Uh-huh. They ever kiss? Maybe. Once or twice. All right, Jerry. That's good enough. I'll let you off the hook. Now. Now. That's where the routine pauses, gathers momentum, and moves ahead. So... What do you suppose Lieutenant Savage is going to do now? 
He knows that you and Rita are having an affair. He has no proof. Oh, he knows it in his bones. Walter, he has the building blocks. All he has to do is put them in place. So, he's going to ask questions. Many questions of many people. Think of all the people who knew about or suspected that you and Rita were having an affair. Think in particular of Millicent Weber. Millicent? Ah, the name drains all the color from your face. And rightly so. Now, when in the course of his routine investigation, Lieutenant Savage talks to Millicent Weber, what do you suppose she's going to tell him? Would I love to be there to hear it? But you know perfectly well just exactly what she'll say. I would rather not discuss Walter Powers, Lieutenant. Uh, Mrs. Weber, this is a murder investigation. And what you want to know from me is, was there anything between Walter and Rita Holland? Yes, ma'am. Well, let me save us both some time. I read the story in the paper about poor Dennis's murder, how a robber shot him. <laughs> I don't believe a word of it. You don't? No. And you don't either. Walter and Rita were having an affair. Now, you would testify to this in court? No, but only because my testimony would be prejudicial. You see, I have reason to detest Walter Powers. May I ask the reason? He was engaged to my younger sister. He broke it off to run around with that married woman. Doris took it very hard. I tried to tell her she was better off out of it, but she was a very romantic child. She was at the beach last summer. There was an accident. She drowned. I think she did it deliberately. That's all I can tell you. Do you know of any way we could prove Rita Holland and Walter Powers were having an affair? No. Oh, wait. Of course I do. The Riverview Motel. I wanted to expose him. So I had him shadowed. The detective reported that Walter and Rita had spent several nights there. I presented the evidence to Doris. Yes? It, uh, That was the end of things between them. But it was also the beginning of the end of everything for Doris. The Riverview Motel. Thank you, Mrs. Webber. Riverview Motel, Walter. That's what Millicent will tell him. And how many desk clerks, chambermaids, and cocktail waitresses will remember the two of you together there? What are you trying to convince me of? Well, that you are getting closer and closer to that little scene in the police station where she sells you down the river. Uh, you, you don't know how much she really loves me. She would never do that. Well, she may have no choice, Walter. The routine. It's become a juggernaut. It threatens to ride right over her. Now, Lieutenant Savage is going to go back to her. Now, Lieutenant Savage is armed. He's ready. And you can just picture what he's going to say to her. You're, you're crazy. You mean you can't picture it, Walter? You mean he isn't going to ask her? Mrs. Holland, are you having an affair with Walter Powers? Am I... what? Shall I repeat the question? How dare you... But you have no right to ask such an insulting, slanderous question. Mrs. Holland, if I were to go to the Riverview Motel... The Riverview Motel? Would I find witnesses among the personnel who could testify that you and Mr. Powers engaged a room there quite often? Would I... Lieutenant, listen to me. He did it. Walter Powers. He did it. you see, Walter, the scene. We are ready for the scene. You don't believe it. I... I, I don't believe any of this. I, I can't. I'm going crazy. I have this hallucination that you're here, that a dead man is talking to me, that a man I killed is here in this room talking to me. Ah, if only it were an hallucination. All of this is unreal. All of this is fear. And Phantom, all Rita and I must do is not lose our heads. She has to send you down the river, Walter. No, no, no. You're, you're not real. 
All I have to do is shut you out of my mind. I'm real, Walter. It's a reality you can't understand yet. In this room, however, there is a reality that you can understand. It takes up room. You can stub your toe against it. You can touch it. Turn the switch on, you can hear it. The record player, Walter. I brought you the record player. You left the house at three this afternoon. It wasn't here, was it? No. Well, I keep telling you, I brought it as a gift so that you would believe me. But it's geez. the finest you can buy, Walter, exactly like the one I have, or I had in my house. You see? Look at it. Listen to it. Only I could have brought it, yes? E yes. Place yourself in my hands. I'm the only one who can help you, really. She mustn't play that scene in the police station. She's capable of it, isn't she? Isn't she? Yes. One way or another, one day or another, you have to be killed. Just as I had to be killed. Kill her first. What? Well, no. You have to. But that'll surely... I, I, I mean, the police... I'll be arrested for murder. No, you won't. Well, what do you mean, I won't? Walter, I'm dead. Which means I see things. Kill her. You won't be caught. Right now, she's asleep all alone at her mother's house. Go there quietly. Kill her quietly. No one will know. Kill her. You'll get away with it. Trust me. Believe me. Be believe you? Isn't this music proof that you can believe me? Yes. Yes. What? 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 What are you doing here? Oh, no. No, Walter. Not with a knife. Oh, my goodness. I hope you got rid of the knife. I threw it off the bridge. Good. No one will ever find it. What happens now? Nothing. The police probe and pry and poke around. But proof? None at all. Sit tight. Sit tight. Sit tight and enjoy the music. Who, who could that be? Why don't you answer it? Oh, hey, this is a break. I'm glad you're home. Well, uh, who, who are you? Well, who do you think I am? I'm glad you're enjoying the set. Maybe you want to buy one, huh? Hey, maybe that's not such a bad way to advertise. What are you talking about? Well, this dame wanted to give her husband a surprise birthday present in apartment 4E. Uh, she bought him this here record player. Oh, what, what, what are you saying? Only that uh, stupid salesman at the store wrote down 3E on a ticket instead. <laughs> the super let me in here earlier. No, no, you, you're making a mistake. You... Well, that's what I'm saying. I made a mistake. This, this record player, it, it, it's a, a gift from Dennis. Oh, look there. Uh, leave me explain it again. Uh, Dennis, tell him. Tell him. You see, this woman calls me up. Dennis. Uh, she's having a fit. Where's that record player? I paid for that record player. Dennis! And I said, lady, I delivered that record player. I installed it in apartment 3E, like the ticket said. Dennis, Dennis, why don't you tell him? 3E, she yells. It's 4E. Please, tell him, Dennis. So, if you don't mind, I'll just have to unhook this. Well, no, wait, 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 what are you doing? What am I doing? Say, that's mine. Well, buddy, I just explained. Dennis gave it to me. Are you nuts? Dennis told me it would be all right. Look, do I have to get a cop? Dennis said nothing could happen to me. Even after you kill her, he said, nothing can happen to you. D Dennis, Dennis knows. No, he, he, you know how Dennis knows? Well, go, go ahead, ask me. Uh, uh, how, how does Dennis know? Uh, because uh, Dennis is dead. Oh, 
Oh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I see, I, I, I see. Well, look, I, I must have made a mistake. Yeah, of course you did, yes. It, it was Dennis who brought me this wonderful record player. I, oh, sure, sure, of course he did, pal. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, why, um, well, why don't you just, uh, excuse me, excuse me. The end of the story? It writes itself. That poor, frightened sound technician. Can't you see him hailing a police cruiser or making a frantic call from the nearest phone booth? Can't you see the police arrive and take our friend Walter into custody? And you know perfectly well that poor Walter has had it one way or another. It's probably a cell in an asylum for the rest of his life. If he ever recovers, it'll be a cell in a prison. Which would you choose? Choose neither. I'll be back shortly. Can the dead do the dead ever come back? Of course they do. All the time. They come back in what we do in what we say, and even in what we are. They are gone from our sight, their voices are still, and we see them and hear them so clearly sometimes. Who was it that said, to be remembered is to live forever? Our cast included Ralph Bell, Robert Dryden, Evie Juster, and Sam Gray. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Acquisitiveness is one of the less noble human characteristics. It isn't the poor or deprived who manifest this failing. Generally, it's the well-to-do, the educated. Owning and having seems to spawn avarice. And from avarice to greed to death and beyond death are the steps of the story we're about to unfold. Miss Lombard, when you were looking at that painting, the Leonardo da Vinci... Your face was such a mask of pain and unhappiness. I should have thought of actually owning such a work would inspire and delight. No, I hate it. Glorious work like that? You hate it? For you, it may be a masterpiece. To me, it is evil. That painting is ruining my life. Our mystery drama... The House of the Dead Heart, adapted from a story by Edith Wharton, especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate, Jr., stars Christopher Tabori. I'll be back shortly with Act One. What makes certain people have a certain way? 
what to you and I might appear a quirk of nature is natural and appropriate to others. Take Paul Winant, for example, a graduate student pushing for his Ph.D. His father manufactures shoes. His mother does the bookkeeping. Paul wants no part of that business. Music, literature, and art are his life. His parents think Paul is lazy and crazy. Paul thinks their lives are monotonous and tedious. You see, my mom and dad are real New England home folk. Work hard all day long and fall asleep at night. And they also believe God's Garden of Eden is right in your own backyard. So when I became an art major and then went back to school for my Ph.D., they gave me plenty of flack. But the day I said I wanted to go to Rome for the summer, they acted like I, like I was going to walk on the moon. So I thought I'd talk it over with Professor Dalton. To conclude today's lecture, it's unfortunate that so much of Leonardo da Vinci's work has been lost. We know of several paintings that once existed because they've been mentioned in letters. And fortunately, we do have the Mona Lisa. Uh, on Monday, our final lecture before your term papers are handed in, we'll discuss Leonardo's belief that science and fantasy do interact. Mathematics and the supernatural. Dismissed. Uh, excuse me. May I, may I see you for a moment, Professor Dalton? Yes, be in my office in ten minutes, Paul. I'll have time then. So what do I do, Professor? You're saying that I shouldn't pay any attention to my parents? Paul, oh, it's your life. Sure, they're concerned. But in the long run, what you do with it is your responsibility. <laughs> That's what I keep telling them. Mm. Have you mapped out your itinerary? You're not only going to Rome. I thought Naples, Venice, Milan, Florence. Florence. Oh. Is, is Siena on your list? Siena? No. Oh, Paul, you've got to go there. From Florence, it's only an hour and a half by motor coach. And there's an old friend of mine you must see. Oh, sure. Someone you know personally? I'd, I'd love to. Good. His name is Dr. Arthur Lombard. We got our PhDs together uh, years ago. One summer, like you, he visited Italy, but he never came back. Married an American girl, has a daughter, I believe. Uh, this is 20 years ago, and he's been there ever since. Uh, Lombard's an encyclopedia of the Italian Renaissance. But that's not the only reason I think you should see him. He owns a Leonardo. Oh, you're kidding. No. A real, genuine Leonardo da Vinci? If he says it is, it is. He won't allow anyone to photograph it, because the picture could be sold and commercialized. The French and the Italian governments have offered him the sky for it, but he's turned them down. Do you think he'll let me see it? I hope so. If he won't let you photograph it, please write out a detailed description. Will you, Paul? Oh, you bet. Someone who owns a real Leonardo. I can't wait. I'll give you a letter of introduction before you go. I know the street he lives on, but not the house number. He must be fairly well known in Siena. My letters reach him without any trouble. You haven't seen him in 20 years? I was in Siena three years ago and stayed with them. You go there, Paul, with my blessings. Professor... You've made me feel a lot better about pursuing my interests. I love my parents, and I hate to disappoint them, but I'm just not ready to make a life commitment. I do know that making shoes isn't it. <laughs> I envy you. A summer in Italy. Three weeks later, I was on my way to Italy. And as the weeks went by... And it got more and more exciting, seeing ancient civilization, enjoying the legacy left the world by masters of sculpture and paintings, Naples, Venice, Milan, Rome. It was only when I arrived in Florence that a bell rang, just as if Professor Dalton had rung it. An hour and a half by motor coach, he'd said. 
So the next day I was sitting in a cafe in Siena on the Piazza del Campo studying a street map. Oh, excuse me. I think you dropped this envelope. Oh. oh. Oh, thanks. Yes, I did. You speak English very well. <laughs> I'm not Italian. English? No, American. I'll be done. You don't look it. So am I. Paul Wyatt. David Michaels. You live here in Siena? Well, for the time being. I should go back home, but I can't bring myself to. Home? Cincinnati. There's something about Italy that must be catching. How so? Well, you're an American and you're finding it hard to leave. I have an art professor back home. He was telling me about a friend of his who came over here years ago, settled down, and never went back to the States. Matter of fact, uh, he's the one this letter's for. Dr. Lombard. The only address I have is the... The Via Papa Grillo. Oh, well, I, I, I was trying to find my way there on this map here. But the number of Dr. Lombard's house is 13. You could almost walk there from here. You know him. Well, he's very well known in Siena. He lives in a house called the House of the Dead Heart. Oh, what a strange name. He got its name from a piece of marble shaped like a heart which is over the front door. It's centuries old. Thank you very much. Number 13, huh? Mm hmm. Listen, I, I was thinking maybe since you know the man. Well, uh, maybe I better wait and see how he greets me. I don't know the man, not personally. How about a drink, David? I owe you one for being so helpful. Another time. I've got to be going. I, I don't know how long I'll be staying in Siena, but perhaps we could meet again. Well, I'm usually at this cafe on the piazza about noon. Fine. I will look for you. By the way, uh, when you get to the doctor's house, ring the bell twice. Oh, I see. Well, no, I, I, I don't. Why twice? It's the custom. <laughs> Yes, what is it? Is this the house of Dr. Lombard? Yes, it is, honey. You're an American, aren't you? Yes, I am. But don't stand there on ceremony. Come on in. A Yankee American, think of that. Oh, I'm so sick of answering the door every day, you have no idea. We have this Italian cook and a husband. Now, don't ask me what they do all day. You can never find them. My husband's not very well, so I have to answer the door. Uh, this way. Living room with one flight up. I brought with me a letter of introduction from Professor Dalton. Sammy Dalton? Well, how is he? The doctor's just finishing his lunch. Oh, he'll be delighted. Sammy Dalton. Oh, you know, my husband and Sam went to school together. Arthur? Arthur, who do you think I brought upstairs? Uh, oh, what, what'd you say your name was? Paul Wyant. He's a friend of Sam Dalton. Uh, a student of Professor Dalton's. How do you do, Dr. Lombard? Hello. I brought a letter of introduction for you. Oh, let me have it. So you're a student. You look a little old to be a student. How old are you? I'm 26. I'm taking my Ph.D. in art history. Are you? When I was a girl, I came here from Virginia to study art. And I met Arthur, and we married and settled down. And then he taught at the American school right here. And we never went back. Oh, come in, Sibylla. There's a young man here from America. A Yankee. But that doesn't matter anymore. He's a student of Dr. Dalton. Hi, I, I'm, I mean, hello. Uh, this is my daughter, Sibylla. Our own child, our pride and joy. <laughs> oh, it's a nice letter. <laughs> Old Sam writes a good letter. <clears throat> well, I'm glad to see you, Mr. Wild. We lead a quiet life here. We don't see many people. But any friend of Professor Dalton's is more than welcome. My wife and daughter often talk of him. When was he visiting us? I can't remember. Uh, was it two years ago? Three, Father. Really? <laughs> That's a wonderful house guest. Helped out everywhere like it was his own home. <laughs> now, uh, <clears throat> you want to see my Leonardo? Do I? <laughs> That's the way they all behave. <laughs> That's... That's why they all come here. The bell rings every day, but I send them all off. While I live, not one unworthy eye shall desecrate that picture. Father, Mr. Wyatt. I know, I know, Sibylla. I won't do my friend Sam Dalton the injustice to suppose he'd send an unworthy representative. Paul, I'm going to call you Paul. Oh, I wish you would. 
Your professor writes me he would like a description of the painting for a book he's writing on the unknown Leonardo. Uh, so be it. You shall describe it, if you can. Yes. The professor wants me to take away all the impressions I can. You're welcome to take away all you can carry, Paul. That is, um, if he has your permission, Sibylla, it really belongs to my daughter. Well, let's go to the gallery before the light fails. The key's in the drawer, Sibella. Mrs. Lombard, after you. Uh, no, 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 my, my, my wife won't come with us. She, she has no feeling for art, uh, Italian art, that is. We always raise horses at home in Richmond. I was into dressage before I was barely out of diaper. I simply had no time to develop other aspects of my life, honey. Horses? You can imagine my total disappointment when I came to Florence to see the statue of David and discovering he was not on a horse. <laughs> An adorable Philistine, my wife. Arthur says things about me he doesn't think I'll understand. But I do, Mr. Wyant. And I put up with him. Why shouldn't I speak my mind? I'm going to be dead in six months. What a strange, sardonic man Dr. Lombard is. And his daughter, Sibylla, who has hardly opened her mouth. And Mrs. Lombard, who seems restless and unrequited, a stranger in Siena. And somewhere in this house of the dead heart is an unknown painting by the great Leonardo da Vinci, which will pull at the lives of those we have met as strongly as the pull of the moon on the tides. I shall return shortly with Act Two. We are in Siena, Italy, ancient city of narrow streets streaking across steep hills, its nine gates keeping out most of the 20th century. Down the street from the 14th century world, which inspired Richard Wagner to compose Parsifal, is the house of the dead heart, and in it an American family, a visitor, and a virtually unseen masterpiece that is about to be unveiled. I'd never before felt such an inner excitement as when Dr. Lombard and his beautiful daughter led me down a stone passage to a small door with a heavy lock. Inside a carpeted room, bare of furniture, hung a velvet curtain, a skylight let in the golden afternoon sun. I felt like an acolyte about to assist in some strange worship. There's a little too much light, Sibylla. Draw the silk curtains. That'll, that'll do. Paul, you see the pomegranate design on the carpet? Place yourself there. Keep your left foot on it. Now, Sibylla, pull back the velvet. Ooh. What do you see, Paul? Incredible. Incredible. Now, you must know this Leonardo is not mine. It belongs to my daughter. Some time ago, Sibylla inherited from her grandmother a, a sizable legacy. Tell our visitor how you came by the painting, Sibylla. On the far side of the piazza, a house was being torn down. I had a friend who knew the contents were for sale. They wanted a small fortune for the Leonardo, and I used all my inheritance and bought it. Yes, but, but, but say why you had to buy it, Sibylla. I could not help myself. <laughs> you hear that, Paul? Sibylla made it possible for me to spend the last days or weeks of my life in communion with one of the world's masterpieces. May I just look at it and, and say nothing? I'll lose the impressions if I use words. Uh, well spoken by a true lover of art. Oh, you're very fortunate, Miss Lombard, to possess anything so perfect. Yes. It is considered very beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. That poor, ungainly, worn-out, overworked word. <laughs> it's used for anything these days. Automobiles, golf games, skyscrapers. <laughs> beautiful, uh, 
Never let me hear that that, that word again. Father. I, 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 I can't breathe. Mr. Wyatt, help me take Father out of here. This is too much for him. He's ill. <laughs> Miss Lombard, how's your father feeling now? He's lying down. He's better. Mr. Wyatt? Oh, no, no. You can call me Paul if you like. No, no, that won't be necessary. Please listen to me. Yes. Do you have a message for me? A, a message? No, I... Are you sure? Look in your handkerchief pocket. My handkerchief pocket? Yes. It, it's just my handkerchief. What is it? Well, why does that disturb you? Nothing. I'm very sorry about your father. He has a weak heart. Any excitement is bad for him. I have to take care of him. Mother doesn't know how. I think I'd better go. I'll come back, well, perhaps tomorrow or, or some other That's time. That's what I came in to say. He's asked for you. Me? Now? Yes. Mother's inside with him. They both want to speak to you. Before I go in, Miss Lombard, I'd, I'd like to ask you something. It's very hard for me to say this. You were going to say... Why am I not as enthusiastic over the Leonardo as my father? I was going to say, it wasn't the painting that left me without words. It was the look on your face. It shows? Yes, it shows. The look of such pain and unhappiness. Am I mistaken? I, I hope so. Mr. Wyatt, what you saw on my face is the... That painting is ruining my life. I may never escape from it. Ever. It's all right, Paul. Come on in. How are you, my boy? <laughs> Your stupid business. My, <clears throat> my breathing's all right now. It's loud and clear. Quite recovered. Arthur's feeling much better. Uh, uh, sit, sit by my feet, Paul. Uh, I have a peculiar presentiment about you, as if I'd met a long-lost son. Do you feel that, Sibylla? Paul is like a brother? I don't know. I watched you. Didn't you sense you were in the presence of something holy, my boy? That room is a chapel. The sight of that picture is a sacrament. I never had a son... But I have one now. You must feel as I do. You've made me feel very much at home and welcome. I can say that. May I come back and see the painting again? No, not, not again. Now. Let me up. Help me, Virginia. Arthur, do you think you should? Your heart. My heart tells me to get up. <sighs> come on, Paul. I'll unlock the secret. I'll show you... It is all secrets and no secrets. Sibella, have you the key? We go now. Pull back the curtain, Sibella. Uh, say nothing, son. I shall tell you what there is. The central truth of existence. Art, beauty, love... Religion. You sense that, don't you? I have given my life to a study of the Renaissance, and yet, standing here in front of this Leonardo, I am ignorant. It could mean nothing, yet it means all things, all ages, past and to come. Don't excite yourself, Father. Oh, it's easy for you to talk. It's bad for you. Now, now, Paul, now. I want to know what you see. I see pain. There's a sword piercing a body. Blood is flowing. It's overwhelming, yes. But I don't see mystery and beauty in this painting. Where is it? These colors, those people? They're reaching out and hurting me. What does the canvas show, really? Stabbing, blood, and the feet of Christ on the cross, ominous black clouds, the eternal punishment of man. Yes, it's a masterpiece of horror, but not inspiration. Get out. Get out. You have no eyes, 
does it? You see death in blood. I see life. Get out. Tell your professor he has sent the wrong messenger. You're lucky I'm not a king. If I were a messenger, you'd lose your head. It was an unfortunate end to the day. That unhappy man and his unhappy daughter were all I could remember. Not the Italian masterpiece I had come to Siena to see. I went to the bar in the Hotel Continental where I was staying and ordered a whiskey. May I join you? Oh, David Michaels. Yeah. Yes, sure, of course. Sit down. Thanks. Oh, I've just spent a horrible few hours. I'm glad to see you. Unnerving. Here, have a drink. No, thanks. I knew you were there. I I followed you. To Dr. Lombard? You did? Why? I think you have a message for me in your pocket. I do? Look in your handkerchief pocket. Upper left-hand corner of your suit. Why? Yeah. So there is. And all folded up. It has your name on it. David. Who put it there? It's the only way Sibylla and I can reach one another. Oh, yes, she asked me. She asked me did I have a message for her. Is that what she meant? I tried placing a note for her in your pocket when you left the cafe, but I wasn't quick enough. You give notes to strangers to carry? Exactly. The telegraph boy, the grocer, the plumber, any visitor. Every day I write Sibylla a note of love and hope. And I look for someone who's going to the house, slip it into his pocket, and tell him to ring twice. It's the signal that the visitor may have word from me. You mind explaining all this? Well, Sibylla and I met a year ago. In fact, it was I who discovered the Leonardo and persuaded her to use all her inheritance to buy it. As it turned out, the painting has come between us. Uh, if you'll excuse me, I want to read her note. Uh, hmm. Yes. Well, I'll read it to you. David is getting worse. I am being strangled. Light ten candles tomorrow. S. S for Sibylla. Mm -hmm. Light and candles, I... Oh, well, at the church of San Domenico, where, where we first met. How has it come between you? It infected her father. It's bewitched him. Sibylla feels if she leaves and takes it with her, which she has every right to do, it will kill him. He has such a bad heart now. She keeps putting me off. Wait, wait. So I stay in Siena. I'm forbidden to see her. She is not allowed out of the house. We write notes. That's our life. Yeah, but I don't understand in, in this day and age why she just doesn't walk out the door. I think her father would kill her if she tried to walk out the door. No, she'd have to lock him up and then run. Why else do you think I hang around Siena? I'm hoping. I can't bring myself to believe it's hopeless. The next day... I took my old table at the cafe in the Piazza del Campo. I addressed an envelope to Dr. Lombard, number 13, Via Papa Guillo, Siena, and began to write. I would apologize for my rudeness and crudeness and ask to be permitted to see the painting again. You see, I felt I had let down Professor Dalton. I'd never be able to explain to him what had happened. There you are, honey. You haven't left Siena. All's right with the world. Oh, Mrs. Lombard. <laughs> you know, I was just about to write the doctor a letter and apologize. You see, I've addressed the envelope. Oh, don't bother. He sent me here to apologize to you. He? To me? Oh, yes. Arthur's lonely. He does silly things, says silly things. You have to understand him. You see, I thought I should get back and see the painting again. I, I promised Professor Dalton that I'd describe it in detail for his book. Do you think that the doctor would let me take a flash picture? Well, you can aim it. Don't bring a camera. Sibylla, Arthur, I brought the gentleman back. If you'll excuse me. I am so hot, I simply must take a cold bath. Uh, would you mind coming into this room off the hall with me? No, no, not at all. How is your father? Is he better? Oh, he's still asleep. He doesn't know you're here, I don't think, and I don't want to tell him yet. I must speak to you. I never have a chance to speak to anyone. It's so difficult. He watches me. Sibylla! Sibylla! Yes, father? 
Did I hear someone come in? No, Father. Come and tell me when your mother returns with that ball, will you? Oh, yes, yes, Father. He's going to find out any minute now. He'll be here. What can I do? Can you come again tomorrow morning about ten? Come here again? Yes. Make some excuse. A, a, a sketch pad. You, you didn't bring a sketch pad to make a, a drawing of the, of the Leonardo. And then tomorrow I'll, I'll unlock the door for you where the painting hangs. Father will come with you, of course. And then I'll go out the door and lock you both in. Lock us in that room? Is that what you mean? Don't you understand? It's the only way for me to leave this house if I'm ever going to do it. I'm to be locked in that room with your father and the Leonardo. Oh, I'll never have another chance. I'm watched every minute. The key will be returned by a safe person in, in half an hour, or perhaps sooner, as if it were all a mistake. I thought I heard voices. Ah, my son, Paul. <laughs> all is forgiven. Emotions, emotions. We're all victims. The painting. Shall we go and look at it again? Sibylla and David must have planned it out together. And I didn't like that. Light ten candles at the church of San Domenico tomorrow. It was obvious. Ten o'clock, they meet, and they run away. Well, if I'd had a hand in it, certainly Professor Dalton would never forgive me. That the unknown Leonardo in the possession of Dr. Lombard should mean two things to two people is quite possible. All his life, Da Vinci himself made drawings of ugliness and beauty side by side, as though he were depicting the two halves of human coinage. So the blood drawn in this masterpiece could mean carnage to young Paul and the pulse of life to Dr. Lombard. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Time passes. Paul returns to graduate school, gets his Ph.D., but still is unable to direct his life. From time to time, he is plagued with phantom night sightings of the Lombard family in Siena. The dreams vary, but they all begin the same way. Paul enters the front door of the House of the Dead Heart and, looking up, sees the ancient marble heart, bleeding thick red drops. He cannot rid himself of the nightmare. Paul Wyant, what brings you back here to the university? What are you doing with yourselves these days? Hmm? Well, I haven't decided yet. I came to see you, Professor, because... How can I put it to you? When I was here at graduate school, I felt I was on the right track. By learning more and more, I would have a better chance to decide which road I should take. Mm -hmm. And that hasn't occurred to you yet? Hmm? I have this feeling now that somewhere along the way, somewhere I've been shunted off the rails. You know, Paul, I never told you this, but last year, when you returned from Italy, you seemed to have lost your drive, certainly in my classes. Oh, you passed, because you knew the subject, not because you wanted to. I... I have these awful dreams. Oh? You want to talk about them? I dream I'm in that special room Dr. Lombard calls his gallery where the Leonardo hangs. He keeps saying over and over how happy he is living inside Da Vinci's creation. Inside it. And he goes on talking, and his daughter, Sibylla, a very beautiful, sad girl, 20, well, she's standing there. She's standing there the way she did in real life. And the picture begins to bleed. And Dr. Lombard is saying uh, the painting is a sacrament. And then Sibylla says, Notice the modeling of the left hand. It recalls the hand of Mona Lisa. The embroidery of the cloak is symbolic. And these dreams are all alike. Um, no. But there's always blood. Always the marble heart over the front door, bleeding. You've talked to nobody about this? Who, who would understand? 
About Dr. Lombard, Paul. I don't know whether it's actual telepathy of some sort, or perhaps there was something in the papers about it that I didn't see. He died, didn't he? You did see something in the papers, huh? Well, no, I, I, I just know. I, I've known it for... I, I think I've known it for a month now. I wonder what happened to the painting. I wondered about that myself. And Sibylla. Why don't you drop them a line? I'll give you the address. I'm sure they'd be glad to hear from you. I know it by heart, Professor. 13 Via Papa Willo. The House of the Dead Heart. The cloud of uncertainty is wrapped about me like a cocoon suddenly lifted. I knew what I must do. Indeed, had I done it months earlier, I might have lived easier. Do you understand? It was as if I had read a book, but closed it before I got to the last chapter. Now I had to open that book and find out how it all ended. Si, signore. You wish... Uh... Uh, my name is Paul Wyatt. Uh, you're the editor of the American News in Siena. Yes, signore. Well, I'm trying to find out something about someone I knew here in Siena. Well, certainly, if, if I can help. Dr. Lombard. Does that name mean anything to you? <laughs> Does it mean? Dr. Lombard, the famous man with the Leonardo. He, he died, you know. Ah, uh, yes. D does his widow still live at the... Oh, uh, yes, yes, yes. On the, the uh, via... Let me think. Via Papaguillo. The house of the dead heart. She's still there? Oh, yes. And they had a daughter, Sibylla. Ah, <laughs> you knew her? Well, we met briefly. Tragic story. Romeo and Juliet. She didn't marry? No. There was someone also an American like yourself. They were... Uh, <laughs> it's too bad. Tragic. He... Uh... David Michaels? Yes, that's the name. Uh, but we don't write about it. He married another American girl. And he went home to Cincinnati. Miss Lombard. She still lives in her father's house. Oh, yes. And the Leonardo. The Leonardo also is still there. Thank you. Thank you very much. I couldn't make myself walk the length of the Via Papaguillo and ring that doorbell. So, back to the familiar cafe on the piazza to fortify myself with a whiskey. When I got there, all the tables were occupied, except one way at the back where a lady sat alone. As I got closer, I could see three empty glasses on the table... One in her hand. I beg your pardon. Uh, are you? An American. Sit down, honey. Uh, are, you, are you Mrs. Lombard? Do you know me? Do I know you? Mrs. Lombard, I'm, I'm Paul Wyatt. How do you do? You better have something to drink, honey. It makes this heat bearable. You don't remember me? Didn't you come to see my husband a long time ago? Not that long. A year and a half. I had a letter of introduction from Professor Dalton. Mm, Sam Dalton. Of course. Sam Dalton. <laughs> An old dear friend. He was a house guest many years ago. Sam Dalton. <laughs> How is he? I saw him quite recently. He's very well, thank you. Sam. Names from the past. Sibylla and I. We often say we should go back. She's never been to America, you know. She was born right here. How is she? Sibylla? I don't know. She's very quiet. Sometimes days go by, we don't talk. I think it has something to do with that painting. I was thinking of coming around to visit you, if I could. If you could. I'll tell you what. As soon as you finish your drink. That's you and I go home and surprise Sibella. I didn't get around to ordering a drink. Well, that's perfect. Then we don't have to wait. I had to let the cook and houseman go. Uh, I'm afraid it's a little shabby. Since Arthur passed away, I haven't had the energy. Sibella? I brought someone. Sibylla. Oh, there you are. Hello, Miss Lombard. Do you remember him, Sibylla? Oh, oh, 
I never did know your last name. Why? Carl reminded me that Sam Dalton sent him. How is he? Oh, did I ask you that already? He's fine. I told him I was coming to Siena and that I would look you up. Miss Lombard. Yes? How have you been keeping yourself? I mean, well, do you still have the Leonardo? Would you care to see it? Oh, yes. It's an original Leonardo, you know. I'll get the key. I could not believe my eyes. In less than two years, this beautiful girl had grown old. She took the same key from the same secret drawer, walked me down the stone passage to the padlocked door, unlocked it, and stood me on that special place on the carpet. The pomegranate. Left foot on it, please. How's that? Do you wish to see it now? Sure. Oh. So you couldn't part with it? What do you mean? I don't wish to be indelicate, but at one time... You thought I would sell it? I thought perhaps... You thought it was a millstone around your neck. But you were right to keep it. It's too beautiful. You think so? It maddened me when I first saw it. Couldn't control myself. Now I realize the intense meaning in it. Oh, it's beautiful. I never thought it beautiful. Really? Never? I hated it. Oh, no. He made me come into this room. I'd have to stand here like a museum guide. Notice the modeling of the left hand. It recalls the hand of the Mona Lisa. The embroidery on the cloak is symbolic. The sword and the blood and the flesh. I can't say any more, Daddy. Don't make me. It hurts. Slumbered. Sibylla, are you all right? I'm not looking at it now. I can't bear to look at it. You can't force me to look. Did, did you wish me to close the curtain in front of it? I hate it. I've always hated it. But he would never let me. He will never let me now. You mean your your father, Dr. Lombard, didn't wish you to part with the picture? No. He prevented me. He will always prevent me. Oh, I see. I see. You promised him before his death. No, I didn't promise anything. He died so suddenly he didn't have time to make me. He died, you see. And then, you see... Yes? I was free. I was perfectly free. Or so I thought until I tried. Well, well, until you tried what? To disobey him. To sell the picture. Then I found it was impossible. I tried again and again. But he was always in the room with me. This room? Yes. Everywhere. Wherever I am in the house. And I can't lock him out. I can never lock him out now. I told you I'd never have another chance. What can I say? It's too late. But you ought to have helped me. That day. The human mind, especially of a sensitive soul, can only stand so much before breaking. All of those we have met have been tested. All have been found wanting. And some even unable to meet life. What other explanation can there be? Surely you're not one of those who believes in the power of pigments used by a painter 500 years ago. I'll return shortly. We humans delude ourselves into believing we can fathom most of the answers to life's mysteries. We claim that seeing is believing, and what we don't know won't hurt us. We scoff at UFOs, ghosts, thought transference, and much of the unexplained, and therefore the unscientific. And perhaps in that category belongs the post-mortem power of a masterpiece, a painting with a force of its own 
like that of Dorian Gray. I personally go along with the thought that anything is possible because I happen to know the ignorance of man is stupendous. Our cast included Christopher Tabori, Gordon Gould, E.V. Juster, and Court Benson. The entire production was... This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Who was it that said... A wise woman never yields by appointment. It should always be an unexpected happiness. That may very well be the ideal situation. However, we have those neglected ladies who keep waiting and waiting. And some of them have waited for so long that they cannot really be blamed if they take steps to arrange for the unexpected. What do you want? I want to gamble on you. I want to bet you really would like to get out. Get out? You're not in as deep as you think. We can say you cooperated with these people because we wanted to expose them. We? We. You need me. Look at me. Am I so hard to take? Oh, no. I'll save you, darling, from your worst enemy. Yourself. <laughs> mystery drama, The Old Maid Murders, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Tammy Grimes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. a bit of philosophy that is 2,300 years old. A woman's time of opportunity is short, and if she doesn't seize it, no one wants to marry her, and so she sits and waits and watches for omens. Laura McRae has been confidential secretary to that renowned political scientist and advisor to presidents, Professor Morgan Lowcroft, for the past 12 years, and during all that time, she has been sitting and watching and waiting for omens that might suggest she could become something more. Unfortunately, there haven't been any. Come in, please. Oh, Miss McCray, come in. Have a seat. It's nine o'clock, you're right on time. Uh, did you have a good night's rest? No, Dr. Waller, I did not. Oh, well, I may have to prescribe a sedative... I don't want to start that sort of thing. Well, we may need it for your treatment. I'm very tired, Dr. Waller. Do you mind if I go back to my room? Oh, no, by all means. Uh, get some rest. You'll feel better. No, I won't feel better. Not till I find someone who believes me. Well, give me a chance to trust me. Why should I trust you? What have you got to lose? What have I got to gain? I've already lost everything. I'll never get another job. Uh, tell me what happened. I don't know what happened. Hmm. How did it begin? When did it begin? I don't remember. You don't want to remember? Let me alone. You won't believe me. Tell me the truth, and I'll believe you. 
the truth. How did it begin? How did it begin? When did it begin? It never began. It always was. I loved him. Even before I met him. Does that make me sound crazy? No. It was always Dr. Lowcroft and Miss McCrae. He was very good to me. But I didn't want that. I wanted him. They were women from time to time. He was a flirtatious man. But I didn't mind. They didn't mean anything. I had the best part of him. The part that negotiated with presidents and prime ministers. I was with him when he was truly alive. It's just... Yes. It's just that I wanted more. Oh, not much. Just a little bit more. I understand. No, you don't. And that morning he walked into the office, the way he always did, with that quick little smile on his face, and I said, good morning, Dr. Lowcroft. And you know, he would never say good morning to me. He would just wink his eye and say, Let's get to work, Miss McRae. Now come inside with this morning's tale of woe. Number one, you're to call the president. Yes, and who else? I should think you'd want to return the president's call immediately. Why? Because you always do. <laughs> you see how we become slaves of habit. Uh, read on, Miss McRae. Would you be willing to give the commencement address at Western University? No. And Miss Mallis called. Ah, yes. Who is... Miss Maris. You've never heard of the beautiful, desirable Madeline Maris? Oh. I saw her latest film. Right. I believe you're blushing, Miss McRae. True, it was quite frank and even clinical in certain places, but all in all a work of art, which is how one must look at these things, no? I suppose so. I asked myself, what would it be like to spend an evening with a woman of so much vitality? I phoned her and left word. I'm surprised she returned my call. It would be a surprise if she didn't return your call. Now, Miss McRae, I need your advice. I called Madeline Maris on the spur of the moment. But as you well know, I am not a spur of the moment person. Now, well, I, I need your guidance. After all, you're an expert on love. Me? As a female. The fact is that love is for women. What did Lord Byron say? Man's love is of man's life, a thing apart. But is a woman's whole existence. Lord Byron never outgrew his juvenile fantasy. But he was right. Now, should I back away from Miss Madeline Maris? You're asking me for advice? Of course. You're the one person in the world I can trust completely. Dr. Lowcroft, I would rather you didn't involve me in these... Uh, these affairs of yours. Miss McRae, you know how we do things around here. Prepare me a position paper. Well? <sighs> yes, sir. Since Miss Maris's appeal could only be considered physical, there are those who would say you are exploiting her purely for pleasure. Uh, yes. It might prove difficult to shed Miss Maris should you tire of her charms. Why? She is America's sex goddess, and so people would assume that she was too much for you. Or perhaps you were not enough for her. You could become an object of ridicule very incisively put, Miss McRae. Now you know why I've kept you all these years. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Lowcroft's office. One moment, please. It's Miss Madeline Maris. Are you here? Oh, well, so much for all our honest resolve and intelligent design. Hello there. Yes, himself. Uh, what did I have in mind? A dinner this evening. Huh? Oh, some quiet spot where we would not be besieged by the media. Oh, your place is fine. Seven is excellent, of course. Till then. Uh, make a note, Miss McRae. I need a bottle of Chateau Lafitte Roth's shield. Uh, no, I better wait to see if she has the palate for it. Her first date, a very good domestic wine is in order. Dr. Lowcroft, are you really going to have a date with Madeline Maris tonight? Yes, my dear, and wish me luck. Dr. Lowcroft, look, don't I... look so troubled. I know how to be very discreet. It isn't that, it's... It's what? Mm. Yes? I... I better answer the phone. Go to Lowcroft's office. One moment. It's a Mr. Jeremy Wilmot. Are you in? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Jeremy, how are you? Yes, I just finished reading it. Mm-hmm. No, you're onto something. 
Oh, only a few suggestions. I made them on the margins. I'll send it down with my secretary. She'll guard it with her life. Uh, what's the best hotel on the beach? Uh, good. She'll be there this evening. Right. Goodbye, Jeremy. Now, how would you like a little vacation? Uh, in Florida. Now, where is that envelope? Uh, it's in my attaché case. Now, guys, here it is. A vacation? In here, a manuscript by Jeremy Wilmot. The historic roots of the economies of emerging nations. <laughs> it sounds grim, but it's great. Dr. Lowcroft. Now, if you check into the Beach Royale for a few days and let yourself go. But I have so many things to do. You need a vacation. You're tense, you're nervous, irritable, out of sorts. Oh. Whatever's gotten into you, a few days off will sweeten you again. But I can't spare the time. You know how we do things around here, Miss McRae. Now, I'll drive you to the airport myself. By noon, Dr. Waller, I was on a flight to Miami. You didn't think it unusual? He was always sending me off somewhere on an hour's notice. I was lucky it was Miami, Florida. It could have been Karachi, India. And, uh, and then what happened? You know what happened. I told this over and over. What happened, Miss McCray? The thing. The thing at the baggage claim. The manuscript envelope. It was in my suitcase. It was too big to fit into my carry-on bag. It was in my suitcase. And my suitcase wasn't there when I arrived in Miami. What did you do? I waited. I waited and waited. Then I went to see the person in charge. Uh, do you recall what you said to that person? I was very upset. I said, look here, my suitcase is missing. You've got to find my suitcase. And he said... Uh, Ma'am, we are doing our best. There's an important manuscript in that suitcase. Do you understand? Uh, you, you, you come in on flight seven from Washington, huh? I don't like to do this. I hate to try to impress you, but I'm working for Dr. Morgan Lowcroft. Well, well, I am doing the best I can. Now, if it's not good enough, maybe Dr. Morgan Lowcroft can come down here and look for a suitcase himself, huh? But it'll be my fault if it's gone. Things like this simply cannot happen to me. Well, they can happen to anybody. Hey, Theodore, you put down that comic book and check to see is everything out of Flight 7, huh? Yeah, I got a lady here, so you just keep on looking. Does this mean you haven't found my suitcase? Well, we're going to turn the place inside out and upside down, okay? But everything was in that suitcase. Uh, Ma'am, what's the problem? We don't find it. You get a whole brand new outfit on the house. But the manuscript. So it's a manuscript. There's got to be a duplicate copy, oh. huh? <laughs> Why does it have to be the end of the world? I don't know what's the matter with me, honey. I'm sorry. Well, you just write down where you're staying, huh? And I guarantee you, in one hour, one way or the other, you're going to hear from me. Well, how do you do? Oh, it's you. From the airline. Yes, ma'am. I thought I'd better bring it over myself. That can't be my suitcase. <laughs> it looks a lot worse than it is. It's destroyed. Well, we, we are sorry, ma'am. Hey, you get a new one. Well, how did it get so mangled? Well, we got this mechanical lefter and sometimes... Well, anyhow, your clothes seem to be okay now. But anything you want to replace, well, we... The envelope. It's ripped. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I don't think there's more than maybe a couple of pages that might be readable. Let me look. The first two, three, four, five, six pages have been torn. They don't look too bad. The whole thing appears to be so crumpled. I have to type a fresh copy. Uh, look, uh, do you want us to handle that for you? No, thank you. You've done enough. Well, now, you let us know if we can help out. I will. Goodbye. Yeah, yeah well, have a nice vacation. <sighs> Front desk. This is Miss McRae in 912. I would like a typewriter, paper, and some carbons, please. Uh, n no, I know it's difficult at this time of day. No, tomorrow morning will not do. I am working for Dr. Morgan Lowcroft. Yes. Uh, within 30 minutes? Thank you. If we are to consider the specifics of the distribution of American military forces throughout the world, we may design the proper countermeasures to halt the insidious spread of American imperialism. Yes, Miss McRae. Miss McRae? There it was, Dr. Waller. I couldn't believe it. 
I read the entire manuscript and... and uh, please, uh, calm yourself, Miss McRae. Calm myself. I'm telling you about a plot to reveal the entire system of our defense. And you tell me to be calm. You must. It is important. I'm telling you that a man who operates on the highest levels of our government, who knows every single secret, is a foreign agent, and you want me to be calm? Miss McRae. I'm telling you... This man is a traitor and a spy. And you want me to keep calm. I don't know. I don't know if I would want her to be calm. After all, she's making quite a lethal charge. But then perhaps Dr. Waller knows something that's hidden from the rest of us at this point. Anyhow, we shall see who is going to keep calm in Act Two which shall arrive here shortly. At the last, said the poet, our only hope lies in ourselves. Of course, what he meant was our hope of salvation. But short of that... We can really use all the help we can get. It's all very well to advise people to be self-reliant, but then it all depends on the kind of self one has to begin with, right? I'm asking you to be calm, Miss McRae, so that you may give me a full description of the event. Dr. Waller, you already have that description. Now, uh, let me see if I can understand what you're saying. What is there to understand? Uh, please, please, Miss McRae. Where is the difficulty? Morgan Lowcross said to me, Take this envelope, which contains a manuscript by a Mr. Jeremy Wilmot, and deliver it to him in Florida. Accidentally, I happened to see the contents of the envelope. It's a document written by Dr. Lowcroft himself, filled with the most vital military and economic secrets. Well, what did you do then? No, please. Don't pass this off as if it's merely a weather report. Do you realize the implications of what I've just told you? Yes. Do you believe what I've just told you? I accept what you just told me. I'm sick and tired of being patronized by people like you. I'm going back to my room. You will go back to your room and do what? I am the last person in the world you can talk to. After me, who is there? Oh. Now, you claim it was a document filled with military secrets? It was. Your next move? I didn't know what to do. I sat there trying to think. I suddenly felt all alone in the world. I had to be in touch with someone, with something. Without knowing why, I turned on the television set. There was a marvelous burst of music and color. And her face, Madeline Morris's face was on the screen. I was so angry, I lost all control of myself. Somehow, I blamed her for what he had done. You blamed her? Why? I don't know why. It's just that I thought she was part of something that was corrupting him. I wanted to smash the TV screen, but I was afraid it would explode or something, so I turned it off. Yes? And then the phone rang. I let it ring. And then I thought I'd better answer. Uh, hello? Uh, is this Miss Laura McRae? Yes. Yes. May I come up for the manuscript? Um. Uh, perhaps if you aren't busy, we could have some dinner. Oh. Or a drink. At any rate, I, I cannot wait to see my manuscript and Morgan's suggestions. Why don't I just pick it up? No. I'll, I'll meet you downstairs. In the lobby. Well, did you meet him in the lobby? Dr. Waller, I wanted to get away from there. I wanted to run with that envelope. I wasn't going to give it to him. I wanted to get back to the airport. But how? And then I realized he didn't know me. He'd never seen me. So I took the elevator downstairs. I didn't meet him. But the trouble was, he met me just as I was about to go out the door. Uh, Miss McRae, Miss McRae, here I am. Um, uh, Miss McRae, I'm Jeremy Wilmot. Uh, you see, I recognize the manuscript envelope <laughs> you're carrying. Well, uh, here I am. 
Yes. So, thank you very much for taking this trouble. Uh, uh, may I have it? What? Uh, no. No? Miss McRae, what, what did you just say? I said no. Well, I'm afraid I don't understand. You were sent here specifically to deliver this manuscript. Uh, to deliver it to me. You can't have it. Miss McRae, is something the matter with you? I said you can't have it. Now, I must insist. Take your hands off me. Don't you dare touch me. Do you mean that uh, we're going to have a scene about this? I said take your hands off me. Please, if something's the matter, let me help Stop you. It. Get away from me. Hey, hey, what's going on? This man is attempting to uh, to attack me. Hey, hey, hold it, Barney. Now, look, all I'm trying to do... Help me, somebody, please. Help me. And uh, did you receive help, Miss McRae? Oh, yes, Doctor. In a moment, he was surrounded by an angry crowd. In the confusion, I slipped out the door and into a taxi. Soon I was at the airport and on a plane back to Washington. I was so frightened. I could hardly breathe. Frightened? Of what? Well, by now they knew. They? The ring of spies and secret agents of which Morgan Lowcraft was a part. Would they be waiting for me at the airport in Washington? I somehow made it to the cab stand. I went directly to Morgan Lowcroft's apartment. He wasn't home. I decided to wait in the study. Oh, how did you get into the apartment? I have a key. It was midnight. And then 1 a.m. And 2. And finally, just a few minutes before 3, I heard the door open. Miss McCray, what are you doing here? I see you didn't spend the night with Miss Varys. What are you doing here? I read the manuscript. You did? Obviously, Jeremy Wilmot didn't have a chance to get in touch with you. He's probably been booked for disorderly conduct. Jeremy Wilmot booked for disorderly conduct? Jeremy? Obviously, you didn't hear me. I said I read the manuscript. I heard you. What are you going to do about it? Well, that depends. What are you going to do about it? I'm going to save you. How? First, tell me why you did it. Well, I, I don't think I really know. Yes, you do. Every boy dreams of becoming president. Most of them get over it. Some of us don't. But you have almost as much real power as the president. Now that's the trouble. Almost. It would be better if I had no power at all. It's the near miss that can cause the fatal wound. But you never tried to become president. You never tried to run for any office. I could never win. They see me as too much the uh, egghead, too much the professor. Are you trying to tell me that you became a traitor because you hoped if a foreign power could take over the country, you would be installed as the leader or dictator or whatever? <laughs> Miss McRae, you have this remarkable talent for oversimplification, but stripped down, you have just illuminated the essential kernel of truth. Do you want me to save you? Save me? Miss McRae, do you know the people you're dealing with? You could be dead by tomorrow. So could you. That manuscript is in a safe place. It'll be made public if anything ever happens to me. What are you proposing? I'm gambling on you. On my ability to read the real, the true Morgan Lowcroft. I believe you're in over your head. In your heart, you want to get out of this. But you think you're in too deep. But you're not. No. It was a foolish notion. You gave in to it. And before you knew it, you lost control. But we can regain it. We can say you cooperated with these people so you could reveal and expose them. We? Yes, we. You need me. Look at me. Am, am I so hard to look at? No. I'll save you, Morgan. Darling. I'll save you from your worst enemy. Yourself. Uh, you, you'd better answer that. Hello? Oh, yes. Yes, Miss Maris. He did arrive home safely. No, no, there's no point in calling him in the morning. He'll be busy for a long time to come. Good night. Now, hold on, Miss McRae. My name is Laura. Call me Laura, darling. As you know, Miss McRae... Both Dr. Wilmot and Dr. Lowcraft tell completely different stories. They're lying. And Dr. Jeremy Wilmot is a professor of economics in a leading Florida university. He is known to have uh, no subversive connections. I know his version, and Morgan Lowcroft's version by heart. 
Dr. Lowcraft denies ever having written such a document. Naturally. What else could he do? But, uh, let us continue with your story. You confronted him early that morning when you returned from Florida. Yes. And then? I insisted we move immediately to expose the spy ring to the authorities. But he said we would have to proceed cautiously. Well, well what made you decide, finally, that he could no longer be trusted? It was Madeline Maris. Oh? He had promised me that, that he would no longer see her or have anything to do with her. And uh, he broke that promise? Yes. He had been meeting her in secret. But you know Washington and the columnists. You can't hold them off for too long. One morning I was reading the paper and in one of the columns it said, In out-of-the-way places, two familiar faces, beauty and the brain, Morgan and Maddie. It could have been gossip. I checked it with the reporter. It was all over town. Everyone knew it but me. So I confronted him with it. I said to him, you lied to me. And you know what he did? He, he just laughed. <laughs> oh, my poor Miss McCray. Don't laugh at me. Our agreement was that you were to drop Madeline Maris. Now, let me tell you about our agreement. When you behaved so inexplicably, I didn't know what to make of it. You had created a wild story about me being a foreign agent. I have the evidence. Now, let me finish, please, Miss McRae. I looked at you as you talked to me. I could see how distressed you were. Of course. It wasn't an easy moment for me. So I decided to play along. Play along? This is no game. I was hoping perhaps you might come to your senses. But, Miss McRae, I am not helping you by perpetuating this farce. We'll see who thinks it's a farce when that document is made public. I wouldn't advise you to do that. Are you threatening me? I'm counseling you. Yes, uh, you need good counsel. Sensible, practical guidance. Don't try that tactic with me. I know how you operate. The wise, calm, patient, all-knowing expert. Along about this time, you should be lighting your pipe. You should be quoting from Aristotle. Uh, Miss McRae, it's difficult to live here at the summit. To be a part of the frenzy. Yes, that's what it is. And to realize how fragile, how thin the line between war and peace is. How easily the world can simply cease to exist even five minutes from now. You have betrayed your country. It's more than most people can stand. And so many of us give way. You know, bend, crack, break. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It's like, it's like combat fatigue. Now, let me help you. I'm not the one who needs help. Take a leave of absence with full pay, of course. You're not going to get rid of me, Dr. Lowcroft. Rest. Relax. And then when you're better, come back. Your job will be waiting. How could I ever get along without you? Is that your attitude? I'll have to go to the FBI. As I said, I would not advise you to do that. What are you going to do about it? Do you propose to have me killed? Killed? Oh, no. No, of course not. But dear Laura McRae, if you persist in this foolishness, it will be something much worse. Something much worse than being killed? A fate worse than death? What can such a prospect be, especially to a lady like Laura McRae? Each of them talks to the other like a person who holds a winning hand. But who has the aces and who has the deuces? The showdown is scheduled for Act Three. Once again, we talk about the basic stuff of life. Life and fiction. Reality and illusion. What is real? And what do we imagine? Laura McRae says she read a document which proves Morgan Lowcroft is a traitor. He claims there's no such document at all. Now, what can you believe? Which of them is telling the truth? But uh, then again, what is truth? Morgan... Why are we fighting with each other? Why do you want to destroy me? I want to save you. 
From what? From the corruption you're drowning in. Miss McRae, things cannot possibly continue in this manner. That's right. I have a duty to perform. It's greater than any feeling I may hold for you. Yes. There are so many who worship at your shrine, Morgan. And I was the most devout of them all. I was even willing to accept the fact that you could betray your country. Why not? How could treason be bad? If Morgan Lowcroft is a traitor. But we're finished. Finished, Morgan. I'm going to the police and to the media. Don't. I'm sorry. The magic is gone. At one time, I'd have done anything under the sun for your sake, but no more. Not for my sake, but for yours. Goodbye, Morgan. You can't stop me. That's what I thought. But he did stop me. It seems I forgot something. You know what I forgot, Doctor? Tell me. I forgot that he was the establishment. And you simply do not buck the establishment. I went to a top officer in intelligence. Someone I knew. You develop contacts. You know who to see to get things done. He listened to me very intently. And when I finished, he looked at me and he said... Thank you, Miss McRae. We'll take this under advisement. Colonel, what are you saying? I'm saying we'll investigate. No, Colonel, that's not what you're saying at all. Miss McRae. Let me tell you what you're saying with your eyes, your manner, and that tone of your voice. You're saying I'll humor this kook and get rid of her as gracefully as I can. No, Miss McRae. I know the drill. I had to get rid of kooks myself. You're seeing me because you want to be covered. But that's as far as it goes. He's talked to you already, hasn't he? Miss McRae, we have run a check on Dr. Lowcroft that is so exhaustive he couldn't swat a fly without our knowing it. You mean you're just going to sit there? I have to. Because if I tried to follow up on what you've told me, I couldn't get anywhere either. But this man is a foreign agent. It's obvious. To whom? This document. You read it. Yes, but how can you prove he wrote it? What should I have done? Why did you confront him? Why didn't you come to me first? I could have investigated quietly. Uh, this way you alerted him. You can accept the fact that I could be right and yet disregard me completely. Yes. How can you sit there and say that so calmly? It's hard to explain this, but you know something? Even if you're right, it's not the end of the world. Ourselves, our adversaries... What secrets do we really have from each other? I can't accept that. I believe it matters. What's your complaint, Miss McCray? You say the media's sitting on the story. My paper published it. My stations carried it. But look at how you slandered it. Miss Laura McCray claims. Miss McCray alleges. Well, that's what they are. Claims, allegations. I stated basic facts. If I told the story as you told it to me, I could be sued for libel. This subheadline, Spinster, says Dr. Lowcroft admitted his guilt. What about it? Do you have to label me as a spinster? How does the dictionary define spinster? An unmarried woman, does that describe you? If I were an unmarried man, would the headlines describe me as a bachelor? Spinster. There's something, something ungainly, something erotic. What right does a woman have not to be married? There must be something wrong with her. You came to us with a story. Because of your position, we printed it. We have now discharged our duty. It's up to the authorities to take it further. I showed you that document. Well, he denies that he ever gave it to you. And here we go, round and round again. I have a responsibility. yes. And I know to whom? Yourself. You're scared, Mr. Jones. Of what? You're afraid you'll be frozen out. You won't get any more inside information, any off-the-record briefings. You're not going to rock the boat. You're not going to make a powerful enemy. Just between you and me, Miss McRae, what's the real story? I told you the real story. No, 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 you didn't. I've been around this town too long not to recognize a vendetta when I see one. What did he do to you? Are you trying to say there's something personal in this? There has to be. I only... 
Is that what you think? A woman of your inside experience and understanding? How could you miscalculate so badly? Yes, Miss McRae. How could you? I thought... No, it doesn't matter anymore. But it does. Nobody cares about me. I care about you. As a patient. As a person. How can you care about me as a person? I'm a spinster. There's something so... pathetic. No. Ludicrous. About that word. I find you attractive? Perhaps you do. There's a tone in your voice. I recognize it. Well, you're quite a woman for recognizing tones and voices. It's a talent you develop. You have a seductive tone. <coughs> well, I, uh, I wasn't aware of it. Why did you say you find me attractive? Well, you have a, uh, a quality of inner strength, of integrity. At my age, a man finds that more uh, appealing than the superficialities. Uh, uh, let's continue. You actually find me attractive? What, uh... <clears throat> you know, what did you do after you saw the publisher? You do find me attractive? Yes, Miss McRae. Say Miss McRae again. Why? McRae. I mean, it's hard. Crisp. But it sounds so lovely when you say it. Uh, uh, tell me what you did. Yes, I'll tell you. I'll tell you anything. I found out Morgan Lowcroft was right. He didn't have to kill me. I was already dead. As Morgan Lowcroft's secretary, all doors were open to me. As that kooky spinster, Laura McRae, everyone was out when I phoned. And then, you know what I did? Then go ahead. Tell me. Yes, I'll tell you. I was so frustrated. Angry. I stood outside the office building. And I actually harangued the people passing by. I'm Laura McRae. I was Morgan Lowcroft's secretary for 12 years till he fired me. The man is a spy and a traitor. And nobody wants to do anything about it. Keep away from me, officer. You can't silence me. Nobody can silence me. But surely, Miss McCrae... You must call me Laura, Doctor. Laura. Mm -hmm. You know that that kind of conduct would be considered unbalanced. Yes. But it doesn't matter now. What was wrong with me all those years? Why did I have eyes only for him? Why was I blind to other men? There were men who must have thought I was attractive. There must have been men who looked at me the way you're looking at me now. Well, I'm not aware that I'm looking at you in any specific sort of way. You are? You are? Why did you kill him? Why? For my country. Your country? Yes. I killed him because somebody had to stop him. I went to the apartment. I confronted him. I said, you can't be allowed to get away with this. And once again, he laughed. You should have heard that laugh. <laughs> oh, my poor Laura. Haven't they locked you up yet? Don't talk that way to me. You're insane, dear girl. Insane. I'm not. Oh, I'm sorry. I must ask you to leave. I want to save you. Who's that? Can't you guess? I'm surprised she doesn't have her own key. She does, but she keeps losing it. You don't want to be saved. That's right. Goodbye, Miss McCoy. But I'm going to save you, whether you like it or not. Now, look, this has gone on long enough. If I can't save you in one way, I'll save you in another. This is how I'll save you. You're, you're, you're crazy. Put that down. I'll save you. Ah, how, what did you do? What did you do? Ah, I saved you. Ah. <laughs> Keep ringing. Keep ringing. He'll never answer you. And how did you kill him? I killed him with this. This? He had one in his desk, just like this. Long, sharp, pointed. I remember some years ago he had lost his letter opener and I bought him a new one for Christmas. That one. Where did you get yours? I, uh... I don't remember. I've told you everything. I've told you all my secrets. You know why? Because I'm in love with you. You mustn't say that. I don't care. I need somebody. I must have somebody. Tell me the truth. What truth? 
Was there actually an incriminating document in that envelope, or did you create that situation yourself? Why would I create it? How could I create it? Because of Madeline Maritz. She wasn't his first affair. But for the first time, you felt vulnerable. Madeline Maritz touched off the explosion. In 12 years, you couldn't get Morgan Lowcraft to look at you. Now, you would force him to. That is not so, Doctor. The mishap with the baggage was the uh, spark for the explosion. I had deliberately typed a brand new manuscript. You could do it. You had access to enough secrets. I didn't do it. I don't care what you say. I know I didn't do it. Well, you uh, you could have done it without knowing it. Now, now listen to me. Yes, I listen. Sometimes, when we want something to happen, we want it so badly, we will it so strongly. Yes. When your voice is soft and sweet like it is now, I listen to anything. Everything. Well, what you did, creating that document, it's been blocked out of your mind. But you have to go back to it. You have got to face it. Whatever you say, we'll face it together, won't we? I'll help you. It is my job. Not only because it's your job. Say it's more than that. Well, of course it's more than that. I'll keep nothing from you. I'll bear my heart, expose my soul. Uh, Miss McRae, there is something we must straighten out. Oh, excuse me. Dr. Waller. Oh, yes, yes. No, no, not too late. Yes, I'd like that. Uh, tell the children we can go. Right. You know I do. See you soon. Bye. Who is that? Uh, that was my wife. You didn't tell me you were married? Why didn't you tell me you were married? It has no relation to your therapy. You seduced me. I what? You gave me that loving look, that special tone of voice. You didn't mean either of them. You only wanted to trick me into trusting you. And I did. I told you everything. Miss McRae. What happened to Laura? She's been betrayed again. You'll never do that to anyone else. Miss McRae, put that down. Never. You know by now... That letter opener can be a lethal weapon, so put it down. You betrayed me. I told you the truth, and you betrayed me. You're all against me. Miss McCray. That's right. Back to Miss McCray, the neurotic, frustrated spinster. Laura. It's too late for Laura. But no one will ever betray her again. No, you... Never! Don't! Never! Oh! Oh! Never! Oh! oh. doesn't look as if anyone will ever get the chance either. Our heroine has been put away for quite a long time. It proves, as the poet says, that love suppressed breeds a viper's nest. And was she telling the truth? Was he a spy or was it all a lie? I shall return shortly. flattered him on the magnificence of his imaginary wardrobe. That is, everyone except for one little boy who piped up, but the emperor is naked. It's too bad the story ends there. It would be most instructive to learn what happened to that clear-eyed little boy. Did everyone appreciate his sincerity and candor? How, if at all, was he rewarded? What sort of future did he have, if any? Was our story a variation on this ancient theme? Well, you know how it is with a good story. It's anything you want it to be. Our cast included Tammy Grimes, Norman Rose, Cork Benson, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. After all, he isn't it? 
a close friend or anything like that. Uh, no, but I mean, you know, if I'd been in my office or even at home where I was supposed to be, maybe he wouldn't have done it. Oh, nonsense. I mean, I was here with you. Where you were or weren't has nothing to do with what happened. But it's my fault. Will you stop taking credit for something you couldn't help? You're just being arrogant. Arrogant? Me? It's... It's Louise. Louise? What about Louise? First Benita Barlow, now this Stephen Bennett. Both dead. But Louise didn't know either one of them. That doesn't mean a thing. Not when you have the... the capacity for evil. The evil eye. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. What is blood? Well... That all depends. To some, blood is a cause for pride. To others, blood is a reason for prejudice. Blood. Mysterious blood. It unites us. It divides us. Ironic, isn't it? When you consider that everyone's blood is the same. Well, practically... Now, he must slow down, see? The road ahead is under construction. Are you sure this is the car? I'm sure. Hand me the rifle. Are you sure? I can see him sitting next to his driver. I swore I'd kill him. Now, now he belongs to me. Now! I missed him. How could I miss? You didn't miss! Couldn't you see the shells bounce off? His car is plated with armor. His glass is bulletproof. It's impossible, Anthony. You'll never be able to get him. I'll kill him, Vincent. Somewhere, somehow, I'll kill him. Our mystery drama, The Only Blood, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan. And stars Howard Da Silva. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. They came by the millions to America. They came wearing a rainbow of costumes and speaking a babble of tongues. Frightened by the strangeness of marvelous, mysterious America, they huddled together for security in clusters of kinfolk, landslide goombas, to begin the often slow and sometimes painful process of becoming Americans. And this is the story of one of them. A man named Anthony Boda. And it happened some 40 years ago in a large East Coast city. You're not hungry tonight, Anthony. Oh, yes, I'm really very hungry. You haven't eaten a bite. I... I was thinking. Oh, uh, about what? Well, I, 
I'm not sure. Ah, uh, look, you always tell me later. But this time, tell me sooner. I... Ten dollars is missing. Ten dollars? Yes. How is that possible? Well, you know, thanks to Lewis, we now have a cash register in the store. I was always opposed to it. Well, the boy is right. It's the modern way. It's how things are done in America. But when you kept the money in a drawer, nothing was ever... When missed. we kept the money in a drawer, we never knew. How could we tell? This way, every time you take in money, it prints on a paper. At the end of the day, the paper tells you how much money you should have. Oh, well, then perhaps... Uh, perhaps what? Perhaps the paper is wrong. Impossible. Now, what troubles me is it's always $10. What do you mean, always? Well, not only is it always $10, but it's always missing on a Friday night. I tell you, it's that machine. Oh, for the last six weeks. Could it be that Lewis... Oh, no. Your own son? Your only son? I don't know what to think. Throw out that machine. <laughs> Have your lunch, Lewis. Oh, I promised the lady she could have her shoes at one o'clock. No, no, I'll finish for you. Go. Mama doesn't like it when anybody's late to eat. Hello, Louie. Uh, what, what, what can I do for you, Chuck? You got to hand over a fin. Uh, listen, listen, could we talk about this later? What? Later? I'm here now. Get it up. Louis, who is this man? What does he want? You, uh, Pop, it, it's no just a No little... reason why you shouldn't introduce me to your old man. The association likes to know all its customers. What association is this, Lewis? Pop, I can explain everything later. I, I saw you last night, Charlie. Yeah, yeah, I know. But the executive board held a meeting this morning. You know how prices are going up everywhere. Like, for instance, what are you paying for leather today? You see what I mean? So, with uh, what with your overhead and everything, we got to go from 10 to 15. But I don't have the... Louie! I want to be your pal. But you know how it is. All right. Here you are. Lewis, what are you doing? Papa, please. Keep smiling, Pop. Everybody smiles today. Look at this fiver here. Even Lincoln's smiling. Shows you've done a good thing. See you next week. Same time, same station. So, this is what happens to the ten dollars. I was hoping you wouldn't find out. You were hoping what? That maybe I can't add... Count? I used to pay for my own pocket, but lately I... Uh... So, we belong to the association. For what reason? Because we have to. We have to? Everybody belongs. Every shop in the street. My son, it is quite possible that you have forgotten who you are. Let me remind you. You are not a sheep who follows. You are a man who leads. Poppy, you don't understand. I understand quite well. We had these bandits in the old country, too. When several rode up to our farm, my father shot them. No, Papa, you don't understand. I understand this, my son. I didn't come to this country to live on my knees. Dory. Good afternoon, Vincent. Well, I can see. Here is a man who carries the troubles of the entire world on his shoulders. You learn something every day. What did you learn today? I learned that men who appear to be strong, proud, and honest are afraid to join their hands together. I will also turn you down. Vincent. These are not just street hoodlums, Anthony. They work for a powerful man. An important man. A bandit chief. Perhaps. But here he is respected. He stands well with the politicians. His name is Al Carley. But how... Anthony! Certain things are the same in every country. But there is a principle. Oh, yes. At first, I too felt bad to bathe these dogs for protection. And then there were fights. People were afraid to come in. But it's wrong. I see it as just another tax. But this time, I get what I pay for. You mean you will not fight these swine? Come, Anthony, what is it? A few dollars? It won't make you, it won't break you. I see. Well, I will fight him alone. And 
to me. I must say the chicken is the finest you ever made. I wanted this to be the best supper in your life. Is that true? Why? Because it could very well be your last supper. Oh, and what does that mean? Lewis has been talking to me about the association. And what right does our Lewis have to worry his mother with business matters? Since when is a woman to be concerned? Lewis with... is frightened. Why? Anthony, there is no way in the world you can defy these thieves. This is America. Here one does not have to fear. There is a man named Al Carley. He is what is known as a boss. He is not my boss. I could never look at myself in the mirror if I bowed down to scum like that. You will pay these people. Maria, are you telling me how to run my business? You will pay these people. Never. Promise. I'll think about it. Promise. Very well, I promise. Papa? What is it? I, uh, I don't think you should be here. No. No, 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 Papa, because... Yes? Because? <laughs> He'll be here any minute, and, and, well... And you would rather I did not witness the shameful transaction that will take place, huh? You don't have to be involved with it. You mean I should pretend this thing does not exist, huh? Okay, Papa, okay. It's just that you've got a short fuse, and I'm afraid one word could lead to another, and, well... I must see this with my own eyes. Besides, it's already too late. The jackal is at the door. Well, happy... Happy days to Anthony Boda and Son, as the sign reads on the window. I will pay the money, Louis. Well, this is a gloomy-looking group. What's the matter? No hello? No how are you? No how tricks? Where's all this old-world courtesy I used to hear about? Now take your money and get out. What's eating you, Pop? I don't like to be called Pop by a common thug. Listen, Pop. Maybe I'd better smarten you up. Chuck, he, he doesn't mean it. Now, you don't mean it, do you? I never spoke a word I didn't mean. Well, then, that calls for this. <laughs> I only want to teach you manners, Pop. Now, do you apologize? Or do I knock out your teeth? Louis, explain to your father what the score is. Papa, please. Louis, explain why you stand by while this animal strikes your father. <laughs> What could he do about it? He could do this. Oh. And this. No, Papa, Papa, don't, don't hit him again. I'll kill you. Papa, he has a gun. I see, I see. Drop it. Drop it. Drop the gun. I'll break your arm. I said to let go of the gun. What, what are we going to do now, Papa? Summon a taxi cab. We will deposit this... This refuse, this human garbage, at the police station. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Boda, I'd like to talk to you in private, okay? About what, officer? Well, that's why we better talk in private. Now, this way, huh? Uh, sit down, please, Mr. Boda. Thank you. I'm Sergeant Carey. Each and every word I'm about to say to you is off the record. If you ever quote me, I'll swear I never said it. Understand? What is there to understand? Here's the situation. I'm on duty at the desk. You come in with this badly beat up hoodlum. Ah, uh, you know he's a hoodlum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got a small reputation. But that's all I know. And you say you want to press charges. By all means. We only have your word that he tried to shake you down. And the word of my son and all the shopkeepers in the neighborhood. We can have this... Suppose animal. all the neighbors dummy up. Suppose they don't want to get involved. You? An officer of the police? Are you telling me I must submit to this? No, no. I'm just trying to give an honest man the same break we give a criminal. When a crook is brought in, we inform him of his rights. But I still don't see why. I must listen. Al Carley is your enemy. Not that small-time hood. Al Carley's got judges, politicians, businessmen in his hip pocket. And policemen, too? I wouldn't doubt it. Then it's time that pocket was slashed open. 
And those vermin were exposed to the light of day. If you bring charges, you'll have the best lawyers money can buy. Sergeant, thank you for your kindness, but we're wasting time. Okay. Do this. You say the man you brought in is the collection guy for the neighborhood? Yes. Call some of your friends. See if they'll come down and identify him. See if they'll sign affidavits. Of course they will. All it required was one man to lead the way. How can they refuse me now? Do what is required, Sergeant. Place this... this animal behind bars. <laughs> doubt that Anthony Boda is a man of strong courage and firm convictions, but he may be just a little bit unaware of the qualifications for leadership. We will consider leaders and followers when I return shortly with Act Two. tried to shake down Anthony Boda, an immigrant shoemaker. Anthony, who believes what he has read about law and justice, promptly disarmed the thug and delivered him to the police station. Sergeant Carey, a wise, cynical, and experienced officer, is trying to explain to Anthony that things are not really the way they seem. Mr. Boda, listen. Al Carley doesn't want rough stuff for publicity if he can help it. He'll yank Chuck out of there and stick him someplace else if you'll forget the whole thing. He told you all this? I don't want you to get hurt. You are a man with heart, Sergeant. But it is more important for me to discover something. Discover what? If I made the right choice when I decided to come to America. <laughs> You at me, Butter? Who are you? I can be your best friend or your worst enemy. Mister, I like riddles, but not in the middle of a working day. What's your business here? And my name is Carly, Al Carly. You heard about me? I heard. I cannot say I like what I heard. But I like what I heard about you. Yes? What have you heard about me? Hey, tell me you're a man. And? And so you should be concerned with that little situation that happened here the other day. Why? Because it's beneath you. I will not be slapped by hoodlums. Of course not. You gave better than you got. Your honor should be satisfied. Now forget it. This matter is now in the hands of the law. Of course. But in whose hands is the law? In the hands of a man who can buy better lawyers, better witnesses. I'm not sure I understand what you want. In this case against my collector, why well, he is scum, isn't he? Well, this case must not go to trial. Why not? You have the lawyers, the witnesses, the judges, the juries. What have you got to fear? I have read the Bible. A pity you don't take it seriously. Back then, when the fight was arranged, who could have believed that David would kill Goliath, huh? Drop the charges. No. Anthony, I want to get away from this rough stuff. I got a kid, she's going to college. American society girls go to that college. This daughter of yours, she knows, of course, what her father does. It really does. I see. Anthony, I need a guy like you. To do what? What, to uh, help me run my organization? Uh, you don't want me. Ah, plenty of guys got guts, Anthony, and plenty of guys got brains. But you're one of very few guys who got both. Why are you killing yourself in a shoe repair store, huh? You don't want me, Mr. Carley. If I ever decide to become what you are, there wouldn't be room for us both in the same organization. Do you understand me? I came here because I like to avoid bloodshed. You're a chump. You'll never know what hit you. Vincent, were the police here to see you, Vincent? Well? Yes. Someone from the 
from the district attorney. I received another visitor, too. Who? This gentleman explained uh, certain facts. Facts? Yes. This gentleman explained that in order to run my business here, I need a license. You always knew that, Vince. Yes. But he explained that when I apply to renew my license, there might be difficulties. You get your license from the government, not from these hoodlums. Uh, but you see, this gentleman is with the government. That part of the government that sees to these things. I don't believe it. I spoke with the lawyers in the district attorney's office. I believe them to be honest and sincere men. They said they would protect me. They will protect you too. Calm, Vince, and talk to them. I'll think about it. What's there to think about? Uh, Tony, things are not so simple. I see. You have already thought about it, and you have decided. Good morning, Mr. Bodum. Ah, uh, the police sergeant. Now that you're going through with it, we'll protect you as much as we can. Thank you. No, we should thank you. You're doing something no one has done before. You're a man of courage. What chance do I, do we have? It'd be better if we could have more witnesses, but maybe they'll come around. Uh, the newspapers have caught hold of it. I brought you a copy. Here, see what it says. Shoemaker defies mob. This is about me. Mm -hmm. That man who spoke to me in the police station, he was a reporter. That's right. Well, uh, we have one. No. We have to win in court. But the newspapers say the we... papers, you're today's sensation. Tomorrow, it'll be somebody else. Don't go anywhere without telling us. And we'll have a man watching the store day and night. Hello? Yeah, where you been? Well, how come I couldn't reach you all morning? Yeah? Well, what have you been doing? You're supposed to keep it out of the papers. It's all on the front pages. It... Listen, this case can't go to trial, you understand? Well, you figure it out. That's what you got paid for. Clowns. I'm surrounded by clowns. Oh, Daddy. Marissa, what are you... I mean, uh... Shouldn't you be in school? Yes. Something the matter? Daddy, I, I even have a midterm exam. When? At two o'clock. Well, that's four hours from now. I'll drive you back up there myself, no, huh? No, no, I, I have my car. Marissa. Look, there are stories in the papers, and, and my friend said to me, oh, of course, it isn't your dad. And I said, of course not. It's another Al Carly. And, well, the reason that... The reason I came down here... Was to ask me... Oh, Daddy, I, I didn't know what to think. It is another Al Carly. Daddy, oh, what... I knew it, I knew it. Oh, Daddy, can, can you ever forgive me? Uh, what's to forgive? Uh, high school. Oh, uh, look, Daddy, would you mind terribly if I... If I change my major... I've decided, finally. It's sociology. I want to work with poor children. Okay, you go right ahead, baby. You do whatever you want. Oh, well, um, you know, some of us are thinking of renting a store or something downtown and helping kids study the core subject. Hey, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll pay the rent and buy a book. <laughs> Daddy, I, I don't know what could have possibly gotten into me. I, how could I have even thought... Forget it, Marissa, baby. Forget it. Oh, what I forgot was what I should always remember. It's in the Bible you bought me. Honor thy father. Hey, you better get back to school. See, Lewis. See what it says in the newspapers. Papa, I just wish I were like you. Uh, you're my own son. You're just like me. No, no, Papa. Very few people are just like you. You were, you were born at the wrong time. What? How can a man be born at the wrong time? No, no. You should have been born when there were great kings and heroes and fighters. My son, every age needs fighters. 
I know I failed you, Papa, but I'm, I'm, I'm frightened. There's nothing to be frightened. Yes, Papa, there is. Why? Everything. But I'll stand by you, Papa. I know you will. Mama. Maria, what do you have there? A package. The, the letterman brought it to the house. What kind of package? Oh, read here. Let's see. It says, uh, from the leather company. Why would the leather company send a package to the house? Here, let me see. Mm. Yes. It's from the leather company. It's their label. Must be those special strips I wanted. Papa? What is it, Louis? That package. What about the package? Uh, I, I, I don't know. It uh, must be my imagination. Mm, listen, Louis, your trouble is you live too much in your imagination. Open up the package. All right. Well, I'll go shopping. Uh, what would you like for supper? Why do you ask? <laughs> You're now a famous man. <laughs> Papa, this doesn't look like... Like what? Like the leather company package. Look out, it's a bomb! Just a moment ago, the shoe repair shop of Anthony Boda and Son was a neat, bright, cheerful establishment. A mother, a father, a son. A close-knit, loving family stood together, talking, laughing. Now the place has become a mass of twisted, smoking wreckage. And three bodies lie motionless in the ruin. I shall return shortly with Act Three. Anthony Boda was a boy in the darkness of the old country. America was a shining beacon light in the distance. Years later, with hard work and some good luck, he was able to come to America with his wife and his son. And because he believed in justice, he defied the gangsters who were trying to extort protection money. And it happened that soon after, a bomb destroyed his tiny shoe repair shop. And the beacon light that was once America for Anthony Boda is flickering faintly and about to die. Now, Mr. Boda, they say you should be out of here in a couple of days. Yes. All of us, we... We're very sorry. Thank you, Sergeant. I know that nothing can bring back your wife and your son. Tell me, Sergeant. Why were they killed at once, while I received only scratches? Well, it uh, has to do with uh, the angle of forces, I suppose. No, 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 no. I mean, what reason? What plan? Why had the Lord seen fit... For that, you would have to ask a priest. I have asked a priest. And? And he said God's ways follow a mysterious design. So you see... I am no wiser than before. I'm sorry about the other thing, too. What other thing? The trial. Oh, the trial. I should say that there was no trial. It doesn't matter. The hood just disappeared. So there was no defendant. Carly must have had him taken for a ride. It doesn't matter. Oh, yes, it does. You set an example for us. You woke a lot of people up. We're after Carly now. It doesn't matter. You can't keep saying it doesn't matter. I have succeeded in unraveling the riddle myself. You see, I had become arrogant. I had forgotten the law of nature. The strong destroy the weak. I had seen my pictures in the newspapers... My head was turned as if I were drunk on champagne. I didn't listen to men of experience and true wisdom. Men like my friend Vincent. Pay it. It's just another tax. I've been punished. You can't talk that way. Believe me, Mr. Boda, we'll break up that mob. That will be your affair. Carly figures he can ride out this particular storm just like he rode out others, but he won't. Of course not. I intend to kill him. 
You can't make your own justice, Mr. Boda. But I must. That's the only justice there is. <laughs> I didn't think you would ever speak to me again, Anthony. We've been friends too long, Vincent. Mm. I forgot that. I should have agreed to be a witness. Not because it was right or wrong. But because a friend asked me. Maria and Louis. I'm so sorry, Tony. They must be avenged. What are you saying? I must kill this animal. Kill him personally. This Al Carly. Tony! Tony, this kind of thing, it's not done in America. I'm sick and tired of being told what is and what is not done in America. I don't want you to get into trouble, Tony. I come to you as a friend. Will you help me? Well... The answer is yes or the answer is no. The answer is not well. The answer is yes. The hunting rifle, the one your father made. Tony... There's no better, no more accurate weapon in all the world. But what can you... It gives me two barrels, the over and the under. I need only two shots. One for Mr. Carley, the other for his bodyguard. Well, you can't walk around the streets with a rifle. No, there is no way to get him here in the city. But I have learned something. On a Friday night, he slips away. He takes the turnpike north. He drives alone, except for this bodyguard. Tony... There is a place where the road is being fixed. So one must slow down. That's where I will be in ambush. Well, the rifle. Can I talk you out of this, Tony? No. I knew that. Well, when do we go there? We. Oui. What is a friend, Tony? A friend is another gun to stand beside you. much traffic. Are you sure he comes here this late at night? Yes, yes. And is that... No, no. See? See how the car must practically crawl past because of the construction? This barricade gives us perfect hiding place. I put blacking on the gun barrel so it wouldn't shine in the moonlight. Thank you, Vincent. I have a score to settle with him, too, you know. Well, not as great as mine. No. That's why you may have the first two shots. After that... Listen. Is that... Yes. You sure? Yes. I can even make out his evil face in the moonlight. Let him come just a little closer. I've got him. I've got him. Now. How could we miss? We didn't miss. He's gone. He's got away. Tony! Didn't you see... The shell simply bounced off. His car has a coat of armor. The glass is bulletproof. There's no way we can shoot him. There's just no way. Hello, Mr. Boda. Good evening, Sergeant Curry. I figured I'd find you here in Vincent's. You are looking for me? Mm hmm. I hear you and Vincent went hunting last night. Hunting. Yeah. You did some shooting up around South Chester. I don't know where you received your information, Sergeant. That's not the right way. By now, you should know you can't gun him down. After last night, he'll build up more protection than ever. That's true. There is no way I can get to him. I'm glad you realize that before you get into a lot of trouble. But there is a way I can make him come to me. What are you saying? Yes. I can make him come to me himself. With blood in his eye. Burning with hatred. Obsessed with a desire to murder me with his own hand. Mr. Boda. And then, of you... course, I will have every right to kill him. Because, you see, I will be compelled to kill him in self-defense. <laughs> Hello. Good evening. 
Well, I'm afraid school's over for the night. I'm just closing up. Uh, do you have a child you want us to tutor? No. Oh, well, then, uh, well, what can I do for you, Mr., um... Boda. Anthony Boda. Is the name familiar? Well, I... I don't know, I... I seem to remember seeing it somewhere, but I can't recall. Uh, what do you want, Mr. Boda? Your father, among a thousand other crimes, killed my wife and son. What? What are you saying? You know what I'm saying. But you... You must be mad. I, I'll call the police. You call the police. But why? I've done nothing wrong. I have merely stated a fact. Look, you... you... Get out of here! Will that change the fact? My father, he's, he's good, he's kind, he's, he's the most decent man in the world. How does your father earn his money? Huh? Well, uh, Where is his factory? What goods does he handle? In what does he trade? I'm a shoemaker. I smell of leather. Your father, he smells of death because his business is death. I, I, I don't know what you're talking. Were you about to say you don't know you don't wish to know. You read, you think. Oh, get out of here. Get out, get out! Good evening, Miss Carley. Dad, you remember I... I asked you about the man in the papers? You said it was another Al Carley. Marissa... What are you trying to... Don't lie to me, Daddy. Don't lie to me. Yeah, but... But it was another Al Carly. Don't lie to me, please. Uh... It's... it's bad enough. I've... I've had to lie to myself. It was another Al Carly. Now, listen, please, listen. There are two Al Carlys. One is your dad. The other is somebody who does what he has to do. The only thing he knows how to do. Oh, I never saw it before. I suppose I never wanted to see it, but... A man named Anthony Boda, just a shoemaker, opened my eyes. And I can never close them again. Boda? Did you say Boda? Anthony Boda. I have never seen such... Dignity. I was a fool. I should have made sure of him before. But I'll kill him with my own two hands. And I'll kill him. I'll cut his heart out. Benji, can't you get more speed on this heap? Come on, faster! State trooper, lose him. Look out, look out, that idiot up ahead, he's turning, he's, he's, look out! Mr. Boda. Yes. Ah, the sergeant. I've been looking for you. Hop in. You heard the news? I heard the news. He was coming after you. I knew he would. But I have been robbed. I will not have my revenge. He's dead. Uh, no. The radio said he cannot live. So you see, there is no justice for me. And do you know why he can't live? He needs blood. He can buy all the blood he needs. No, he can't. Why not? Because he, uh... It so happens he has a very rare type of blood. And he needs a transfusion from someone who has that same type. Only someone with that same blood can save him. Surprising. I thought his blood would be as base and as common as sewage. We do know of a donor. The hospital has a record of someone with the exact same blood type. Why tell me? Because you are the blood type. Ah, uh, I'm me? I have the same blood as that swine? Yes, Mr. Bodum. The only person we know of. 
How was this fact made known? Well, when you and your wife and son were brought to the hospital, naturally your blood was typed. One of the lab technicians happened to remember. Well, that's the blood Carly needs. Or he'll die before tonight. You... You expect me to give my blood to the murderer of my wife and my son? You expect me to keep this animal alive? Mr. Boda. How, how I prayed that I would kill this monster. I thought my prayers would never be answered, but they were. They were. I now hold his life in my hands. So you see, Sergeant, this is justice. No, that's not justice. It's revenge. Let the law deal with him. You may drive me to the hospital, but he'll never see one drop of my blood. And why do you want to go to the hospital? To look in his eye, to laugh in his face, to let him know who has conquered. Carly. Al Carly, can you hear me? Yes. Do you know who I am? Yes. Do you know why I'm here? To torture me. I was in this hospital. You killed my wife, my son. I swore I would kill you with my own hands. Mother, mother, please. Please, don't let me die. What do you say? Please. You beg me, your enemy, your sworn enemy, for your life? Please, please, let, let me live. This? This is what makes us tremble? This is who owns judges, lawyers, politicians? This is what we fear? You cowardly animal. Can't you even die decently? Oh, Mr. Boda, oh, Mr. Boda, you came. I knew you would come. You see, Daddy, I told you. Mr. Boda is a man. Does the doctor know? Have they been told to prepare for the transfusion? The transfusion? Oh, that's, that's why you came, isn't it? To, to give Daddy the blood? Daddy said you would never do it. Daddy said you would drain every drop of blood from your own body and die first before you... Shh, shh, shh. The young girl should not talk like that in front of her father. Now, now you must say no more. Carly. Al Carly, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I... Al Carly, you are very close to eternity. Speak the truth. For the very first time in your life, the truth. Look into my eyes, Al Carly, and tell me. Tell me. If it were the other way and I lay dying, would you give me your blood? Answer. And remember, God is listening. The truth, Al Carly. Would you give me your blood? Would you? No. Daddy. This is between your father and me. You would not give me your blood, Al Carly? No. No. Then this is the difference between us. I will give you mine. Al Carly recovered. He stood trial. His empire collapsed like a towering castle of sand when the high tide sweeps up on the beach. Al Carly will not be around for a while, 99 years to be exact. But when his daughter needs advice and comfort, she visits with Anthony Boda. They're good for each other. Each makes up for something the other has lost. I'll be back shortly. Anthony Bodas, the Al Carleys, each brought the same blood to the melting pot of America. But the melting pot 
is a crucible where men, like steel, may either be hardened or destroyed. Our cast included Howard Da Silva, Ken Harvey, Robert Dryden, Bryna Rayburn, and Jack Grimes. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. Oh, be quiet, Eddie. Your husband isn't thinking straight, Mrs. Breach. It isn't that easy. You think that Harney will be satisfied if I let him live? If I walk off this job, somebody else walks in. This isn't the only gun in the world. He's right, Eddie. Maybe the only way is to give him the money back. There's nothing to give back. You think money stands still in this business? Look, maybe if we left town, went to Mexico or someplace... Arnie won't give up that easy. It means too much to him. Well, I'm not staying here. I'm getting out. I'm getting as far away as I can. Eddie. Both of us, Connie. I meant both of us. <laughs> you expect me to run in a wheelchair? Maybe... Mr. Derry can tell us what to do. I can think of only one thing. Joe Harney wants a dead body. That's what we'll have to give him. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up and Contact, the 12-hour allergy capsule. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The truth requires two people, said Mr. Thoreau. One to speak it, and one to hear it. Haven't we all, at one time or another, been sure we were in the right, yet no one would listen to us? It can be comical. It can be irritating. But what if your job, or your freedom, or even your life hung in the balance? That would be no laughing matter. Fritz! You ever hear of the boy who cried wolf? I'm not crying wolf, Captain. I'm crying treason. What do you mean? Look at the facts. What facts? Okay, okay. Hunches. Fritz, do me a favor. Forget it. Our mystery drama, The Rocket's Red Glare, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Percy Granger and stars Mason Adams. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the Sinus Medicines, and Exlax. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Our country is guarded by a mighty fleet of planes, ships, and missiles. Hundreds of thousands of people work in our defense system. And the industries which build our sophisticated armaments employ tens of thousands more. Everyone involved is highly skilled and carefully screened. But with so many people, how can we be certain an occasional bad apple won't find its way into the barrel? The scene is Washington, D.C. Yes, Mr. Lomas? Well, Lucille, uh, come in here, will you? I've got a letter to dictate. Yes, Mr. Lomas. Now sit down. 
It's to the Secretary of the Army, Pentagon, etc. Et oh, no. Why? What's the matter? My pencil just broke. Just a minute, Mr. Lomas. I'll be right back. No, 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 no. Don't go. Here, use my pen. Now, uh, dear Mr. Secretary, this is to inform you that the blueprints for the nuclear missile system known as Scorpio, commissioned by the Army from Lomas Industries, are virtually complete and that plans to build a working model can begin on schedule. Mr. Lomas. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it? You've already dictated this letter. Oh, I did? This morning. It's already typed up. All it needs is your signature. I'll just go get it. Uh, no, no, don't, don't leave. Mr. Lomas, are, are you all right? Uh, of course I'm all right. It must be this, this heat wave. I think you need a rest. You haven't had a vacation in over a year. Uh, what, what? You seem distracted. What is it? Nothing. Can, can I bring you something? Some order? No, no, no. I'll be fine. But... Uh, just between us, Lucille, it's the Scorpio missile. It's nowhere near ready. But you said in your letter... I'm stalling. What? I thought that Mr. Simpson had finished the plans. You've just been working on them day and night. He's got the best mind we've got, but... If we don't meet our deadline, the Army could withdraw the contract and we'd be ruined. Ah, uh, yeah. Let me see. Yeah. Must be something else I need you for. What was that? What? Well, it sounded like a shot from Mr. Simpson's office. That's all we know, Sergeant. I was dictating a letter to Miss Reed here, and we heard a shot, and when we got to Mr. Simpson's office, he was dead. With a gun in his hand and this note on the desk. Hmm? Is that his handwriting? Uh, yes. It says, forgive me, but I must do this. I have no choice. Huh. That's not much of an explanation, is it? No, no, I guess it isn't. What was Simpson like? He was the kindest, most gentle person. And the most brilliant scientist in the firm. Any reason why he'd want to take his own life? Uh, that's just it. There wasn't any. <sighs> Must have been something wrong. Oh, he was one of the sanest, most well-adjusted people I've ever known. He didn't even drink or smoke. Hello, Fritz. Hi, Captain. This is Mr. Lomas, the president of Lomas Industries and the secretary, Miss Reed. Captain Suggs. Hello. I'm sorry about what happened. Uh, Sergeant, could we go now? Miss Reed is upset. Yeah, yeah, sure. Just keep yourselves available, so forth, you know. Oh, come on, Lucille. I'll drive you home. It's so tragic. I know. I don't know what we're going to do now. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Just, uh... Just what do you mean by that? Well, Jeff Simpson was working on a new missile. If we don't make the deadline, we could start losing our defense contract. So Simpson was working against time? Yes, yes. But he loved pressure. He thrived on it. Thanks, Mr. Lomas. That's all. Have you done the autopsy yet, Captain? No, it's not completed. Come up with anything? If Mr. Simpson had a motive for suicide, he certainly kept it hidden. His home life was fine. He had no apparent enemies. No record of any mental health problems. What about physical? Was he dependent on any medications? Nope. <laughs> From everything we're hearing, this guy was a bionic wonder. <laughs> Only trouble is he's dead. Apparent suicide. You have doubts? That's what I'm paid for. Fritz, two lab technicians passing Simpson's door saw him pull the trigger. Okay, so it was suicide. Perfectly well-adjusted, successful, bright guy snuffs himself out and leaves a note saying he had to do it. Why? Well, he was dealing with top-secret stuff. He had access to information that could have been worth a lot. To the right people. Fritz, Espionage is for the FBI. Yeah, but the suicide is ours, and I want to find out why. Well, where are you going? Have another talk with Lomas. Why? Because I didn't like him. Fred, it doesn't add up. Oh, with your permission. 
Thank you. But Fritz, stay off espionage. Espionage? Oh, it's impossible. Everyone's checked electronically when they enter and leave the building. Not even the smallest roll of microfilm could be smuggled out. Yeah, but it could be carried out, couldn't it? In broad daylight, by the right person? Uh, well, uh, yes, I suppose. Now, what was this project Simpson was working on? Project Scorpio. But it wasn't complete. What's missing? A uh, conversion system or something. I'm, I'm really more of a businessman than a scientist myself. I... Uh, I don't know what we're going to do. Complete. It'll be one of the most frightening systems ever developed. But trying to find a replacement for Jeff. Uh, I don't know. It never rains, but it pours. What do you mean? Lucille, uh, Miss Reed, my secretary, has asked for a leave of absence. Oh? Why? Well, it wasn't a pretty sight, Sergeant. Still, you know the problems of finding a secretary with top security clearance? Uh, let's get back to this Project Scorpio. What makes it so frightening? When Jeff was developing a nuclear device of extraordinary simplicity. With these plans, I mean, if it were complete, of course, almost anyone could construct the missile. Including third world nations? Oh, Jeff would never have done that. Look at his file. His patriotism was unquestioned. And he certainly had no interest in money. He'd always insist on paying for our drinks. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You told me that he didn't drink. Oh, a social drink for Pete's sake. An occasional cocktail at the Heritage Bar after work. It's hardly worth mentioning. Everything is worth mentioning, Mr. Lomas. Sergeant... If I'm not mistaken, you're exceeding your province in this investigation. Now, is that all? Yeah. Hey, uh, you got a payphone in the building? You're welcome to use mine. Thanks, Mr. Lomas, but we're in Washington. I'd rather use a payphone. It was all the same to you. In the lobby. Downstairs. Just one other thing. Miss Reed. Where does she live? Put me through to His Excellency. Uh, Captain, this Fritz here. Hey, listen, I think we ought to put a tail on Lucille Reed. Because she's just quit. That's why. He also run a check on Simpson's finances. Now, let's see. Well, what do you know, Miss Reed? Oh, hello, Sergeant. What are you doing here? Lomas told me that you quit. Oh, just for a week or two. I, I couldn't keep working. Not after Yeah, what yeah, I'll, I'll buy that. So why are you back? Oh, it's nothing, really. Mr. Lomas lent me his pen this morning, and in all the confusion, I forgot to return it. You live in, um, Fairfax County? Yes. And you drive 40 miles to return a fountain pen? No. Well, I mean... Well, well, it's Mr. Loma's personal pen. Yeah, sure. Listen, I can keep a secret. What do you mean? Well, I mean, you got something going with the boss. It isn't the end of the world. Well, I'll tell you. I came back to return his pen and to see how he is now. Well, how was he? He was upset, naturally. But even before that, the man's tired. He's overworked. Seemed to have all his marbles to me. Why do you say that? When I went into his office this morning, just before Mr. Simpson... You know, he started dictating a letter he had already written. Yeah. And when I started to leave the room, he wouldn't let me go. He wouldn't. He seemed nervous, as if he didn't want to be left alone. Or as if he wanted you there? Yes. But not like you think. Look, Miss Reed, my apologies. If you'll excuse me. Captain. Is that him? Yeah. He's got the manners of a bull moose. Captain! 
He's recently moved here from New York, hasn't adapted to the diplomatic way of doing things. Well, let's get this over with. Okay. Come in, Sergeant. I think I've got our first real lead. Miss Reed? No, no, forget her. She's the scrupulous type. Drives 40 miles to return fountain pens. It's Lomas. I see. First, you want me to put a tail on Miss Reed and check Simpson's bank account. And now it's Lomas. I think he knew Simpson was going to shoot himself. The case is closed, Fritz. What? It's closed, Sergeant Mangle. Who is this? This is Barney Judd. He's from the Department of Defense. The Pentagon. So what gives? You mean you guys are taking over the investigation? There is no more investigation, Sergeant. But you got to listen to me. The case is closed. But I... No more questions. That's an order, Sergeant. You might as well tell a musician not to play his fiddle as tell a detective like Fritz Mangle to stop asking questions. However, we were all taught to respect authority, even when we think that authority might be wrong. For isn't obedience what holds a society together? I'll return shortly with Act Two. suspect, goes an old saw. Obviously, our friend Sergeant Mangle knows very little at this point, but suspects a great deal. Is it possible that something is rotten in the state of Denmark? Or, should we say, Lomas Industries? Or is the bully sergeant the owner of an overactive imagination? Fritzy, is that you? Daisy... Open us a couple beers and sit down at the kitchen table. Uh-oh. He's brought his work home with him again. Okay. Let's review the case. Fritz. First off, we got a guy commit suicide. Eh? For no apparent reason. Fritz. What? What case are we talking about? This guy Jeff Simpson. A brainy scientist at Lomas Industries committed suicide this morning. Eh? But I got a hunch... That Mr. Lomas, that was his boss, knew in advance that he was going to do it. Well, maybe he had a grudge against him and drove him to it. No, I don't think that's it. Simpson was designing a new weapon system that was going to save the firm. Yet his boss lets him pack himself in. Now, what's your first impression? That you've got the wrong hunch. Something is screwy, Daisy. Because when I get back to the station house, suddenly I find the case has been closed. Just like that. No explanation. And furthermore, grab this one. I got down to see the autopsy report afterwards, and no one knows anything. It's confidential. Well, what reason did this man have to take his own life? That's just it. There wasn't any reason. This guy had everything going for him. You sure it was suicide? Two guys saw him pull the trigger. And obviously the key to the whole thing is finding out why he did it. Ah, you're cooking. Okay, dear. Who don't you like? Well, that guy Lomas, for one, and Judd. Who's Judd? Barney Judd from the Pentagon. He's the one who told the captain to nix the investigation. Don't you think the Pentagon knows what it's doing? Not necessarily. I'm going to keep a little eye on Lomas. But the case is closed. Oh. Oh, no. Just whose little eye are you planning to use? No, 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 listen, I got it all figured out already. No, I got a hair appointment in the morning. You see, Lomas' secretary quit on him. The job calls for top security clearance. Which I have under, under your my main name. name. How's your typing? I use the biblical method. Seek and thou shalt find. How's your short end? They're both the same length. Good girl. You'll work out just swell. Yes? Mr. Lomas? Uh, yes. Who are you? My name is Daisy Cochran. I'm from Office Temp. Oh, yes, yes. Do I have your references? Here. Mm. Uh, these are three years old. I'm a wife and mother. 
The job requires clearance. It's all there with my references, sir. Oh, well, that's good, but it's only temporary. The agency did tell you that, didn't they? Yes, sir. My regular secretary will be back within a week or two. Yes, sir. This is an odd time of year for a vacation. What do you mean? Oh, just making conversation. There are 16 letters and four reports on the desk outside, Mrs. Cochran. I need them tight before noon. Yes, sir. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Can I help you? I'm here to see Mr. Lomas. Oh, but he doesn't have any appointments listed. He'll be expecting me. Who shall I say is here? Judd. Barney Judd. Judd? Oh, Judd. Oh, just a minute. I'll buzz him. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm a little new here. There. Yes? Mr. Lomas? Yes, Miss Cochran? There's a Mr. Barney Judd to see you. Oh, oh, yes. Send him right in. You can go in, sir. It's the... I know the way. Uh. Everything is set, Lomas. Can you get the plans out of here okay? No problem. You remember the time and place, Judd? North side of the Folger Library in the shrubbery. 10 p.m. tonight. So Lomas is smuggling something out to this Mr. Judd. Did they say what? All he said was plans and the time and place. 10 o'clock tonight at the Folger Library. I thought there was something a little bent out of shape about that Judd character. Pentagon my foot. So now I suppose you'll want us to give up our bridge game tonight? Are you kidding? Just tell the Pagliaros to come an hour earlier, that's all. But Fritz, this Mr. Judd and whoever else is involved is bound to be watching Lomas the whole time. Sure, but only from the outside. My police ID will get us past the night watchman and into the library. I don't know. Maybe we should just call Captain Sutton. But I'll wait. He's had his chance. I'm not involving him again until I've got some hard evidence. Anyway, Judge seems to have him under his thumb. <laughs> Can't wait to see the captain's face when we dump this in his lap. I can't see a thing. The basement window's over there. Careful of those books. Mm -hmm. Here we are. Now we just open the window. What time is it? Two minutes after ten. What if it's already taken place? If you hadn't taken so long to play that last hand... I wouldn't have if you hadn't jumped and shifted to space. Well, you weren't giving me the right signal. I did so. with them. The important thing is making sure they don't get those plans. Can you reach them? <laughs> Not quite. You're smaller. Squeeze through the window. <laughs> Just enough to... Got him. Let's get out of here and see what we've reeled in. <laughs> says Scorpio Project. What? Isn't that what you said Simpson was working on? Yeah, but according to Lomas, the plans weren't complete yet. Well, now what do we do? You know, this may work out better than we thought. I think it's time we found out just what those plans are. We still aren't going to the captain? I'm going to the captain. What about me? You're taking these plans over to Brian Keaton. That scientist friend of yours? A nuclear scientist. I want him to check these out. Who are you calling? Oh, I hate to disturb my honored leader at home, but we'd better get tails on Lomas and Judd right away. When they find out their little rendezvous didn't work, we don't want them panicking and taking refuge in some foreign embassy. Oh, don't be so melodramatic. Hello, Mr. Suggs. This is Sergeant Mangle. Yeah, can I speak to his eminence? 
What? I see. Thank you. What's the matter? The captain went back to headquarters at 9.30 this evening. What do you think that means? I don't know. But somehow I get this lousy feeling. I just goofed. You idiot! You meddling, incompetent, arrogant fool! Why do you insist on making a point of never listening to me? I told you the case was closed. Captain Sarge. Now, oh, don't tell me, Mr. Judd. I already know the whole story and then some. Sergeant Mangle. What's he doing here? This Mr. Judd is the man who took the plans. What? I told you we should have let him in on it from the beginning. He's like a kid. If you tell him not to do something without giving him a reason, he won't listen to you. Sergeant Mangle, that was a setup, a stakeout. Those plans were fake. They were meant as bait to trap a ring of foreign operatives. I know, sir. Captain Suggs told me. Did he also tell you that before he committed suicide, Mr. Simpson confessed to selling top-secret documents to those agents? No. He told Lomas everything. Lomas? That's right. That's why he killed himself. Because he couldn't live with himself any longer and he was in too deep to get out. Simpson's last redeeming act was to tell Lomas the place and time of the next drop. Lomas agreed to help us. That's why we told you city cops to stop your investigation. Defense was handling this. All right, I'm sorry. I just had a hunch. I don't think your hunches will be needed for a while, Sergeant. As of this moment, I'm suspending you from the force. Indefinitely. Turn in your badge. My badge? And your service revolver. Can I go now, sir? Please. Uh, just a minute, Mr. Mangle. Where are the plans now? They're with a friend of mine. What? A man named Brian Keaton. He's a scientist. I wanted him to check him out. Where does he live? In Arlington, Mason Avenue. I'll get him back. I'm sorry, Captain. Ah, uh, there's one more thing, Mr. Mangle. Just how did you know about that drop tonight? Rather not tell you, Mr. Judd. I really don't see the matters now. I insist you tell me. I protect my sources, Mr. Judd. Well, you've got to hand it to him. He's resourceful. I don't trust him. No, he's honest, Mr. Judd. He's just a little impulsive, that's mm -hmm. all. His impulsiveness this evening may prove costly. I'm sure you'll come up with a way to accomplish what has to be done. Fritz is out of your hair now. I'm not so sure. Fritz, you're back. Just barely. Why, what happened? Captain Suggs and Mr. Barney Judd took turns using me for basketball. What? I'm afraid I really loused up good this time, Daisy. That whole episode tonight at the library, the plot we foiled, it was a stakeout. Fritz. It was a trap. The only trouble was we're the ones who sprung it. Fritz, Brian Keaton's been trying to call you for nearly an hour. I know, I know. The plans are fake. No, they're not. What? Brian's checked them over thoroughly, and they are a completely operational blueprint for one of the most deadly weapon systems he's ever seen. It was Ben Franklin who first said the only two certainties in life were death and taxes. But death comes only at the end, and taxes but once a year. That leaves a great deal of time for the uncertainties. And how are we to deal with those? Fortunately, in our case, there is a third certainty we may rely on, and that is, I shall return in a moment with our final act. Like the lame leading the blind, Daisy and Fritz Mangle seem to be stumbling into an ever-deepening crater of intrigue and mystery. From the very first, with the strange suicide of Jeff Simpson, events and people have not been what they seem. The plans? 
or operational? Brian said they were theoretical, of course. They'd have to be tested. Yeah, but none of the steps were missing. There wasn't a, a conversion system or something that wasn't complete. No. <sighs> Roma certainly went out of his way to make us all think so. So that was the plan, hmm? He dupes the Pentagon, actually gets them to help him make the exchange. But if there was a stakeout, like Judd said... Yeah, but these foreign operatives would know that, right? And Lomas would tip them off. So they'd be prepared in advance to give him the slip. And Lomas is in the clear. The plan, so far as the Pentagon knows, were fake. Or at least missing the vital step. And he's free to keep passing information from his firm's other contract. Who are you calling? Well, I've got to try to catch Judd and Suggs at headquarters. Hello, is, is Captain Suggs still in his office? He has? No, thanks. Uh, he just left. It'll be 45 minutes before he gets home. Well, we don't have that much time. What if they tell Lomas what happened? He'll panic and run for asylum. That's the trouble with Washington. Too many free spaces. It was a lot easier to corner a rat in New York. What about Judd? Yeah, maybe I can reach him. It's worth a try. If I call a night desk at the Pentagon, they ought to have a number for him. Hello, this is Detective Sergeant Mangle of the Washington Police. Yeah, I'm trying to reach an employee of yours, a Mr. Barney Judd. Yes, I know it's 12 o'clock at night. I want his home phone. No, I can't come down there in person. There isn't time. It's a matter of national defense. Yeah, yeah, I'll hold. Guy who invented bureaucracies ought to be shot. They won't give you the number. Not without identification. She's getting a supervisor. Well, the Pentagon's only a few minutes away. I can't identify myself. I've been suspended. What? What? What for? For messing up their trap tonight. The... Hello? Hello, is a supervisor? Yeah, look, it's imperative that I reach Barney Judd to just... What? What? Huh? Uh, I see. Thank you. But what is it? There's no one by that name who works for defense. Oh, no. Oh, no, is right. I told Judd Brian's name. Why? He made a point of asking where the plans were. Brian? We've got to get over there right away. Well, I'm going alone. Why? For the same reason that the president and vice president don't fly together on the same plane in case something goes wrong. Brian. Brian, it's me, Fritz. Open up. Brian. Hey, the door's open. Brian? Brian? He isn't here. But that's right, Mr. Mangle. He isn't. Judd. Why do you persist in interfering? Where's Brian? You've been told this case was closed. You've even been suspended from the force. By what authority are you here? I could ask you the same question, Judd. Hello, Fred. Who's... Captain... Where's Brian? He's been arrested for possession of stolen documents. Captain, do you know what's happening? Those plans weren't fake. They are fully operational. And what's more, I think Mr. Judd here knows they are. Furthermore, I don't know who this guy is working for, but it isn't the Department of Defense. I called them. They've never heard of them. Now are you going to believe me? Romus is guilty of treason and Judd is his accomplice. Well, Captain, Fritz... I'm afraid I'm going to have to put you under arrest. Me? What for? Conspiring to steal classified information. Why won't you listen to me? It's him you ought to be arresting. Don't you know what'll happen if those plans get into the wrong hands? Put out your wrist, Fritz. Handcuffs? On me? Put them out. Not on your life. Fritz! He wouldn't even trust me. I just can't. 
can't believe he's involved, too. The fact is, neither Judd nor the captain was surprised when I told them the plans weren't fake. And what about the clam up on Simpson's autopsy report? No, sir, from here on out, as far as I'm concerned, they're all in it together. Lomas, Judd, and the captain. But what can you do? You're a fugitive. Oh, if I could just get something concrete on Lomas, maybe then someone would listen to me. Who? Who can you go to now? Uh, I've got no choice, have I? Oh, no. You mean... The FBI. But, Fritz, that's against your principles. I know, I know. How can you get Lomas? I think the answer to that lies right back at the beginning. Jeff Simpson's death. What are we doing in this bar? It's a long shot, but Lomas Excuse told me... Excuse me. Oh, I take a walk, mister. We, we've got no spare change. I know. Mario, the bartender, he said you was looking for information about a fella named Simpson. Yeah? Don't tell me you know him. No, but I recognize his face from the newspaper. How did you recognize him if you didn't know him? Well, because I talked to him. Or rather, he talked to me. When? Oh, a couple of nights ago. I never seen a guy so upset. I I really felt sorry for him, you know? What did he say? Hey, uh, maybe you could... Oh, oh, yeah, sure, sure. What do you want? Uh, just, just a whiskey. A bartender? Uh, maybe a double... Yeah, give me, give me a double whiskey here for my friend. Hmm? Sit down. Fritz, what is this? Someone doesn't want Simpson's autopsy report known, right? We know how he died, so I figure it's got to be something else. You mean like something he already had in his body? Yeah, like alcohol. Lomas told me he and Simpson came here sometime. Like I say, it's a long shot, but it's the only bullet we got left in our gun. <sighs> How you feeling, pal? Ready? Oh, yeah. So, uh, what was this guy Simpson so so upset about? Well, he was, he was scared, you know, really scared. He, he just found out from some doctor that he'd been exposed to nuclear something. Radiation? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. He kept saying his mind was going. It was only a matter of time. Well, he was really concerned about his mind. So that was it. That's terrible. I'd sure like to know the name of the labs that ran those tests. Uh, ain't, ain't this what you want? What? He left this piece of paper. He was staring at it all night. Kept crumpling it up. Let me see that. When he left here, he must have forgot it. Keystone Labs. I thought I'd better hang on to it in case he came back. Poor guy. I never thought he'd... Uh... Well, he was scared acting like he didn't even want people to get near him, you know? Like he might contaminate him or something. I guess he didn't figure I counted. Look, pal, you were a big help. Here, here's a fiber. Oh. At least you'll know where your next one's coming from for a while, huh? Hey, thanks, mister. Ma'am. Oh, that poor man. Well, at least we know now why Simpson killed himself. I don't see how that implicates Lomas. Look, I'm going to have to put up at a hotel tonight. Now, I got one last thing to check out in the morning, and then I'll give you a call at work to tell you what I want you to do. And then? I'm coming to Lomas's office. Why? To give myself up. Good morning, Miss Cochran. Good morning, Mr. Lomas. Look, I'll be in Jeff Simpson's uh, old office for a few minutes. If there are any calls, just transfer them in there. Okay. 9.35. What's keeping Fritz? He's got to arrive before... Hi. Hi, Daisy. Where have you been? Is the, uh, is the coast still clear? Yes, but you better hurry. It's 9.35. You got the folder? Here. Just like the one the Scorpio plans were in. Good. Where, where's Lomas? He's in Simpson's office. I don't get it. He spent half a yesterday in there, too. I think I can help him out. Let's just hope the timing works. What? Well, uh, Morning, Lomas. Sergeant Mangle. Ex-Sergeant Mangle. I've been dismissed from the force. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, why? Because I've been making a nuisance of myself by insisting you were guilty of treason. That's ridiculous. Apparently so. 
I uh, interrupted you. You were looking for something when I came in? Uh, looking? Uh, yeah. Wouldn't by any chance be this, would it? A blood report from Keystone Labs. How did you get it? I think the question is, how did Jeff Simpson get it? What do you mean? A seasoned nuclear scientist so careless as to expose himself to radiation? Well, it's not unheard of. Mr. Lomas, I checked with the lab. Mr. Simpson's annual checkup was negative. Well, he... I don't think it would take a handwriting genius to say who wrote this report. I don't know what you're talking about. Lomas... You can level with me. After all, we're both criminals. What? There's a warrant out for my arrest. What for? Stealing classified documents. We're in the same business. What documents? The plans for the Scorpio missile. You've got those? I was at the Folger Library last night. I beat your pal Judd to the punch... Oh, by the way, I had a friend of mine take a look at those plans. I was very embarrassed. What do you mean? Well, you told me those plans weren't operational. Where are the plans now? They're right here in this folder. Uh, what do you want from me? You see, no one believes me, Lomas. But I want the personal satisfaction... Of hearing the truth from you. Yes. Yes. I forged that lab report of Simpson's blood. The heat was on. There was a suspicion of a leak, so... I had to give the feds a guilty party. What else do you want to know? That I've been selling information to foreign agents? For sure. You know how hard it is to make a steady buck in this business... Some politician knows the right guys and suddenly the competition gets my contract. Or you have to expand your plant facilities for a really big job, the kind you dream about. And then, when it's finished, goodbye, thank you very much. You're left with an overhead that would sink a battleship. Is that enough? Yes, Mr. Lovis, that's just fine. Good. Now it's my turn. You shouldn't have brought those plans back into the building, Mangle. Because you're never going to get them out of here again. Or that phony lab report, either. Miss Cochran? Yes, Mr. Lomas? Ask security to send up two guards. Uh, yes, Mr. Lomas. Wait a minute. Daisy. Daisy. Yes, Fred? Isn't anyone out there? Yes. Well, what's the matter? Didn't you leave the intercom on like I told you? Yes. What's going on? How do you know my secretary? Your secretary, Mr. Lomas, happens to be my wife, and you've just treated the FBI to a nice, neat confession. Hello, Mr. Mangle. What? Judd, how did you get... Relax. Okay, Mr. Lomas, you're under arrest. Hey, what gives? You were right, Mangle. I don't work for defense. I'm with the FBI. The FBI? That's right. Mr. Lomas, we got you in our sights a couple of weeks ago. We were hoping to nail a few of your contact agents as well, but Mr. Mangle here has seen fit to make that impossible now. All right, come on. Let's go. Okay, Sergeant Mangle. You're reinstated. Thanks, Captain. At least you got us a nice confession out of Lomas. Sorry about the rest of it, sir. I didn't know. Okay, okay. But, Fritz, for next time, when you don't know, the next best thing to do is listen. So Lomas was guilty, driven to desperate acts by the financial uncertainty of his business. That word uncertainty again. But people should be stronger willed, you say. Of course. And doesn't it seem an abomination that a man should seek to provide for his own financial security, heedless of the terror and destruction he might be unleashing elsewhere in the world? Of course, I shall return shortly.
time, nothing happened. The villain was caught, and everyone else turned out to be on the right side. But what about next time? Are we really to be trusted with our own terrible inventions? Well, it seems we have no choice, and therefore we might as well be optimistic. But we'd do well to never forget the old Latin proverb, Who will guard the guards? Our cast included Mason Adams, Robert Dryden, Catherine Byers, and Sam Gray. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Here the commonplace is not our brew. If boy meets girl, you can be pretty sure that the expression in her eyes might conceal a demon or a witch. In a way, this story is like that. Because not one, but several persons are possessed. Its origin goes back 20 years and might have gone farther back except for a man's good behavior. For what? His son, Rob Hudson, is in a reflective mood. I was only seven years old, Margot, when he was sent to prison. And that was the end of my boyhood. Were you ever bitter? I mean, kids are cruel. Oh, sure. I had lots of fights defending him. The kids called me killer. <laughs> nice, huh? Poor Rob. And you're still defending him. Because I can't believe he murdered his best friend. <laughs> Mystery Story, The Secret of Laurels, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars Norman Rose and Don Scardino. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. is destiny, a course through life predetermined by fate, and most of us believe in it. The belief is very old. The Greeks and Romans believed in the fates who controlled the birth, life, and death of every man. They're considered cruel because they pay no attention to the wishes of anyone. And they are cruel to the individual, but also to those close to him. Someone goes berserk and kills. That mad act casts a pall over his family. Philip Hudson has had 20 years to think about that. Rob? Welcome back to life, Dad. I thank you for meeting me and for saying that. There's a life ahead for you. I know that. Oh, maybe. I certainly haven't helped yours. Rob, I'm very proud of you. I've often thought of what I put you through and your poor mother. The disgrace killed her. Don't think that because it isn't true. Look, I'm a doctor, remember? Mm, I never forget it. That's a great achievement, Rob. Under the circumstances, remarkable. I'll make it up to you. There's nothing to make up. You've served your time and you're a free man. Oh, hardly that. I'm free, but I'm not free. People don't forget or forgive. To them, I'll always be the man who murdered Johnny Marsh. I'm an outcast. I can't pick up life where I left it, Rob. 
Your Margot knows what I mean. Meaning what? You have felt my disgrace. That's undeniable. And your wife, I'm sure, has felt it for you. Your loyalty has placed a chip on your shoulder. I'm not aware of it. Oh, don't kid your old man, doctor. Admit what I'm saying. Well... Oh, that's better. If I know Margot, and I know her only from what you've told me about her, I bet she's told you many times not to be defensive. Am I right? Well, yes. I'd never turn my back on you, Dad, no matter what you did. Let's come to that. What did I do? Well, you were so jealous of Mother and Johnny Marsh that you murdered him in the library at Laurel's. And then I was convicted and sentenced to life in prison, but released after 20 years for good behavior, whatever that might be. Rob, let me ask you a blunt question. Sure, go ahead. You've been loyal to me all these years. Why? You're, you're my father. Mm -hmm. Any other reason? Well, despite the evidence... I can't believe you'd commit murder. Well, everyone's capable of... Huh? Well, that may be, but you would You do... don't want to think that I murdered Johnny, isn't that it? Yes, I, I don't want to think it because... Now, let me finish for you. If I murdered Johnny, your defense of me becomes a cruel joke. Oh, well, that expresses it pretty well. I'm sorry, Dad. Uh, don't be sorry. You've been right. Johnny Marsh was my best friend. There were rumors about him and your mother, but... Well, they were never substantiated. Yeah, I, I know. I've checked into that. Rob, I did not commit murder. But, well, the evidence... Airtight. I know. Let me amend what I said. I might have murdered Johnny, but I'm convinced that I didn't. Well, then, who did? I don't know. But I intend to find out. <laughs> He is, Rob. Thank you, darling. I think so. He was always good to me when I was a little boy. He taught me to ride, and he bought me a horse. Mm -hmm. And then it all went smash. I was a kid whose father was a murderer. I like him very much. I wish he'd stay with us. Too much to do. He was an important man in Jefferson Falls. He wants to recapture that image. He'll stay at the Lee Hotel until he vindicates himself. I has to admit that he blanked out and really did murder that man. That could have happened, of course. At the trial, he said he blanked out, couldn't remember what happened. Because of his position and Johnny Marsh's reputation, the court wanted to show mercy. Otherwise, he'd have been hanged. Johnny really turned on the ladies, right? I guess so. <laughs> I remember him, of course. He was at our house, Laurel's, a lot. Why does your father think he's innocent? Well, you heard him, Margot. But I didn't really understand him and his talk about character. Do you? It's the world he moved in. Johnny Marsh may have had his eyes on lots of girls, but he'd never fool with anyone in his set. That was an unwritten law. <laughs> Unheard of. So those rumors about Johnny and your mother weren't true? No, well, the two were flirtatious, but what my father is saying is that he never was really concerned about them. If he wasn't jealous, he had no motive for the murder. All right. If he didn't murder Johnny, who did? The housekeeper and your mother found him dead in front of the fireplace and your father sprawled on the floor with a revolver in his hand. I know. You don't think your... your mother... Well, I don't want to, but I've wondered about it. Hmm. And Mrs. Grove? No, no motive. She was our housekeeper. A nice, simple, competent woman. I liked her. I don't think he's got a chance, Rob. He was caught cold. He must have murdered Johnny. You can't get around the facts. What can he possibly dig up now that might help him? Your mother's dead. Your old home is run down. No one will buy it because of the story and the rumors. Hmm, the haunted house. That makes me sad. Laurel's was a wonderful place. I remember it clearly. Victorian. Lots of fireplaces. And the library with its books and the smell of leather and, and fruit wood burning. Mm. My favorite room. Keep the memory and forget that the murder took place there, Rob. I may have to. All of it should be forgotten. Maybe it's foolish to rake up the past. Yes? Uh, good 
Good evening. The real estate agent gave me this note. Oh, you want to see the house? I know that it's late. But there's no electricity here now, so if you'll come back tomorrow... Oh, I won't uh, be here tomorrow, Mrs... Uh... Betsy Grove. Used to be the housekeeper here years ago. They kept me on as the caretaker, the owner. Well, you best come in. Oh, thank you. I-, I won't keep you long. Oh, that's all right. But you won't be able to see much. I just got candlelight. You best come back to the kitchen. The other rooms are empty. This is Laurel's, isn't it? That's right. Used to be a regular mansion, one of the finest in Jefferson Falls. Are you interested in buying Laurel's? Mm, I might be. Needs lots of money for repairs. It's real run down. Why? Why hasn't it been maintained? Well, it's... Is there something wrong with it? Well, ever since what happened, it's got a bad name. I'm not supposed to talk about it. Oh. What did happen here, Mrs. Grove? Good heavens. That's what happened. Who fired that gun? Ain't no gun, mister. Hasn't been one for 20 years. That sound is just the old house acting up. That was a gunshot, Mrs. Grove. Someone fired it. 20 years ago. And a man was murdered. And Mr. Hudson was arrested and sent to jail. And the gunshot? Around this time of day, going on six, you can hear it. Well, that makes no sense. Well, you heard it. What does it mean? Don't ask me. Is the old house trying to tell you something? Nothing to tell. He deserved what he got. Mr. Hudson? No, the other man, Mr. Johnny Marsh. He was carrying on with Mrs. Hudson, so Mr. Hudson shot him dead. Uh, Mr. Hudson murdered the other man. He had a right to. Mrs. Hudson and Johnny Marsh were... They carried on. She was a flirt. You could see what she was up to. And that Johnny Marsh got lots of girls in trouble. Mrs. Hudson flung herself at him. It happened when he was sick. Mr. Hudson, when he was laid up. Oh? They rode horseback, the three of them. Mr. Hudson broke his hip and was in terrible pain. He was laid up for months, and they still went riding. The wife and Johnny Marsh. You can imagine what happened out there on the trails. Oh, I see. Uh, So he was here? In the library, stretched out on a sofa. Johnny Marsh and Mrs. Hudson walked in and Mr. Hudson shot him. Something like that. I don't want to talk about it. Uh, You were there when the man was murdered, weren't you, Mrs. Grove? Well, who told you? Of course it was. It was in the paper, but that's long ago. No one told me. You see, I was there too. Huh? I am Philip Hudson. The murderer. Did I murder Johnny Marsh, Betsy? Of course you did. Not, not, not that I blame you, Mr. Hudson. No, no, please leave. You're, you're giving me a terrible start. Why? You, uh, you coming back like from the grave. You're different and you've got a look in your eyes. Please go. You make me afraid. <laughs> Betsy's daughter. Wasn't her name Rose? Oh, that's right. Rosie Grove. She... I know her, Phil, from the hospital. Handsome woman in her late 30s. She's a, a nurse in pediatrics. Oh, you must know her, Phil. Dark, red hair, good figure. Right, I've seen her, but I never talked to her. So that's Rosie Grove. Mm-hmm. She used to babysit with me, remember, Dad? I had a real crush on her. And you never introduced yourself when you became an intern? I had my eye on a younger nurse, you, Margot. <laughs> Rosie's old enough to be my mother. Oh, hardly. You were seven, and she was about 19 when I was arrested for shooting Johnny Marsh. Uh, Margot, you see her every day? Almost. Why? Well, I've been doing a lot of thinking. Rob, do you remember Johnny Marsh? Sure. I liked him. Mm-hmm. Your impression? Handsome, manly. He had uh, charisma, presence, appeal. And those lively eyes seldom missed a pretty girl. Mother? No, no. He made hers sparkle, but I don't believe Betsy Grove when she implies that there was an affair. No, no, I I mean young girls around town. What's your point, Dad? I helped him out of a couple of scrapes with angry parents. Rose? Is that what you're thinking, Phil? Rose? I I don't get it. I do. Rose was around Laurel's a lot, wasn't she, Phil? Oh. Mm -hmm. If Johnny Marsh got Rosie into trouble... And if Rosie was at Laurel's on the day of the murder... She might have murdered Johnny Marsh. Blackstone wrote, It is better that ten guilty men escape than that one innocent person suffer. Justice is not perfect, and innocent men have been tried and convicted before because circumstantial evidence has condemned them. 
Is Philip Hudson innocent of murder? Did he deserve imprisonment? His search for the truth about himself, or someone else, continues when I return with Act Two. mystery surrounds murder, it is wise and practical to study the victim. Why was he killed? Once this is determined, then match death with motive and study the suspects. There may be several, each with his own reasons for thinking of committing murder, but only one who is irrational enough to do it. I am referring to premeditated murder. The problem for Philip Hudson is that he acted impulsively when he murdered Johnny Marsh. He was proven guilty and now is attempting to prove his innocence. It is nine o'clock at night. Betsy Grove rings her daughter's doorbell. You busy, Rose. Oh, come in, Ma. I couldn't tell. I know, I know. Oh, why do you stay out there at the laurels? No electricity, no telephone. It's out of the Middle Ages. It's a living room. Oh, well, I'd rather be a lighthouse keeper. Hey, you look kind of upset. Anything wrong? Mr. Hudson, come back. Huh? Mr. No. He's out of prison. Mm -hmm. Well, did you see him? He come to the house just before six and he heard the shot. I didn't know who he was. Oh, how could you forget him? His mustache is gone and his hair's white and thin. Mm. Well, what did he want? He wanted to see the library where it happened. Oh, well, why not? There's a curse on the room. <laughs> oh, come on, there's no such thing, Ma. It's just an empty room. You heard the shot, Rose. Oh, or something that sounds like a shot. I can't believe that shot goes on echoing all the time. Murder was done there, Rose. And it's like that dead man never wants it to be forgotten. Mm, well, I've forgotten it. Well, does Mr. Hudson want to buy the house again? I don't know. He just wanted to see the library. Yeah. The murderer returns to the scene of the crime. Well, let him see the room and then forget about it, Ma. He'll go away. No, he won't. Not as long as he wonders what happened. Well, there's nothing to wonder about. He murdered Johnny and that's that. I'm glad he did. Oh, you know what I went through. You turning your back on me. You ever think back on what you've done, Rose? <sighs> Once in a while. It's only natural. There was a funny look in his eyes. Mr. Hudson. Kind of intense. And boring into you like he thinks maybe he didn't do it. What are you talking about? Didn't murder Johnny? Oh, of course he did. We were there when Mrs. Hudson came through the door and Johnny on the floor and a gun in Mr. Hudson's hand. Yes, that's true enough. He did it all right. What else is bothering you, Ma? Oh, it's all come back in a heap. Him showing up, the shot, all of it. The trouble you had. Um, I'm lonely and afraid. Of what? I told you a hundred times, move in with me. I make good money at the hospital. No, no, no. You have your own life to lead. Oh, well, it's a dandy, believe me. You should have married. There was only one man for me. I believed he was serious. Then I find out I was just another doll in his collection... Well, I'm alive. That's something, I suppose. And he's dead. When I feel low, I think about that. He's dead. That makes me feel good. <laughs> I owe a lot to Mr. Hudson for killing that pig. Let me reconstruct the scene of the shooting. I'll draw the library and place the furniture. How big was the room? About 25 by 18, paneled in wood, with a fireplace here opposite the double door, which was always kept open. Your desk in front of the bookshelf? Mm-hmm, here. And to the left, a big sofa. To the right, French doors opening onto the garden. You were lying down on the sofa? Mm -hmm. My legs propped up and my hip hurting like the devil. Mrs. Grove came in with my painkiller pill, and I took it. And the revolver? I've been cleaning it. They say that I left it on the mantel. So, Johnny Marsh comes into the library. You get up, go to the mantel, pick up the revolver, and shoot him. Oh, I don't remember, Margot. All that is a blank. And they found you on the floor with the gun in your hand. Who found you, Phil? Betsy was there, and my wife was standing over me. 
She staggered and Betsy led her to a chair. What did she say? I can't believe it. Johnny is dead. Johnny is dead. And then Betsy or Rose called the police and you know the rest. Dad, how could you have gotten up and gone to the mantle for the revolver and... No, wait, wait a minute. Johnny was shot facing the door. How come? Well, what do you mean? Well, if you'd gone to the mantel for the revolver and Johnny came through the door and you shot him, he'd have been facing the fireplace. And, and didn't the bullet lodge in the paneling by the fireplace? Yes. But the positions are wrong. Look, you're at the mantel facing Johnny in the open library door. Only if you faced him with his back to the fireplace can you explain how he fell and where the bullet lodged. I see. Johnny ha had to have his back to the fireplace and Phil had to come around and face him. And that doesn't make sense. He'd see you had a revolver in your hand. You don't remember any part of it, Dad? No, no, none of it. But you're right. It doesn't make sense. It wasn't gone into at the time because I was found on the floor with the gun in my hand. Uh, how high on the paneled wall was the bullet hole? I don't know. Why? Were you taller than Johnny? Well, an inch or so, yes. And he was shot through the chest. The position of that bullet hole is important. Why, Rod? It can determine from what height the gun was fired. Given Phil's height and Dad's, the bullet would be five feet or so from the floor. If it's higher, then the shot was fired by a shorter person or from the floor. Well, that's where they found me, son. You went to the mantel, got the gun, fell down and fired at him? Unless there was a struggle, that doesn't make any sense. We have to examine that bullet hole, Dad. I intend to. Three other persons could have fired that gun and then wrapped your hand around it. Mm -hmm. Your mother, Betsy, or Rose? Yeah. What about Rose? Was she in the house at the time? Why, I think so. Betsy had said earlier that Rose wanted to talk to me. What about I don't know, but I can guess. If Rose was in trouble, she wanted advice from me. Or money. And if Johnny Marsh was the man, Rose had a motive for murdering him. Well, so did Mother if Johnny had rejected her. Well, that's possible, I suppose, but... No, I can't see it, Rob. I'm supposed to have had a motive, and I admit I sometimes wondered about your mother and Johnny, but... But if I'd been concerned, I would have spoken to him. But Rose is another matter... What about Betsy? No, no, I can't see that. She was devoted to the family. And it was Betsy who gave me the medication. Were you given a blood test after you came out of your blank out, Dad? No. I was hustled to the jail and bond was refused. I was too dazed to think. You... You think that I might have been drugged? Well, that's one way of explaining blanking out. I'm convinced you didn't shoot him. So am I. Are you? I'm thankful. But then... Who did? And how do I prove it? Look, before we get dizzy theorizing, we have to find out why Rose wanted to see me that day. I'll make a lunch date with her tomorrow, Phil. Uh, be discreet. I was fond of little Rosie. Oh, she won't talk. Why should she? Mm, leave that to me. You ask the right question, and you'd be surprised how much a person will tell you. Oh, yeah? What kind of question? What if I ask how you go about adopting a baby? Miss Grove, you mind if I join you? No, how are you, Margo? How's obstetrics? Oh, we delivered three this morning. It was pretty busy. Oh, well, keep them healthy so we don't have to come to the rescue. You've always been in pediatrics, haven't you? Yeah. Little kids get to many. Mm -hmm. They're so helpless. Mm -hmm. I wish I had one. Oh? Well, what's wrong with that doctor husband of yours? Uh, no, it's me, Rose. Oh, well, that's too bad. I'm, I'm sorry. You don't know my husband, do you, Rose? Not really. Oh, I know he's an internist, that's all. Why? Did you ever wonder about it? <laughs> what kind of a question is that? Well, the name means nothing to you? Hudson? Mm -hmm. No, I knew some Hudsons a long time ago. My mother was their housekeeper. That's, I don't know, 20 some years ago. You know, there's lots of Hudsons. Mm -hmm. His name is Rob. Do you mean to tell. Rob Hudson? Uh huh. Well, I was a babysitter to a little kid named Rob Hudson. Now, don't tell me. But I do. That little boy is my husband. Well, I don't believe it. <laughs> Rob. And I didn't know him. I've got another surprise for you. His father's come home. No surprise. I heard. Oh? Released for good behavior. 
Mr. Hudson. That name brings back memories. Mm. Bad ones for us. I suppose. But I don't regret what he did. I hated the man he killed. You did? I'm uh, not a pure spinster, Margot. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, I uh, I don't mean to pry. Ah, uh, it's no great secret. Johnny Marsh got a couple of young girls pregnant, including me. I said he had to marry me, but he told me to run along. I begged him for money. He had none for me. Yeah, it's a messy story. Mm. You, uh, you had the baby. Yeah. Johnny's mother helped me out a little. And the baby? Oh, I don't know. I let her go for adoption. Mm. It was a long time ago. Do you know Laurel's, Marco? Well, yes, I've seen it from the outside. Well, it was some place back then. I lived there, you know, with my mother. They had two rooms on the third floor with a view of the garden. It was beautiful. I left when I was 18 for nurse's training. Mr. Hudson paid the tuition. Was there um, anything between Johnny and Mrs. Hudson? Who knows? My mother thought so. She was straight-laced, I can tell you. When she found out about me, she condemned me straight to hell. She got her wish. I'm 38. All I've got is my job. Otherwise, the last 20 years have been empty. You never thought of getting married? Not after my experience. Anyway, Johnny, no matter how rotten he turned out to be, he was it. Hmm. He must have been something else. He was. You know something, Margo? I'd like to see Mr. Hudson again. He was very good to me. I'll tell him. He killed Johnny. He doesn't think so. He blanked out when he shot Johnny, he says. Maybe prison really blanked him out. <laughs> Will you see her, Phil? I don't know. I'm surprised that she talked so freely. I'm not. It was the biggest thing in her life. The only thing. Johnny Marsh and his murder. There's no question in her mind that I shot him. No. Well, she also had a motive. She was in trouble and Johnny didn't want to be bothered with her. Your best friend was a real dandy, Dad. I knew it then, Rob. I guess you were like a father to her. I helped, but she deserved a chance. You know, I can't imagine Rose hurting me. Allowing you to go to prison? I can. If Rose shot Johnny and set you up as guilty, she'll never admit it. As time goes by, people have a way of fantasizing, believing what they want to believe about something that happened. I was stuck. It has to be Rose or my wife. Or Betsy Grove. You said no, Phil, but from what Rose said, her mother is a very self-righteous person. Margot's got a point. It comes down to what is sin. Think of the Inquisition, the witch hunts. It was death to the disbelievers. You give me a self-righteous person, I'll give you... No, no, I can't believe that Betsy would commit murder. For the sake of her daughter? Well, she had rejected the daughter, Rob. Well, what if it was both of them? Betsy gave you the medication. It must have knocked you out. Rose walks in, grabs a revolver, waits for Johnny to appear... And bang. If that's what happened, there's nothing to be gained in my talking to Rose. It's too long ago. I have no evidence with which to make a charge. The position of that bullet hole, Dad. Yeah, that's clever, but after 20 years, who's going to buy theory? We have too many suspects. Me, your mother, Rose, Betsy. Well, I'll call on her again. <laughs> if she'll let you in. Oh, she will. And then I'll make my accusation. If I come down hard on Rose, Betsy might break. And then we just might begin to see the truth. It's a funny thing in life how friendships arise and what their consequences might be. Here is Philip Hudson, a sound, sensible man who, when he was young, became friendly with Johnny Marsh, a different kind of person. Unsound in the sense that he lived for the day and forgot about tomorrow. We know the outcome of that friendship. The question we're pursuing to an answer is this. Is Philip Hudson destined to live out his life as a marked man? I'll return shortly with Act Three. It would be an 
agonizing experience to be imprisoned for 20 years, thinking all the time that you did not commit the crime of which you were accused. Yet, there is the evidence. You must have committed murder. If, in fact, you did not, how can you ever trap the guilty person? Not with facts. They're against you. By admission? Maybe. Under the pressure of fear and guilt, a person has been known to break down. And that is what Philip Hudson hopes for as he waits for Betsy Grove to open the door to Laurel's. Oh, Mr. Hudson. I have to talk with you again, Betsy. I've nothing to say. I don't want you in the house. Do you see this? Oh, you must be crazy pointing a gun at me. Now step aside and close the door. No, no. Mr. I have something to say to you. No, please. And you will listen. Please put the gun away, Mr. Hudson. It reminds you of 20 years ago, doesn't it, Betsy? The day that someone shot Johnny Marsh. You, you murdered him, you know that. I don't think so. That's what we're going to review. Now carry the candle into the old library. No. And do as I say. No, please, Mr. Hudson. Oh, dear Lord. The ghostly sound of the shot that killed Johnny Marsh. You know what it means? Here, I'll open the door. Oh, it's like a tomb. It is a tomb, and it's held a secret for 20 years. And ever since, you can hear that ghostly gunshot at the same time every night, because I was falsely accused of murder. Isn't that right? No, sir. You killed him. I seen the gun in your hand, and so did she. And Rose? Huh? Rose? She was here, Betsy. Don't you remember she wanted to talk with me? No, Rose wasn't here, Mr. Hudson. She says that she was. Rose? You talked to her? She told my daughter-in-law Rose was here. And you know why Rose wanted to talk to me, don't you? Rose and I weren't close. No, I don't know. She was pregnant. <gasps> Merciful heaven. My life was cut off. And I spent 20 years in prison for a crime someone else committed. Rose was pregnant by Johnny Marsh. Oh, that feels... He wouldn't marry her and he had no money. Oh. That's why Rose wanted to talk to me. Isn't that so, Betsy? Hmm? Of course it was. Why oh, you throw that disgrace in my face, Mr. Hudson? You admit that Rose was going to have a baby and that she led it for adoption oh. to the Davis Foundling Home. Oh, you're cruel. Poor little girl. Unwanted. Rose couldn't support the baby and she lost her head. What are you saying? Uh, Betsy, you gave me my medication. Do you remember? Oh, you was in bad pain. The painkiller never before had knocked me out, Betsy. Why did it knock me out then? Why did I blank out? Maybe you just fainted from the pain. Oh, no, no. I think that you drugged that medication. What do you say? You know what I'm saying, Betsy. Rose hated Johnny Marsh. She was in the house waiting to see me. You came in with my medication and drugged me. Rose grabbed the revolver off the mantel and waited for Johnny to come, and then Rose shot and killed no, him. No, not Rose. No. Rose murdered Johnny Marsh. No, she didn't. Mrs. Hudson was... Uh, she and Johnny... Are you saying that it was Mrs. Hudson? I'm saying nothing more. Did my wife put Rose or you up to drugging my medicine? You won't get another word out of me. You can't come back after 20 years and blame innocent people. I'm going to tell Rose. You don't have to. I'm going to tell her myself. Don't you go near her. You try and stop me. I have an idea. It's pretty far out, but it might work. What is it? Um... Remember the play within the play in Hamlet? Sure, that's how Hamlet trapped the king. Well, why don't we reenact the murder? When a detective is stuck, sometimes he gets everyone together, goes over the case, and then someone turns pale or something, and that's it. But we don't have all the suspects. I could be Mrs. Hudson. I mean, your wife. Well, you'll never get Rose or Betsy Grove to cooperate. Oh, there's a way around that. Yeah, what is it? Well, I have to think it out. You two visit. I need a pencil and paper and some quiet. I won't be long. I hope. Well, it's pretty far-fetched, Rob. Mm, what else is left? No one's going to confess. Don't you want to try it? I don't want to make a fool of you two. We believe in your innocence, Dad. So do I. And I'd like to make it up to you. But the chance is so slim, it's Rob. It's up to you, Dad. If you don't want to take it... I don't think that I do. What's changed your mind? The facts. I sat in prison so long, I convinced myself that I didn't murder Johnny Marsh. But the facts were conclusive. I was jealous of him. And there was talk. You see? Motive, opportunity, the revolver in my hand. Let's call it temporary insanity and let it go at that. No, Phil. I heard what you said, and no. We're going to try my scheme. 
Someone's gotten away with a horrible crime. I'm not revengeful, Margot. Well, I am. Now listen to me. And I'll tell you why Rose and Betsy will cooperate. Margot, you're a dirty little sneak. Well, you said it was common knowledge, Rose. Did you have to pry and gossip about it to Mr. Hudson? Do you know what he did last night? Yes. He told my mother that I had murdered Johnny Marsh. Well, I'm seeing a lawyer when I go off duty, and Mr. Hudson will hear from him. I'll sue him for everything in the book. And you, too, for putting the idea in his head. Okay. Is that all you can say? Okay? You're in trouble, Margot. Look, he was sentenced for murder, and he comes back, and he says he didn't do it? <laughs> well, that's a lot of nonsense. He didn't, Rose. Well, of course he did. Is he crazy or something? No. We don't think he did it. But I did. Is that it? That's what he suggested to your mother. Suggested? He pulled a revolver on the old lady. She's a wreck. And he'll pay for that, too. Oh, I liked Mr. Hudson. He did a lot for me, but this... Tell him we'll see him in court. Oh, accuse me of murder. He didn't, Ross. Well, of course he did. He said I did it. Or Ma and me conspired to do it. Well, you were glad to see Johnny die. Well, I still am. But I didn't murder him. You could have. Oh, look, if you'll calm down, I'd like to tell you something. Mr. Hudson says he doesn't remember the shooting. Well, what else could he say? He may have had reason for the shooting. Sure. Jealousy. But you also had reason to shoot Johnny Marsh. I did, but I didn't do it. Can't you get that through your blonde head? Well, your mother... Oh, come off it. My mother? She hated me for getting into trouble, not Johnny. She knew what he was, but shoot him? Oh, not a chance. And then we come to Mrs. Hudson. What about her? What if Johnny had rejected her? Uh, no good. They were together a lot, and they rode those trails. You know what can happen. Oh, that supposition. I am not naive. Mrs. Hudson was a beautiful woman, and she enjoyed her conquests. Johnny was one of them. What if he wasn't? The set he belonged to just didn't tamper with each other's wives. Do you get what I'm saying, Rose? That she murdered Johnny? That's what we really think. Oh, she's dead. You'll never know. We may. If you and your mother will help us. Huh? We want to reconstruct the scene of the murder. Tonight. In the library. Just when that gunshot is heard. What for? To see if we can't jog your memories. Mr. Hudson or you or your mother just might remember something about what happened that will point to the truth. I... I do remember she came into the room, but she didn't go past me. I wonder... The windows in the library are, are French doors. Very beautiful. See? That's what I'm getting at. If you'll help us, Rose... Well, Mr. Hudson accused me of murder. But why? Ask yourself why. He did get your mother to admit you were there, Rose. But don't you see? He was fishing for information. But Margo, he did it. The gun was in his hand. But he was in pain. The revolver was on the mantel. And the shot was fired from the wrong direction. What? Well, tell me about that. Oh, will you help us? Just you. We, we won't bother with your mother. Oh. Okay. One more shock and she's gone. Oh, sure. All right, I'll play your game. I'm grateful to you, Rose. Well, it's all right, Mr. Hudson. Last night I could have killed you for saying I murdered Johnny. But Margot explained what you were up to. It's okay. I'm going along. Maybe Ma and me will remember something. You haven't told your mother about our plan, Rose. No. I hope this doesn't scare it to death. No, Margot. Remember, you'll be on the staircase, Rose. Okay, I do remember that. I was coming down to talk to Mr. Hudson. And, Rob, you, you're outside. I'll be at the French door. Now, Phil, don't forget to check the door and unlock it. I will. You know... Thinking about it, it could have been Mrs. Hudson. She was hard and always had her way. If Johnny passed her up, I'm sure she could have shot him. You just didn't insult Mrs. Hudson. All right, Phil, it's time. Now go up to the door. Hello, Betsy. I really shouldn't let you in, Mr. Hudson. I told Rose how you come raving in here last night and accusing her of the murder. Well... 
I've changed my mind, Betsy. Well, thank the Lord for that. I thought you was out of your head. What is it this time? Let's go to the library. Oh, but, Mr. Hudson... There's nothing to be afraid of. What are you up to? Betsy, will you listen to me very carefully? Go on. I want to see if I can't reconstruct what happened 20 years ago. What? Now, I'll be on the sofa cleaning my revolver. What? You bring me my medication. Just pretend medicine. A glass of water will do. We'll hear voices. What? What voices? We'll see you and I. The dead are coming back to the library. Maybe. Oh, you give me a chill. Well, there's nothing to be afraid of. You're a sensible woman. I'll just open the door. Oh, I hate this room. Now, you get the medication. Oh, and Betsy, this is important. Oh. Think back. Think back 20 years. 20 years. Mm-hmm. You're suspicious of Johnny and my wife. Oh, and I think how they pulled the wool over your eyes. And think about Rose, pregnant by Johnny. Oh, that dirty... Think about all that. It's 5.30. Now, I'm on the sofa. Mm. All right. Now, begin. Mm. I, I pretend I give you the water. That's right. Mm-hmm. Hand it to me. Mm. Then, what did you do? I, uh, I took the gun from you. I, I remember that. You said, put it on the mantel. Hello, Phil. We're back from our ride. Uh, on the floor. Get on the floor, Mr. Hart. Betsy, what are you doing? Drag on your to the floor. Johnny, he's dead. You killed him. Ma, oh, Ma, what have you done? I saw it. It was you. You murdered Johnny Marsh. Oh, good Lord. He tricked me. Mr. Hudson tricked me. I killed Johnny because of you, Rose. As a disgrace. He was rotten. I killed him. I killed him. Oh, and you tricked me, too. You told me that Mrs. Hudson had... I wanted the truth. Now I have it. My mind and soul are clean. I'll call the police, Dad. No, no, Rob. I'm not vindictive. I'll speak to my lawyer in the morning and let him do what is right. But you have to be cleared, Phil. I will be. But I'll urge the court to be lenient with Betsy. Now, let's leave this room for the last time. Did you notice anything different about it? I didn't hear that ghostly gunshot. It's gone. A gunshot laid to rest. And so Philip Hudson was vindicated. The evidence against him was circumstantial and, as we have learned, it was contrived. If he and Johnny Marsh had not been friends, if Mrs. Hudson had not been attracted to Johnny, if, 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 such a big word, if... Earlier, as we set out on our visit to the realm of the macabre, I mentioned destiny. Is life predestined for each of us? Think about it. I'll return shortly. A pebble dropped into a still pond sends out waves. A deed sends out waves of a different kind. What you do affects others, and the interactions begin. When the deed is murder, the effects are great. Mr. Hudson and his son and daughter-in-law suffered a great deal. It's behind them now, but they'll never forget their trial. Our cast included Norman Rose, Don Scardino, Ann Williams, and E.V. Juster. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour allergy capsule, and Exlax. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. He who thinks himself wise, according to Mr. Voltaire, is a great fool. Well, then, does it also work both ways? Can we say that he who thinks himself a fool is, in truth, possessed of great wisdom? This is a complicated question, since wisdom is often taken for folly. And the other way around. Who accuses this man? I do. He stole my son's donkey. Huh. Is this the truth? I... I confess. In that case, I must send you to jail. But you cannot send Avram to jail, Your Honor. Why not? He's the only shoemaker in the town. Who will mend our boots? Uh, that's true. Uh, because we only have one shoemaker, Avram cannot go to prison. Ah, but since we have two carpenters, uh, we will send one of them instead. <laughs> mystery drama, The Village of Fools, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Fred Gwynn. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. the story of a town that never existed. Or maybe it did. It's about people who were probably the most foolish human beings in the world. Or maybe they were the wisest. One thing we can certainly say, they have long ago departed this earth. Or then again, maybe they haven't. Well, at least this I can tell you. They lived in a town called Helm. It was a tiny, ramshackle, poverty-stricken village deep somewhere in the remote wilderness of Russia. Or was it Poland? It might have been Lithuania. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Let the tale begin. Have the storyteller step forward. And what is your name, my good man? What is my name? Uh, you, you must know my name. The, the whole world trembles in suspense. The... The sun will refuse to rise and unless you know my name. All right, I'll tell you my name. My name is Mendele Moshe Rothschild. Rothschild? Rothschild? Oh, my. Are you one of the Rothschilds? By this question, you mean, am I one of those Rothschilds? Well, it didn't work out the way I expected. <laughs> what does... Man plants wheat, the Lord sends crows. I'll tell you how my name happens to be Rothschild. One day, I said to my wife, Sorifka, I'm home. My cup runneth over. Rejoice, dear wife. I have rejoiced each day that I've known you. My life has been one uninterrupted festival. There is great news. You have mud on your feet. Such news. I have just scrubbed the floor. Listen, Sorarifka, listen. A marvel. A thing of wonder. Take your shoes off. I, Mendela Moshe, am now a citizen. Hmm? And what is a citizen? What do you mean, what is a citizen? Everybody knows what a citizen is. Oh, I see. So, my beloved, light of my life, my, my partner for the here and the now and eternity, how does it feel to be a citizen of the great French Empire? And... What is the French Empire? The uh, French Empire? This this town where we live. Yes? Last year it was part of the Great Russian Empire. The year before it was part of the Great Austrian Empire. And before that, the, the Great Prussian Empire, no? You're telling the story. So then, uh, all this coming and going, uh, do you know what it means? No. I don't know either, uh, except... Except? Except that each time they change the czar. 
Yes. Well, one year the Tsar is Nicholas, then he is Ferdinand, and now he is Napoleon. Napoleon? And what does he want from us, this uh, Napoleon? He is going to give each and every one of us a name. A name? Just what I needed. So Rivka isn't good enough? Every citizen is to have a last name. I already have one. I was born Sora Rivka. I'll die Sora Rivka. It's the first and last name I'll ever have. You'll have to have another one. I don't want another one. It's the law. Why can't I be called Sora Rivka? Do you know how many Sora Rivkas there are in just this little town alone? How, how many Mendela Moishas? I ask you, how could the Tsar ever hope to keep track? But... Mendela Moshe and Sora Rivka, Rothschild. <laughs> well, now. Rothschild? I have chosen the last name of Rothschild. But it belongs to the Baron. The Baron Rothschild. I can choose whatever name I like. I am a citizen of the great empire. But, but Rothschild? Why Rothschild? Consider. Everyone named Rothschild is rich. No? Well, yes. Why? Why? How do you account for it? Well, uh, I... Can it be a coincidence? How do you account for the fact that all people named Rothschild are rich? I can't. Then, I'll tell you. It's magic. Magic? Rothschild must be a magic name. So, if I take the name of Rothschild, then I too shall become rich. Ha! How simple it is. Soon, you shall have a palace and servants, a carriage and furs... What do you say? Next time, if you don't take off your muddy shoes, I won't let you come into the house. Well, anyhow, nothing changed. And all I got out of it was a last name, Rothschild. But for me, somehow the magic didn't work. As usual, nothing ever went right. But I must say, one good thing did happen. I made a friend. Who? You'll never guess. None other than the great Baron Rothschild himself. When he heard my name was Rothschild, he, he he wanted to meet me. He gave me all sorts of jobs to do. He even called me cousin. Well, on this particular day, he sent for me. Come in, cousin. Sit down. Now, is everything fine and comfortable at home? Uh, you know how it is, Baron. Well, while, you, while you live, you're afraid to complain, and after you're dead... It's too late. Yes. I called you here to ask you a favor. A favor? A most important favor. Tell me, cousin, can you undertake a mission for me? Did you say mission? A confidential mission. A confidential mission? Who could tell where it would take me? The great Baron Rothschild... Huh. Advisor to all the proud and mighty crowned heads of Europe? Oh, was I to carry a message to the Tsar of Italy? Or France? Or Spain? Maybe Austria? England? You will do it for me, cousin? But, Baron, do you think I'm... Qualified? Cousin, from every point of view, you are the best qualified. Uh, now then, I am looking for a certain place. It is called Helm. Helm? I want you to find this place, this helm, for me. And where is it, Baron? You'll know when you get there. I'll know. That's what he told me. Uh, uh, that's what who told you? Who, the man, the man who sold me the secret. There's a secret? Uh, yes, cousin, a great secret. A great secret? Perhaps the most valuable secret in the world. And such a secret, listen... Just yesterday, a man was admitted to my study. He had a long white beard, ragged clothes, torn shoes. Yes, but with such an honest look on his face. And he said to me, Baron, will you give me 50 gilden? And I said, my friend, if you need 50 gilden, by all means, you shall have them. But he said, Baron, I do not ask for charity. And I said, well, brother, why are you here? And you know what he answered? No. He said, I have something to sell you. Well, what is it, I asked. A secret, he replied. What secret could be worth 50 gilden, I asked. And you know what he answered? Uh, I cannot imagine. He looked at me and he said, 
the secret of eternal life. And so I said, sell to me the secret of eternal life. Here are your 50 gilden. Yes. And he said, very well, Baron. If you desire to live forever, uh, yes, come and settle in our town of Helm. Because ever since the beginning of time, no rich man has ever died there. Ah, you see, cousin? Yes, Baron, I see. No rich man has ever died there. Now, this is a secret. Not today and not tomorrow. Perhaps not even next year. But sometime when I feel... Uh, you understand? Oh, absolutely, Baron. When that time comes, I shall decide to reside in Helm, as it were. Of course. Therefore, I must make the proper uh, preparations. Uh, naturally. A suitable house and so forth. It goes without saying. In these matters, one requires a confidential agent. It will be my pleasure. You see now how uniquely qualified you are for the job? Oh, uh, th uh, thank you, Baron. <laughs> I rely on your discretion. I shall breathe a word to no one. Not even to your wife? Oh, rest assured. Uh, wait. Do you talk in your sleep? I shall say nothing. It will be a long, arduous, dangerous journey. I am equal to the task. Naturally, your family will be provided for. Oh, thank you, Baron. Can you leave now? Now can also mean tomorrow morning. And so, at breakfast, I told my beloved Sura Rifka, you married a man of importance. Hmm. Who could be as lucky as me? I have a job. The Baron is sending me on a confidential mission. I know. You know. You are going to look for the town of Helm. Who told you? You told me. When did I tell you? Last night, when you were asleep. Oh. Uh, well, you don't want to believe what I say while I'm asleep. Why not? I can't believe what you say while you're awake. Now, Sora Rifka. Uh, what did he tell you about Helm, the Baron? He told me to find it. Oh, well, you'll find it. <laughs> you won't have any trouble at all. You know why? Because you're a fool. Sora Rifka. And Helm? Do you know what Helm is? Helm is the town of fools. Oh, what are you saying? Everyone knows it. That's why the Baron has chosen you. Oh, no. no. Yes, Mendela Moisha. Like is sent to find like. Uh, I won't go. You must go. Uh, but the Baron thinks I'm a fool. Why shouldn't he think so? You are a fool. You... You call your husband a fool? No. Uh, some men are fated to be rich, others handsome, some wise, and others fools. And yet, all are as one in the sight of the Lord. You want me to go, even though you know it's a fool's errand? My beloved Mendela, who else but a fool can be sent on a fool's errand? Who else, indeed? And it is written that there is a time for all things, a time to be wise and a time to be foolish. Well, each of us must follow his destiny. Wise man or fool, we play it out to the end. The trouble is we can never really be sure which part we are performing. We may find enlightenment in act two. And uh, then again, who knows? said we would tell you a story about Helm, and so far we haven't even arrived there. So, what's your hurry? We still have two acts to go. Besides, we had a great many affairs to settle before we could start out on such a long, hazardous journey. After all, does one just say goodbye, I'm off to Helm, without so much as a by your leave? Anyhow, our hero, Mendel Moisha Rothschild, is finally on his way. Yes, he will discover that every uphill has its downhill. That you can't sell the skin of a bear that's still in the woods. And that a man should live, if only to satisfy his curiosity. How are we doing, Mendel Moisha? How are we doing? We? Suddenly I have a partner. I'll tell you. A fool is the only living thing created by the Lord that grows without rain. It is now six weeks since I left my beloved Sura Rifka to search for the town of Helm. 
And while I am no closer to it, I feel I am no further from it either. And no one can help me. I have walked hundreds of dusty, difficult miles, and I am sustained by faith, the faith that I will know. Yes, faith. But isn't it written that faith makes a full breakfast but a scanty supper? Yes, I will confess that there were times when I was ready to admit defeat. And then I came to the outskirts of a tiny village, and I saw a man kneeling in the road. Shalom Aleichem, my friend. And what are you looking for? I am looking for a ruby. Ah. A silver ruby. Ah, shall I help you look? Uh, my name is Mendela Moshe. Ah, my name is Yitzhak Isaac. Hmm. Well, Yitzhak Isaac, as far as I can see, uh, no, there's no trace of your silver ruble. Uh, whereabouts on the road did you lose it? Oh, I didn't lose it on the road. I lost it back in the synagogue courtyard. <laughs> but if you lost the ruble in the courtyard of the synagogue, why are you searching for it here? How can you ask such a question? The synagogue courtyard is knee-deep in mud. Here, at least, the ground is hard and dry. So, which is the better place to look? And the moment he said it, a great light began to shine in my brain. Of course. It was so clear, so logical, so right. And I knew. Don't ask me how. I knew. That's all. I knew this was the place I had been looking for. My search was ended. This must be Helm. What else could it be? Helm. I found it. But why do you mean you found it? Did you ever lose it? I found it. Helm is like my lost ruble. It slips out of the pocket and it's gone forever. I have been searching for Helm for weeks, for months. Is one permitted to ask why? Isn't it written, to each man his fate? And what has fate to do with Helm? You see, Yitzhak Isaac, I am a fool. And so, therefore, I belong here. Here? In Helm? Yes, because... Helm is the town of fools. Who says so? Everyone. Who is everyone? Well, it's known. And, and you came here because you believe this is the town of fools? Yes, that's one reason. Ah, my poor Mendela Moshe, you have been deceived. This is not the town of the foolish. This is the town of the wise. What? We have no fools here. We have sages. We have no simpletons. We have philosophers. Here, all is learning. The very air crackles with wisdom. Listen. To what? The crickets. Listen. You hear them? Well, yes, but... To the uninformed, the crickets merely make an idle chirping. Well, perhaps they do in other places, but here, each chirp is a nugget of wisdom. Oh? Listen again. To what? The birds. To the uninformed, the songs of the birds are merely some random snatches of melody. Mm, perhaps they are in other places, but here, each note is a pearl of profundity. But I don't hear them saying anything. Uh, yes, well, neither do I. Well, then how, how do you... Wisdom, my friend, is a ladder. It has many rungs. We, uh, most of us, are still trying to climb up from the bottom. But when one can comprehend the chirping of crickets and the singing of birds, <laughs> that indeed is the highest rung of the ladder. I see. Uh, you say your name is Yitzhak Isaac? What else should it be? You have a long white beard. There's no credit to me. It was created by age. Your clothes are ragged. You, you, your shoes are torn. Wait, is my name Rothschild that I should wear new clothes and whole shoes? Rothschild? Wait, you have an honest face. The rest of my body is equally... You, you are the man. You are the one who appeared before the Baron Rothschild. You sold him the secret of everlasting life. And you know why I arranged that transaction with the Baron? So that he would send you to Helm. Me? Yes. No rich men have ever died here. But wise men? Ha. Ah. Like a farmer harvests a rich crop, the Lord takes them in season. Each year we become fewer. But the Baron sent me because he thinks I'm a fool. It is written, discretion is the better part of valor. Therefore, it follows that wisdom is well advised to wear the cloak of folly. 
Then, then I, 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 I am a wise man? Oh, of course. But I always thought I was a fool. Ah, uh ah. -huh. That is the true beginning of wisdom. Yes. And one by one, you will climb the rungs of the ladder of wisdom. And one day, perhaps, you will reach the highest. My beloved Sura Rifka, live and be well a hundred years. I have found Helm. And Helm has found me. I am here to learn wisdom. I have been asked to be the judge. And what have I learned as a judge? What haven't I learned as a judge? I learned that the wise man must hear one word and understand two. But I didn't just become a judge. No. I was interviewed and examined and questioned and tested. Hmm? What comes easy in this life? We have here Mendela Moshe, who is to become our judge. Why? Ah, good question, Hannah Bela. The answer? Because we need one. I know we need one, but why him? Why him? Because he's here. Is he a man of good character? Is he honest? Put him to the test. I will. Mendela Moshe, if you found a purse with a million rubles lying in the road, would you be able to withstand temptation and return them to their rightful owner? Yes and no. If the money belonged to some big, wealthy millionaire, then I confess I would keep it. You would? But if it turned out that the million rubles belonged to some poor, hard-working peasant, then I would return every last penny. Ah, uh, this is what any one of us would have said. This is spoken like a true Helmite. Are there other questions? I have another question. Uh, speak. Tell me, which is more important, the sun... Or the moon. Can you answer, Mendela Moshe? Which is more important, the sun or the moon? It is not to be taken lightly. Um, how, however, upon consideration, one must conclude that the moon is more important. You say the moon. Why? The thing is obvious. The moon is useful. It shines at night when there is need for light. The sun is wasted shines only during the day, when there is no need for it at, at all. A uh, Solomon, a uh, Solomon. A uh, judgment. Are all here satisfied with Mendela Moshe? Yes. Yes. A uh, Solomon. I then must ask our judge Mendela Moshe to solve the problem that is pressing this congregation. What shall we do? The poor box has been stolen from the synagogue. Um, construct a new one. Uh, but how can we be sure the new one will not meet the same fate? To safeguard the poor box, suspend it high from the ceiling. A thief shall be unable to reach it. Uh, true. A thief will be unable to reach it, but it will also be out of reach of those who wish to contribute to charity. Uh, then this is what must be done. Place a ladder beneath the poor box so that all who wish to contribute may do so with ease. Truly, there is a judge in Israel. I feel humble because of the great responsibility that has been placed upon my soul. Well, when they look in Helm, they look to me. Yesterday, there were two cases. The first concerned the sexton of the synagogue. Mm, he has neglected his duty. It is necessary for him to wake all the citizens of Helm for midnight prayers. Yes. He is paid to make rounds of the village and knock on everyone's shutters. And he has not been doing it? No. And so people sleep instead of being awakened to recite the psalms. What have you to say to this, uh, Yeshaya Tzvi? I... I am very old. Uh, yes? And I know I should walk through the town and knock on everyone's shutters, but I cannot walk so far. I am too tired. I see. Yes. <clears throat> Friends, what is to be done? Can we deprive a man of his livelihood because he is old and tired? On the other hand, if he cannot walk through town to bang on our shutters, how shall we be awakened for prayer? But, uh, there is an answer. Let all the window shutters in Helm be removed. 
and stack neatly in front of Vishayatsvi's house so that he may strike them all at the same time. Yes, my beloved Sura Rivka, I am kept busy indeed. Daily, I acquire wisdom, the wisdom of Helm. It is true I do not yet understand the chirping of crickets or the singing of birds, but I, I am getting there. I, I listen. I listen closely. For on that day, I know Helm will truly come into its own. Helm will become the light of the world. And talking of light, the world will yet be grateful to Helm because we have saved the moon. Yes, my beloved Sura Rivka, we have saved the moon. It, it came about this way. Um, uh, good evening, Hannah Bela. Uh, good evening, Mendela Moshe. You uh, seem to be unhappy. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, may I ask why? Well, it's... I don't know how to say it. Now, suppose the moon were to stop shining. Well... Well, what? Suppose the light of the moon were to go out. Um, I hadn't thought about it. Why haven't you thought about it? Because it never happened. Does that mean you shouldn't think about it? Well... And because it never happened, does that mean it never will happen? Um, all I can say is, don't worry about it. That's all you have to say. Yes, what else is there to say? Oh, don't worry about it. <laughs> but who says the light will go out from the moon, Yitzhak Isaac? Who says? Mm, it could happen, yes. No. You sure? Am I sure? Um, well... And when the light does go out, then what will we do? Then, um, there will be no moon, that's all. Are we not commanded to bless the new moon every month? Yes. If we cannot see the new moon, how will we be able to recite the prayer? Ah, uh, yes, I, I see the difficulty. If the light goes out and the moon is dead, how can we save her? Uh, let me think. Um, uh, uh, let me think. You must admit, only in Helm would this problem occur to anyone. And yet, just because the moon has shed its light all these millions of years, does it mean that it will continue to illuminate the skies? Who is to say that the moon will not disappear tomorrow? How can anybody be sure? I shall return with Act Three shortly. say in Helm, send a lazy man for the angel of death. However, at this moment, our little town is not concerned with philosophy. They have a much more immediate problem. What is going to happen if the moon were to lose its light? Suppose the moon were to, well, to die. What then? All right, don't despair. There are wise men in Helm. Believe me, this problem does not defy solution. We cannot be sure that the moon will die. Can we be sure it will not? If you ask me, it should have happened long ago. W what are you saying, Harabella? To me, it's the biggest surprise that the moon has lasted till now. Why? Look. Look up at the moon. Yes? See how it shines in all weather. All alone up there with nobody to take care of it. So you know what I say? Bring it down here. Down here? Where we can look after it. Ah, not a bad idea, even if it does come from a woman. Bring it down here? Br br bring the moon down here? Why not? Well, she's right. We can watch over it, protect it. The way it is now, left alone by itself, outside, all night. Who can tell what will happen? Somebody could come along and steal it. Well, no. It's not possible. Nobody's stolen it till now. Until now, we've been lucky. We must bring the moon down here. As a judge, surely, Mendela Moshe, you can see the wisdom of such a course of action? Yes, uh, uh, but... Ah, uh -huh. there's a but. How? 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 Yes, how? Mendela, 
You are the wisest of the wise here in Chalm. How do you suggest? Uh, friends, I, 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 I'm afraid nothing occurs to me. But it must be done. How? Uh, 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 again, can one set ladder on top of ladder, uh, climb to the moon and, and carry her down? Now, there is an idea. Oh, yes, a splendid idea. <laughs> but uh, someone would have to climb up the ladders. Well, of course. Way, way up on the ladders. Certainly. And I will do it. Far. Up, up out of sight. Well, somebody has to do it. And, and suppose when you are above the whole world and, and, and you should become dizzy and lose your balance and fall to the ground. Oh, no. Who would then earn a living for your wife and children? No. The, there must be another way. Yeah, but how? How can we save the moon? Uh, wait. Uh, wait. Yes? The question is how to save the life uh, of the moon. Do you all agree? Mm, yes, yes. Well, and and what is the life of the moon? Uh, think. Uh, the life of the moon is the light of the moon. As long as the moon shines, it is well and healthy. It lives. Yes? Yes. And so, if we can capture this light, th th this moonlight... But how? If we cannot capture the moon, how can we hope to capture its light. Friends, the wisdom of Helm can solve all problems. But how can this be done? Tomorrow is the night of the full moon. Hmm? First, we shall say the benediction, and then, then, we shall save the moon. What a big, bright, and beautiful moon. Now then, friends. Hmm? The barrel. Well, why do we need a barrel? A broom. Heim. Hmm? Push it this way. Ah, good. Right here. Now. The moon is directly overhead. We have here this huge barrel filled with clear, pure spring water. But why? For what? In a moment or two. The moon shall pass directly overhead. Yes. See? See? L look in the barrel. See? See how the light of the moon fills the barrel? How it shines inside? Huh? Huh? See? Yes. You can see the full moon. It is all in the barrel. Huh? <laughs> quickly, quickly. Uh, Avrum, there's Heim. The lid, the lid. Put on the lid. And now, hammer it down. Hammer, hammer, hammer. My friends, see my friends, see what we have done. <laughs> we have captured the light of the moon. <laughs> and now, whatever happens up there, out there, in the vast reaches of the sky, we shall always have the moon. My beloved Sir Rivka, greetings from your devoted husband in the village of Helm, where I grow mightier in wisdom with each passing day. I now must tell you of the great tragedy which befell us here in Helm. One night, we were sound asleep in our beds, when suddenly the dreaded cry... Fire! Fire! The bathhouse! The bathhouse is burning! Fire! Is in the fire! It was a terrible fire, and before anyone could lift a finger to stop it, the bathhouse had completely burned to the ground. Oh, 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 a few charred sticks were all that remained of the of the bathhouse of Helm. <sighs> Need I tell you, my beloved, of the cloak of sorrow and sadness and gloom that covered the village? How long can people live without a bathhouse? What's to be done? Friends, uh, there is only one thing we can do. Uh, yes? We must build a new bathhouse. A new bathhouse? We need money. Ah, in all of home, are there even two rubles we can rub together? Uh, we are not isolated human beings. There are Jews all over the world who would be willing to help us. Is it not written? It is a blessing to give. Yes, with the help of good, pious people everywhere, what a beautiful bathhouse we shall build. A, a, a bathhouse that shall be a glory. And so, 
I took Yitzhak Isaac along with me for his great knowledge and our room for his broad and strong back. And we began our journey. People uh, listened to our story. Uh, we told them who we were and where we came from, and everyone agreed that Helm simply had to have a bathhouse. Soon, we had enough money. Uh, yes, we had more than enough. Uh, we decided to stop at an inn for the night. <clears throat> uh, do you have a room for three honest men? Honest men are a novelty in these parts. I'll try to accommodate you. Uh, uh, what do you mean, honest men are a novelty? Strangers, huh? Uh, yes, we are uh, going home. Are you carrying money? Uh, 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 money. Well, I hope not for your sake. Uh, uh, no, uh, no. The roads are infested with thieves. Uh, thieves? Not just ordinary thieves, mind you. They're, they're having a war in the South, so you've got deserters, all sorts of wandering bandits. Uh, they'll cut your throat. For a penny. Oh, oh, oh well, well, uh, 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 then we have no, no money. Do you think we could have some supper? I'll, uh, I'll bring you something to eat. And, uh, shh, 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 we must talk very quietly. But we have money. We have a good deal of money. Don't say a word. Yeah, but we're miles from home. I know. And along the way, we are certain to be stopped by bandits. Mm, that's true. We will never be able to get this money home. Why? We must do something. Who? I know. We will buy goods. What? Goods? Yeah, merchandise. We will turn the money into merchandise. Ah, yes. And this merchandise, whatever it is, how will we get it home to Helm? We cannot hope to carry the money without being robbed. We cannot hope to carry goods either. Yet, wait, 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 wait. Is there something we can buy? Something that doesn't have to be carried, but could arrive safely in Helm. Is there? Why, you couldn't even imagine it. Here, here comes the landlord. Oh. Your supper, gentlemen. Now, uh, you, you'll be spending the night. Uh, the, uh, if you have a room. Oh, yes, we have a room, but please sleep fast. We need the pillows. Hearty appetite. Did you hear what he said? Well, he said hearty appetites. No, 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 no. He said the word pillows. A wonderful word. So what's so wonderful about pillows? What's inside a pillow? You know what's inside a pillow? Tell me. Feathers. That's the solution. To what? Our problem. We will invest in feathers. We can buy sacks and sacks of good downy feathers. The, the very best. The, the most expensive. Yeah, but the thieves would steal downy feathers from us as quickly as they would anything else. No, no, the, the, the thieves won't be able to. Ah, why not? Be because we won't be carrying them. Well, then how can we bring those feathers home? We won't bring the feathers home. Then how will they get there? They'll bring themselves. Yes, my beloved Sura Rivka, the feathers would get home by themselves. Beautiful, valuable feathers of, of the finest, the softest now. Once they were in Helm, we would sell them and use the money to build a bathhouse. And I knew exactly how we would get them home. And so, uh, early the next morning, we bought hundreds of sacks of the loveliest feathers you ever saw. And we hastened to a high hill. We waited for a strong wind that was blowing in the direction of Helm. We would fly them home. This is the breeze we have been waiting for. Release them. Release the feathers. Oh, look. Fly, little friends. Fly, fly. Straight to Helm. Yitzhak, Isaac. Avrum. Chaim. See. Look, look. See how they fly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Straight and true. We shall see you soon. We shall see you in Helm. It's Mendel. Mendel and Moshe, you're back. Yes, friends, we're back. Oh, did you raise the money? Yes, but it was too dangerous to try to carry it home. So, we bought feathers. Feathers? Where are the feathers? What? Do you mean they didn't get here yet? No. 
Now, what now what can you say to that? We we released them in a high, strong wind that was blowing directly toward Helm. Well, what, whatever could have happened? Oh, perhaps they lost their way. Ah, 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 yes, yes, of course, they lost their way. Well, what can we do now? Nothing. If they're lost, they're lost. Oh, ah, I know. Get all the feathers from all the bedding in the village, and we shall release them into the wind. But what good will that do? Don't you see? These are our very own feathers. They know where we live. So, they will meet the new ones, the strange feathers, high in the air, and then they will guide them home. Oh, a brilliant idea. An idea worthy of home. <laughs> Send up the feathers. And so, we climbed the highest hill with all of our bedding and comforters and, and pillows and we released all of the feathers into a high wind and they will meet the ones we bought and, and uh, they will conduct them safely home and uh, so my beloved Sura Rivka uh, uh, we are standing here and uh, waiting for them all to return and as far as I know they're still waiting patiently and hopefully. For every man, woman, and child in Helm still believes that one day those beautiful feathers will descend upon the town. And before you smile at the naivete of these simple, humble, innocent people, you might just pause to ask yourself, what feathers are you waiting for? I'll return with something to tickle your imagination shortly. And so, what can we say about Helm? What really did take place there? Was it inspired wisdom or absolute foolishness? All that we can say concerning wise men and fools is that the good Lord created them both, loves them both, and needs them both. Remember, God told some people to be wise, and he told some people to be foolish, but he never told anyone to be stupid. Our cast included Fred Gwynn, Bryna Rayburn, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Have you ever felt depressed... What a foolish question. Who has not? But the depression we are concerned with here is an unhappiness that seems to descend from nowhere, enshroud us for no apparent reason, and plunge us into a despair as to who we are, what we are doing here, and why we are doing it. Even whether we are alive and awake or simply asleep and dreaming, the whole strange and sorry affair. Why did you come here? What? 
What do you think you'll find here you couldn't find someplace else? Why, well, I, I, um... There's I, nothing here, you know. Absolutely nothing. But that's what appeals to me. The absence of everything. That's what I want. A place where there's nothing. If that's what you want, you got it. Our mystery drama, Waking and Sleeping, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Michael Tolan. I'll be back shortly with Act One. ever felt that there must be a beautiful life that you are not leading, a wondrous world you cannot see, a peace and contentment that have somehow eluded you, and have you wondered where the fault lies? Is it with you? Or is there no such life, no such world, no state of being, no peace or contentment anywhere at all? I suspect both things are true in part. The whole truth lies somewhere in between. Things were getting worse. Walking purposefully into a room only to find myself ignorant as to why I'd entered it. Talking animatedly to a friend. Then losing my train of thought and having to fumble my way out. I thought I must be having a nervous breakdown. And I decided to go off somewhere by myself. To think. To set myself straight. Not an original decision, I grant you. One which many have made before me. And as you will soon see, one of the stupidest decisions a person can make. Yes, yes, I'm coming. Yes? Is this you? I, uh, I beg your pardon? This piece of paper, you write this? Oh, oh, yes, 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 I did. Found it tacked up on the wall of the saloon. Yes, well, I, I can explain that. I... I had thought to put an advertisement in the newspaper, well, we but We got I... no newspaper in Ungerville. Yes, I found that out. But I, I thought perhaps there was one in some nearby town or city. But nobody in Ungerville reads a newspaper. So I was told by the bartender. D did you come to answer this, uh, this piece of paper? Well, it says there you need somebody to do some housework. Yes. I, I find I can't manage it by myself. Nobody around here does housework. Oh, you're sure there's nobody would be willing? I I can afford to pay rather well. Everybody in Ungerville works for self, not for others. That makes it rather awkward, doesn't it? You buy this old house? No, I, I rented it. Well, if, if you're not interested... It's a big old house. Yes, yes, it is, rather. It was the only place I could find. Nobody's lived in it for years. I know. Can't think why you'd want to. Well, let's just say it appealed to me. Living here all by yourself? That's what you plan on doing? Yes. Uh, if you should by chance hear of someone who... Well, like... I won't hear of anybody. Oh, well, then I won't, I won't keep you. Thanks for... Of course, for... there is my husband. Uh, I beg your pardon, you said your husband? He's pretty handy around the house. Would he be willing? If I tell him to, he'll be willing. Well, I'd certainly appreciate any help I can get. Well, you see, he crippled himself a few years back, drove a pitchfork into his own leg, so he's no good for farm work anymore. But I guess he could shuffle a broom around here, if you'd pay him right. Oh, I, I would, yes. I, I'd be glad to. He'd be slow, but he'd be thorough. No, I'm sure he'd work out fine. I ought to tell you he's a trifle on the weird side. Oh, well, listen, aren't we all? Well, I don't mean he's dangerous or anything like that. He's just... Weird. Ever since he stabbed himself with a pitchfork, he's been weirdish. But if you want him... Oh, I do. Yes, I, I, I do. I, I need someone. So I'll tell him. He'll be here tomorrow morning. Well, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm sure he and I will get along splendidly. But that remains to be seen, don't it? Yes, I... I suppose it does. Now, I thought... Now I will settle in and start putting myself to rights. Resolve the chaos in my head. Reach an understanding of my misery. Once this big old house was in order, 
free of the clutter of unwashed dishes, balls of dust, and, and layers of grime. Then and then only could I set about restoring myself to myself. So I was wide awake, washed and shaved, when the woman's husband knocked at the door. Uh, yes, yes, I'll be right there. Oh, good morning. G- good morning. C- come right in. Uh, come, sit down. I'm, I'm glad you could make it. <laughs> I, uh, I'm assuming you're the husband of the lady I spoke to yesterday. Uh, am I right? <laughs> well, yes, I thought as much. Well, I, uh... I, I live alone. My, my tastes are very simple. I mean, I wouldn't be having any guests or, or parties or anything like that. But I... I do need to live in a clean place. I, I can't stand a mess of any kind. Do you, do you know what I mean? Do you? I know. It's, it's just a question of keeping the place reasonably clean and, and my clothes in some kind of order. Uh, I don't suppose you'd want to cook a meal now and then. I could. Oh, well, well, say now, that, that's, that's fine. That's just fine. It, it needn't be anything fancy. I, I happen to like very simple food, uh, a chop and a baked potato. <laughs> I, uh, I think I could manage my own orange juice and coffee for breakfast, and I'd, I'd probably take luncheon out somewhere. Uh, Ungerville does have a restaurant of some sort, doesn't it? There's a diner. Oh, well, some diners are very good. I've eaten in a few that were really excellent. Uh, is, is this a, a good one? I've never been in it. Oh. Well, I'll just have to take my chances, won't I? Uh, so, it's, it, it's all settled. Or, or is there anything you want to ask me? Any, any questions? Why are you here? What? Why did you come here? Why did you take this house? What do you think you'll find in Ungerville you couldn't find somewhere else? Why, I, um... Ungerville's a ghost town. There's nothing here. In a way, that's what appeals to me. This absence of anything distracting. Used to be a tin mine here. But that wore out and closed down 50 years ago. Now there's nothing. But that's what I want. A place where there's nothing. Well, you got it. You see, I... I simply got to a point in my existence where I couldn't see the sense of it. Does that sound foolish to you? No. I couldn't... I couldn't continue. Uh Uh-huh. There's a poem. (laughs) But you wouldn't know about that. Mm, Why wouldn't I? It's by Wordsworth. Ever hear of him? Yes. It goes, if if I can remember it, it's been a long time. (laughs) The world is too much with us. Late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Something like that. Little we see in nature that is ours. That's it. Yes, that's it. We have given our hearts away. A sordid boon. You know it. Why shouldn't I know it? Why, no reason, I guess. I just never... (laughs) Well, anyway, I I started to think... All this getting and spending. I was laying waste my powers. I was. I had... Well, I had given away my heart. (laughs) Does that sound ridiculous? No. I wasn't reacting to anything anymore. All sorts of things were going on around me. Anyway, they seemed to be. But none of it interested me. None of it concerned me. None of it even touched me. I was... I was all alone. All alone by myself. (sighs) Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you really understand? I think so. It's very important to me that somebody should. Of course. Have you ever felt that way? Of course. What did you do about it? Waited for it to pass. And did it? Sooner or later. How soon? How much later? Sometimes sooner. Sometimes later. Tell me something. Did it ever... 
you know, get worse. I never went mad, if that's what you mean. I guess that is what I mean. How did you know that was what I meant? I just knew. But how? How did you know? I'm human, too. Oh, yes, of course you are, but how... Oh, well, never mind. Look, I I'm very glad you're going to be around. You're the first person I've been able to talk to about this... this condition I find myself in. I've been shy, embarrassed. You know what I mean? Yes. I've been so darn... not lonely, worse than that. Alone. I'd given my heart away. A sordid boom. Yes. Yes. This sea that bears her bosom to the moon. These winds that will be howling at all hours. And are upgathered now like sleeping flowers. Like sleeping flowers. For this. For everything. We're out of tune. Out of tune. Yes, out of tune. It moves us not. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn. So might I, standing on some pleasant lee, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn. Have sight of Proteus rising from the sea. Or hear old Triton blow his wreathed horn. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yes. Listen, do, do you know what I'd like to have? What? A horse. A horse? Yeah, I'd like to get up in the morning and throw some tack on a horse and just start off. Could you find me a horse? Yeah, I could do that. Yes. I'll find you a horse. horse felt good under me. I breathed in the crisp, fresh air, looked around me at the trees and the wildflowers that grew by the side of the road. Then, as though it had been waiting for me, and for this moment, there lay a field of white daisies, a huge field of daisies, almost an acre it seemed to me, all white with yellow centers, swaying a little, stretching a little toward the sun, looking so... Beautiful, so uselessly beautiful that I I cried. For the first time in heaven knows how long I cried. I sat down on my horse and cried. It must have been several minutes before my tears stopped and my eyes cleared. But when they did, I saw with hardly any surprise a young girl standing in the center of that field fluttering daisies. Sudden beauty can do that to us. Particularly beauty that has no purpose and no price. Beauty that cannot be purchased or possessed. That is simply presented to us by God or by nature, which may eventually turn out to be one of the same things. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. to imagine a world where all the daisies have gone and are never coming back. Where every sunset is dimmed and discolored by smoke. Where the grass is brown and the trees are thin. Where all our small wild animals have starved because their earth is covered completely with paved roads and parking lots. Can you imagine it? It frightened me. Yes, actually frightened me. A grown man sitting astride a horse, crying. Crying at the sight of a field of daisies and a young girl. She looked to be about 17, looking up at the sky. What was happening to me? Was this the breakdown I'd so long feared? Was I suffering some sort of collapse? I turned my horse around and walked him back to the house. The next day, I asked my newly acquired manservant to saddle up my horse once again. Uh, do you know a place near here, a few miles from here, where there's an enormous field of white daisies? Daisies grow wild wherever they have a mind to. 
I'd like to have a field of daisies like that. Well, they won't stand for transplanting. Oh, I didn't know that. Sometimes they'll stay where you put them. Sometimes they won't. Depends on their mood, I guess. When I saw that, that great horde of daisies and... And then the girl. You saw a girl? She was just standing there, surrounded by flowers. I... I saw her through my tears. Well, aren't you going to say anything? What should I say? Aren't you going to ask me why I was crying? No. Good, because I don't know why I was crying. I see. I wasn't prepared for anything like that. I came on them so unexpectedly. And there were so many of them. There must have been millions, millions. They were... They were like a vision. Yes, a vision. Your horse is ready. When you see a vision, you... Well, something happens. Something's bound to happen, don't you think? I should think so. I mean, you... You fall on your knees, or you... Or you shout out loud, or you praise God, or you... You cry. You cry. And that's what I did. I cried. I didn't know I was going to cry. The last thing in the world I expected was that I'd cry. And then... The girl standing there, looking up at the sky. Hey, want a leg up? Uh, what's that? I said, do you want a leg up? Can I help you mount? Oh, yes, yes, thank you. I, uh, I don't know when I'll be back. It wasn't the same. The depression hovered over me like a black cloud. Not quite as large as before, but just as threatening. I felt the gnawing anxiety in the pit of my stomach as the horse trotted down the dirt road with the overhanging trees. I was taking the same path I'd followed the day before. And now I knew it was the wide field of daisies I was looking for, like a grail. Just up ahead, beyond the little white deserted church... That was where I'd find it. Just ahead. Just ahead. I reined in my horse and searched wildly. Where were they? My daisies. My field of daisies. Where are you? Where are you? Where? What's the matter, mister? Uh, what? Something wrong. Where? Where are they? Where are what? I, I was here yesterday and there was a big field. There's a field right over there. But there were daisies growing in it yesterday, all all over it. What happened to them? I don't know. You you remember them, don't you? I don't know if I do. But you must have seen them. You you were you were standing right in the middle of them. Yesterday? Yesterday morning. What time? Uh, about about ten o'clock. Ten o'clock? I was in school. No, no, you were here. I saw you. I was not here. I... Well, actually, I wasn't in school. I was home. You sure? I guess I know where I was. Why weren't you in school? Because I didn't feel like going. That's why. Why didn't you feel like going? I don't have to tell you. No, you don't. It's none of your business. That's right. It's nobody's business but my own. I didn't go to school because I was... I was... Miserable. No, sick. I was sick. No. Miserable. Absolutely miserable. Yes. How did you know? You didn't want to be with other people. You didn't want to face them. How? How did you know? Why didn't you want to face them? Well, because... They'd know how miserable you felt. Just by looking at you. They'd know. That's part of it. And they'd know why. That's the other part of it. I don't understand you at all. I never even saw you before. I don't know your name. So how does it happen you know all these things about me? I have no idea. My mother doesn't know. My father doesn't know. So how do you... I just do, that's all. Listen, you're still miserable, aren't you? Never mind, I know you are. You think the whole world is stopped, don't you? You think it'll never start up again? Not for you. For other people, maybe, but not for you. 
to you. Never mind how I know. I know. Well, let me tell you something. The world hasn't stopped forever. It'll start up again. When? When will it? About... About four o'clock this afternoon. I stayed out almost all day. Everything seemed... Not pleasant exactly, but not unpleasant either. It simply was. It's hard to describe it, and, and I find I don't want to describe that day. Describing it might spoil it, and I wouldn't do that for anything in the world, because it was one of the best days of my entire life. I reached my house in time to have a drink before dinner, and that was the end of my almost perfect day. You! You there! Get down off that horse! What? Why? What's the matter? I got a few things to say to you. Well, do you want to come inside? I can say what I've got to say right here. Well, well, please do. Please say it. Whatever is on your mind. What are you trying to do to that girl? What girl? You know what girl. Oh, you, you How mean... How many girls do you know in Ungerville? I don't know any. I, I met one girl once this morning. What'd you do to her? I didn't do anything. You hypnotized her. What are you talking about? I wouldn't hypnotize anybody. I wouldn't know how. Well, you did something. We, we had a little talk, that's all. Five, ten minutes. And what did you say to her? What difference does it make what I said? She thinks you're some kind of god. That's what difference. Well, I didn't say anything to make her think I was a god. We just talked. A, a friendly conversation. That's all it was. Are you some kind of a magician? Is that it? No. She says you know everything that goes on in people's minds. But I, I don't. I never said I did. Well, she said so. She said it to me. She's saying it to everybody. It's all over town. Now, you better get out of Ungerville, mister. It ain't healthy for you around here. But I... I haven't done anything. You've done plenty. You take my advice and you get out. I haven't. I haven't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't for the world. You want me to take your horse to the stable? What? Oh, what's that? You want me to rub him down? Oh, oh, yes, the horse. Yes, yes, uh, cool him out. Listen, do you, do you know what your wife said just now? Did you hear her? Part of it. Well, all I did, this, uh, this young girl, all I did, I, I could see she was unhappy, and I, and I said as much, and she said, yes, it was true, and I said, well, don't be too unhappy, because it won't last, it'll stop after a while, and you'll be happy again, and, and she said, when, when will it stop, and I said, I said, about four o'clock this afternoon, that's all I said. Why did you say it, do you think? Why? I don't know. I just I just said it. It was the first thing that came to my mind. Why do you think it came to your mind? I don't know. I suppose I wanted to make her feel better or something. How do I know why I said it? It just seemed to be the right thing to say. Oh, I see. And now she thinks she's telling people I'm a god or something. Anyway, that's what your wife said. Your wife accused me of being a magician, some kind of weirdo, a freak. She told me to get out of town. I Shall I cool the horse out now, sir? If he needs it, I, I brought him home on a slow walk. Hey! Hey there! Is that the girl? Yes. I want to talk to you. Look, what have you been saying about me around town? Why, nothing. Except that you were wonderful. You didn't tell anybody I was a god or a magician or anything like that? Oh, I don't think so. I may have said you were like a god or like a magician, and you are. I'm not. And you could get me into a lot of trouble going around saying those things. I wouldn't do that. Well, you may have already done it. How could I have? When you did such a wonderful thing for me. I didn't do anything for you. But you did. Don't you want to hear about it? I'd like very much to hear about it. You remember this morning? When you said I was miserable. I didn't know myself that I was miserable till you said it. I kind of knew, but I didn't know what, I didn't want to admit it. All right. So what? And then you said that by four o'clock this afternoon I wouldn't be miserable anymore. And by four o'clock I wasn't. That's all? That's everything. At a quarter to four, I met my boyfriend and we made up our fight. And I was happy again. That's it? That's the whole thing? The thing is, you knew. When I was talking to you, I thought I'd never be happy again as long as I lived. But you knew that wasn't true. I didn't have to be very bright to know that. But at four o'clock, you knew about four o'clock. A guess, a wild guess. Oh, no, you knew. You absolutely knew. 
And I'm so grateful to you. Now don't be. Don't be. Oh, but I am. And I, I wanted to do something for you. So I went over to where you saw the daisies. You know, the field. And I asked the farmer about the daisies. And he said he cut them down. Cut them down? The whole field? He's going to plant alfalfa or something. Well, it's getting on for dinner time, so I'd better go on home. Maybe I'll see you tomorrow? Maybe. Yes. <laughs> Probably. Good. I'll be looking forward to it. Me too. At least I think so. Uh, what, what about the horse, sir? Uh... Oh, what about him? Oh, well, just, just rub him down and give him a good bran mash. He's had quite a day. And so have I. Okay. Come on now. Hey, hey, wait a second. What What do you think of all this? Hmm? Oh, what? All this falderall about the girl, me. What your wife said about the talk around town. Well, could be one of several things. Or a combination of things. Could be mere coincidence that she said four o'clock to the girl and she reconciled with her boyfriend at that hour. Or it could be that she put the idea into her head so that when four o'clock arrived, she made the reconciliation possible. Or... Yes? Or? Or what? Or it's possible that a true telepathy exists between you and this girl. An actual meeting of the minds. In which case... Yes? I'd take my wife's advice if I were you. And get out of town. We've all heard of empathy... It is not the same as sympathy. One may empathize, that is, feel another's pain, without feeling sympathy for it. Actors do this all the time, and it is one of the fundamentals of their art. But our hero is not an actor. He is an unhappy man who has gone off to try and alleviate his own suffering. Feeling the suffering of another may be nature's response to his need. I'll be back shortly with our concluding act. Telepathy between lovers is not uncommon. Telepathy between mother and child, not at all rare. But telepathy between two strangers who have met purely by chance, though not unheard of, is exceptional. If telepathy is really the motivating force behind our story, well, listen to the concluding act and decide for yourself. <laughs> I woke next morning with the same despondency hanging about my shoulders like a heavy shawl. I took a different path this time to avoid the field now shorn of its daisies. Perhaps I didn't belong in Ungerville. Perhaps coming here was going to solve nothing, only complicate everything. I turned my horse into a field. A barren, ordinary sort of field. And then... Then it happened... An enormous flock of tiny birds rose from the stubble. And such birds! What beauty! Some, some sort of finch with shiny black heads and breasts of brilliant pink. A huge flock of them all rising and flying together. I held my breath. Oh. Hi, mister. Hi there. What? Who? Hi. Oh, it's, it, it's you. Yeah, it's me. Uh, did you see them? All those birds? I didn't see any birds. Well, I did. The minute my horse stepped into the field, they, they flew up from the ground, hundreds of them. One second there was nothing to be seen, and the next, hundreds of these tiny birds in the air. I, I think they must have been rose-breasted grosbeaks. I don't think we have any of those around here. I suppose they were migrating. Not around here. Well, maybe they lost their way, made a mistake. That can happen. Hey, look here. What is it? Is this one of your birds? Well, let's see it. Hand it over. Is it dead? Now, this is one of them, all right. No, I, I don't think it's dead. I think... 
I think maybe it got tired, or maybe it flew into something, got a shock. Will it die? No. No, I don't think so. I'm afraid. I think if you were to take it home with you, keep it warm and, and talk to it a little, it will live. You really think so? I really think so. Then what do I do with it? Then you, you take it outdoors in the warm sun, and you let it lie on your hand for a while. And then what? Then if, if it flutters its wings, well, then you lift your hands up a little higher, about, about as high as your head. And then what? Then the bird will fly away. To be with the other birds? Yes, where it belongs. When will it happen? When will it fly away? Yes. At two o'clock this afternoon. Really? Or three. One or the other. I think I'd better take it home now. Yes, you'd better. I walked my horse back home very slowly. I had no idea why I'd answered the girl's questions the way I did. My knowledge of birds was minimal, and how to care for an ailing one was nil. But the concern I saw in her eyes, her free and ardent desire to be of help to something more helpless than herself, I simply said the first sensible words that came to mind. Through with your ride so soon? Yes. Beautiful day. I, uh, I ran into that young girl again. Oh? Did you? I started across a barren field, reduced to stumps of clover or grain or something, and a, and a great mass of little birds flew up right in front of me. They'd been resting in the stubble, I suppose. Mm, feeding, probably. They were incredibly beautiful. They must have been migrating and gotten off course. The girl found one left behind. She, she thought it might be dead, but I held it and its body was still warm and I thought I could detect a faint, fast heartbeat. So I told her I thought maybe it had run into something and got a shock. Yeah, that's possible. So I said, take it home, keep it warm and, and talk to it. And after a while, take it outside on the palm of your hand and if it flutters its wings, hold it up high and it'll fly away. Uh -huh. Now, why did I say all that? I don't know if that'll happen. For all I know, the bird is dead by now. Died before she got it home. Why do I just say whatever comes into my mind lately? I just blurt it out without stopping to think. Just blurt it out. I, I tell you, something's happening to me. Something I don't understand at all. And, and I don't much like it either. I sat slumped on the front porch. Why did I come here? What did I thought to find? If anything, the mess in my head was more disorderly than ever. Then I saw the girl running up the front walk. It happened. It happened. Just the way you said it would, it happened. What? what? What is it? The bird. I did what you said, and it happened. The bird's all right? It flew away to be with the others. Why, Why that's marvelous. Isn't it? It's just marvelous. I'm very glad for you. Oh, no. You did it. Just you. You did it. No, no, wait. I took it home, and everybody said it was dead. Even my father, and he's supposed to be so smart. He said it was dead. I should throw it in the ash can. I got so mad I wanted to kill him. But I took the bird and wrapped it in a piece of flannel left over from a nightgown I had when I was little. And I petted its head very softly, and I kept talking to it, saying, you know, love things, sweet things, things I thought would encourage it. You know? I think I do. That went on for, I don't know, an hour, I guess. More, maybe. Then I thought I felt its head move a little bit, so I took it out in the sun. This was a little after 12, so the sun was straight up, practically. And I kept talking and touching its head. And then you know what? What? Its whole body gave a little wriggle all over. And it looked at me. It looked right at me. You don't say. I almost cried. I got this lump in my throat. Of course you did. And I waited. And I waited, and I talked some more encouraging things, like you would do a baby, you know. And then it happened. What happened? What 
what you said would happen. What did I say? You said it would ruffle its feathers, and it did, it did. And then what? And I lifted it up as high as I could over my head, and it flew. My goodness. First, it flew to the branch of a tree, and it perched there looking around, and then it flew off to join the others. How wonderful. Yes, it was. It was wonderful. It happened just the way you said it would. I wasn't sure it would happen just that way. But it did. It happened just like that. Just like you said. Well, now, that, you know... That's when I knew I loved you. What? I watched the bird flying off and I knew for certain that I love you. And will always love you. Now, wait. Wait. Only you. Forever and ever. Hold on. You don't know what you're saying? Oh, yes, I do. I'm saying I love you. I worship you. And I want to belong to you and spend my life with you. And never be away from you for a minute. Now, stop it. You stop it this minute. Just stop that kind of... Why uh, should I? Because I tell you to. No, look. Not, not because I tell you to. Because... Because it's wrong. It's, it's inappropriate. Why is it inappropriate? <laughs> Little girl, how, how old are you? Seventeen. And how old am I? I don't know. I'm 62, my dear. I don't care. But you must care. And I must make you care. You're just beginning to live, and I'm, I'm beginning to contemplate the end of living. Oh, no, you're not. You'll never be dead. Oh, not today. Probably not this year or the year after. But some year after that, if anyone takes the trouble to look. I won't be there. I don't believe you. But you must. It's very important that you should. I don't see why. I know you don't, because you're very young. And you've lived so little. You don't know much about life or living. Or anything at all. You mean I'm stupid? Oh, no. Not, not stupid. Just simple-minded. That goes with being young. I think everybody at age 17 is simple-minded. And is that why you don't want me? Maybe it is. You're terrible. You're a terrible person. I know. I hate you. I never want to see you again. And you shouldn't. You should take all that love and sweetness you have in your heart and give it to someone who will accept it with joy and hold it close and make his life around it. That's what you should do. I know somebody who wants me. Good. Good. As a matter of fact, he's waiting for me right now. Good. So, goodbye. Goodbye. Have a nice life. You too. Oh, dear. Dear me. How's your appetite now? Uh, how's that? I brought you your sandwich. Oh, just, uh, just set it down. All right. What do you, uh, what do you make of all that's happened here? Uh, the bird, by the way, recovered and flew off. And on the strength of that, the young girl fancied herself in love with me. There's no doubt there was an affinity between you. Some might call it telepathy. I prefer the word affinity. But Why? Why should there have been? Why did I come here in the first place? Please, I, I'd, I'd like your opinion. You know how Ungerville got its name, don't you? I've no idea. From the Danish word ung, it means young. I think you were looking for your youth. Instead, I found my age. Is that it? No. No, that's not it. You're a man of intelligence, sir. And a man of honor. So you never forgot your advanced age. Nevertheless, you were able to recall the moods, the impetuosities, and the infatuations of youth. Very few people who have grown can do that. I don't know when it is they start to forget, but... Somewhere along the way, most of them do. And this is very hurtful to the young. Well, I think you're to be congratulated, sir. 
and admired. That you can remember how difficult it is to be young. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. You make me feel better. There's a car pulling up in front of the house. So there is. And the lady's getting out. You're right. Darling. It's my wife. Darling. How are you? I, I'm fine. I'm just fine. How, how in the world did you find me? Oh, I asked around. We drove through Ungerville on our honeymoon. Don't you remember? That was 30 years ago. How, how could I remember? Well, I remembered. You said then you'd like to come back here someday. Remarkable. So I had sort of a sixth sense, a kind of telepathic message. Whatever you want to call it. A meeting of the minds. <laughs> Sit down, sweetheart, and, and share this sandwich with me. Then we'll go home. I've got a lot to tell you. I doubt that there's anyone beyond the age of 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 who does not now and then look back to and long for the early days when everything seems possible and even simple, even certain. One small compensation that comes with the ensuing years is the knowledge that everything is not. I'll be back shortly. advanced years who have not learned that almost nothing is simple or certain are the ones to be pitied. They are the ones who remain eternally infantile and unsatisfied, a burden to everyone and most of all to themselves. Pity them we must, but let's face it, they are a nuisance. Our cast included Michael Tolan, Terry Keene, Robert Dryden, and Amanda Plummer. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Ancient civilizations are remembered for a variety of reasons. Egypt for her pyramids, the grandeur that was Rome, the glory that was Greece. But how about our own civilization? Sometimes in my darker moments, I wonder if perhaps ours won't be remembered as the creators of the sleeping pill, the little pellets that have brought surcease from care to so many, and unfortunately, death to so many others. All this he needs is a good cameraman, and we could make a film. Please, Jenny, control your sense of humor. And here, take this pill. I never take pills. It is just to help you through the final rite. The making of the mark of the Valpurgis Club. That way, I promise, you won't even feel the heat of the branding iron. <laughs> mystery drama, Woman from Hell, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Joan Lovejoy. It is sponsored in part by the Florida Orange Growers and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One.
suicides always rate a few lines of newsprint. But every newspaper headlined the shocking and totally unexpected death of the legendary superstar Jennifer Grinnell from an overdose of sleeping pills. The question on everyone's mind was, had this fantastic woman taken her own life? In Los Angeles, the medical examiner's office was off limits to reporters seeking the answer. One man, however, had been admitted, given a report, and now he walks slowly down the long corridor out of the building and into the bright California sunshine. Mr. Ducot! Uh, Mr. Ducot! I have nothing to add to what I've already said. Oh, you've got me wrong. Uh, I'm not a reporter. Uh, here's my card. Darrell Jones, private investigator. I have no need for a private detective. But I need you. You see, someone's hired me to look into this death. Then I'm not the only one who feels there's something very strange about this so-called suicide? You can say my client has some doubts. And who's your client? Now, come on, Mr. DeCoe. You know that information must be confidential. Good day, Mr. Jones. Uh, no, uh, wait a minute. Uh, where are you going? To my car. It's in the parking lot. Okay, if that's the way you want to play it. Uh, have you ever thought how much better your chances are of proving your wife didn't commit suicide if you had some professional help? That was my introduction to Mr. Durrell Jones. Other introductions are in order. My name is Lawrence Ducot, the man who accompanied Jennifer Grinnell through life. Her only husband. But a husband who remained so discreetly in the background throughout her flamboyant career that only her intimates knew she was married. Nevertheless, I loved her, and I could not allow the world to believe she'd taken the coward's way out. And so I found myself in a quiet restaurant, drinking coffee with Durrell Jones. Uh, I'd like to know why you're so sure that Jennifer Grinnell didn't commit suicide. I should know. I was married to her. We lived apart, but we kept in touch. Oh, give it up, Duco. You're never going to make anyone believe you and Grinnell had a close relationship. I was under the impression you were going to be of some help. But you're just the same as the police. I don't know why you bothered to ask me to talk. Because I'm getting paid to do a job, and you've made a lot of waves by going around insisting she never would have killed herself. I'm no expert, but don't most suicides leave a note? Eh, not all of them, but more do than don't. There was no note. A point. But not conclusive. Do you believe in extrasensory perception? <laughs> now, there's something that would look great in my report. No hard evidence, but husband says that his ESP tells him Grinnell was murdered. How about a tape recording? You have a tape proving she was murdered? No, not exactly, but if you want to come out to my house, I think you'll find it interesting. Okay, where's the tape? Let me explain. I can't afford servants, so I had this telephone answering tape installed. And since Jenny and I spoke frequently, I've kept a tape recording of every phone call. Very clear. Ten days ago, I called her. Here's the call. Here are her words. Hello? It's me, Jenny. Oh, Larry. I'm so glad you called. You're in trouble, aren't you? Yes. Money? Uh, worse. Can I help? I was just writing a letter to you. You can tell me about it. Oh, no. No, not over the phone. You're frightened. Now, what is it, Jenny? <sighs> the one secret I ever kept from you, my pet. Well, tell me. Uh, the letter I have just written to you, it should explain enough. Goodbye, love. You were so sweet to call. Jenny, don't hang up. Uh, Jenny. Now that you've heard that conversation, what do you think? I can understand why the police weren't interested. You don't believe that she was frightened? Sure. But of what? She didn't mention anything specific. Uh, if the police and the medical examiner say that Grinnell killed herself, I'm not about to argue with them. Well, then, why did you take the case? <laughs> That's the way I earn my living. A client asks me to look into something, I look into it. That's why I'm here. But I'm not on anybody's side, and... I don't like to make myself look like a fool, especially in front of the cops. I see. Now, she said something about a letter she was writing you. Did you ever get it? No, she must have had second thoughts after she talked to me. I never received the letter. It was a lie. I had received the letter, but I felt that it would have been useless to show him. His mind seemed to be made up, and so was mine. Jenny had said one secret she never told me. 
Because I felt that Jenny's secret lay in her past, I went to the man with whom she'd had her longest and closest relationship, the spectacularly successful novelist, Bruce Brown. He was working at his latest retreat, a remotely situated house on the Greek island of Samos. You hear about our girl. How can I help? Well, first, by telling me whether you think she committed suicide. Hell no. That's why I hired a private detective. By the name of Durrell Jones. That's my boy. Has he been in touch? Yes, he has. Hmm, and? He thinks she did it. Does that make you change your mind? Well, it bothers me. Jones is good. Who would want Jenny dead? Bruce, she was scared. Scared? Our Jenny scared? Our Jenny. Hey, <laughs> look. Do I catch a whiff of jealousy after all these years? Come on, shall we stick to the subject? Right after I tell you something. If you don't mind, Bruce, I think I... It'll only take a minute. Now, you know when I first met Jenny, and you know how I fell for her. But what you don't know is that I proposed to her. You know what she said? Not only what she said, but how she said it. She told you didn't have to. I know the routine. She opened those violet eyes wide and in her best ingenue voice said, but I am married. Yeah, well, what you don't know is that I asked her to get a divorce. She refused. <laughs> Welcome to the club. You say she was scared. What was scaring her? I received this letter. Postmarked the day of her death. Shall I read it to you? No, no. Yeah, let me. Dear heart... There is no way you will make any sense out of this letter. But I do not see any other way. If one week after you receive this craziness, I am still alive, you will destroy it and forget it. If something should happen to me, then you will make your own decision. Yes, I am afraid. Of what? Of a mistake I made back in the days of innocence. I never told you, but now it has come back to haunt me. But I also have another secret. I kept a diary. A diary? Jenny, a diary like any schoolgirl. I don't believe that. She's putting you on. Now finish the letter and then we'll talk. I have written both too much and not enough. But for your own dear sake, I warn you... Trust no one, no one, at you, Jenny. Well, what do you think? I think if this letter had been written by anyone but Jenny, I'd say it was a woman who was going insane. But with Jenny, well, there's no question she was scared. And fear, well, fear is just the wrong emotion to associate with Jenny. If we think that way, we're not going to get anywhere. But where do we want to get... I want to get whoever killed her. You think we can? She has the answer in her diary. You know where it is? I have an idea. Excuse me a moment. Yeah? Uh, Bruce, this is Jones. Yes, yes, Jones. You got something on the Grinnell case? Look, I'm calling to tell you that there is no case. The dame took an overdose of sleeping pills, period. There wouldn't have been any talk at all if it weren't for her husband. He made news just by turning up. Very few people knew that she was still married to him. Well, did you talk to him? Oh, sure. I even listened to a tape of a phone conversation he had with her, but that just proved she was upset. Larry, did you show Jones the letter? No. Hello? Hello, you still there, Bruce? Yes, yes, I'm still here. Oh, look, I haven't got a single clue that points anywhere except to suicide. Okay, you've made your report. I want you to stay on the case. For how long? Until I tell you to quit, or until you tell me you're quitting. Okay. You're paying a hell of a price for what I think is plenty of nothing. I understand. You keep pitching, and I'll keep the money coming. Bye. Glad you heard, Larry. Yeah, I heard. He's convinced it's suicide. I'm glad you didn't tell him about Jenny's note. But I didn't because you didn't, and come to think of it, why didn't you? Because Jenny specifically wrote for me not to trust anyone. But you've already disregarded that bit of advice by telling me. What Bruce Brown said was true. But I hadn't told him everything. I hadn't told him that Jenny's favorite song was La Vie en Rose. Or that I felt Jenny was trying to tell me something about the diary and how to locate it. That's why I stood on the cobblestones outside René Pergamo's florist shop on the Rue Clichy just two days after I talked with Brown. René's window 
with its usual bounteous and beautiful display, brought back memories. And as I stood there, René himself came rushing out. Monsieur Ducot, Monsieur, may I express my condolences and shock at this sad news? When I heard, I could not believe. I know, René, thank you. Come inside. You're most welcome, mon ami, and expected. Expected? But of course. A few days ago, this little package arrived from Madame, addressed to you and marked, Hold for arrival. There are people who have actually died from fright. Medical testimony bears that out. The question in our tale seems to be, can fear actually drive a person to take his own life? A logical answer would be, some people... But would a woman like Jennifer Grinnell be driven to this act of desperation? We'll be back with the answer right after these messages. Now, what does anyone expect to find in a florist shop in Paris in the spring? Fresh cut flowers, certainly. The lovely scent of burgeoning spring plants and, of course, the undertones of romance which accompany the annual springtime awakening of the City of Light. But for Laurence Ducot, the florist shop of René Pagamo might hold the answer to a riddle. The proof that his glamorous wife did not take her own life. How long are you staying in Paris, Monsieur Ducot? Well, it depends, René, on what is in this package. Monsieur, let me assure you, if there is any way I can be of help. Oh, that's very fine of you, René. Let me get the door for you. These are not just words. Uh, oh, attention, monsieur, watch out. Hey, monsieur, get it! Oh, well, let him go, René. But I won't forget that I'm even further in your debt. You know, he, he really might have hit me. It was almost as if he were trying. That is our Parisian drivers for you. Hop in, Ducot, quick. Jones, what are you... Come on, or we're going to lose that car that almost got you. You know, you're, you're talking like a man who believes that car really tried to run me over. It's a lot easier to believe that than your story that your wife didn't kill herself. Still, why would anyone want to rub you out? Because, perhaps, of this package. Ah, damn. You lost him. Uh, now, what's such a big deal about that package? It's my wife's diary. Complete up until the day of her death. <laughs> Do you intend to follow me wherever I go from now on? I think you need protection, Ducot. Well, maybe, but I can't afford your fee. I oh, don't let the fee worry you. I'm already being paid. Oh, a room service, please. Is your client paying for this, too? <laughs> of course. Oh, yes, uh, two special lunches, the filet of sole and a uh, carafe of white wine to 731, Mr. Ducot's room. Thank you. If you've really got your hands on her diary, it might change a lot of things, but... Somehow, I never thought of Grinnell as the type would keep a diary. Yeah, well, for once, we're in agreement, but... Uh, here it is. Do you recognize her writing? I'll take your word for it. But before you start to read it, think. No one, not even you, suspected she kept a diary. Maybe there are some things she didn't want anyone, I mean anyone, to know. Jones, you're a fool. I was married to Jennifer Grinnell for 23 years, and I knew her a lot better than anyone guessed. We're not going to find anything in this diary she'd be ashamed of. The years fell away, and memories came flooding back as I read the entries and found myself again under the spell she'd always cast for me. I could see her sitting in the small, cramped flat we'd had in Paris right after our marriage. I could smell her perfume and hear her as she wrote in the diary I never suspected she kept. And such foolishness today. Mutsi, my agent who adores me, has made an appointment for me with Anton Krasuski for the lead in Woman from Hell. I told Larry, thinking we would laugh. But he thinks I should go. I told him I would. But I refuse to make a fool of myself. Jenny, Jenny, are you home? Larry! Uh, I will give you only one guess what we have for dinner. Did you go to but see... But a small clue, it is heaven. Well, what about Krasuski? Uh, did you like him? What did he say? 
Oh, he said I was a fat cow who would be fine as a milkmaid, but to play the lead in a picture as big as Woman from Hell... Oh, you're lying. <laughs> of course. I did not go. It would have only been a, a great waste of time. <laughs> yes? May I speak with Jennifer Grinnell? Who's calling? Anton who is it? Uh, your waste of time, Anton Krasuski. <laughs> Lady, you will tell me why you failed to keep an appointment with Anton Krasuski yesterday. Uh, may I have a light, please? Do you want the part? Are you offering it to me? Here is your light. The part can be yours, depending. Depending? On how much you really want it. Why do you choose me, an unknown actress dreaming of a career for the lead in the most important film of the year? Because I have seen your nightclub act. Because your insolence and your beauty are perfect for the part. Well, pardon me for being slow, but I thought there were other considerations. Only one. Join the Valpurgis Club. The Valpurgis Club. Hmm. And what is that? A club of witches? Exactly. It was a desolate house in the country, lit only by firelight and candles with weird music, and people drunk, not with liquor, but with some kind of frenzied belief in the magical power of the devil. As Krasuski took me through the various rooms, he watched, and then asked perceptively... You find this amusing? <laughs> that disappoints you? Not at all. But I must warn you that this is literally playing with fire. <laughs> with hellfire? A most exact description. And now I would like you to see the altar. The altar is impressive. But I was more impressed with the worshippers. They believed. And people who believe as deeply as they did can be dangerous. Krasuski was most cordial today when I again visited his office. It is my belief that you were born a witch. I only wish to reawaken your slumbering destiny as I'm sure I can make the hidden fire in your eyes burst into flame with the proper caresses. Hmm, no doubt. But just what plans do you have for me in the Valpurgis Club if I should join? You will be a star, believe me. The club has helped me in my career and I know we can help you. I will do as I always have, help myself. What I was asking was, what does the club expect of me? Only to recruit members. And suppose I should fail? You fail? Unthinkable. But we are not monsters. As long as you sign the membership papers and are bound by our rules, you will find us most agreeable. You know enough about me to know that I like to make my own rules. Not in this game, Sherry. Not in this game, ever. How can I tell Larry the truth? He smugly keeps reminding me that he was right about me getting the part in Woman from Hell. How I ache to tell him about the Volpurgis Club. But I cannot. And even if I did, he would just laugh and dismiss it as a silly joke on Krasuski's part. I must admit, I felt the same, but there are certain things that worry me. As, for example, today, when we were rehearsing privately the scene where I shall carry you the tortures he will suffer in hell if he allows me to seduce him. No, 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 it is all wrong. And uh, how many men have you seduced, Anton? You will listen to me because when this man takes you in his arms, he is doomed for all time. If you do not believe, how do you expect the audience to believe? This is your picture. And you are the woman I chose. A woman from hell would know. She would see immediately that this is a man who likes to suffer. Who enjoys being tortured. So that he will have the best of both worlds. You in this and eternal punishment in the next. You know this, and you are amused. I am not confused. Tell me, Anton, how do you know all this? Don't you know? 
I have a hotline directly to hell. I do not like it. I do not like it at all. But I cannot withdraw now, and the picture promises to be a success. It is almost frightening, the knowledgeability that Anton shows about the workings of hell. I even accused him of it the other day during a break on the set. But why should you question my knowledge of witchcraft and diabolism? You and I belong to the same club. I am reaping the benefits of years of research. And your payment, Anton, for these benefits. How much is it and when is it due? I will tell you. Or perhaps you will know when the picture is finished. <laughs> I loathe fidgety men, and Anton has become extraordinarily fidgety. He has also become a bore about other men. He blames everything upon Hollywood and the Kleeglet frenetic quality of our success. But this is nonsense, and he knows it. When are you seeing him again? You mean Bruce? You are forgetting an obligation to the club to which we both belong. <laughs> I cannot help it if I am not a good saleswoman. Isn't that an understatement? Your record is immaculate. Not one convert to the Valpurgis Club since you became a member. Remember, I warned you about the possibility of my failing. I remember. And now it is I who have to warn you. Either Bruce Brown becomes a member, or you will suffer severe consequences. <laughs> They overestimate my influence on Bruce. They know just how infatuated with you, Bruce is, and you have never really believed, have you, Jenny? And you won't until it is too late. However, we have a problem. We? Do you mean you, the club, or me? All of us. You remember Jacqueline Fournier? Of course. Then you may also remember that she was announced for the part that I gave you in Woman from Hell. Uh, must we go through this ancient history? I am afraid we must. You see, she has heard rumors about the Valpurgis Club. And she threatens to do a whole expose, claiming you got the part through witchcraft. Let her. The club does not think that would be wise. Then let the club stop her. That is just what they intend to do. Fournier can be appeased. With your influence, you could get her a part in a picture and she would be happy. I do not pay blackmail. I told them what your answer would be. But Jenny, for your own sake, get Bruce Brown to join the Coven. Hello? Have you seen tonight's paper? No. I thought you should know that Jacqueline Fournier met with a tragic accident. Her car ran off Mulholland Drive and crashed. She died almost instantly. Which, of course, is something to be thankful for. Accidents can happen. Anytime, anywhere. And today, everyone knows what you mean when you designate a person as accident-prone. On the other hand, would we be so willing to say someone was accident-prone if we knew that a coven of modern witches wanted that person dead? That knowledge bothered even the strong-minded Jennifer Grinnell. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. One of the most famous and dramatic moments in the theater occurs in the play Peter Pan, when the actress playing that immortal boy turns to the audience and asks them to applaud if they believe in fairies. Invariably, the house breaks into a storm of applause. However, would the audience response be the same if the actress asked for applause from those who believe in witches? That was precisely the problem that faced Lawrence Duco as he tried to prove that his wife didn't commit suicide. 
her diary asked him to believe in witchcraft. Now, if you want to waste some more time, we'll continue reading the diary, but my advice would be for you to burn it. Less than two hours ago, you were all enthused over the chances of finding the answer to Jenny's death, and now... You're not thinking, chum. You started all this because you wanted to clear the stigma of suicide from your wife's name. And I still do. Even if you now brand her as a believer in witchcraft... A wheeler dealer in the occult who built her whole career upon a deal with a coven of modern witches? I don't see that it has to be put just that way. And I'll make my decision when I've finished reading the whole diary. And so I reopened Jenny's diary. And again found myself reliving those days when Jennifer Grinnell was Hollywood's biggest star. And I, her husband, was a forgotten man. While her romance with America's favorite writer, Bruce Brown... Headed the list of items in every gossip column. Hello? Jenny, it's me. I'll pick you up at the usual place at nine. Oh, that is not possible, Bruce. Why, what's up? I thought we had gone beyond questions. Well, I thought so too, but that was before we stopped seeing each other. Or haven't we stopped seeing each other? More questions? I'll pick you up at nine. No, not tonight, really. Tomorrow? I suppose I owe you that much, love. You don't owe me a thing, and I'll explain when I see you tomorrow. Tomorrow will be the last time I see Bruce. It is something I have refused to face for too long now. But I am afraid I believe that the Walpurgis Club is an evil and vicious thing... If they are not witches with supernatural powers, then they are criminals. Because I cannot believe that Fournier's car crash was an accident. And I will not even talk to Bruce about joining. <sighs> Poor Anton. I must lie to him. Or maybe not. Maybe the truth would free him. Come in, Anton. Isn't that your phone? I hear ringing. Yes. Why don't you answer it? You know me better than to question me, Anton. I do what I choose. If I do not want to answer the phone, I do not. Because you know very well that it was Bruce Brown calling and you did not want to talk to him. So? You have deliberately broken off your relationship with him. And if I have? If you have, you have done something I have never known you to do since we met. You have broken your word. So I have. And it is about time you should find the courage to break yours also. Don't talk to me of courage. You could continue to see Bruce Brown and never bring up the question if he's joining the club. But that way you might get into trouble if the club members are really witches and warlocks. So you take this coward's way out and it ruins me. What can they do to you? For starters, they can take me off the picture. I will not allow them to do that. They have already done it. Will you answer the phone? What do they expect to gain by punishing you? First, discipline for the ranks. I was the one who recruited you. That was an error. Two, they think perhaps out of a feeling for me, you will change your mind about trying to recruit Brown. Ridiculous. Yes, I know. But you will suffer too. Just wait until you see the new director. At this point, I closed the diary. Jones looked at me inquiringly. Had enough, Duco? Now I understand what Anton Krasuski was trying to tell me. You went to see him. When? As soon as I heard he'd been taken off Jenny's picture and replaced by Luigi Ferrelli. You seem to be pretty buddy-buddy with a lot of your wife's lovers. Oh, we had a lot in common. Would you like to hear what happened when I went to see Krasuski? Well, I'm still on the case, and my report has to be written. Go ahead. Of course, you never knew Krasuski, so you wouldn't have noticed, as I did, the changes as I approached his house. It used to be crowded and well-lit... And this night, it was empty and almost deserted. I crossed the driveway, rapped on the door. Larry, come in. It is very nice of you to come and see me. What happened? Why did they take you off the picture? <laughs> they said they wanted a director who would be less dazzled by Jenny. Well, that's nonsense. Jenny's the star. You did two great pictures with her. Nevertheless, they seemed to be logical when they chose Farelli. 
Do you know any director who is less dazzled by Jenny than Parelli? He hates her. And she him. It almost seems as if someone wants to ruin Jenny and her career. And me, no? Here. Here. Look inside my forearm. Wait, wait till I roll up the sleeve. Now, tell me what you see. Uh, are you sure you're all right? Tell me what you see. Well, a small scar. It's shaped like a horseshoe or, or a hoof. That's right. Now ask Jenny. Ask her to show you hers. And that's when I walked out on him. Did you ask Jenny about her scar? No, I never did. When she broke her leg and was taken off the picture, it completely slipped my mind. And then... Oh, well, you know what happened then. Oh, everybody does. Your girl couldn't get herself arrested in Hollywood. She was finished in pictures. You don't know what that meant to Duco, her. I am still interested in finding out what happened just before she died. And I think we ought to skip ahead in that diary and see if we can find out. Yes, you're right. Now, let's see. Sometimes she dated entries and other times not, so... Oh, yes. Here. This one's dated just a month ago. And here's what she says. It has happened. I suppose I should have known that someday it would happen. But I really thought I was finished with the Volpurgis Club. So many years had passed. And no word from them. And so it came as a surprise when I did hear. And in a way I never would have expected. My agent phoned and told me that Tyler Campbell wanted to see me. I'll confess, I felt some of the old excitement of meeting a talented motion picture director. I've always been one of your greatest fans. Every scene in Woman from Hell is etched indelibly on my memory. I'll quote the dialogue for you if you like. <laughs> Would not you be embarrassed if I said please do? Uh... If you want my company, all you have to do is pay for it. If you want my love, you will pay more. A price that I advise you no one can afford. <laughs> enough, enough, <laughs> I am convinced. Uh -huh. I can't understand why a talent like yours shouldn't still be working. Oh, I agree with you. And that's why I've come to see you. How do you feel about trying a comeback in a film I'll direct? Of course, I wouldn't expect a commitment until you'd seen the script. You haven't even asked what the film will be about. Well, I, I was not up to that in my mind. Mm -hmm. It's about witchcraft. Oh? Does that turn you off? Well, it, it is too soon to say. You know I don't do ordinary films, Miss Grinnell. Yes, I know. And I assure you the film is well worth doing. Today, witchcraft is in. But I intend to use it somewhat differently. I see you as fate. Beautiful. Enigmatic. And inescapable. Uh, interesting. Good. I promise that I shall shoot you so that even in the cruelest close-up, your scar won't show. My... My scar? Don't tell me that that little mark inside your wrist is no longer there. Even plastic surgery won't eradicate it. And it's exactly the same as the one I have here, behind my ear. See? Yes, I see. So this was all a trick. You are a member of the Valpurgis Club. In good standing, Miss Grinnell. Which is more than I can say for you. But my offer to do a picture with you is very real. I am not interested. Too fast. You make a decision before you know any of the facts. We have nothing more to I say. I suggest you listen. If you think you've paid your dues in full, you're mistaken. You betrayed us. And you betrayed your oath. I am finished with you and with the club. And you will be. I promise you. Do one small favor... And you'll be a big star again. And no strings attached. How do you mean, no strings? You will be allowed to resign from the Valpurgis Club. 
The only member in this 300-year history to be given that privilege. I have already resigned. I have not been to a meeting or... What you have in mind does not necessitate your going to a meeting. You've heard of Jason Albright. (laughs) Who has not? He is the sixth or or seventh richest man in the world. Mm -hmm. Did you know that Jason Albright is one of your greatest fans? No. He's worshipped you for years. How nice. Jason Albright is very ill. In fact, he's terminal. Well, that is too bad. My fan club will be reduced by one. True enough. But you can make a dying man very happy. Simply by talking with him. Visiting. Spending a little time with him. Are you out of your mind? Why would I... Albright has no heirs. His will leaves all his money to various charities. But wills can be changed. I see. Of course. Simplicity itself. Nothing for you to do except spend a little time with Albright. Be your charming self and... And persuade the old man that the Valpurgis Club is worthier than all of his other charities put together. Precisely. Couldn't have put it better myself. Before you answer that, I have a feeling it will be Jason Albright. What? We managed to get word to him that you'd be receptive to a call. I see. Hello. Who is this? No. No, this is not Miss Grenell. She is not at home. She will not be in for some time. No, I do not know. Goodbye. That, Miss Grinnell, was very foolish. I want you to think carefully. Think what a small thing we're asking of you. And then consider the alternative. We can make things very definitely unpleasant for you, Miss Grinnell. Think it over. How long do I have to think? We can give you only 12 hours. And then we'll be here for your answer. alternative do I have? I cannot go to the police, and I will not have anything to do with the club or its scheme. So, I turn to my diary and write. And I get an inspiration. I cannot go to the police, but I can hire a private detective to protect me without telling him why I am hiring him. And I remember, I had heard of a good one. I will call him this minute. There, I feel better. I have called and he is on his way. I hope he is intelligent. And that may be too much to ask. But his name is... Don't bother, Duco. I know my name. You? You were the detective Jenny called. I'll take that diary now. (laughs) If you look closely at my wrist, you'll see the mark that her diary described so well. And now, of course, you understand why the cause of her death must remain a suicide. Now, I know there are some scholars in the audience who will say that Walpurgisnacht, the witch's Sabbath night... Named after St. Valpurgis is a fake. And the Valpurgis Club, therefore, must also be phony. For the simple reason that St. Valpurgis was an English woman who never committed an evil deed in her life. I'll be back shortly with some more thoughts on witches and witchcraft. Witches and warlocks have been part of man's history and development since the beginning of time. And frightening demons and demonology abound in the history of civilization. And also in man's progress, scientists for years have solemnly announced that there are no demons, no witches. Then why do these myths persist? I think perhaps because we need them. 
If they really don't exist, then we'll invent them to answer this need. It's something to think about till next time. Our cast included Joan Lovejoy, Norman Rose, Mandel Kramer, Paul Hecht, and Matt Polan. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. How long does murder keep fresh? Forever. Even 20 years? Whose murder? He killed a priest. A priest? Father Jim Morgan, what have you got? What have you got? You got my word that your sentence will be cut. I made deals while you was in diapers. Now, we'll do it this way. My mouthpiece has to meet with a DA. And all the I's get dotted. And all the T's get crossed. How do I know you got anything? Only three guys know about some that could sit Mike Perry down in a chair. Mike, me, and Pop Morrison. I like you, copper. But first, my mouthpiece has to tell me we got a deal. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and by the Florida Orange Growers. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs> 